This comprehensive course on web development with HTML and CSS is created with beginners in mind. It's taught by Akash, the CEO and co-founder of Jovian. The course starts with the basics of HTML and CSS and gradually progresses into advanced concepts covering Git, GitHub, and cloud deployment using Vercel, as well as mobile-first responsive design, the Bootstrap CSS framework, and the Express Web Application framework. So let's start learning. Hello and welcome to this course on web development with HTML and CSS. HTML and CSS are the foundation of modern web design, allowing you to create visually appealing and functionally uh, uh, visually appealing and functional web pages. HTML specifically stands for the hypertext markup language, and it is a standard language used to create web pages. And this is what HTML code looks like. This is some of the code that we'll be writing today. It can be used to create headings, paragraphs, images, links, and many more things. So if I head over, for example, to jovian.com, this is a web page. Now on this web page, everything has been crafted using HTML and then styled using CSS. So HTML is used to structure the content and add elements and then cascading style sheets, uh, cascading style sheets or CSS is used to describe the presentation of HTML documents. It allows you to control the layout and the appearance by defining styles for elements and you can configure things like fonts, colors, margins, borders, etc. So today we are going to look at the very basics of HTML and CSS. We are going to start by creating an HTML file, adding code into it using the VS code editor, viewing it in a browser. We're going to then use some basic HTML tags to create a web page. Then we're also going to use some more HTML tags to structure content on a page, things like headings, lists, paragraphs, etc. Then we're going to add styles using CSS and understand the CSS box model for layout. That is the core uh, foundational concept in CSS. And then we're going to style these uh, HTML tags using CSS to replicate the structure of a desired web page. So we'll look at a problem statement and we'll try to replicate the web page that we have in mind using HTML and CSS. And finally, if time permits, we are also going to try and deploy that website to the cloud using an online hosting service. So in just about two and a half hours from now, you will be in a position where you will have deployed uh, your first website to the cloud. So isn't that exciting? The first, very first lesson, you'll be deploying your own website. And there are no prerequisites for this tutorial. The best way for you to learn these skills is to follow along as you're watching the lesson, pause it at various places, follow along, type out all the code yourself. Don't even copy paste, just type everything out and then experiment with it using the exercises that are present in the lesson. Now you can find the completed code for this tutorial here in this GitHub repository. Specifically, you can open up this folder, my first web page, and you will find all the code that we are covering today in this folder. So we will explore the basics of HTML and CSS by attempting to solve this problem statement. We will create a web page that showcases job listings for Jovian. At Jovian, we have a growing team, we have a growing user base, we're adding new programs. So we have certain jobs for which we want to hire, but we don't have a jobs page yet. So we're going to try and create a jobs page for Jovian. And on this jobs page, we're going to sh show a few things. We're going to require our jobs page to have a few things. One is a nav bar at the top showing the Jovian logo. So something like this. This is called a navigation bar or a nav bar. Then we may want a header section displaying a picture and some relevant information about Jovian. So anybody who comes to our jobs page should learn a little bit about the company itself. So we'll have that. Then maybe a list of job openings that include the job designation, location, and maybe salary details. We'll see what we can put in there. And maybe also a link to apply for the job. And then a footer at the bottom of the web page with some important links. So generally at the bottom of any web page in a website, you might include, you might have a bunch of links to other web pages on the same website or elsewhere. So we are going to try and build all of this today in the next couple of hours. And we will also attempt to make the page visually appealing and informative. So let's see how far we can get. This is a fairly ambitious problem statement while we are also learning the basics of HTML and CSS. Now, creating your first web page is actually quite easy. All you need to do is simply create a file, put some text into it, and then open that file within a web browser. 
And while you can use any text editor to create the file and put some text into it, web developers often use editors that are better suited for programming because they have certain features that will help you write code in various programming languages easily. And these are called code editors or sometimes also called integrated development environments. Okay. So in this tutorial for today, we are going to use a code editor called Visual Studio Code. Now you can download it for free. It is a free and open source tool. So you can download it by going to code.visualstudio.com. All the links are present in the lesson resources and the lesson notebook. Now, based on which operating system you're working on, you'll have to download it for that operating system. You can see that it is available for all major operating systems and it is developed by Microsoft. So it also has great windows support and you should download it. And once it is downloaded, just double click the installer and follow the instructions to install it on your computer. And once it's installed, we can then start creating our very first web page. Okay. So let's get into it. Now, uh, the first thing we need to do is create a project folder. Typically, whenever you're working on a project, it's a good idea to create a folder where you're going to put all the files so that you don't pollute your desktop or your downloads folder. So let me go in here and let me create a new folder. So I'm going to call this folder. Let's see. I'm going to call this folder my first web page. Okay. Uh, I've just used hyphens here, my first web page. Um, if you can't see, let me just zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, so you should be able to see it now, my first web page. All right, uh, so I've just used hyphens here, my first web page, that is the name of the folder. And now we want to open up this folder in VS Code. So let us first open Visual Studio Code or VS Code. Let me just type Visual Studio Code here and open up Visual Studio Code. Okay, so now, now I've opened up Visual Studio Code. This is what its user interface looks like. You might also see something like this. You might see a sidebar here as well. So that depends, you can hide or show the sidebar. You have options to show this over here. Now, what we wanna do in Visual Studio Code is open up this folder. Okay, so you wanna say file, open folder. So go into the file menu, select open folder. And I'm gonna come into my web, uh, desktop and select this folder, my first web page. Don't double click on it, just select it and then click open, okay? So now you will immediately see that you, you will see the folder name here in the sidebar, my first web page. I hope you can see it. And then you'll see this welcome screen. I'm going to close this welcome screen. But now this folder is open in VS Code. So VS Code is showing us this folder. And what I can do is I can now create a file within this folder directly from VS Code. So if I just go here, I should see a new button. And in this new button, um, I can using this new button, I can create a new file. And I'm going to create a file called webpage.html. So any web page has the .html extension, just like images have a .jpg extension or Excel files have .xls extension. So web pages have the .html extension. Okay. So now I've created this file called webpage.html, and I can verify that this file is actually present here. Webpage.html. You can see that when I open that window, uh, when I open that folder, I can see that the file webpage.html has been created. Okay. Now let me just get this onto the right. Now, once I've created this file webpage.html and let me close the sidebar, I'm going to put some text into it. So let me just say hello HTML. All right. So I've just written the words hello HTML into webpage.html. All right. Now here's what I'm going to do. I am going to now open this file webpage.html in the browser. So I'm going to say open with and I'm going to select the browser that I'm using, or sometimes you can also just double click and it will automatically open in Google Chrome. But just to be safe, I'm opening it with Brave browser. That's the browser that I'm using. And you can see as soon as I opened it, the same text that I entered into the web page or HTML file, the exact same text showed up here. You can see I'm just zooming into about 200% so that you can see it more clearly. Okay. Let's keep it at 200. All right. So, Hello HTML is what I typed here and hello HTML is what showed up when I opened when I opened webpage.html in the web browser. So that's it. That's how you create a web page. You just create a text file, call it something.html and then open it in a web browser and you have a web page. However, you want to put some kind of a structure into the web page because we don't just want to write text. We can paste a lot of text, but it'll all just be text on the screen. 
So that is where you, you use something called tags. So first, let me just put in some code here. So I'm going to create this tag called HTML. And you can see that this tag starts with a less than symbol or an arrow bracket and ends with an arrow bracket. And every tag has a tag name. In this case, this tag has the name HTML. Let me zoom in further. So it has the name HTML and every tag generally has a closing tag. Okay, so this is the opening HTML tag and HTML is always the outermost tag in any web page. And then there is this closing HTML tag and the difference between the opening and the closing tag is this slash character before the tag name. Okay, so any HTML page or any web page is built up using tags. These tags are used to create structure within the page. Okay, so now within an HTML tag, I'm going to put in a head tag Okay, we'll talk about what these tags do in just a second. And again, VS Code does this nice thing that as soon as you create an opening tag, it automatically adds a closing tag for you. And that is why uh, developers use these code editors. Okay, and then uh, another tag that I'm going to put in here is called the body tag. Okay, so now we have a HTML tag, which is the outermost tag. Inside it, we have the head tag and the body tag. And let me just save that for a second and reload. And you can see now all the content has gone away. So now nothing is showing up on the browser because we've not put any content into the page. The first thing I'm going to do is inside the head tag, I'm going to put in a title tag. Okay. Um, so I've just typed title. I've created an opening tag and VS Code added a closing tag for me. And let me just say my first web page here inside the title. Let me save that. Let me come back here into the browser, reload. And now you will notice that nothing has happened here on the page. But if you notice carefully the browser tab, the, the browser heading, the tab, the browser tab here, it has the title, my first web page. Okay, so it has the title, my first web page, and you can zoom in here and I can zoom in here and I can show you that it has, it has a title, my first web page. All right, now uh, let us add something here in the body. So I'm going to just add something called a div here in the body. So div is again another tag that is used to put some content into the body. And let me just put here hello HTML and CSS. Okay. So this is what a typical web page or a typical HTML document looks like. It contains a bunch of tags and then it contains tags within tags and each tag has a specific purpose. Okay. So now let me put that in and let me reload. And now you can see that here we have hello HTML and CSS. And then you can go back and change this. Let's say, let me make it hello HTML slash CSS and let me reload. Now it says hello HTML slash CSS. Okay. So this is how you construct a web page. You put in some tags and then you open the web page in a web browser. All right. So that's the basics of how you create an HTML page. You launch VS Code, open up the project folder within VS Code and then put some code into it. This is HTML code. So we put in an HTML tag, head tag, title and body, and then save the file once you've added the code and then open it with a browser. And this is what it looks like. Okay. Now let's understand HTML tags a little better. So tags are the building blocks of HTML and they are used to describe the structure and the content of a web page. Now, normally every tag will have an opening tag, like the HTML tag had an opening tag like this over here. And it will also have a corresponding closing tag. And sometimes tags can have attributes. And these attributes are used to provide more information to the browser or modify the behavior of a particular tag. For example, the HTML tag has this attribute called lang, which is simply written in within the opening tag itself. And then the attribute lang is given a value en, which means English. So here what we're doing is we're indicating to the browser that this particular HTML page is written in the English language. So now that browser can use it for, let's say, uh, setting up a translation, automatic translation tool or something like that, right? So an attribute is used to provide some additional information about that tag or modify the behavior of that tag. And we look at a lot of attributes with time. So I can say here, for example, HTML lang equal to en. And that doesn't do anything visible, but that does inform the browser that this is an English web page. All right. Now, uh, so that's about tags and a tag can contain one or more children. So like the head and the body are called the children of the HTML tag and a tag along with its children together is called an element. Okay. So the tag is simply this piece. This is the opening tag and this is the closing tag. Everything inside a tag is called its children, which is again, other tags. 
and then a tag together with its children is called an element. So this whole thing is an element and then this is an element and then this is an element. So every tag along with its children is an element and then what's a, whatever is inside a tag is called children. Okay, so these is just some terminology that you'll see when you're reading about HTML and CSS. All right. Now tags contain attributes. We talked about that, that and there are various different tags to create headings, paragraphs, lists, images, etc. And we we'll look at those in just a bit. Now, uh, one thing I want to mention is that HTML is the outermost tag. However, in many web pages, you will find a doc type declaration just above the HTML tag. So you will find something like this. You will find a doc type. Let me zoom in here. So you will find doc type HTML at the top of most web pages. And that is just a good convention that is followed that at the top of every HTML web page, it's a good idea to just put this doc type HTML. Okay. And this, this is just something that you copy paste at the top of every HTML web page. And you can literally just go on Google and search doc type declaration. Okay. And you can find this link HTML doc type declaration, and you can just copy this and put it at the top of each HTML page. And if you want to understand what this does, you can, I encourage you to go through this H uh, W three schools link. Uh, it's not important. It's just a convention that you want to put in because there have been multiple versions of HTML. And this is a way for you to indicate that you want to use the latest version of HTML to the browser. Okay. Now we have the doc type. Then we have a bunch of these tags. Now the HTML tag is the outermost tag. We already talked about that. And the HTML tag is typically only contains two other tags, the head tag and the body tag. And it ha has a lang attribute and it has some other attributes also that can be set. And you'll see a doc type declaration just above HTML. So that's the HTML tag. Okay. Then we have the head and title tags, which are the tags that we are seeing here. So the head tag is a container tag in HTML that often it doesn't contain any content that is going to be visible on the page exactly, but it generally contains some information that is passed on to the browser and that is useful for the browser. And that is also useful when you're sharing this link with somebody else. So for example, it contains the title tag. We put in the title tag over here in the head and the title tag is used to set the title of the browser tab. Similarly, there are some meta tags. So, and then some meta image tags, etc. And these are used to set the preview image and the description that shows up when you share this link on a social platform or when this is seen by a search engine or something like that. Okay. So the head tag is uh, very useful. It is also used to sometimes include maybe style sheets, CSS uh, files, and sometimes used to include scripts. We'll cover all of these. Don't worry if these terms don't make sense just yet. For now, we're just using the title tag within head. So within head, we just have the title tag. And then we have the body tag. Now within any HTML page, you have a body tag and the body tag defines the main content of the HTML document. It is usually placed after the head tag and it contains all the visible elements of a web page. Okay. And the body tag can also include other HTML tags like headings, paragraphs, links, etc. And here is the key thing. Here's the key difference between just putting some text into a file versus putting it in the body tag and putting it in, in HTML tags. You can add styling, you can add colors, fonts, you can change the layout, and you can even add interactivity using JavaScript and CSS, right? So all of these things are applied within the elements in the body tag to change the appearance and functionality of the web page, which is what we're going to do today. So here is an example of a web page with some content within the body tag. So here there is an H1. Uh, which is a heading tag. We'll talk about it. There is a paragraph tag. There is an image tag and there is a a tag. So I will not paste these right now, but I'll actually leave these as an exercise. So maybe just try and paste this into an HTML page, open it in the web browser and see what you can come up with. Okay. So that is the body tag. It is what contains all the content of the web page that we are going to be building today. Then we have the div tag. Okay, now you notice that inside the body, I did not directly put in hello HTML and CSS. I created a div. So I didn't have to do this. Uh, I could have just put it into the body itself. But the div tag is typically an HTML element that is used to group and organize other HTML elements together. For example, you can create one, one piece of content here in this first div. Div, this is some content. 
and then you can have a second piece of content under in the second div and then you can have maybe a third piece of content which is itself divided into multiple pieces of content in this third div okay so div stands for division and it literally creates a division on the page vertically speaking it kind of divides the page vertically essentially you can think about it and it is used to divide or group content into logical sections and it is a block level element which means that it takes up the full width when you add a div tag it takes up the full width and then the next div tag is going to appear below it and the next div tag is going to appear below it and so on and it does not have any its own style or semantic meaning or anything but it is used with css for styling okay so the div tag is something that we will attach a lot of css properties into to style the web page so let us create a let us look at an example of a web page create containing some div tags okay so here is the content that we're going to put in or type in one by one so first let us create a div tag and let us say this is some content okay so now we have put in some content to div tag and it says this is some content as we might expect then let me create another div tag and let me say this is a second line of content okay now if i reload the page you will notice that this content showed up below this content so that is what the div tag is creating it is basically creating a division within the page so this content is shows up in this area and then this content shows up below it in this area now notice that i can go into the next line i, I can type this is isn't a third line now i'm not creating a new div tag i'm still using the second div tag but this time you can see that even though I've typed this content on a new line, it is still showing up on the same line as the second line. Okay. So here is the important of, importance of div. If you want to split content vertically on a, on a web page, then you want to create divs and each div is going to create a new vertical section or new vertical division within the web page. Okay. And if you simply create multiple lines of content like this, all of that is going to show up in a straight line that is not necessarily going to show up uh, one below the other. Now here is another example. Now this time I have a div div tag, but inside the div, I'm then creating more div. So some more lines. Okay. So now I have this third div tag. And now in this third div tag, I have again, another div tag, uh, uh, three more div tags, one around each word. So now the, even though all these three div tags are on the same line within the HTML source code, you can see that each div, each inner div tag takes up its own vertical space. Okay. So that's what I want to convey here that as you want to keep building, uh, as you want to keep con adding content below the existing content on a web page, you should be creating new div tags. Okay. So that is the div tag. And those are the most basic HTML tags. Now we've just looked at what the head, the HTML tag, we've looked at the head and title tags, we've looked at the body tag, we have looked at the div tag, and I'll encourage you to experiment with this. What we really want to do though, is maybe first figure out what our web, what we want our web page to look like. Okay. So when, when you're building a web page, it's a good idea to first plan ahead and create what is called a wireframe. And this is what a wireframe for a web page look like. It is, it is just a rough drawing of what the web page should look like. Okay. That's what we typically call a wireframe. Like you don't put in colors, you don't put in exact fonts and sizes of fonts, etc. You just put a rough diagram of the structure of the page and you can use that as a visual guide while you're writing the HTML and CSS. Okay. Now, if you don't already have a design to work with, then sometimes it can be confusing if you're trying to design your web page as you're trying to code it. So the having a wireframe is going to help a lot. And you can use, you can create a wireframe using pen and paper, or you can use digital whiteboards like Excalibur.com. So Excalibur.com is a digital whiteboard. So this is what it looks like. And here on this digital whiteboard, you can create boxes, you can create circles, you can create lines, you can add text. And you can do a bunch of things to create uh, your wireframe. Okay, so you can use a digital whiteboard, any any one of your choice, but I like using Excalibur.com. Um, and the idea here is to separate the design and the implementation process to help you focus on one aspect of the development at a time. Okay. 
Now I will note, however, that professional web developers work with a detailed design mockup of the page and not generally wireframes because these design mockups or these design specifications are often created by UI UX designers with a standardized design system. So normally at a company, you will receive a full fledged design and that design will have all the colors, all the fonts and everything specified there. And you'll be working from that. But for your own personal project, it's okay to maybe just do a quick wireframe and then figure out the design over time. Okay. So let's recall the problem statement and then create a wireframe for the problem statement. We want to create a web page that showcases job listings for Jovian. And it includes a nav bar at the top of the page showing the Jovian logo. It includes a header section displaying a picture and some relevant information. Then it includes a list of job openings that includes the job designation, location, and then it includes a footer at the bottom of the web page with some important links. Okay. So keeping these requirements in mind, let us try to first design very broad, a very rough in a very rough fashion. Let's try to design what this web page should look like. Okay. So I'm just going to zoom to an area of Excalibur where I can actually design. Now you might see a bunch of these controls here. So when you're actually drawing, you might have these controls and you can always hide them. So there's an option called Zen mode here. Uh, but here, let's say this is what our web page is going to look like. Okay. Now at the top of this web page, we want a Jovian logo. So I'm just going to put a box here indicating the Jovian logo and I'm just going to put the word Jovian here. All right. And so now that's the Jovian logo that is going to show up at the top of the page. And this is going to be the navigation bar. So maybe let me just put a separator between this and the rest of the page. Then let us, uh, we want maybe a banner image, a header section with a banner image and some information about Jovin. So let's say this is going to be an image. So I'm just going to draw maybe like some hills here. Uh, we'll figure out something better than a hills and a sun. But uh, here we're going to put here, we're going to put an image. And then below the image, maybe we could have a section called about Jovin. Because when somebody visits our job, ba job page, we also want to tell them a little bit about Jovin. So let me come in here and let me just put in about Jovian. And then uh, maybe on the left here, we want a picture of the team. So here we're going to have a, a team picture, maybe a bunch of people here. All right. Very, very rough drawing. And here on, on the right here and on the left, maybe we have some information about Jovian. Okay. So some info about Jovian. Now, I'll show you a quick trick. Sometimes you need to generate uh, or you need to get a bunch of text to fill the page. Now that you can do using this tool called lorem ipsum. So lorem ipsum dot io. Okay, lorem ipsum dot io and the link is in the notebook is a quick tool to generate as much text as you need as many paragraphs of text as you need. So I'm just going to copy a bunch of this random text. This doesn't mean anything. I'm just going to put that in here. And let me just split it into multiple lines. Okay. So yeah, just about that. And maybe also let me reduce its size a little bit. So now we have this, let me change its color. Yeah. Now we have this about Jovian section, this nice about Jovian section over here and Let's move all this here as well. So one nice thing about digital whiteboards is you can move some of this stuff around. And then let us put a section called job opportunities. Okay. And in this section job opportunities, I'm going to just make that black in color once again. In this section called job opportunities, let's make that a little bigger like that let us put in a few job roles. So we have a job role for a front end developer. And then we have a job role. Uh, and this is in Bengaluru, India. And maybe we want uh, like an apply button here. Okay, or an apply link or apply button or something. Let's put that here, a small apply button. Let's make this a little smaller. Like that. So that is what our, uh, that is what a single job role looks like. And now once again, the good thing about these digital whiteboards is I can just take this and I can create a copy and create a second job role and 
copy and create a third job role. All right. So let's call this backend developer and let's call this data scientist and maybe let's also put something like remote here and let me put mumbai india here right and uh, apart from the jobs we maybe also want to have a footer at the bottom of the page so i'm going to just add a separation here and maybe i'm just going to add a few links so one link to courses one link to programs and one link to youtube okay and just put that in here courses programs youtube let's line these up so these are going to be our footer links and finally right at the bottom i'm just going to add a copyright notice copyright 2023 jovian and let's make that a little smaller and put that in here as well okay so yeah just in about four or five minutes we have uh, just created a wireframe for what our web page should look like all right and then you can cop you can take this whole thing and you can copy it as png and save it somewhere maybe you can send it to uh send it to a co-worker for review you can just like copy that as a png or i think you also have the option to export it you can go in here and you can actually export the image as well um so this is a good thing to do anytime you're building a web page first it's a good idea to just go ahead and create a wireframe using a digital whiteboard and something that you can modify easily as well okay so now that we have this wireframe you can see here this is what the wireframe looks like we have the nav bar we have an image we have an about jovian section we have the job opportunities we have an apply button or apply link and then we have a footer at the bottom Okay, so I encourage you to again try and replicate this wireframe on your own using Excalibur or maybe try adding a additional section here and there just to see if you can do this on your own. Okay, so you should be following along with this lesson, pausing the video, following along, pausing the video, following along, and trying to make changes here and there just to experiment with things. Okay, so now that we have created this wireframe, we can now use this wireframe as a reference to add content in our html page okay so right now we don't have any useful content in our html page so we can start adding the content one by one and the first thing that we're going to add is headings so let's figure out what headings we have within our web page so here we have a couple of headings we have this heading called about jovian we have this heading called job opportunities and then i could even consider these as headings of each of the jobs okay so heading is generally just some big text on the page it is maybe the start of a section it is maybe a start of a subsection or it is maybe the most important piece of text in a particular element on the page so i'm going to consider about jovian job opportunities and front-end developer back-end developer data scientist as headings now there are various kinds of headings in HTML. Uh, in fact, specifically there are six heading tags. Uh, these tags are H1 to H6 and H1 is the highest or the biggest heading tag and H6 is the lowest. Now heading should always be used in a logical order and should accurately describe the content on the page. So if you're using H1, then for subsections you should be using h2 and then for sub subsections you should be using h3 and so on. Don't use an H2 as the heading of the entire page and an h1 in the middle of the page because that is going to confuse people even though you can change their font sizes from the default but still it's logically it makes sense for you to use uh, use the headings that are uh, use headings appropriately within the page so h1 should be used for the most important heading h2 for the subheading and so on okay so let's go ahead and let's add some headings into our page so the first thing i'm going to do is clear all of this Let me also just, let's see, let me get rid of this piece over here. Yeah, so the first thing I've done is I've cleared out all the existing content on the page and let me save that and that that has all gone away. So let's add the headings one by one. The biggest heading on my page is about Jovian. So let me add that. And once I do that, you can see that, okay, now, now I have a nice big about Jovian section. The next heading on the page is job opportunities. Great. And then we have three of these jobs. So you can see here we have front end developer, back end developer, data scientist. So let's go H3, front end developer, H3, 
backend developer and h3 data scientist okay i can go up to h6 but i'm just going to use these three headings here so now we have this nice logical separation between headings so we have about jovian then we have job opportunities and then we have these three job roles and all these three job roles should use the same header ideally because they're indicating the same level of hierarchy okay so that is how you create headings really straightforward just put h1 h2 h3 and keep going all right so now we've added headings and this is what that looks like great and our page is start slowly starting to take shape not exactly what we're looking for just yet but it's getting there next is there are specific text uh, there's there are specific tags for adding text specifically we have a couple of tags one is a p tag or a paragraph tag and the second is a span tag and both are used to define text in html so this is some text you can see that we we are going to add up below about jovin and this is added using the p tag so the p tag defines a paragraph of text and it is typically used for longer sections of text that form a distinct block so if you have an entire paragraph that is what you should put into a p tag and then the span tag defines a small section of text typically if you have maybe just a few words or maybe a single line somewhere within a div you can use it and it is typically used for inline styling let's say you have a longer piece of text and within it you want to make uh, some specific piece of text bigger or of a different color then you would wrap that around a span and we look at examples as we go along but p and span are the two tags that are used to create text on a web page okay of course you don't need to use a span or a p you can directly put a text within the div tag as you saw already but p and span give some one they semantically inform the browser that now inside this tag there is going to be text and second the div is going to automatically create a vertical separation the span doesn't do that so sometimes if you want text to maybe join together uh, and show show up in a single line you can use a span and the the p tag has some spacing before and after so it automatically adds some separation between the text and the rest of the content okay so let's use the p tag to add some description below about jovian so here is the description that we're going to add at jovian we're on a mission to build the world's highly most highly reputed technical university and we're building it complete building it completely online let me change that to it and we're building it completely online we offer several beginner friendly courses that are taken by 300,000 plus registered users okay so right below the h1 right below the section here i can put in all of this content and i can just click save and then i reload this and you can see that this p tag has been added and in this p tag we have this basic text now somebody had a question why not use a div tag here well if i just use a div tag you can see that the amount of well it, it works just just fine but as you noticed as we put in multiple paragraphs of text you will notice that the p tag automatically adds some gap between paragraphs so that is going to be the difference between using a p tag versus using a div tag okay all right so now we've added a p tag then uh, the other place where we can possibly use a span is within the job opportunities section notice that under each job opportunity we have also put in the location of the job so let's put that location of a job using the uh, using a span okay so here's what i'm going to do i am going to first wrap uh, i'm going to create a span and i'm going to take the span and the h3 and put that in a div tag because each job is logically separated so each job we wanted to show up in a logically separated area that is why we're putting a div around the uh, job okay and don't worry if this doesn't make sense if you're wondering when should i put a div around something when should i not put a div around something well uh, you just experiment with it extreme html is all about experimentation all right so here we have an h3 tag and then i'm going to put a span and i'm going to put in bengaluru india then I'm going to put in another div here and I'm going to move this backend developer role here and I'm going to put in a span. I'm going to put in, let's put remote here and I'm going to put in another div here and I'm going to put in the third H3 here and I'm going to put in a span. Let's put Mumbai India here. Okay, so now we have added these job opportunities uh, locations and we put each of the job opportunities plus location in a div tag 
Now, one quick thing I want to show you is let's say you're typing and maybe things go a little bit haywire uh, and you don't have this nice indentation or this nice logical structure visible anymore. Just right click and select format document. And that is going to automatically arrange all the tags in this nice fashion that tags that are children of an outer tag are automatically going to get some indentation or some space before them. And then it's also going to split up the lines nicely. So anytime you want, you can right click and select format document. And there's also a keyboard shortcut to do it. And then you can save it. And let's reload now. And all right, so now it's starting to look a little better. Now we have the front end developer role and under it we have Bangalore India, then we have back end developer under it we have remote and data scientist under it we have Mumbai. Great. So our, our notebook, our, our web page is starting to take shape pretty nicely. Okay, so now we have this information. Now apart from this, there are also several smaller modifier tags. So there's a tag called B in case you want to make something bold in with, within a paragraph. There's a tag called I in case you want to make something italic. There is a tag called U in case you want to underline something. Now you can use these tags in between. I'll show you an example. Let's say we want to highlight 300,000 plus. I'm just going to put it in a B tag. So there's an opening B tag and then there is a closing B tag. And you can see that 300,000 is now bold. However, these specific tags are slowly falling out of fashion. What is being done instead is you just put a span around a specific piece of text and then use it, use CSS to style it. And we look at CSS soon. So uh, just know that although you have all these tags, the use of these modified tags is now considered a bit outdated and it is recommended to use CSS styles instead. Okay. So, but still as an exercise, I will encourage you to just play around with these tags and check them out. Okay, perfect. So now we have looked at text. We have looked at headings. We have looked at spans as well. Um, next, let us look at lists in HTML. So almost every web page that you might have seen contains some form of lists. And there are two types of lists in HTML specifically. There are more, but these are the two that are commonly used. One is an unordered HTML list and an unordered HTML list is simply a bullet list. It does not have any ordering. It is ordered, but it doesn't have numbers for the elements or the items within the list. And then you have an ordered HTML list An ordered HTML list simply has numbers associated with each of the items. And special HTML tags are used to create lists which allow for presentation of information in an organized and structured manner. So there are two types of lists, as I said, unordered and the unordered lists are created using the UL tag. And then list items within an unordered list are created using the LI tag. And bullet uh, points are used to denote the list items and you can change the appearance of bullet points using CSS or using some attributes as well. Similarly, you have ordered lists and ordered lists are created using the OL tag. So OL is ordered list, UL is unordered list and list items are added using the LI tag and numbers or characters are used to denote list items. Okay. And the appearance of the numbers can be customized using CSS or using attributes within the HTML element itself. You can also nest lists within each other. So you can have maybe a list and then each list item can have a sub list inside it and so on. So you can do a bunch of interesting things, but it's important to close all your tags properly to ensure that the page is rendered properly. Otherwise the browser is going to run into issues and things are going to look a little weird. Okay. So remember we had a footer on our page. Uh, let's try and maybe this looks like a list of links. So let's try and maybe create a, an unordered list for the footer elements. So I'm going to come in here and again, I'm going to just create a logical separation by creating a div and I'm going to create a UL or unordered list. And then in the unordered list, I'm going to have three list items. So I have a list item called courses and I have a list item called programs and I have a list item called YouTube. Okay. And then below this, I also have this copyright thing. So you can see we have this thing copyright 2023 Jovian. So I need the copyright character. So I'm just going to go on Google and I'm just going to search copyright symbol. Okay. This is the copyright symbol and I can just go ahead and copy it from here and paste it. So this is how you get special characters in your HTML. You just search the special character online and then you can copy it from there and put it in So copyright 2023 Jovian. Okay. Now let's reload the page. And just like that, you can see here at the bottom of the page, 
we have courses programs youtube and we have copyright 2023 right so a page is taking shape and apart from this let's also add a, a an ordered list somewhere so maybe in the about jovian section in this region let's maybe also list the programs that we offer so let's add another paragraph here let's see what do we want to do well we we add another paragraph and we're going to say we also offer two industry focused boot camps so let's create another paragraph p and let us put in this text we also offer two industry focused boot camps and in this paragraph let us create an ordered list because we are we have two programs and we can list them one by one so let's create an li here one or actually i don't need to put the number one the number one is going to come automatically full stack developer bootcamp and then the second one is data science bootcamp okay i think we want jovian full stack developer bootcamp and jovian data science bootcamp all right so now you can see that we have we offer two industry focused boot camps the jovian full stack developer boot camp and the jovian data science boot camp and the numbers one and two have been added automatically just as it was done in the case of the footer items where here it just added a bunch of bullet points great so so far so good we have added some lists as well and that has added some more content on the page next up we can add some links now since we have added some footer uh, we had added some footer items we also added maybe a couple of programs so we can now link these to other pages you know that any web page on the internet typically contains links to other pages and that is how you navigate a website now links can be to the same website links can be to other web pages on the internet um, it, it is completely up to you but links in html are created using the a tag the a tag is used to create hyperlinks and the a tag must have an href attribute to specify the url of the destination page and the text that is di displayed as the link is placed between the opening and closing a tags and let's say you want to link to open in a new tab then you can use the target attribute to specify where the link page should open okay so let's see that step by step let's first do this for the jovian full stack developer bootcamp so what we what we want to do is we don't just want to show this text jovian full stack developer bootcamp we actually wanted to point to the program application page because let's say somebody is applying for a job but they also want to see what kind of programs we offer it would be a good idea to maybe just link that from here so let me go to www.jovian.com and i'm going to scroll down here and i'm going to find the section full stack developer bootcamp i'm, I'm going to grab the link of that and let's come back here and let's create an a tag inside the li item so inside the list item we are creating an a tag so a and then you provide an href 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 is the attribute and then the attribute value is always put within double quotes so within these double quotes i'm going to paste the link okay and then i'm going to close the a tag and i'm going to take the closing tag and put it outside the text okay so now you have a href and then you have the href of the or the you have the url of the jovian full stack developer bootcamp and then you're closing the a tag inside the li tag so remember your tags have to be matched up properly when you you cannot put the a tag closing a tag outside the li tag because that is going to cause some problems so just be careful as you're doing this and now if i reload the page you can see that clicking on this is going to take me to the full stack developer bootcamp page right let me grab the data science bootcamp page as well so data science bootcamp copy that link and once again let's put that on a new line let's create an a tag here a href equals oops yep data science bootcamp and let's take the closing a tag and let's put it here and let's save that and now we have the jovin data science bootcamp linked from here as well and that is how easy it is to add links within a web page let's go ahead and maybe let's also link a bunch of these uh, footer links so i'm going to come in here and i'm going to say let's see a href equals let me just point it to jovin.com slash learn for now yeah all right and let me also point the second one to jovin.com slash learn
Okay, so both the courses and the programs footer links for now are just going to go to the same page, jobin.com slash learn. And then the third footer link, let me point that to our YouTube channel. So a href equals https youtube.com at jovian hq. Okay. Let me just format that. So let's say format document and that's going to just indent things a little better. All right. So now we have this courses link that opens the courses and we have the programs link that opens the programs. Um, but of course, both are going to the same place. Uh, but what we have here is this particular section within the page. It actually has an ID. So the section has an ID called courses. So if we actually type something like this, Ash courses at the end of the URL. Okay, that doesn't seem to work. Never mind. Yep. So uh, yeah, we have linked the courses, we've linked the programs, and we've linked the YouTube channel. Now, one thing that I want to do here is I also want to add a new. I want these links to open in a new tab. I don't want to change the current tab because if somebody is looking for jobs, I don't want to get distracted and lose track of the jobs page. So I'm just going to add target equals underscore blank. Okay. So anytime, what does this mean? What does underscore blank mean? Why do you need that underscore? Don't worry about all that. This is a very standard syntax. Anytime you need to open a link in a new tab, just put target equals underscore blank as an additional attribute in your a tag. Okay. That's all it is used for. Um, there are other targets that are possible as well, but underscore blank is typically what you should be using in most cases. Okay, so now if I click on courses, that is going to open it in a new tab. Okay, then if I click on programs, that is going to open it in a new tab. If I click on YouTube, that's going to open it in a new tab. All right, so now we've added links and our page is shaping up quite well. Now we have links on the page as well. What next? What else is missing from our page? So we've added headings, we've added some text, we've added some um, jobs as well. Uh, we've added footer links. I think the images are missing. So let's add the images as well. How do you add images in HTML? Well, so the way to add images in HTML is using the IMG tag. So there's a tag called IMG and you can use that to add images. Now the just like links are added using the A tag, A, A is short for anchor. So links are added using the anchor tag or A tag and you have to specify an href attribute. Similarly, Images are added using the IMG tag and you can specify the SRC attribute with the location of the image. The image could be on your computer, the image could be uh, next to the web page basically or the image could be somewhere on the internet. Both of these work. Um, you can just specify the location of the image using the SRC attribute. Apart from that, because images also typically have, uh, you should also indicate what that image is about. This is for screen readers and for search engines, etc. So you can also add an ALT attribute or an alt attribute, which is used to provide an alternative text for the image, which is displayed if the image is not loaded. And it is also read by screen readers for people who are unable to see the image. And it is also read automatically by search engines uh, to improve the visibility of your page on search. Now the width and height attributes of the image can also be set using the width attribute and the height attribute. And you can specify the width or height of the image as pixels on the screen. So if you know the resolution of your screen, the resolution of your screen is typically given in pixels. For example, 1280 pixels horizontally and 720 pixels vertically, something like that. So you can specify the height and width of the image in pixels as well. Okay, now the last thing is that the image tag or the IMG tag is a self closing tag, which means that it does not require a closing tag, you just put the IMG tag, you put its SRC, you put its ALT alt attribute, you put its width, you put its height, and uh, if you want, and that's it, you don't have to put a closing tag, you don't have to put anything within the image tag as children. Okay. So let's check out some images that we can possibly use. We need a couple of images, one image here as the banner that's going to show up on the entire page left to right and one, one, one image here which is going to show up here on the right. Okay, so how can we add, uh, how can you find these images? Well, one good place to find great photos that you can use for free is Unsplash. So Unsplash.com is a great place. So I'm going to search for career here 
and let me scroll down to find an image that might be good as a banner i think this image looks good so this image is a nice image that i could use as a banner on the page maybe not the entire height of the image but maybe like just this section would be good so i'm just going to go here and i'm going to say download free and from here i'm selecting the medium size okay so that is going to download a jpg file and i'm going to come into my desktop go into the folder where i actually have the web page.html file and put in the image file here so let me just call it banner.jpg okay so now we've created a banner.jpg file so that is going to be the banner that we use on the page let me grab another image which is going to show up here maybe here i want to show a team picture so let me close this and let me search for team let's see if we can find a good team image or let's search for maybe people working okay that looks good not the jovin team but uh, never mind we can still put it on the careers page so let's download this also in medium quality so let's go and call this team.jpg all right so now if i open up the sidebar once again by the way you can open the sidebar using this button here or you can also just use command b or i believe it's control b on windows you can see that along with web page or html we now have these files team.jpg and banner.jpg and now we can add these images into our html page so the first image the banner.jpg image is going to show up above the heading about about jovian so i'm just going to add img src equals and paste okay i'm just going to put in the file name here banner.jpg remember this could also be a url of an image on the cloud or somewhere on the internet but for now the image is right here next to the file that i have so i can just put that and let me just put the alt text here and the alt text i'm going to put here is uh, banner this is just the banner and i'm going to close this tag let me now reload the page and you can see that the image has been added here but it's too big let me just shorten the image so what i'm going to do is i'm going to just say height equals and i'm going to set the height of the image to let's say 360 pixels so when i say height equals 360 and reload now you can see that the height of the image has been reduced to 360 pixels okay i can reduce it further maybe just for now and we can make it bigger later yeah now the height of the image has been reduced so now we have this image of course it's not laid out how we want but it's there in the right place and then the second team image is going to show up on the right side so in some sense right is next or after so i'm just going to put that second image after this p tag before job opportunities so i'm going to say img src equals team dot jpg and alt equals team and let me give it a height of uh, 200 okay let's reload that okay so now we have the image here as well great so again you should what you should be doing is pausing this video watching maybe five minutes and then following along typing out everything on your own and build this step by step the best way to become a better programmer is to just code write a lot of code and even if you're writing the code that you're seeing on the screen you should be asking yourself uh, what that code means and you should be experimenting with it a little bit and if something breaks you should be searching online and maybe asking us a question okay that is how you're supposed to do this it's not enough to just watch this but at this point i feel like we have all the content that we require on the page it's just not laid out properly all right so we have all the content let's see yeah we have all the content we needed we have this about jovian we have this image okay maybe we don't have this navbar logo right now how about we fix that sometime later we'll, we'll figure it out um, but we have job opportunities we have uh, this image here we have this footer and we have this copyright section now one thing i want to mention about html tags and css html and css in general is that there is so much here so many different tags and everything that you shouldn't go about trying to learn every single tag and every single attribute of every tag before you start building web pages because then you will just be doing that for years it's uh, you should take the opposite approach where you start trying to build something and whenever you feel that okay you're not able to build it with the tags you already know then go and search online to see if there is a certain tag or maybe a certain other css property that is going to help you do it 
and over time the things that are going to be used most frequently are going to become second nature to you and you won't need to look them up that is what i do i still look up some fairly basic stuff on css even after 15 plus years of web development and i do this every week so uh, one exercise for you is to check out this tutorial on htmldog.com on the various beginner and intermediate level tags so you can check out the html beginner tutorial and the html intermediate tutorial so up once you're done with this lesson itself check this out at the very least go through all these different types of tags and if you have the time you can also go through advanced but that is something that we're going to cover in a future lesson anyway okay but this is a good place for you to practice another good place for you to practice is the w3schools.com website this contains a great HTML tutorial. So if you want to learn about a specific type of HTML tag, just go find it in the sidebar here and go ahead and do it. We're not going to look at every single HTML tag here because that's um, that is defeating the point. The, the reason we are here is because we want to build good web pages. Okay. So let's move forward. We are halfway there. Let's go ahead and style the web page. Now cascading style sheets or CSS is used to describe the presentation of HTML documents. It allows you to control layout and it allows you to control the appearance by defining styles for elements such as fonts, colors, margins, borders, and more. So let's look at some different ways to apply CSS styles. There are a few ways to do this by, and we'll do this by attempting to just center this about Jovian heading. We just want to bring it into the center of the page, um, horizontally speaking. We want to bring it in the horizontal center like that. And let's see how we can achieve that using CSS. Okay. So the first way to do it is using something called inline styles. Now in inline styles, you can achieve this simply using the style attribute and you can put that directly within whatever HTML tag you're trying to style. So let's say we have H1 and we want to style it. So you want to set the style and then within the style attribute, we want to set this as the value. So this is what a CSS declaration looks like. So what you do is you declare certain properties about that tag using CSS. You have a CSS property. So here the property that you are fixing is called text align and there are hundreds of such properties. But text align is the property that is used to decide the alignment of the text. Should the text be aligned on the left, center or right? And then you have a colon. The colon separates the property from the value. And then you have a value, okay? So all of that goes inside the double quotes that are used to enclose the value of the attribute. So yeah, so you have the CSS property and then you have a colon and then you have the value and then you have a semicolon to end the declaration. And then you can have multiple declarations here. Let's say apart from center aligning it, you also want to change the color to indigo. That is something that you can do here as well. Okay. So that is the simplest way to apply H, uh, apply CSS to some HTML tags. You simply go into the HTML and then you add a style attribute. Now within the style attribute, you add a property. So let's say we want to do text align. And for now, let me put center here. And then you put, so you have the property colon, you have the value. Generally CSS values do not require quote quotations. Some of them do, most of them don't. And then you put a semicolon and let me save that. And let you, let's just reload that here. And just like that, this is centered. Now you can experiment, you can go and change this to right. And you can see that that should bring you to bring it to the right of the page. And again, you can go back and change it to center and that should bring it to the center of the page. Okay. Let me also add a color. So color is added using the color attribute. And let me set the color to indigo. You can create any color you want using something called an RGB or a hex formula but there are some named colors within css and you can always look these up so you can search css named colors so these colors are recognized by every uh, these colors are already recognized by every browser so these are all the colors that are already available in css and you can use all of these color names whenever you want directly okay for example i could use dark blue instead of indigo and that would work as well and let me just reload the page here and you can see that now the content is centered on the page. Uh, just the about Jovian heading is centered on the page and it has the color dark blue. Okay. If you want to create colors that are not named uh, already in CSS, then we'll talk about that in the next lesson. All right. Um, so that is one way to add styles 
This is called the inline style and you simply add a bunch of CSS declarations in the style attribute. The other thing, because you might want to add a bunch of different styles or you might want to add the same set of styles to multiple tags is to use a style tag. So you can create a style tag within the head or the body and then you can put some CSS code within the style tag. Let me put the, uh, let me create a style tag within the head here. So I'm just gonna, going to create style. And now inside the style tag, the first thing you need to put in is a selector because now you no longer know where you want to apply the style to unlike this attribute which was associated with a tag already. So you need to put in a selector, okay? So there are many ways to select a particular or a bunch of HTML tags on the page. The easiest way to select a bunch of tags is by the tag name. So when you say h1 and then you open these braces or curly brackets, what you're saying that whatever I put within these curly brackets or these braces should be applied to all the h1 tags on the page. Now, of course, here we have just one h1 tag, but if you had multiple of those, then uh, it would apply to multiple h1 tags. But let me get rid of the inline style here. So now that the inline style is gone, you can see it's back to this position. And now in the style tag, I'm just going to write text align center. And now one of the benefits of using a style tag is you can use multiple lines. You can make your code easier to read instead of stuffing a bunch of styles within the same attribute and color. What was that deep blue or dark blue? Yeah. Okay. So now we have about Jovian, which is at the center of the page horizontally, and it has the dark blue color. Okay. Now notice that this style did not get applied to any other element on the page, but suppose this second element on the page job opportunities was also an H1 tag. You will notice now that job opportunities is also receiving the same style that the first H1 received. Okay. So that is the benefit of using the style tag. You don't have to retype the same style over and over for each tag. But let's revert that back for now. We are going to make this an H2. Okay. So that is the second way to do it, which is, let's just revert that. Yeah, this is fine. So that is the second way to do it, which is using the style tag. So in the style tag, you have a selector and then you have this bracket and then you have a property and then you have a property value. Okay. And then you close the bracket. And of course you can have multiple properties that you can apply using uh, to the tags that have been selected using this selector. And the simplest selector is just a tag. We look at other selectors as well. Now yet another way to create to apply CSS to an HTML file is to create a separate file containing CSS. This is very popular because that way you can put all your styles in a single file and all your HTML in a single file and then link the file, link the dot CSS file within the HTML page using the link tag. Okay. So you use a link tag to specify within the HTML page that the styles should be picked up from this particular CSS file. So let's do this. Let's create a file styles.css. Let's first get rid of this H1, all of that. And let's get rid of the style tag. Okay. And you can see that the style is gone. Now let us open up the sidebar once again, and let us create a new file styles.css. And now in this styles.css file, let us add H1 and let us put text align center and let us put color dark blue. Okay. And let's save that and let's reload the page. Nothing happened because we've not connected the CSS file with the HTML file. So let's come back here and now I don't need the sidebar anymore. Let's add a link here. So link is a tag, special tag. This is typically used for adding style sheets and it has a structure like this. So you say rel equals style sheet. You basically, you basically specify what is the relevance of this link uh, to this page. So style sheet, or what is the relation of this link to this page style sheet? And then you say href equal to styles.css. Okay. And that's it. And again, you don't need a closing tag. This is a self closing tag. So there are a lot of self closing tags in HTML. Now this href can be a CSS file that is sitting right next to your web page, or it could be in a subfolder. Let's say it was in a folder called CSS. Then you could put it under CSS slash styles.css, 
or you could also specify something on the internet. So that is what is done typically with frameworks like Bootstrap. Somebody has put up a bunch of styles on the internet and we simply include it, link it to our page using the link tag. And notice that the link tag is different from the A tag, which is the anchor tag, which is used to add links on the web page. The link tag is used to simply link style sheets. So it's a bit confusing the terminology because of how HTML evolved, but uh, that's what it is. Okay. So now we have link rel equals style sheet styles.css. Let's reload the page. And once again, this is now back to the center and it has the deep blue color. Okay. So those are the three ways in which you add CSS. You have the style attribute, you have the style tag, and then you have CSS files. Now, one thing I want to mention is CSS stands for cascading style sheets and inline styles take precedence over style tags and style tags, I believe take precedence over the um, external, uh, external files. And there are also other ways in which precedence is decided. So for example, like if I went in here and I added a style tag, uh, I added a style attribute and I changed the color to black again, you will notice that even though the style.css file says color dark blue, because I've specified the style explicitly on the H1 tag, that takes precedence and that is going to apply the black color to it. Okay. So keep that in mind. This can be sometimes confusing and generally speaking, keep things as simple as possible so that you don't run into all these issues. Okay. So now that we have done, we've added CSS. Let's maybe look at what are some other ways in which we can select specific elements and then apply styles to them. So when using the style tag or a separate CSS file, CSS properties can be applied to multiple desired elements on the page using three types of selectors. One is the tag selector. This is something that we've already seen. For example, we've done this text line center and color deep blue or dark blue for the H1 tag. The second is the ID attribute. So typically what you can do is you can set the ID attribute for a particular tag and then use the hash prefix within CSS to select it. Okay, so I can do this. I can add an ID for this uh, banner.jpg uh, image. So I can just say ID equals banner. And generally as a rule, there should be only one element with a specific ID on a page. You can have multiple and the browser won't complain, but just as a rule, semantically speaking, you should have one element with a particular ID on a page. Okay, so ID should be a unique identifier. So now we have banner. And now we can select the banner element. So now if I said IMG, that would apply to all the images on the page, right? If I said IMG, that would apply to all images on the page, but now I only want to apply to the tag, which has the ID banner. And that is why I have this hash or pound character. And now I can set something like width hundred percent. Okay. And now you can see that this image has a width of 100%. 100, width 100% 100 simply means occupy the entire space available horizontally. Okay, even if we resize the page, you can see that this image automatically resizes. Of course, there is an issue here that it, this image is getting stretched. We'll fix the stretch in just a bit. But at the very least, we are able to apply the width of 100% to just this specific image and not to this image. So that is the second way to select an HTML tag and apply some CSS styles to it. Then the third way to select an HTML tag is using a class. Now, sometimes what you might have is a several tags, which you want to style at once. And all these tags have to be styled using the same sort of styles. So here is an example. Let's say I add location. Let's say I add here. No, I have location somewhere here. Let's say I look at the location here. Yeah. So I have locations here. I have location for the front end developer role. I have location for the uh, remote developer role. I have located or the back end developer role and the data scientist role. And let's say I want to make the color of the location gray. So I can do this. I can say span and I can say class equals location. Okay. And let me go in and let me add that here as well. Span class equals location Span class equals location. So there may be many spans on the page. You can see that there is a span right here at the very bottom as well. But these three particular spans have the class location. And now I can apply some styles to specifically these three spans by using dot location. So I can say dot location dot is used to indicate a class. So you can either select a tag where you don't need any prefix or you can select an ID which is hash or you can select using a dot which is a class. And now I can say color gray. Okay. And let me reload the page. And now you can see here we have Bengaluru, India, remote and Mumbai, India. So 
this is applied this color is applied specifically to these specific sections okay now you might ask okay how do i know when i should use color when i should use text align when i should use what the simplest way is to just go on google.com and search okay how to center text in css and you can say it uses the text align property but now we also have tools like chat gpt where you don't actually have to go and search this on google and browse various web pages so this is something that i've been using a lot these days you can see that i have a bunch of conversations here already with chat gpt regarding html but you can just go into chat gpt or chat.openai.com and you can search how to center text in css okay and it is going to tell you that it's going to come up with an answer for that and it's maybe also going to come up with an example and you can ask it some follow-up questions as well okay let's give it a second maybe it will come up with yeah to center text in css you can use the text align property and set its value to center okay and it's showing you an example as well right and that's it so you this is great it, it works really well it doesn't always give you the right answer but you could ask it a couple of things and you can try it out it's a good starting point whenever you face an issue to go ahead and ask in chat gpt in fact i'll encourage you some of the questions you've been posting on zoom try posting them to chat gpt and uh, you might be surprised uh, at how well it can answer these questions okay so that is about the different ways in which you can select things now, I encourage you to learn more and experiment with various types of CSS selectors. What you can also do is you can uh, combine selectors of various types to select a specific set of elements that match all the conditions. For example, let's say you have certain divs with the class location and you have certain spans with the class location and you only want to apply these uh, settings to the span with the class location, then you can say span dot location. And I believe that is going to, or span dot location, and I believe that is going to just select the spans which have the class dot location. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to tell you before we go ahead and actually style the rest of the page is the CSS box model. The CSS box model describes how HTML elements are rendered as rectangular boxes in a web page. Okay? And the box for any HTML element is composed of several layers that determine the layout and the sizing of the element. So let us create, um, uh, there are a few components to the box model. There is the content, there is a padding, there is the border and there is a margin. We're going to understand all of these terms and we'll do that by creating another web page just so that we can experiment with the box model. So I'm going to open up the sidebar here and open up another page called boxmodel.jpg. Okay, there it is, boxmodel.jpg. Oh, sorry, boxmodel.html. Let me rename that. Let me create another page called boxmodel.html. Okay. And I can open up boxmodel.html here in my web page, in my web browser, like that. Just double click on it. Now that opens up boxmodel.html for me. And now inside this, let me start putting in some content. So HTML, let me put in the doc type declaration as well. You can see that VS Code auto completes the doc type de de declaration. It's nice. So let me add head. Let me add a title here. So CSS box model. And let me add the body here. And let me add a couple of divs. So let me add a div called first. Let me add another div called second. And let me give both of these divs a class each. So let me call this box one. By the way, for class names, you can put hyphens in between. So in CSS, whenever you're using class names or IDs, you can put hyphens. Let me call this box two. Okay, and let's reload that. Let me zoom in a little bit. 200 is good enough, yeah. So you can see that we have content as we expect, first and second. Okay, let me add a style tag here. And for box one, I'm going to set some styles. And then for box two, I'm going to set some styles. Okay, so no change here so far. Um, now the first thing I want to point out is what does the content of a div look like? Well, uh, let me add a background color. So the way you add background color is you just start typing and VS Code shows you. So let me add a background color. Let me add the background color aqua for box one. 
and let's add a background color let's see beige for box two and let's reload that and now you can see that each of these boxes or each of these uh, divs and a div is essentially a box which occupies the full width of the page mostly uh, each of these boxes have a background color one has the background color aqua and one has a background color beige okay just first notice that the content of the uh, of the box occupies the entire width by default when you create a div okay you can see that there is some empty white space around that is because the body the body tag which is the outermost tag on the page contains some margin and padding which i'm going to uh, or some internal spacing which i'm going to just set to zero for now um, we'll understand these terms margin and padding in just a second yeah so now you can see we have first and second we have a uh, box one which is first and box two which is second so you have the actual content which is the innermost component of the box and right now our boxes just have content they don't have anything else no, no border margin padding nothing now the content itself can be controlled using the height and the width properties of course if you put in a lot of content the height will automatically expand but i can also set the height specifically i can say this should have the height 240 px and this is how you specify lengths in a css you specify a number and then you specify px now you can also specify in inches you can also specify in percentages and all but in in the current case i'm just going to use px okay 240 seems too big let me just set it to 40 px right now yeah now we've set the height to maybe 80 px okay so now we've set the height of the first container or the first box to 80 px and let's set the height of the second box as well height 60 px so the height of the second box is set as well so so far we just our boxes just have a content nothing special now the next thing that we can add is something called a padding now the padding is the space around the content so you have the content and then you have padding which is the space around the content okay so let me add adding 20 px and reload the page and now you can see that we have this box first and the content itself is of height 80 but then around it there is this additional space of 20 px okay you can you can uh, by the way you can uh, just comment out something or you can disable some css property simply by putting it under these uh, slash star commands um, and you can do this using the command slash okay command plus slash is going to comment something out you can see without the padding it uh, this is the size and then with the padding this is the size and clearly it is added more uh, it, it we, have, we have added some space before the uh, on the left and also you'll notice on the right as well if you try to actually do something with it okay so let's say we set a width i can also set a width here width 100 px again you can see that this is the structure or this is the content of the box without padding this is what it looks like and with padding it is added around the content so padding is space around the content but the key thing about padding is that the background color or the background image or whatever also applies to the padding okay now next thing that you can do is you can set a border so you can you can set a border and you can set a border of let's say one pixel and let's just reload nothing happens because when you're setting a border you need to specify not just the border uh, width you also need to specify what kind of border you need and the typically the border that you need is like a line border which is solid and you also need to specify what is the color of the border okay so one px solid blue that is what i'm setting as the border of the of the uh, of the box okay so now you can see that outside of the padding a border has been added which is blue in color let's make that 10 pixels so now we have a 10 pixel border and you can see once again the size of the entire box has grown so first we have the content and then around the content we have the padding which is indistinguishable because uh, it has the same background but it is space you can clearly see and then around the uh, padding we have the border by the way you can also add a border radius radius here let's say you can add a border radius of 20 pixels and a pixel is simply one point on the screen okay and uh, you can just est you can just uh, play around with the pixel values when you're experimenting and over time you'll get a sense of which what pixel values make sense for the web page you're working on okay but i'll remove the border radius for now so now we've added a height we've added a width we've added a, we've added a border so we have the content and then we have the padding and these two are indistinguishable because the they have the same background then we have the border and the border has its own color it can match the background it can be different but it's going to show up separately 
then you can add some space outside the border as well okay and that is called the margin so margin and padding are the two most confusing things for when people they are getting started with css so i hope this is going to clarify so let's say margin 20 px and when we add a margin of 20 px you can see that outside the border 20 pixels have been added left and right around the entire box okay so the css box model basically tells you that you can get some content then put some padding around it and that will have the same background and then add a border around it and then add a margin around it which is going to space it away from the other elements on the page okay now uh, with border and margin padding and margin you can actually use a different border side uh, you can use a different border width or a padding width on each side so for example you could say something like this padding left is 10px padding right is 100px padding top is 20px and padding bottom is 30px Okay, let's for a second, let's just disable that. I'm just commenting it out or uh, basically this is done using command plus slash. Okay, and you can see now we have uh, some padding here and then we have some padding here, uh, which is which seems to be higher and then we are going to have some padding at the bottom as well. You can you'll be able to see it more accurately if I hide. So there's higher padding at the bottom, lowest padding at, at the left and then there is um, some medium padding here and then there is of course a lot of padding here without the right padding. Is going to be different right so that is one thing you can do you can actually specify padding properties for each side separately or you can also just specify for all sides directly here so you can say 10 px uh, left padding 100 px right padding 20 px uh, oh, sorry you have left no i'm not sure well um i think you start from the top or you start from the top so padding property order yeah, so the first uh, first padding applies to the top, the second to the right, the third to the le left, and the, the third to the bottom, and then uh, the last one to the left. Okay, so instead of padding left, uh, left, right, bottom, top, bottom, you can have padding, and then you can specify what padding you want for the top, what padding you want for the right, what padding you want for the bottom, and what padding you want for the left. So 20px, okay? And that is going to set the padding top right left or top right bottom left okay clockwise order starting from 12 o'clock so that is padding top right bottom left and similarly you can specify margin separately as well so you can say 20 px at the top 30 px on the right 50 px at the bottom and 100 px on the left and that is our margin applied properly okay now, one thing you can also do is let's say your top and bottom margins are equal or top and bottom paddings are equal, then you can keep them the same. So you can, um, you can do this, you can say margin uh, padding 10 px and uh, 100 px. So the 10 is going to get applied to top and bottom. And then the 100 px is going to get applied to left and right. Okay, again, top, bottom, left, right, if you put just two values, it is going to repeat uh, those two values. Okay, top, bot uh, top, top, right, left, bottom clockwise order top right left bottom always get confused all right so that is margin and padding now here's one interesting thing i want to point out though i hope this is all clear and you can also of course go uh, say border bottom width is 30 px and that is going to just change the border bottom width now here's one interesting th thing i want to point out let's say we give this a padding as well padding 20 px Okay, so now it has some padding and let's say we give it a border border 10 px solid red so now it has uh now it has the second box as a border as well now let us give it some margin specifically let me give it some margin top okay so notice keep your eyes here keep your eyes here and i'm just going to add a margin top of 20 px and let me just save that and reload you can see nothing happened so what happens is that margins between consecutive elements can collapse into each other okay so what happens is this has a margin bottom of uh, this has a margin bottom of 50 px you can see here it's coming from here it's it has a margin bottom of 50 pixels and this has a margin top of 10 pixels so when you have two elements side by side or one above the other and both of them have margins then both those margins collapse into each other and only the bigger of the margins is maintained okay so even if i had let's say margin 20 px all around 
and reload this page, you can see that a margin got added here, a margin got added here, a margin got added here, but a margin did not get added here because this margin is shared with the margin of the above element. Okay, so that's something that you should keep in mind. The margins of successive elements collapse. Don't worry if you forget this, you're going to figure it out when you build your web pages anyway. Here's another thing that I want to tell you. You can use another margin setting called auto. So let's say I said margin top to be 20 pixels, margin uh, right to be auto margin bottom to be 30 pixels and margin left to be auto. What happens is, and I also set a width for this. Let me set the width to 80 px. So you can see what happened that the width constrained how much space the div can take up because you've set a width properly. And then the margin on the top and bottom apply as usual. But because we've set the margin left and right to auto, both of those are automatically adjusted to be equal. And this is a very powerful thing. This doesn't work with top and bottom. This works with left and right only. If you set the left and right margin to auto, what that does is that centers the div horizontally on the page. You can see as I change the size of the browser, the second div stays in the center. So that's a good neat trick to center a div horizontally on a page. Just set the margin to auto for left and right. All right. So that's about the CSS box model. And generally speaking, if you want to, if you have a doubt about where a particular space or margin or padding is coming from, here's what you can do. Let me just zoom. Uh, let me just make this full screen for, for once. And you can right click on an element. And this works in Chrome or Brave browser doesn't work in Safari, I believe. But right click on an ev element and click inspect. And when you click inspect, the browser is going to show you the actual HTML structure of the page. So you can go into any web page on the internet, you can right click and you can inspect and you can study the HTML source code of the page. You can see here it has all the entire style, it has the entire body div, all of that. And when you hover over a particular div, it shows you what that div looks like. And specifically the green area, the, the green area that you're seeing that is the content of the div, including the padding, and then the orange area that you're seeing that is the generally the margin of the div. Okay, you can see the orange area is the margin and the green area is the content. You can also come in here on the right and you can study all the styles that are applying to this particular component. And you can actually look at the box model for that particular. So if you select box one, you can see its box model here, you can see that it has the size 100 by 80. And it is highlighted. And it has a padding of 10 at the top 100 at the right, and then 10 at the bottom and 100 on the left. And you can see it has a border of 10 on each side. And finally, it has these margins 20, 30, 50 and 100 on each side. Okay, so that is one great way for you to explore the CSS properties. If you scroll up, you can also see what are all the CSS properties that are applied here, you can actually turn off these CSS properties, or you can add additional CSS properties. For example, you can say text align center. And that is going to apply that additional CSS property. So this is a great way to just experiment with your web page in the browser itself before you go back and make some change in your code. Okay. And if you reload the page, all of these changes will go away. But uh, the box model is useful to explore, then the CSS properties are useful to explore. And you can also add additional properties, or you can change the values of specific properties. Let's say instead of aqua, I want to change this to gold, I can do that here as well. And again, all of this is just changing in the browser, it's not going to go and save anything. All right. So that's an interesting way for you to explore uh, web pages. By the way, if you're not able to see the box model, let me just turn this off here. Yeah, so this is the box model. Uh, you can see that if you scroll up, you can see here that you have the box model, you can see the margin, you can see the border, you can see the padding and you can see the size of the box itself. Okay. That is the CSS box model. Okay. So let's go back into the page web page.html. And let's also open up styles.css. So let's go back to styles.css. By the way, you can use command P within VS code to open styles.css. VS code is really nice for coding, it makes your job really, really easy. You can also close or collapse some of these HTML tags in case you don't want to see them. And that way you can reduce the structure of, a, of your page. So I'm just opening everything for now. But you can do that if you want. Okay, then let's go back here to my first web page. And let us now try and achieve this layout step by step. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is go into styles.css right at the very top. I'm going to 
go into body and i'm going to set a few things right because every browser has its own setup of the body uh, the its own margin and padding you can see here that there is some white space around this image even though i've set its width to 100% so within the body i'm just going to set margin as 0 and i'm going to set padding as 0 as well great so now this is completely out there touching the edges okay one other thing that I want to do in the body is I don't like this font which has these things sticking out of the J you can see right at the top it has this old look uh, this is called a serif font this small piece sticking out of the J this thing over here is called a serif and similarly this is called a serif so this is what is called a serif font um, generally speaking mo most modern websites are built using sans serif fonts so I'm just going to go in and change the font now the way you set the font is by setting the font family and there are many font families that are available on the internet uh, by default browsers support several font families and then your operating system may have certain font families and then you can include new font families from the internet from a resource like google fonts and we'll do all of those things but for now i'm just going to say sans serif okay what that does is if i reload the page you can see that now it looks a lot more modern now it looks that now it doesn't have those things sticking out of the j and out of the b and all so that's one other thing that we've done let me just zoom out a little bit okay so now we've done that uh, let's start fixing things or let's start implementing the wireframe by applying the styles step by step okay so the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to add a header so i'm going to go in into webpage.html and here right at the top i'm going to create a div and i'm going to give it the id navbar okay this is going to be the navbar right at the top so over here and inside this i'm going to need an image uh, i'm going to put that image in in just a second but let us give me let us give some styles to the navbar so let's go in here let's add i've given it the id navbar so i can select it using hash and let me then set the height or let me just give some padding to the navbar let me give it a padding of 8 pixels let's just set it to 8 pixels for now okay nothing happened oh there it is yeah there is so that is a navbar right there it has 8 pixels of padding that is why it's just showing up like that let's now put an image under it so image src what is going to be the uh, location of the image well i have picked out a jovian image logo here so i have this image hosted online okay so whenever you're using an image from the internet make sure that you're actually getting the link to the image itself and not the link to a page containing the image for example this page over here contains the image but i shouldn't put this in the src because then the browser is going to try to fetch this entire page as an image no so you can do two things right click if you want to include an image from the internet on your web page right click and say copy image address and then just put that here in src or you can right click and say open image in new tab and then grab the url of just that image okay always open the image in a new tab and then grab the url that is the safest way to do it all right so img src equals uh, that and I'm just going to give it an alt because that's a good practice. So I'm just going to say Jovian logo and I am going to give it a ID logo. All right. And now this image should show up here, but it's obviously too big. Let's go in here and let us set the, so we have the logo, which is an image. Let us set its height to 32 px. Okay, that looks nice maybe even 30 px and remember this is zoomed in i've actually zoomed it to about 150 percent in your on your side it may actually look a little smaller all right so that is starting to look good is there a margin for the snap bar let's set the margin to zero let's make sure that there is no margin here okay there's no margin and this is looking good so now we have this nice uh, it's looking a bit unequal you can see on the top and at the bottom we have unequal um, space so we can verify why there is this unequal space by checking the nav bar and looks like well looks fine to me 
Okay. I have no idea why this is unequal. That is something in CSS, sometimes you have to uh, figure out ways to fix. But in any case, I, I think one, one way we could do this is maybe just chuck this into a div. No, that doesn't do it. Oh, that's a wrong thing. Maybe I can just set the height directly here. So height equals, what is the height we need for the image? 30 px. So let me just set the height to 30 here directly. Sometimes that tends to do the trick. And let me remove the height from here. So I've just set the height directly. Okay, still doesn't do it. So you're going to run into these issues in CSS where something is slightly off. And I normally just keep these towards the end so that I don't worry about them immediately. Uh, but in any case, now we have the nav bar in order. And then let us fix this image. So this image looks fine. But the only trouble here is that the image is stretching. Okay. Now what I want you to do, what I want this image to do instead is just to cover the entire area that is available to this image instead of stretching. And the way you can do that is by adding something called an object fit into the image. Okay, again, something that you can look up. So this image has the ID banner. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to add for banner. I'm going to set object fit cover. Okay. And now you can see that whether I zoom it in or so or whether I increase or decrease the size of the web page, the aspect ratio of the image isn't changing. So this is the way you uh, you fix your stretchy images, you simply set object fit cover whenever you see that an image is stretching. Okay. So that takes care of our nav bar that takes care of our banner. Fine, let's fix the about Jovian. I think we don't need the dark blue color. I'm actually okay with the black color. And now here we have these two things. So we have the left and we have the right. So we want to show two divs side by side, each taking half the screen. And again, this is something that I, I would search online. So I would say how to show two divs side by side with same width. And you can see I've searched this already. I think this one was one that I found useful. So yeah, you can explore this a little bit, but I'm just going to go ahead and show you the solution here. Um, whenever you need to show, show two divs side by side, what you need to do is first make sure that the, this content and this content both are within a div. So let's take, uh, let's see, let's go to about Jovian and under about Jovian first, let's create a div called description. Let's give it the ID. Uh, uh, let's give it the ID about. Okay, this div is going to capture everything under the about section. And then let's create two divs inside it. Let's give this the ID description. And this is going to be the description. And then let's create another div. Let's give this div the ID team. And this is going to be the team image. Okay. So we have created two divs, one is called description and one is called team. Now by default, divs are going to show up one below the other in HTML. If you want to change that, here is a quick trick you can apply. If you want the divs inside a particular outer div to flow not horizontally, but vertically, then what you can do is go in and this outer div is called about. So I'm going to just go into about. So I'm selecting the outer div with the ID about and I'm going to just set display flex. Okay, we're going to learn about flex the flex display in a lot of detail later on. But the quickest or the easiest reason to use flex is to change the orientation of the divs inside an outer div from horizontal from vertical to horizontal. Okay, and I reload that and you can see now we have description and team image coming side by side. Now here's what I can do. I can set the width for description and team. Okay, so I can do something like this. So we have description. And I can set width 50%. What I wanted to do is occupy 50% of the area of the parent div. And similarly, we have this team image uh, or this team div and I want that to occupy 50% as well. Okay. And now you can see that description takes up 
if I added a background to it, you'll be able to see. So let me add a background just to show you. Yeah, so you can see around description, there is this background. So description takes a 50% and the team image takes a 50%. And of course, now I can go in and I can put these two pieces of content inside those divs. Okay, so I have this P tag with a with this OL and all of that. So let me just grab that P tag and cut that and put this in the place of description. Okay, and let me just right click here and indent. I think it should be formatted already. And now you can see that this P tag contains the data or shows uh, this P tag shows the information on the left half. Similarly, we can take the image now. This contains this is the team image and we can put that here in the team section. Okay, now we have the team image on the right. All right. So that's one thing that I want to point out to you that you should what you should do is you should first try to create a layout using a couple of empty divs, maybe even add background colors and borders to them just so that things are super clear. And once you've created the layout with those empty divs, especially horizontal layouts, then put the content inside because otherwise you might just lose track and become confused. But now once you put the content inside later, you have actually already fixed all of this. So you have fixed what the description and team should be laid out as and then the content inside can be laid out independently. Okay, so build your web page step by step in these steps. Okay, let's maybe clean this up a little bit further. Let's see. So maybe this team image, um, this can have a border radius. So this, it's looking too sharp. Let me just call give this an ID. Team image. And let me come in here. Team image and let me give it a border radius. Let's give it a border radius of five pixels. Again, experiment with a trial and error. But yeah, five pixels looks good. I think I would like to have maybe some space here. So maybe I can go in and I can add some padding into team. So let me come into team and add uh, or let me come into description and add some padding. Let me add a padding of eight pixels. Okay. So now I've added a padding and maybe let me add this padding only on the left and right. So let me keep the padding top and bottom as zero and let me add that padding. But you can see here that there seems to be some space above this as well. And I believe that is because of this paragraph tag. Because this paragraph tag generally has some space above and I can verify this by creating ins by clicking inspect and verifying that in description, this paragraph tag has a margin above. So I can just set for this particular paragraph tag style equals margin zero or margin top. So when you're specifying a zero margin, you don't need to say PX, you can just say P, uh, margin. Okay, great. So the page is starting to look pretty good, I would say. Um, one issue here is that if I extend this forward, ah, looks like I have a, for this team image, looks like I have a width set. Let me get rid of that width here. Or a height for the team image. Where is the team image over here? Yeah, this is a team image. I think I have a height set for it. Let me get rid of the height that I've set. And now it ends up taking up the entire space. So maybe what I can do is I can just come back in here under team and or under team image and I can set the height to, or I can simply set the width to 100% of the parent, which is half the div. Okay, so that's nice. Now it is taking up the entire space inside the inner div and it is expanding um, in size based on that. But as the page gets bigger and bigger, this content becomes too wide. So maybe I want to limit the overall width of this description, right? So uh, overall width of the about section itself, right? So the about section, I don't want it to become too big. The about section should maybe I do. I just want to restrict it to this region, generally speaking. So what I can do is I can set a max width. I can set a max width. Now the max width is the maximum width that this particular section can take. So max width, let me set it to 800 px. And let me reload the page. So now you can see that even as as we make the page smaller, both of these are going to take half the space. And as we make the page bigger, it's going to stop at 800 pixels. But of course, it would be nice for this to be centered on the screen. So that's where I can also use that margin trick, I can say margin zero auto, 
So zero margin on the top and bottom and then uh, right and left margin can be auto. And now you can see about Jovin and here we have this and then we have here we have this image and it's all nicely centered. Okay, so it remains centered, remains centered and then it goes out here and it becomes small. Okay, and maybe we can also add some padding here. Let's see, let's add a padding of maybe eight pixels just so that it's it doesn't touch the edges. Okay, and if we've added padding here, then maybe we don't need this padding here over here. Maybe we just need a padding right. Eight pixels. Okay, so this is what web developers sit and do all day. They fiddle around with small CSS settings just to get things to look exactly as they desire. Uh, but this is looking fine to me. I think the about section looks good, largely. Yeah, somewhere around that is looking good. Yes, this is slightly falling over into the next uh, outside, but that's okay. Okay, so now we're done with the about Jovian section. Let's go ahead and fix the job opportunities section. So I'm going to go in and under job opportunities. Okay, uh, once again, the H2 as well, I'm going to add a se center. So H2, I'm going to say text align center. Okay, now this has centered. Then I can go in and I can maybe again create another outer div called jobs. So I create a div called jobs. So let me give it the ID jobs. All right. And again for jobs, I'm going to set a maximum width. So max width for jobs is 800 px. And I'm going to set margin zero auto. I'm going to set adding zero eight px. Okay, all I'm doing is I'm creating an outer div into which I can then put in all my jobs. So let me grab all these jobs. And this is all the footer. Yeah, all this point till this point, we have the jobs, I'm going to put it under the jobs div. And let me reload again. And you can see that it has this nice, it remains centered on the screen. That's nice. Pretty good. Remains centered on the screen. And it is also not touching the edge of the screen. So generally, you want to have some space from the edge of the screen here. So that's it. Okay, then we have this h3 over here, there's a lot of space between front end developer and then Bengaluru India. So how about we come in? This is an h3. Remember, it's an h3. Uh, let's give it a class called uh, job role. So that we don't affect other S3s on the page if we had any at the moment we don't but yeah okay and let me come in here H3 and let us just give it margin bottom zero I believe it's a margin let's see okay margin bottom zero this is looking good now it is much closer maybe zero is too little maybe let's make it 8px maybe 4px should do the job so normally with margins and paddings, you want to use multiples of four. That's a good idea. And you want to go double, 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 half, half, half. And that's a quick way to work around this stuff. Okay. Now what would be nice if we could also get that nice apply button or apply link here on the, on the job page. So I'm going to again, show you a quick trick. We're going to learn a lot more about things like Flexbox, etc. but a quick trick to just get one single element pulled to the right side is using something called a float. So I'm going to show you right now. So let me say a href equals nothing for now. And let me just put in apply. And let me give this a class as well. And this class is also called apply. And let me put it above every h3 here. Okay, so now we have this apply 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 that is going to show up above every h3. And I think I can go in and I can fix the margin top as well for this h3 to be 0. Yeah, so now we have apply, apply, apply. And what we can do is take the apply class. So dot apply, that is the uh, that is a class given to this apply link. And here, I'm just going to add one thing float, right? Okay. So that's just going to pull this apply all the way to the right. That's nice. It's going to just pull it all the way to the right. 
And I think we need probably under the location, we need some spacing. So I'm going to go back and add some location, add some spacing under location. So we have class location and class location has already had, we've added the color gray. Let me add margin bottom 16 px. Okay, that's a span. So that's another learning. Margins don't work for spans. I know it's confusing. Happens all the time. Margins don't work for spans. So I'm just going to go in and I'm going to change these spans to divs. Okay. Margins and paddings don't apply to spans because they are inline elements. I'm going to change these all to divs. And now it's going to apply. Okay, great. So this is looking nice. Now we have the front end developer, we have Bangalore India, and we've pulled this or we've floated this apply link to the right. So that's nice. One thing that I would want to do now is maybe get rid of these underlines under these uh, links. Uh, these underlines aren't looking that great. So I'm just going to go in and then for all the anchor tags, I'm going to remove the underline. How do you remove the underline all the anchor or the link tags? Well, remove underline from a tags CSS. I just search that and it says that it can be removed using the text decoration property. So you can say text decoration none and that should do it. So if I go text decoration none, that should hopefully get rid of all the underlines. Great. We have gotten rid of all the underlines as well. Now we have these apply links as well. Last thing is the footer. I think we're almost there. We just need this footer at the end. So let me come in and once again, let me create this div called footer. Okay, it's already there. So I'm just going to give it the ID footer. Okay. And then we have this list. Let me just call it. Let me give it the ID footer links. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of things. First, I'm going to give the footer. So dot, um, it's, it's an ID. So hash footer, I'm going to give it the background color gray or something very light gray. Let's see gains borrow. Okay. That looks like a nice grayish color. Oh, what is the lightest gray we can find? Let's search for a very light gray ghost white. Okay. That is interesting. Let me just get ghost white. Yeah, that's a very light grayish color. You may not even be able to see it on the screen, but it's there. Then for the footer links, I want to get rid of these bullet points. And let me just bring that up here. So for the footer links, I want to get rid of the bullet points and I just want to keep them all on the same line. So I am going to say footer links. And again, this is something that I would look up normally, but uh, I happen to remember it. What the way you can get rid of these bullet points is to say list style none. I believe that should do it. And now you can see that the, we, the bullet points are gone. Now, of course, for the footer itself, it might be nice to maybe add some padding uh, at the top and bottom and maybe all around. So let me just add a padding of 8px. And okay, now the footer is looking nice too. And maybe let me also add some margin top. The footer is too close to the data scientist job role. Let me add a margin top. I'm going really fast, but I'm expecting you to follow along here, pause, follow along, and maybe also look up what each of these properties mean, because that's really how you do web development. 16 PX. So let's add a margin. Hmm. Let's see. Did not do anything. Maybe let's make that 32 PX. Yeah, that increased it. So remember our location also has a margin. So the margins collapse into each other. Um, all of that happens. Okay. Final thing we want to make these list items come up in line. So there, whenever you have three divs showing uh, one below the other, and you just want to show them all in line. Then another quick way to do it is, well, we could just do, I think display flex and that would do it. Yeah. Display flex. And that should do it uh, for footer links. Um, we can also add, but I want to show another way to do it. And this is something that you can set on individual list items. So you can say footer links li 
and that is going to select the li items under the id footer links and i'm going to say display inline okay and you can see now they're showing up inline so the difference between flex and inline is flex is something that you apply on the parent and that applies to all the items within it and then inline is something that you apply to the child element let's say you went into one of these list items and applied inline only that would appear inline instead of block which is the entire uh, horizontal width um, but here we are applying to all the list items and i'll tell you why in just a second but apart from the inline we also want to add a margin so let's add we don't need a margin at the top let's add maybe 16 pixels of margin on the left and right so let's add the margin here let's reload okay so now we have a margin and the last thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to say text align center and that is going to center these links on the page okay and in fact text align center can be done not just for footer links but for the entire footer itself we can do it like that and finally let's fix this as well so let's go in and let's call this copyright class equals copyright and let's come back in here and well we could also give it an id but fine class is fine copyright and let's give it the color gray okay so that is our page i think that is looking pretty good so we have the nav bar at the top we have this banner and this banner always occupies the entire length and it doesn't stretch the image too much um, then we have this about job in section that is always at the center and then we have the job opportunities that are also in the center if we want we can experiment with the colors of these and finally we have these apply links uh, they don't do anything right now but it wouldn't it be nice if they could at least maybe trigger some sort of an email and that's where i want to introduce you to another form of link called mail to links okay so just search for mail to links what is a mail to links well you can do this instead of having a link point to some website on the internet you can have a link say mail to colon and then some email address and when the user clicks on that link it is going to open their email application whether it's gmail or whatever email application they're using it is going to open their email application and put in this address on the subject line okay so that's a very interesting hack so this is what we can use here for our apply so i can go in here into apply where is my apply yeah so i can go in here and in the href i can say mail to i can just say mail to support at jovian.com okay and let me come in here and let me say mail to support at jovian.com and mail to support at jovian.com and reload the page now if i click the apply button you can see that it opens my mail application which is gmail and it is automatically filled in the address support at jovian.com okay and then here you can actually then fill out the subject and you can send an email so essentially what we're saying is when the user clicks on the apply button that is going to trigger their email client and they can just send us an email that they're interested in a particular um, job one thing that we can also do is we can also put in a subject here so we can say mail to and you can just say subject you can say question mark subject after the email address equals front end and question mark subject equals back end and question mark subject equals data scientist or just say data all right and i'll also add a target underscore blank so that it opens in a new page underscore blank and let's add target equals underscore blank and let's add target equals underscore blank okay so now each of these mail to links is going to have a different subject and it's going to open a new tab you can see here that it has automatically added the subject front end and you can construct more complex subjects and in fact you can also set up some kind of a body directly as well and similarly you can go in here and uh, let's click on backend developer and it fills up the subject backend and you can go in uh, click on the data scientist and it fills up the subject data okay great and then all these other links are working fine as well i think i'm very happy with this i'm very happy with this web page at this point so i'm just going to save it and 
let's see i'm just going to reset the zoom level okay so this looks good at the normal zoom level and it contains everything that i'm looking for i have the header i have the banner i have this section i have some text on the left i have something on the right yep i have a couple of links here as well i have the job opportunities and i have locations i have this apply button and then i have this footer and then i have this copyright at the end as well great so i'm feeling very happy with this web page now the final step now that we have completed this web page the final step is to go ahead and deploy it so this is what it looks like roughly now we can deploy this web page to the cloud now we're going to cover deployment extensively over the course of this program or the course of this the next few lessons as well and there are many many ways to deploy a website to the cloud there are hundreds of platforms but the simplest thing is to just upload a zip file right wouldn't it be nice if we could just zip up our web page and just upload it on the cloud well that is what you can do using this platform called static.app and there are a bunch of these platforms but static.app allows you to simply drag drop an archive with your page or a website in it and it will take care of the rest okay it will automatically set up a website for you now here is what we do first we have to make sure that we have an index.html page so there is this convention in html that a file called index.html is going to be the root page of a website okay or the root page so when you open jovian.com that's actually opening jovian.com slash index.html so let's go back here and let us rename webpage.html to index.html so let's rename this to index.html and then let us go and zip up this folder so we have this folder over here which has a index.html file which is the sort of the root page or the root web page and it has a bunch of other files and images as well i'm going to zip it up so i'm going to say uh, compress and depending on your operating system you may have a different way to zip things and then on static.app i'm just going to click upload for free i am then going to upload this zip file over here and that is going to then ask me to maybe pick a domain name so it's going to be a subdomain of dot static dot app so let me just put it as jovian j-o-v-i-a-n can't spell my own company name okay and let me just put in an email here sydney is the account i'm using sydney at jovian.com and let me put in the name here sydney carton okay let me put in a password here i'm not going to say that and let me just accept the terms of privacy and let me just say continue okay looks like this email has been taken let me just provide a slightly different email yeah so now that is going to ask me to verify my email i have uploaded the zip file already so i'm just going to go ahead and verify the email I am going to let's see let's open up email.com and here is the account and here is the verification link okay now my email is verified and now you can see that jobincareers.static.app this website is getting deployed okay so let's give that a couple of minutes looks like it is deployed so let's maybe Go and check it out let me just click jovincareers.static.app and yes looks like this website is already deployed and in fact you can open it up on your end as well and because we have set up because we have set up this page well uh, web page.html as index.html that is why it's opening up directly but i can also just type index.html and it will open the exact same page okay not only that remember we have this other page called boxmodel.html well, box model or HTML should open up just fine as well. There you go, box model HTML. And in fact, if we had a link here from index.html to box model.html, then that link would work properly as well. And you can see that both these images got uploaded as well. So that is how you deploy a site. The, the simplest way to deploy your site is to just zip up your code and put it up online. You don't need any Git, AWS deployment commands etc it's all really simple to do okay and that's it so let's take a quick summary of the whole thing here's what we did we created an html file on we created a folder on our desktop we put in our html file into it we added some code into it using vs code and then we tried to view it in a browser then 
we using some basic HTML tags like HTML, head, title, body, div, etc. We created a web page. Then we use some more HTML tags, h1 to h6, p, list, links, etc. to structure content on a web page. So remember this piece, before we added any CSS, we just put up a bunch of content on the web page. And here is what it looked like. Then we learned how to apply styles using CSS. So cascading style sheets, the way we uh, saw we saw that we can apply styles inline. We can apply styles using the style tag. We can apply styles using CSS files. And the key idea is you have a selector and then you have a property and a value. Then uh, we looked at the different kinds of selectors. We have tag selectors, we have ID based selectors, and we have class selectors. Then we learned the CSS box model, which is how you have content and then around the content, you can add padding. And the padding is also shares the same background. And then the padding is inside the border. The border is something that you can set width for. And then outside you have margin and margins can overlap for side by side elements. And then we of course we implemented a wireframe using Excalibur.com. And we then tried to replicate this wireframe within CSS by adding a bunch of CSS properties starting from the top. So we picked section by section, we added a nav bar, we added a logo in it, we fixed the banner, we fixed this section about Jovian, then we went into job opportunities and then we added a footer, right? So that's what we did. And finally, we just deployed our website to the cloud using static.app. We just went to static.app, created a zip file, renamed our main page to index.html and uploaded that zip file, verified our account. And it is deployed as a, um, yeah, so it is deployed. Where is it? Yeah, it is deployed as a subdomain of static.app. But within static.app itself, you can also go into settings and actually configure a custom domain. So you can actually put this on joviancareers.com or something like that. So you can go and up, you'll have to upgrade your plan, you'll have to pay. But you can set up a custom domain, you can just set up a domain like joviancareers.com and you can uh, set up some DNS settings and make sure that that is where your web page shows up. So that's not bad for a first lesson. We probably spend about two hours, two hours, 15 minutes if we exclude the breaks. And we were able to build a pretty good functional website and clicking on this website, the actual functionality is also present because you can click apply and you can actually go ahead and send out an email to the Jovian team to apply for a job. So that's how simple HTML and CSS really is. Once you can become familiar with just the most basic parts. And of course, there's a lot more to it. There are tables, there are forms, there are various CSS properties, Flexbox, etc. But what I want you to take away here is that you should try to first figure out what you want to build and try to build it using what you already know. And then just try to learn as you go along the things that you don't already know. Okay. And here are some references that you can check out. You can find the completed code for this lesson. It may be slightly different because we've done this live. So you can find the completed code for this lesson here. You have this index.html over here. So that's great. And then you have maybe some beginner friendly HTML and CSS tutorials in case you want to look at other tutorials as well. After practicing this, you can go and check that out. So htmldoc.com is something that I found very simple to follow along with. But you want some if you want some interactive HTML tutorials, you can go to w3schools.com. And if you want more detailed and comprehensive tutorials, check out MDN or Mozilla Developer Network. You can check that out as well. They have fairly detailed tutorials um, and a lot of text, a lot of explanation as well. So take your pick depending on how new you are, depending on how comfortable you feel after practicing this lesson, after watching this lesson and practicing it, writing out all the code by hand, you can pick whichever other tutorial you want to take. And some of the other things you can look at is the loremepsum.io. This is the text generator that we normally use. So that's something that you can use to generate text when you want to fill a page. Um, if you want to learn about the CSX bo CSS box model, you can check out this YouTube tutorial. There is this website called CSSTricks.com. This has a lot of great guides on various topics in CSS. Um, don't recommend doing all these guides, but whenever you're working on a particular topic, if you need to maybe get help with a particular topic in CSS, you can check it out. And normally you can just search online and you'll find something good enough. And then if you want to create more advanced mail to links, so you can use this mail to link.me and you can craft maybe a, a very interesting mail to link, which can have a, a two line, a subject line, a body, and a bunch of other things as well. You can add CC, BCC, all of that too. 
So the last time we looked at the very basics of HTML and CSS and we did that by working on a problem statement where we built a simple jobs careers website for Jovian. So today we are going to continue building on that. In this tutorial, we will dive deeper into the world of web development and we will learn some advanced techniques for designing and styling websites using HTML and CSS. We will learn how to create HTML tags of various types. We will learn how to use some advanced CSS properties and we will also learn how to optimize your code a little bit for performance and accessibility. So here is what we're going to cover today. We're going to iteratively improve the existing web page. We are going to create and style HTML tables. We're going to understand various text related and color related CSS properties. We're also going to create an HTML form to collect user inputs. And we're then going to send those user inputs to a server. And finally, we're going to use meta tags to improve how a deployed page is reviewed when it is shared as a link. So there's a lot to get through. Let's get into it. And the best way to follow the best way to learn these skills is to follow along step by step. You don't have to do that if you're watching live, but as you're watching the video, just pause at various places and try to write out all the code yourself. That is how you learn this quickly. And of course, we are assuming some basic knowledge of HTML and CSS here from the previous lesson. So we'll explore these topics by attempting to solve this problem statement. We will try and improve the Jovian careers website that was created in the previous tutorial. So here is what the Jovian careers website looked like. Let me zoom in here so that you can see it easily. So we have a nav bar here with the Jovian logo. We have a banner image here. It says do something great. And we have an about Jovian section and then we have some information about Jovian. We also have an image. Ideally, this should be the Jovian team, but this is just to indicate something about the team. And we have information about job opportunities and you can click apply and an email will get triggered. You'll be able to send out an email applying to these jobs. And then there are some links in the footer as well for courses, programs and YouTube. So this is what we built the last time. And we are going to improve upon this by making the following changes. We are going to show the list of jobs in tabular format with separate columns for the job title, location, salary and the job posted date. We are also going to show an application form below the jobs table where a user can fill out and submit an application. Then we are also going to improve the aesthetics of the page, bring it closer to the Jovian brand using the appropriate fonts, text sizes and colors. Then we're going to deploy the page to, to the cloud and ensure that it previews properly when it is shared as a link. So this is what we're going to work on today. Now the code for this tutorial can be found here. So the starter code, which is the finished website from the last tutorial is available at this link. The completed code for today's tutorial will be available at this link. And finally, the finished site that we are going to create today will be available at this link. So check these out in case you have in case you face issues at any point. So let's just take the starter code and we're going to download and extract the starter code first. And then we're going to open it up in Visual Studio Code. So let's open up this link. This contains the starter code. And I'm just going to save it on my desktop. It's going to be saved with the name myfirstwebpage.zip. You can see that I have a zip file here. I'm just going to open up this zip file. So extract it. And now I no longer need this original zip file. So I'm going to delete it. Then I am going to rename this. So I'm going to rename this to my second web page. Since this is our second web page. So you can see here I've renamed it to my second web page. Now I want to open this up in Visual Studio Code. So let me open VS Code or Visual Studio Code. And I have Visual Studio Code. I've installed it already. In case you don't know, or don't have it installed, just go online, search for Visual Studio Code and install it. And now I'm going to go into the file menu and I'm going to select open folder. And now I'm going to just select the folder, my second web page that I have just downloaded. And let's open it up. And here you go. Now we have this HTML file. Now we have a CSS file and we have a bunch of other files as well from last time. So this is all the starter code that we have. And let me also open up the web page in the browser. So I'm just going to open it up in the browser here as well. So that we have it open both for editing and for previewing. So now we have 
a file index.html here and that file contains all the content for this page. Let's quickly review what this file contains so that we, when we start modifying it, we'll know exactly what to do. Now, of course, we have this head tag here, which sets the title of the page. Notice that we didn't actually set a proper title right now. It just says my first web page. It should say something like Jovian careers. So we'll fix that. Then it contains a link to a style sheet or a CSS files. So there are many ways to attach CSS styles to HTML web pages. And one way to do it is by using the link tag and putting all the styles in a separate CSS file, which we have here. Then of course, in the body itself, we have the nav bar over here. And this is all the code for the nav bar. So we have the nav bar, which is a div and then an image inside it, which is the logo over here. Then of course, we have a banner, which is an image tag right here. Then we have an header, uh, we have a header h1, which is right over here. So you can see that all of these are styled as well. So we have the body, the body, we've set the margin and padding to zero. And we've set the font family to sans serif. We've also set a text decoration for the nav bar. We've set a padding. We've also set a margin for the banner. We've also set an object fit over here so that it shows up properly, no matter what the size of the page is. And for the header, we've set the text line to center. So we've added various styles as well. Then we have this about section. And in this about section, we have a left section and a right section. So the way we did this is we have this about div. And for this about div, we have set the display to flex and we have set a maximum width for this about div. So you can see here that the maximum width is ensuring that this about div doesn't become too big. Apart from that, we've also set a margin uh, that ensures that it is always at the center. Okay, so I'm going through this quickly, but review the previous lesson if not, if some of this doesn't make sense. We've also added a padding. So remember the CSS box model, the padding is inside the border, the margin is outside the border. Um, it's a good thing to practice and review from time to time. Then of course we have, we have the description, which takes up 50% of the width. Then we have the uh, team image, which again takes up 50% of the width. And the team image also has a border radius over here. And then we have these job opportunities. So we've uh, used an H2 here. So you can see we have the description. We have uh, information about the two boot camps, which we have used a list for a list tag. And then we have job opportunities. We've used an H2 here. Then we have a div called jobs. And in this div, we have the three jobs, front end developer, back end developer, and data scientist. And finally, we have courses, programs, and the YouTube link in the footer. Okay. Uh, of course, there are some styles related to the jobs div as well. There are some styles related to each of the jobs we have, those are H3 and there are some styles related to the footer as well. Okay. So very basic HTML and CSS that we applied and we of course deployed it to the cloud using a simple hosting platform where we could upload a zip file. All right. So that's what we have from the last time. So we've opened up the web page. We've opened up the project in VS code and we have renamed it to my second web page. Now the first thing we'll do is try to improve the wireframe. In the previous tutorial, we first created a wireframe. This is what it looked like. So it contained this navbar banner and it contained the same sections that we have on the actual page. And we use this as a visual reference while creating the page. So now we are going to improve that wireframe. We're going to make sure that we are covering all of these things, a list of jobs in tabular format, the application form below the jobs, and also maybe the other things will follow, not necessarily in the wireframe, but when we implement them. And this is something that you'll see as a very common practice. In the world of web development, this process of improving the design of a web page and then going ahead and implementing it on an already live web page is called iterative development. And a website goes through multiple iterations or even web applications. So when you look at Jovian, we add new features more or less every week. And that is how we approach building things. So the one approach that you could follow is something called the waterfall approach where you identify all the requirements, then you come up with a final design, then you do the development for the entire set of requirements at once, then you test it and then you maintain it. That takes a lot of work and you often end up building a lot of features that nobody might use and missing out on some very important features. So another way to think about web development is to take an iterative approach. You should at the very least push something out, deploy something, that people can use every week or, or if possible, every single day. So whenever you're building a website or a web application, you should think, okay, what can I build in a day that people can start using? However limited it is, which is what we did the last time. 
And then once people start using it, depending on their feedback, depending on what else you have in mind and how much time you have, try to come up with a second version with a new set of features and repeat that process. So iterative development is a very common practice in modern web applications. So this is something that you should get used to. So there are a couple of changes that we are making today. The first thing is to replace the list of job openings with a table. And some benefits of the table are they it leads to an improved readability because tables make it easier for people to scan things visually. Tables also offer better organization. So because organizing them in a table, you can also group them by department, location or other relevant criteria later on when we implement more interesting tables. And then tables can also have things like sorting, searching, filtering, etc, which we look at once we look at web application development later in the program. Apart from the table, we'll also add an application form below the table. So the form will ask for the user's first name, last name, or maybe the name as a whole. Let's just change that to name. So the form will ask for whoever is applying, the form will ask for the applicant's name, email, the job that they're applying for, their phone number, their resume, and a cover letter. And here's what you can do. You can actually start revising the wireframe here itself. So you can take this and then create a copy of it and then paste it and then start moving things around. For example, you could get rid of, you could get rid of these and then you could insert a table here. So I could, for example, go like this and create a table. And then I could make some more changes. Let me change that to black. Yeah, so I, fold, I could, for example, create a table here and then into that table, I could add various columns like this. So here's one column, here's a second column, here's a third column. And then I could start adding rows within the table. And then I could maybe start adding information like job title. So these would be the column headers. And after adding the column headers, I can also add some data within those columns. So this is how you enhance your wireframe. You are visually trying to put together what you want your ne next version of the wireframe to look like. And then you could also go ahead and maybe extend this a little bit. So move all this forward. Let's see. Let's move all this down. And you could then add an application section. So you could add a section called Submit your application. And then you could go ahead and maybe add uh, various input fields. For example, you could get an input field called name here. And put an input box below it. And then just create multiple copies of that to create the other input fields and so on. And you could add maybe a submit button somewhere at the end. Right. So this is how you enhance a wireframe. Just create a copy of your existing wireframe and keep adding new things, new sections before you go out and start coding. Now I have already done this, so I'm not going to show this entire process to you, but I encourage you to just do it all yourself. Get into the habit of creating quick wireframes before you uh, start writing HTML code that will save you a lot of time while coding. So here we have added a job opportunities table and you can see that we have a job title, location, salary and posted on. So we have the job titles, we have a bunch of locations, we have salaries both in Indian rupees and in dollars, and then we have a poster on date. And below that we have a submit your application form. And in this form, we ask for the name, email, phone number, and there's a drop down here asking for the position the user has applied to. And then there is a cover letter, uh, there's a box here for submitting a cover letter. Okay. And there's also this checkbox here that we're asking the user to agree to the terms and conditions, which is to be contacted by us or uh, for their resume to be shared within our company and so on. And there's a submit button. So now we have a clear idea of what we want to build today. Specifically, these are the two sections that we want to work on today. And of course, we want to make them aesthetically pleasing. And then we also want to make some other changes to the site in general. So this is a revised wireframe. We still have the navbar banner about section, but now we have a job opportunities table and we have a submit your application form. And of course we have the footer as well. Again, for personal projects, a wireframe is usually enough to plan a website's design and layout. But in a professional settings, UI developers will often create detailed mockups, providing more information on colors, fonts, and visual elements that you can work, uh, that you can use while actually coding the web page. 
So as an exercise, I encourage you to replicate this wireframe and maybe also add some new sections. See if you can add a new section and implement that while you're working through this lesson. But let's come to tables in HTML. Now tables are a fundamental component of HTML used to display data in a structured manner. And tables are created using a combination of the table, TR, TD and TH tags. So there are a bunch of tags that have to come together for you to create a table. And tables can be styled using CSS just like all other HTML tags to add borders, backgrounds and other visual elements. Tables can also be manipulated to merge cells. So if you see here, it's not just a simple table with rows and columns. You can see that these two are merged and then these two are, this is vertically merged as well. So you can do lots of interesting layouts with it using tables. But I do want to mention that tables should be used appropriately. Don't put everything within a table. You might get this temptation to just use a table for the entire web page to lay things out. But that's not a great idea. You should be using CSS for layout and tables should be used only when you want to show a grid of data, which fits in neatly into a table. So a good rule of thumb is if something can be represented using a spreadsheet, then a table is a good way to represent it in HTML. Okay. So a table is created using the table TR and TD tags. The table tag is used to create a table in HTML and all other table related tags are nested inside this tag. Then the TR tag is used to create a table row and each row contains one or more table cells and the table cells are created using the TH tag and the TD tag. Okay, so let's see these in action and it'll start to make a lot more sense. So the first thing I'm going to do here is go down and find the section job opportunities and I'm going to remove this div containing job opportunities. And if I just reload here, you can see that now we no longer have job opportunities on this page. Let me just zoom in a little further. Okay, now let's start adding a table here. So let me add a table. Okay, and let me save that. And you can see nothing really happened. Some additional space got added. But the first thing I'll do is I'll add a row within the table. So a row is added using the TR tag. And let me save that and still nothing happens. Now let me actually put some headings. So let me create a heading called heading one. So I'm going to create two column headings, one called heading one and one called heading two. And these are created using the TH tag. Okay. So now you can see over here in the corner, we have heading one and heading two. And normally you might want a table with a border. So one quick way to add a border for a table is just by specifying the border attribute. Okay. Now, once I've added a border, you can see that there is a border around the entire table. And then there is a border around heading one and there is a border around heading two as well. Okay. Let's add more rows within the table. So let's add a TR. Now let me add another element. So now I'm no longer adding headings. Now I'm actually, uh, now I'm adding actual data elements. Okay. So I'm just going to call it data one for now and TD data two. Okay. And let me just replicate that for one more row. TD data three and TD data four. All right. So now we've created a table successfully. I hope you can see it. You, it's right here in the bottom left corner of the web page. And now, now that you've understood how tables work, we have this table tag. And in this table tag, we have a row. This is the header row and that contains these TH tags. So TH is header. Then we have these uh, more rows. And in these rows, we have the TD and TD creates normal data. So you can see the difference between the heading and the normal data is that the heading is bold. And if the table was bigger, you would also notice that the headings are centered, but the normal data is left aligned. So that is a difference, but it's also semantically informing the browser. What is the heading and what is just data within the table? It is also used by screen readers and search engines to identify the structure of the table. Okay. Now I encourage you to experiment with the table. What happens if, for example, I put an additional column here, let me just save that. And you can see that a new column got added here, but they, you don't have that same column here available. And that is why you have empty space here. Or what happens if let's say you have like a stray TD somewhere. So let's say you have this data five somewhere. What, what does that do? So that creates a new row, even though you do not have a proper TR. So 
even if you do not have a perfect structure of table and then TR and then TH or TD, most browsers will still render your tables, but it's a good idea to maintain the proper structure while building a table. Okay. So that's how you build a table in HTML fairly straightforward. Okay. So let's maybe go ahead at this point and let us add this data into a table. So we want to get the job title, we want to get the location, we want to get the salary and we want to get when the job was posted. Now here's a quick tip for you whenever you're building HTML tables, it's always a good idea to first maybe create a spreadsheet like I've done here, I've created the spreadsheet, let me zoom that in a bit. And I am simply going to now use the spreadsheet as a reference for creating the table and I can also just copy paste the data very easily from the spreadsheet onto the table. So let me just go in here and copy the table headers. And now I am going to paste in these headers. So my first row is going to be a row of headers and that is going to contain these th tags. So now we have a th for job title, we have a th for location, and we have a th or table header for salary. And finally, we have a th or table header for when the job was posted. Great. Now let's start adding the jobs one by one. So once again, I'm going to go in and copy this front end developer Bengaluru, I'm going to copy the salary and the posted on date as well. And let me get rid of these and paste that in here. Let's bring that into new lines over here. Okay, and let's put in a TD here. So again, wrap the data inside a TD and you don't just have to put simple text, you can put entire lists, you can put paragraphs, you can put whatever you want, you can put images into a table. But for now, we'll keep things simple, we are just going to put some normal text into each table cell. So each box that you see within the table is called a table cell. So that is something that you will notice in the terminology, especially if you're searching for questions online. Okay, so that is the second job role. Let me just grab this and create a few copies of this. And in fact, what I'm going to do is also give it a couple of classes. So I'm going to give it the class, I'm going to give the entire table an ID. Jobs table. And I'm going to give this a class jobs table header. And or jobs header row, let's just call it jobs header row. And let's give this a class jobs data row. Okay, and let's create copies of this. So we are adding the classes because we're going to use them later for styling. Now we have the jobs header row and then we have jobs data row. Let's add the second role full stack developer. I believe the second role is in New Delhi, India. And the salary here is 15. Let's see. And the Feb 1 2023 is when it was posted. Let's create a couple more copies for the next couple of rows. Okay, we have a data scientist. This is in San Francisco, USA. And this is, I believe 175,000. Yep. And this was posted in December 22, 20, December 22nd, 2022. And finally, let's get, get that last role in here as well. ML engineer. And this one is the remote job. And this one is $80,000. And I believe this was posted on September 19th. Okay, so that's our table, we have a table inside the main div. And then the table has a border and the table has the ID jobs table. Then we have these rows. And the first row is the jobs header row because it is for the header, we style headers separately. And then the rest of the rows are data rows. And we are using TDs inside instead of TH, which is what is used for the header. And let's save that and let's reload the page. And you can see here now we have the job title, location, salary posted on. And we have all the information here that we had in our spreadsheet. So this is roughly what our table looks like we do have borders, but the borders are not very pretty. So 
as an exercise i would encourage you to try adding more columns to the jobs table for example requirements and responsibilities try including paragraphs or lists within table cells and as you do so you might need to vary, vary the widths of different columns you might need to say that the requirements column should be at least 30 percent of the table's width and so on and that is something that you can add by following this tutorial so sometimes depending on the kind of data you have you may need to vary the widths and that is all something you can control using css or just using normal table attributes but let's talk about styling html tables so styling html tables with css can greatly improve the visual appeal and the readability of a website so here for example is the careers website at stripe which is a payment processor company and you can see that they're also using a table but their table clearly looks a lot better than our table so let's try and make our table look a little better not exactly like this but we'll try and come close so here's what we are going to do we can use simple css properties that we already know to make some changes to our table one we'll add borders around the table and table cells using css not using the border property or the border attribute because css allows us to control other things like color then we will also make the table full width on the page and then we'll align the headers we left align the headers headers are central by default we left align them and we'll also show a different background color for headers and we'll add alternate colors to the rows so here for example you can see that rows have alternate colors so we'll add this kind of an alternate color pattern to our table as well okay so let's try doing this step by step so the first thing I'm going to do is grab the ID jobs table and I'm going to style it by putting some content into the styles.css file and remember that the styles.css file is linked here using a link tag from the head tag of the page that is how you connect a CSS file to apply the styles into an HTML file okay so let me open up styles.css and I am going to come down here to let's see this region over here so I think we don't need this dot location this was there in the previous page with but we don't have location with this class anymore so we don't need that let's put in the table let's select the jobs table so I'm selecting it by ID so I'm using the hash or pound character to select the jobs table by its ID jobs hyphen table and let me set its width first to 100 percent so what I wanted to do is take up the entire width of the parent div okay not the entire width of the screen but the entire width of the parent div so you can see that we have this jobs we have this jobs div over here and this jobs div is set to have a max width of 800 pixels and it has a margin of zero auto that is what centers it on the page so there's a, this outer jobs div and inside it we have this jobs table which is now taking up the entire width of the parent okay so that is one way to specify widths apart from pixels you can specify it in percentages okay that's great what next well let us now add a border so let us remove the border from here first and let us first look at that how it looks okay this is what it looks like let's add a border here so border one pixel solid border there are various border styles you, uh, solid means you do not want any dashes or anything in the border it's a complete continuous straight line and let's make it gray let's not make it black so that's the border let's see okay so now we have a border for the table but apart from the table we also need to add a border for each cell so i'm just going to say jobs table or actually i'm just going to select the cells let's see so we have we have jobs header row so let's get the header row using jobs header row and this time I'm using the dot selector from CSS not the hash selector because the hash selector is used to select by ID but the dot selector is used to select by class and this, T, or this TR or this row here has the class jobs header row so that is why we're using the dot selector okay and I am going to give it a border as well border 1px solid gray and oops this is not doing it so if you notice here the tr over here contains the class jobs header row but what we want is a border around each cell not around the entire row 
So that is where we have to select that TH cell inside the TR of the class jobs header row. And you can do it very simply by simply writing the tag that you want to select. So now what we've done is we are saying select using the class jobs header row. So that is going to select the row that is going to select this row. And then we are saying inside the jobs header row class or inside an element with the class jobs header row, look for a TH, look for a table header cell and apply this border to it. And now if I reload, you can see that now our table headers have these borders. Okay. I hope you can see this. Our table headers now have these borders. Let's also add borders to the table cells. So I'm just going to grab the data row class. So jobs data row is the class for the row containing the jobs data. And now we have the TD or the table cells over here, which contain the actual data. And I'm going to set border one PX solid gray. Okay. And let's set that as well. So now once again, we have borders now, but now these borders have been added using CSS, which is somewhat nicer. We have more control. Now, the next thing I want to show you is how to get rid of these double borders. You can see that we have these double borders over here. So we have the salary posted on, and then we have this border around it and then another outer border around the table. The way we can do this, and this is something that you just have to look up is using the border collapse property. Okay. So border collapse, collapse. You will almost always have to put this on a table if you're just styling from uh, styling on your own. So I'm just going to put border collapse, collapse. And this is something that you could looked up. You could have looked up. How do I get rid of the double border in a table? And this is what you'll see. Okay. So this is nice. Now I have the border collapse. Now the border is looking nice. Next, let us maybe space things out a little bit. The data is very close to the edges. It would be nice if there was some space around it. So here's what we can do. We can go in and we can put in a put in a padding here. So let me put in a padding of eight pixels. So remember the CSS box model, the padding is inside the border. Okay, let me add a padding of eight pixels in the data as well. So both of these will add space inside the border. So you can see here inside the border of a cell, we have added additional space. If we had margin on the other hand, that space would get added outside the border. Okay, so keep the CSS box model in mind. You can always just search online CSS box model whenever you are unsure how this works. Okay, so we have the content, then we have the padding, uh, then we have the border, and then we have the margin outside it. All right, so this is looking pretty good. Let us now maybe add a background color to. Uh, yeah, let's add a background color to the header. So background color. Let's see. I am thinking of the color. Let's maybe just add the color Alice blue for now. One of the named colors. Okay, nice. We have a nice background color for the header. I hope you can see it. It's very light. Um, we are not going to use very strong colors. See what happens is if you use a proper strong color like this, your text becomes unreadable. That is why you always want to use very muted, very light colors. And we'll talk a lot about uh, color guidelines later down the line. Okay, this is looking good. Let's also add a background color now for each of these alternate rows. So we don't want to add a background color for every single row. We want to add it for alternate rows. And this can be done using again using a special property. Now this is the thing about CSS that you have to look these up, look up these special properties from time to time. There's no way to remember them. I just looked it up a few hours ago. That's why I can partially remember. So you can say TD and in the TD, um, I'm actually just going to look it up over here. In the TD or actually not in the TD, I want to add this for the header row. So I want to get the rows from the table which are the nth child where n is odd. Okay. And I'll just show you what this does first and then you will see. Yeah. And then you will see exactly. Uh, then we'll discuss how it works. Okay. Let me make that jobs table. Yeah. 
So here's what we've done. We have said jobs table. So select the jobs table by ID. Inside the jobs table, select a TR, a row. Okay, so we have the jobs table here with the ID jobs table. Inside it, we want to select a row. So each TR represents a row. But we only want to select the rows which are the nth child. Okay, where n is odd. So all the odd rows which selects a full stack developer row uh, and which selects the ML engineer row. So all the odd rows get selected by putting this colon nth child odd. And then we are giving them the background color of ghost white. Okay. Again, if you see carefully here, we have of course a color background color for the header that we have specified. Then we have this background white color for this first row, uh, which is row number two technically. And then we have for the third row, New Delhi, India, we have another background color. Okay. Uh, it is very light, but I hope you can see it. And we've selected alternate rows using the nth child. And how do you know this? Well, you just have to look it up. I just look it up every time. So I don't worry about it too much. Okay, great. One last thing we want to do is maybe this is looking a bit odd that the headers are centered. So let's maybe put the headers on the left. So I'm just going to say text align left. Okay, now the data is now the headers are also left aligned. All right, so I think we've with that we've implemented everything that we set out to implement. We added borders around the table. We made the table full width. We left aligned the headers. We are showing a different background color for the headers. We are using Alice blue and we are using alternate colors for the rows using the nth child uh, using the nth child odd property. Okay, so that is the CSS that we need to style our table. Not a lot. It's about 10, 12 lines, but it look it makes a table look rather nice, I would think. Okay, great. So that is how you style tables with CSS. And you can also verify if I resize this that the table remains in the center and it occupies the full width of the parent component. Okay, so that's tables. Now, I would encourage you to maybe also learn a little more about styling of the rows and columns. So there is this tutorial on HTML table styling. You can have these zebra stripes, which is what we've implemented, or you can also stripe. You can also have colors for the different columns if you want, again, using nth child. And you can also combine vertical and horizontal stripes. So you have a lot of different ways in which you can combine. Of course, you can do tables. You can have tables without borders. So one change, for example, we might make is we may not want the borders between the inner rows. So we can come in here and we can say that for the TD for these data cells, we don't want a border bottom. We just want a border right. Okay. And what that's going to do is that's going to remove this border bottom because we already have alternating colors and that's just going to keep this border on the right. All right. Um, yeah. So that is how you style tables in CSS. So moving right along, we'll also talk a little bit about merging rows and columns of data in tables. Now you can use, you can create all sorts of interesting tables in HTML. What you can do is you can merge a bunch of data cells to look like a single cell, either vertically or horizontally. So what would be nice for us is to maybe try that with one of the columns here. So let's do this. Let's get the location column and let's have the location column split into two columns, city and country. Okay. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have sub columns under location called city and country. So let's come back here into the table definition. And we have this first row. We have this first row and this first row now contains a location. So that's great. Let me add a second header row. So let's add TR. And here again, I'm going to add, let me keep that class here as well. Okay, now here I'm going to add a couple of headers. One is called city and the second is called country. All right. And what does that do? Well, as you might expect that adds a second row of headers, but now in this case, the second row of headers says, city and country below job title and location. That's not what we want. What we want is to show to make this show up under location itself. So here I'm going to use two special attributes. The first is called call span or row span. Okay. So we want the job title to actually span two rows. So row span equals two. 
and now what this does is the job title the job title header is now taking up two rows of data okay we, we've simply added the property row span equal to two the attribute and that ensures that job title take takes up two rows of data whereas location salary posted on are still taking up only one row of data now we want the location to take up two columns so that city and country show up under location so we can add a call span and we can say call span equal to two for location and let's reload that and now you see that the location cell takes up two columns so that's why the city and country headers show up under location because each of them take up only one column each and now let's go ahead and finish this heading by actually giving row span of two to salary and posted on as well so let's set row span equal to two for salary and let us set row span equal to two for posted on okay so now we have the job title which spans two columns then we have the location which spans two rows uh, sorry now we have the job title which spans two rows then we have the location which spans two columns but only one row then we have the salary which spans two rows and then we have posted on which spans two rows however we have now also added the second row in which we have the city and country both of which only span one row and one column and because we have these other values spanning two rows they automatically get adjusted under location okay so this can be complicated at first you're not going to get it just by watching so practice it try watching the video uh, re-watching the video and typing it out step by step and it'll start to make a lot of sense okay now finally let's also split up the data right now you can see that the data is a bit messed up so let us split up the country and city for the data so i'm going to come into the first row here first data row and add another column so now we have bengaluru india as the country and a city and country let's do that for new delhi india as well so let's come in and add india okay that's good let's do this for san francisco usa as well again let's extract out usa and put it in a separate table cell all right so now we have bengaluru india new delhi india san francisco usa now remote creates a problem for us because it's neither a city nor a country so how about we expand remote to take up two cells so let us simply come in here and let us sell call span equal to two for remote and let's reload that and now suddenly you can see that we have the job title and then we have the location and under location we have city and country and then we have the salary and posted on and of course city and country are split properly except in the case where it is remote where it is just a single cell okay so this is how you create a more complex table by merging rows and columns using the row span and call span attributes now that we have this slightly more complex table i think it might be better to maybe bring these headings back into the center so i'm just going to go in here and i'm going to remove this text align left or i'm just going to put in text align center for the headings so under the jobs header row for the th which is the header cells i'm going to center the headings so i've centered the headings right here perfect and i think i'm also going to bring back the separators because here this line ends abruptly so I'm just going to come in here and change the border right for the TD or the data cell to border so that the border shows up on all sides, not just on the right. Okay. So now this is our job opportunities table. Now it contains the job title. It contains the location split by city and country. It contains the salary and it contains the posted on information as well. Okay. So now our table is looking very nice. We have simply added some row span and call span properties and we've added some updated some CSS to make it look something like this exactly what we are looking for now you can again check out this resource to experiment with the row span and call span property to become familiar with css and html you have to practice you have to experiment you have to break things and only then you understand how things work okay so here's one exercise for you create a layout on paper which contains different merged cells and columns and then put in some sample data into that layout and try to replicate it using HTML and CSS tables. The next thing that we're going to talk about is text styles in CSS. Now that we've set up our table, 
Uh, one thing that we also want to do is we want to improve the aesthetics of this page. And there are two parts to aesthetics. There is the text and then there is the colors as well, right? So let's talk about text styles in CSS. Now CSS provides a wide range of text styling properties and they allow you to change the appearance of text in your web pages. And these properties can be used to modify the font, the size, the color, spacing and other visual aspects of your text. Specifically, you can use external fonts within your HTML pages using C CSS. Okay. Now, why do you want, why might you want to use external fonts? There are some inbuilt fonts that most browsers come with, but that differs from browser to browser and the selection is very small. When you're working for a company, the company may have its own design principles, may have its own design guidelines, may have its own fonts that it is using. And you may want to incorporate those fonts into the website. And that is what you use external fonts for. So external fonts make your website stand out and look more unique compared to other websites on the internet. And you can add external fonts to your website using the Google fonts web, uh, using the Google fonts tool. Okay. So let's visit Google fonts and let's check out some fonts. Okay. So looks like we have a bunch of fairly interesting fonts here. And of course there are fonts in all kinds of languages. Now uh, you can click on any one font. For example, I'm clicking on Roboto. And then once you've clicked on a font, let me just reset the state over here. Once you've clicked on a font, you can then select some styles of a font. So each font can have many styles. So you can see here we have the thin font, we have the thin italic font, we have a bunch of different styles from thin to thick. Let me just switch to light mode. Yeah, so we have a bunch of styles here. And you can then select a bunch of styles. So you can uh, select which styles you want to use in your website. For example, let us use the regular style. Let us use the regular italic style. Let us use the bold style. Let us use the black style and let us use the medium style. Okay. So I've selected a bunch of styles for the Roboto font. This font is something that I want to use on my page. And then there's a button here called view selected families on the top right. And now you can simply copy this code over here. So there's a bunch of code here that you can copy and paste into the head of your HTML page to use these fonts within your site. Okay. So that's what we'll do in just a second. But the basic idea is if you want to use external fonts, first you choose a font from Google fonts. Then you add the font to your CSS using the link tag. And we're going to look at that in just a second. Then you use the font within your CSS. So let's say you've incorporated the Roboto font. Now to actually use it on the page for a particular tag, you can select that tag and within your CSS file, you can simply specify the font family Roboto or whatever font you have downloaded uh, or included on your site. And that is how you can set fonts for various elements on the page. Okay. So that is how you use external fonts. You find something from Google fonts, add it to your page and then just add some CSS properties. Now it is common practice to use one font family for all the head headings and use a different font family for all the body text. And at Jovian, we use the inter font. So this is the inter font right here, uh, which looks pretty similar to Roboto, but has some small differences. So we use the inter font for headings and we use the Roboto font, which we already looked at for text within our web page. So let's grab a bunch of styles from the inter font and the Roboto font and then include them on our web page. Okay. So here is the inter font and on the inter font, I'm going to select, let's see, I'm going to select the regular. I'm going to select the medium. I'm going to select semi bold, bold, all of these. So those are all the styles that I selected from the inter font. And from the Roboto font, I have regular, medium, bold. All right. So now we have styles from Roboto and we have styles from inter. And now I can go in here and copy all this. So if you observe this link tag over here, it contains information about which fonts we want to include in our page. And then I can come back into my HTML page, index.html, come up into the head. And before my CSS file, I'm going to paste all these link tags. Okay. So just to show you what that looks like, it looks like we have added a link tag called pre-connect and Two of these pre-connect tags, one goes to Google APIs, one goes to G static. 
not something we need to worry about we just have to paste it in but here is the interesting thing we have this link tag which contains the link to google fonts and it contains these font families inter and roboto so we have these font families and these font families are included as a style sheet okay and in in each of these font families various weights are also included so in, you can actually go in and edit this url slightly in case you want to include different weights but i'm just going to save this now and at this point the fonts have been included on our page okay so if i reload the page you can see that nothing has happened yet because i've simply included the font right now the next thing i need to do is actually use this font on the page and that is something that we're going to do in the css file okay how do we do it well we need to add the font family for the body and then we also need to add the font family for the headers let's do that first i'm going to add the font family for the body so let me change this to font family roboto okay so what we often do is we specify a font family for the body but in case this font was not loaded properly in case the request failed or something we also specify a backup as one of the default font families from that are already present in css so in this case the backup is sans serif okay then i am going to just reload the page after saving this and you can see that there was a small change in the font so if i disable this and reload you can see that the font looks different and if i enable this and reload you can see that the font looks different and if i remove roboto you can see that font looks slightly different it's a very slight difference all of these fonts are very similar often but roboto is what our design team has told us to use so that's what we are going to use for our body okay great next let us set a different font inter for the headers so let's select h1 h2 h3 so you can also select multiple tags like this using commas so h1 to h6 we are going to apply this style to all of them and let us set font family inter and let us set the backup as sans serif okay and let's reload and now you can see that again there was a slight change if i show you so this is without the inter font family and this is with the inter font family okay slight changes but it looks on brand it looks closer to what we have elsewhere on jovian all right so that is how you use external fonts now there are thousands of fonts available on the internet and you should try to pick simple legible fonts for a good user experience otherwise you might run into issues where people are not able to actually read what's on your site even though it looks pretty so check out this link to explore some other font pairings so a header and a body font pairing is often called uh, is often so there are many header and body font pairings that people have created by looking at google fonts for example calvert and acumen so this is a good combination yeah calvert uh, calvert and acumen is a good font combination monster art and courier is a good font combination but obviously it looks very different from what we have then we have a bunch of these these are serif fonts these are not sans serif uh, and we have these more interesting fonts we have some fairly nice cursive looking fonts so depending on what you want you can use various fonts on your web page and i encourage you to experiment but also be conservative stick to some of the more standard types so that people can actually understand what's on your page now apart from the font of course there are many other textiles that css also offers and we're just going to run through them very quickly we're not going to cover everything necessarily but uh, i encourage you to explore these and experiment with these as you are working through the lesson so the first is font family this is something that we've already looked at it select it sets the font family of the selected text we set a font family for the body and then we over rode that font family so we set a font family for the headers as well and the specific setting for headers will override the setting from the body which is applied by default then we have a font size so we can actually go in into the body and we can change the default font size so let's say i set the font size to 24 pixels and reload the page you can see that all the fonts have become slightly bigger um, i'm going to keep it to what it was earlier the default now there are many ways to specify sizes and we'll look at those as well then we have the font weight so we have a bunch of properties that we can use to set the weight or the thickness of the font 
So I can show you here in terms of the body. So if, if I set font weight to 400, that's basically the regular font weight, but I can set it to 600 and then it will be slightly thicker. And I think we included a bunch of other font weights as well. Let's see. We also included 500, 700 and 900. So let me select 700. Okay, that's about the same. Then let's select 900. That's really thick. Uh, we also have 500, which is like a medium weight. So that's a less, less thick. So depending on what you want to convey, how prominent you want the text to be, you can set a font weight and 400 is the default, but you can set, set a bunch of other font weights as well. Okay. And we look at a few examples of font weight. Then we have the text align property. So the text align, of course, is used to do a center alignment, left alignment, right alignment. So you could say, for example, text align. We've already done this here. We've done H1 text align center. We could have changed this to text align right. And then the text would be right aligned. We could set it to center again, and that would be centered again. So alignment is just left, right, center. There is also an alignment called justify, which is often used in text. So we, we say text align justify. What that does is you see this empty space at the end of the line. It makes sure that all line, there are no empty spaces at the end of a line and all the space is distributed between the words. So you can see now I set text line justify for the body and all the space is now added between the words. This is not very readable. So it's generally avoided unless you have to ensure that there is no space at the end of the text. So I wouldn't do it, but it's a, it's an option for you. So you have left aligned, center aligned, right aligned, justified, all of that. Okay. Then you have the font style. So the font style is used to maybe make things italic. So I can say font style italic. And you can now see that everything is a little italic, everything on the page. You can of course also apply it to just a specific section. So I could just go into the description here and I could just apply the font style italic so that everything else on the page is normal, but this is italic, which is just slanted to the side. And there are a bunch of other font styles as well that you can apply. Okay. So I'll encourage you to check it out. There are a bunch of different font styles you can use. What else? Well, we have a uh, text transform. So text transform can be used to automatically make the make all the text uppercase. For example, let's say we wanted all our headings to be all caps. So we could, of course, type it in caps in HTML, or we could just set text transform uppercase. And now all our headings would automatically be uppercase. Of course, this is just for H1. But I could go in here and apply it to all the headings. And now everything is uppercase. All right. So that is text transform. And finally, we have this text decoration. So text decoration is used to add a line, whether you can have a underline overline or strike through. So I could go into the headings and let's say I want my headings to be underlined. So now the headings are underlined. Or maybe I want a line over my headings. Not sure why I might want that, but it's possible. Sometimes for certain designs, that might be useful. And you could also have a line through it. This can be useful if you have specific things within the text that you want to strike out. So you could put a span around some text and then just put text decoration line through. Let me show you a quick example. Let's come in here into the description. And let's say we want to change this to, we want to strike out most highly. So I could just put a span here and I could say style equals text decoration line through and I could close the span. All right. So now we've put this span and now you can see that the word highly is struck out as we might expect. So that's how you can use this text decoration line through. Okay. So that's just one of, or these are just some of the properties. There are many, many more. Uh, one other that you might use from time to time is the line height. So you can see this text over here. Um, if we want to make sure that maybe there is more space between the lines, we could set a line height. So we could come in here and we could set a line height. And the line height is normally expressed as a single number, which is a fraction of the point size. So let's say we want the uh, fraction of the font size. So let's say we want the line height to be 1.5 times the normal font size. 
So if I just do that, you can see that now everything is a little more spaced out. If I set it to two, so then there's going to be almost a double distance between each line, or I can just set it to one, and then everything is going to be very close together. That's probably not what we want. Something around 1.2 is the actual line height that is set by default. So that's what you might want to stick with. Okay. Again, all of these things are properties that will be defined in the design system or in the design mockup that you, that will be shared with you by a designer at your company. But it's good to know what each of these do. And you can experiment just to visually see what, what looks good. Uh, you might have the question, given so many properties, so many values, how do I decide what to pick? Well, keep it simple. Just use as few properties as possible and then introduce properties one by one if, if they make things better. You don't have to add all these properties necessarily. And of course, most of the time you're going to be using some kind of a framework which will have all of these properties configured by default. Okay, so as an exercise, create a new web page with some text on it, then look up available values for each of the above properties and then apply them to the text on your web page and understand the effect. Okay, so the more you practice, the more comfortable you'll get. You don't have to remember this stuff, but you have to know how it works so that when you need to, you can look it up. And there's also this reference that you can check out on styling text. It contains everything that you'll need to know about text styling. Now, one last thing I want to cover before we head into a break. Um, I mentioned to you that one way you can add sizes or lengths in CSS is by using pixels or another way you can do it is by using percentages. So for example, in index in our styles.css, we have set the max width of the about section to 800 pixels. And that set sets the max width of this section. But along with that, we can also sell, select a width in percentage. So here we have 50%, which is the width. And that ensures that it takes up 50% of its parent's width. Okay, so the there are two kinds of lengths. One is the absolute length, which is expressed in pixels. And then we have the relative length, which is expressed in percentages. But there are also many other absolute measures that you can use. So you can also use inches, which corresponds to visual inches on the screen. Uh, you can also use centimeters, millimeters, points or picas. All of these are not very common. So most of the time you'll only see people using pixels, but just know that these are all also present in case you want to specify. So let's say we want to set the font size of the body to 0.5 inches. We could do that. And of course that's very big. We may not actually want that, uh, but that scales the size of the body. Okay. Um, the other thing is in relative, font sizing as well. Most of the time you will use percentages, but when it comes to text specifically, people often use these font sizes called EM and REM, M and REM. What do M and REM mean? Well, M and REM are both units of measurement that are used to size elements based on the font size of either the parent div or the font size of the root element, which is the body, body tag. Okay. So first I'll tell you about REM. So here's what happens. Let's say I send a, a set of font size for the body font size of 16 px. Okay, so now I've set the font size of 16 pixels for the body. And now let's say I set for h1. I set the font size as three rem. Okay, when I set the font size of three rem for h1, what I'm saying is relative to the root tag, which is the body tag, I want the font size of the header h1 to be 3x and that is what is specified by 3 rem and you can actually verify this you can go you can right click you can say inspect and that is going to open up this yeah so that is going to open up this box model for you and you can inspect this h1 and you can go into computed here and you can verify that its font size is 48 pixels so 16 threes is 48 right so just by specifying three rem, we have specified that the font size of the heading is supposed to be three times the font size of the body. Why would, why would we want that? Well, why not directly just set it to 48 px? Well, let's say we had a design overhaul and we wanted to change the body font size from 
16 pixels to 20 pixels. We want to make our text bigger so that people can read it more easily. So if we change it to 20 pixels and reload the page, you can see that the text became bigger, but the heading did not become bigger. So now we've lost that balance, which we had earlier established. On the other hand, if we had three rem here, every time we change the basic or yeah, every time we change the basic uh, body size, that is going to yeah, yeah, that is going to automatically scale the font size of the uh, H1 as well. Okay, so if I remove this, you will notice that the H1, where it should have become bigger. Okay, there might be something else that is affecting the H1. So I'm just going to put in important here. Okay, that doesn't do it either. Maybe we have to set it at the root level. Yeah, so I believe the root the root font size has to be set using star or just using maybe HTML or something. So you set the root or you set the base font size over here using star, and then everything else is expressed as rem of that. So the body font size is going to be one rem, and then the H1 font size is going to be three rem. So if I reload that, you can see that the body is twenty pixels and the H1 is sixty pixels. But if I change the body font size to 16 px, now you can see that this is set. This is now scrolled down to about 48 pixels. Okay, so that is how you use rems uh, to specify the font size in relation to the root tag of the entire page. But of course, you can also set it to 3m. In which case, if the H1 is outside another div and that div has a particular font size, then we are simply going to use the font size which is three times that. Let me show you an example here. So let's say I have this H1 inside a div and in the div we have set the font size to 5 pixels. So now this H1 has the size 3 times 5, 15 pixels because it is set to 3M, EM. Okay, so M is relative to the parent's font size, REM is relative to the default font size of the entire page. Okay, so that's that. Let us revert that change. So now you might wonder that since we have all these different kinds of font sizes, how exactly do we decide what font sizes you should be using? How do you decide the font sizes for the different headers? How do you decide the font sizes for paragraphs? So I just want to share a few guidelines for you. And this is from this library called Bootstrap, which we will look at in the future. So while designing your website, it's important to consider appropriate text sizes for optimal readability and usability. And here are a couple of guidelines. For the body text, 16 pixels is a commonly used font size and this is the default in most browsers. So you can just use that. So in the body, you can just come in and you, if you just say font size 16 px, that is going to be the default font size. You see nothing changes. Then for the headings, you can use these font sizes. So for the H1, you can use 2.5 rem, which is 2.5 times the font size of the body or 40 pixels. For H2, you can use 2 rem. For H3, 1.75, H4, 1.5, H5, 1.25, and H6, 1 rem. Okay. And of course, all these will also be bold. So you'll have different font weights. And then if you have maybe slightly smaller text on the page somewhere, which is smaller than the body text, then you can use 0.875 rem or 14 pixels. And any larger text, you can make it 25% bigger. So you can set that to about 1.25 rem, right? So this is a good rule of thumb that you can have. Nobody tells you this when you're learning HTML, but it's very difficult to determine what font sizes you should have. So just use this, keep the screenshot with you. And most of the time you'll be using a library. So this won't be a problem. But if you're working at a company, you'll probably have a design guide, which will specify something similar for you as well. Okay. So let's apply these font sizes. So for the body, we have the font size of 16 pixels. For H1 to H6, I'm going to use the inter font and I'm going to use the font weight of 500 as well. So font weight 500. So I just want to make it a little thinner. I don't want it to be so thick or maybe 600. Let's see. Yeah, I think I like 600. So I'll keep 600. And then I also want to set the font sizes for H1 to H6. So let us set the font sizes for H1 to H6. 
again, I am just selecting the H1 tag, opening this bracket, putting in the putting in the property font size and then using rem so that if we change the base font size of the page, all of this scales automatically. So 2.5 to 1 rem for H1 to H6. And that's good. And one other thing I want to do is this particular section over here, I want to make it a little bigger so that it's bigger than the rest of the text on the page. So I'm going to come in here into the description section and I'm going to say font size 1.25 rem. And now this is a little bigger, a little nicer. All right. Compared to this table, for instance, or compared to the footer. And of course, I could go in here and I could make this smaller. So I could come in here into the copyright and I could say font size 0 0.875 rem. Okay. Now it is slightly smaller than the rest of the text. All right. So our page is already starting to look aesthetically a little nicer. We have these font sizes. The next thing we should probably fix is the colors. We have too many colors on the page. But that is how you set sizes for text that is how you style text in various using various properties and as an exercise you can try changing the base text size i believe you can just go in here and you can select the html tag and say font size 20 px and i think we should make everything bigger uh, you can just put body as uh, one rem as well so yeah and if you come back make this smaller everything becomes smaller so that's how you can scale for font sizes up and down for the entire page by just setting it up on the HTML tag and then using ev rems everywhere or even M's in some cases. Now let's talk about colors in CSS because this is where a lot of people face a difficulty. What color should I put? Why is my web page not looking good? The single reason, the number one reason why web pages often look ugly is because of poor choices of colors and contrast. That's why we have a dedicated section. And again, this is not something that we pe that people go into in an introductory HTML and CSS lesson, but we want to make sure that you build good, visually appealing web pages. That's why we are talking about color. And colors, colors play a crucial role in web design. And colors also convey brand. Colors also convey balance. Colors also convey emotion in a lot of cases. And there are many ways to incorporate colors into your web pages using CSS. And the simplest is, of course, using the inbuilt color names. So CSS provides 140 predefined color names that you can use directly. For example, you can set the color of a paragraph of text to red. So I could come in here and I could say color red. And that would make all the text on the page red, which is obviously not very nice. But when you're starting out, you tend to pick some of these basic colors. Don't use them. They look your they make your page look bad. Instead, if you have to use named colors, if you're not sure what colors to use, pick some slightly muted colors, slightly pastel or softer colors. So you could use black or you could use gray. Most of the text on your page should be some version of black or maybe some shade of gray. Sometimes you may have a slight tinge of blue or a slight tinge of some other color, but definitely not a very strong color of any kind. For example, this one, Cadet Blue, is an interesting color. So I could probably use this. This could be a nice color to use. Okay, still too different. Probably not that great. So I should probably just use one of these grayish colors, like Dim Gray. So let me just come in and use Dim Gray. And Dim Gray definitely looks somewhat nicer, but it's still not better than the default. So anytime your color choice is not better than default, it's probably a poor choice. But you do have 140 plus choices of colors that you can pick. And these are all named colors within CSS. Okay. Next, you have colors that you can define using the RGB system. So RGB stands for the red, green, blue, which are the primary colors of light. So all the colors that you see around you, all the colors that you see on a screen specifically are built using combinations of red, green and blue. So what you can do is there is this RGB color picker here. I'm just going to search RGB color picker. It's a inbuilt color picker in Google and into this color picker, you can a uh, color picker, you can select a value for red, green and blue. Let me put zero, zero, zero and press enter. So when you have all of them set to zero, red, green and blue all set to zero. Then you get the color black, which means you have no red, no green, no blue. Everything is black. On the other hand, let's say I start increasing red. I increase red to 10. 
it starts to get slightly redder i increase red to maybe 40 it's getting more red i increase red to 50 okay more red i increase red to 100 now it's like a dark red i increase red to 200 now it's a very bright red 150 red of 150 would be something in between now it's a medium red and maybe somewhere right at 255 is the brightest red now you cannot have values higher than 255 so because of how colors are represented internally in the computer memory you have to choose values from 0 to 255 0 is the darkest and 255 is the highest or brightest and of course that is the color for red you could do a similar thing with green so let me set red to 0 let me set green to 50 and now you're getting a dark green let me set green to 100 and now you're getting a darker green uh, a slightly brighter green let me set green to 150 it's starting to look light let me set green to 255 and now this is the brightest possible green that your computer screen can display similarly we have blue so this is the 50 blue this is the 100 blue this is the one 150 blue and this is the 255 blue okay 255 is the brightest zero is the darkest now of course you can combine so you know that red and green when combined become yellow so you can say 100 and 100 and that gives you a yellowish color but it's still not completely yellow you have to go all the way to 255 and 255 to get a proper yellow color right and if you combine all three colors in, in equal quantity you get shades of gray so 255 255 255 is white and 000 is black but of course somewhere in between let's say 100 100 100 is going to be gray and you can make this gray lighter by going 150 150 150 and you can get all different shades of colors by combining various amounts of red uh, various amounts of red green and blue for example i believe green and blue together give you the cyan color and then red and blue together give you i don't know what it is let's see red and blue together give you the magenta color right so you have all these other colors that come together as well um, of course you don't have to type out all these colors directly sometimes you, have, you can work the other way you can go and select a color here that seems nice okay maybe this color seems nice i'm going to use it i'm going to use it for some other text not a great color for text but let me just try using it anyway then i can just select that using a color picker and you can just search color picker on google and get this widget and now i can copy these red green and blue values now i can come back into my web page and let me just change the font font color for now so color rgb so we use the rgb function and then paste the red green and blue value and that will just apply the color to that particular element whatever is selected right now i've selected the entire page that's why it's applying to the entire page and now i can modify this uh, vs code actually gives you a color picker directly over here so you can actually go in and select a value directly from here and that's going to modify it and you can then use that color on your page oh sorry you'll have to yeah you'll have to copy it and i believe then you can use that color on the page so there are ways to do this within us uh, vs code itself but whatever red green blue color combination you have you can use that and for now let's just set the default size to some or the default color to a gray not exactly black let's set it to maybe 210 210 and 210 maybe a slight tinge of blue maybe set that to 230 okay that's actually very light so maybe um, let's make it very light so maybe 30 30 and maybe 40 over here yeah and that is looking actually not bad right so zero is dark 255 is bright and combined red green and blue okay so that is the rgb system you can use the rgb function you can use it for background colors let's say i want to use it not for the color of the page but for the background color background color of 30 40 40 that's very dark maybe let's set it to 230 230 240 yeah that's a fair background but generally speaking even backgrounds it's okay to just keep them completely white or a very very light gray or very very light gray okay uh, so that is the color then there is another way to represent colors which is using the hexadecimal color codes okay so the hexadecimal is a textual representation of rgb but instead of numbers you use numbers and characters 
Now this is represented using the hexadecimal number system. I will not get into it here. But the idea here is an hexadecimal color is represented using three uh, represented using six characters and each character could have A to F or 0 to 9. So 0 to 9 or A to F and the first two characters represent red. This is in fact the hexadecimal notation for the red value and then the next two characters represent green and the next two characters represent blue. Okay. So often what you can do is you can if you have a RGB color in mind, let's say the color I want to use in RGB is 230, 230, 240. I can put that into a color picker and I can get that hexadecimal code from the color picker and I can just copy that. And instead of typing out the entire RGB, I can just say color is hash, hash includes hexadecimal and then type out the color here. Okay. And that will just change the color on the page. It's a very bad color, but you get the idea. Okay. So RGB and hex are equivalent. It's just that hexadecimal is more commonly used because it's easier to copy paste and uh, use across different platforms. So often you will find colors in hex. So when somebody says get the hex code or get the color code, this is what they're referring to. And you can always get hex codes online. In fact, a lot of color pickers also give you hex codes instead of RGB. Let's say I go in here and I go select a very dark color and I click this. Yeah, I just click that and that is going to get the RGB color for me. Oh, sorry, that's going to get, get the hex code of the page for me. Okay, so now I have applied the hex color to it as such. Now, of course, as you might expect, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is white. Oh, sorry, is black. All zeros is 0, uh, very dark red, very dark blue, very dark green is black. And because each value goes from 0 to 9 and then A to F. So F, 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 that is white. Okay, now everything has gone white. And of course, if you if I put 0, 0, 0, 0 here, that would be red and so on. So first two characters are red from 0, 0 to FF. And next two characters are green, next two characters are blue. Okay, let's get rid of that. So that is the hexadecimal color code. And you can use that to set background colors, you can use that to select text color, all of that. And you can use the Google color picker to convert RGB colors into hexadecimal or vice versa. You can, for example, copy this hexadecimal color code and come into the Google color picker and paste it here. And that will give you the RGB code in case you need it. All right, so that's the hex. Another color scheme is something called the RGBA color scheme, which is similar to RGB. You have red, green, blue, but then you also have transparency. So you can, for example, make the background of a div or you can make the text um, on, on a particular page slightly transparent so that the color behind it shows through. Okay, let me show you an example. Let us set the background color of the page to let's say red going to look very ugly but let's set it here no problem then let us set the color of the text to 0 0 0 or maybe just 20 20 20 which is a very dark gray okay it looks very similar it's still looking very black almost close to black but now let us come in and change this to RGBA and let us set the opacity or transparency to 0.5. So one is, I believe, full opacity and zero is completely transparent. In fact, let's put 0.5 first. And you can see that you can see some of the red behind. You can see some of the red behind the text. If this were green, you would be able to see some of the green behind the text. So if I set the transparency to zero or the opacity to zero, now you can't see the text at all. If I set the opacity to one, you can't see any of the background color at all through the text, but somewhere around 0.4, for instance, you will see that we are able to see some of the background coming through. Okay, So you can also use this RGBA and similar to RGBA, there is also the hex code where you have red, green, blue, and then two more characters to represent the opacity level as well. Okay, Not very commonly used, but this is also something that you can do. So that is about colors in 
HTML. And as you might have seen, all the color choices that we are making by default look pretty ugly. So we'll talk about how to come up with good colors. But now that you know how to create a color, these are all the different ways in which you can use colors. So you can use color to set the color of the text, which is what we've been doing right now. You can use background color to set the background color of an element. We've done that as well. You can set the border color and then you can use box shadow and text shadow. So box shadow is used to create a shadow around a box or a div and text shadow is used to add shadow for text. Okay. So you can look up the properties specifically and see how these are set. But I'll just show you an example of border color. Let's say we can come here and we can set for the team image. We can set the border width or we can just set the border to five pixels solid. And let's pick a color deep blue or something like that dark blue. Yeah, now you can see that there is this dark blue border and I can in fact, just change the border color separately. So I can say border color RGB and let's say 20, 20, 20. And that gives it a blackish or a dark gray border. And I can also set these border properties separately. So I can set border width to 1px and get rid of this. And I can say border style as solid. This is a solid border. Or let's make that 5px. This is a solid border. I can also have a dashed border. You can see that you can have a dashed border like this, not very common, but you can do it if you want. And you can also set maybe the width of different borders. So you can say border left width is five pixels so that you have this border only on the left and everywhere else you just have a one pixel border. Okay. So you have all these ways in which you can specify borders and you can specify the styles of borders and colors of borders as well. So again, experiment with colors a little bit and generally speaking, Picking good colors is really hard. And if you're picking at random or just looking at some colors and trying to use it, that is, you're going to have a tough time. So here are some guidelines for picking good colors. The first is to use a color palette. So use color palettes to ensure consistency throughout your design. And a color palette is a set of colors that go well together. So a color palette will typically have a primary color and some shades of the primary color which are often used either for text or for maybe buttons or for um, backgrounds. Then you will have a secondary color, which is also used sometimes for buttons. You may not have a secondary color at all. And then finally, you should have a, maybe a few shades of gray that you're going to use as backgrounds or as text colors. Then uh, one other thing to keep in mind is contrast. You want to make sure that the text is legible, which means that the text should have, should have a high contrast compared to the background. Okay, if generally speaking, you're not able to read the text, then that's a bad color choice. So light text on dark background or dark text on light background works well. Then the other thing is simplicity. Avoid using too many colors just because there are all these colors doesn't mean you have to use them. Just use, as I said, a color palette with a primary color, a few shades and a secondary color, a few shades. Even there, stick to one or two shades. All the text on your page should more or less have the same color and ideally should just be shades of gray, maybe with a slight tinge of blue or slight tinge of green, depending on the theme of your website. And finally, um, know that sometimes there are issues like uh, some people have color blindness, some people do not have a perfect vision. So there might be color vision deficiencies that your users might have. And there you can use tools like color contrast checkers. So you can just search online for color contrast checker. And you can paste some HTML code here, or you can like set the foreground color, background color, and you can check what the contrast ratio is. And it'll tell you whether this is going to be readable for, for somebody who has color vision issues or general reading issues. All right. So just keep those things in mind. Now, generally, most companies have a design system with predefined sets of colors for various parts of the application. And for now, you can just use this one color palette. So what I would suggest is use this color palette tailwindcolor.com. It's linked in the notebook page. And from this color palette for whatever website you're working on, pick a primary color. In my case, I tend to almost always go with the blue. 
and pick a secondary color. So the primary color is what is going to be used in most places. And then the secondary color is going to be used in some other places where you need a second color. And then maybe just use the different grays for showing text. Okay. So that is what I would suggest. Uh, pick a primary color, pick a secondary color and pick a bunch of grays. Don't use the predefined CSS colors. They don't go well together. Don't use random choices of colors uh, that you find come up with or try or you're trying to figure out using the RGB color picker that generally doesn't work use a color scheme okay so based on the color based on these I would also encourage you to go through some example sites here these are some examples of bad color choices I mean this one's not too bad but it's still too bright I would say uh, these are all all completely fairly bad color choices this is you used to see a lot of that a lot of this earlier in the internet era and these are some choices of good colors so one thing you can do for your website is just pick color combinations you can see that there's a primary color which seems to be orange and orange and yellow so some shades of orange and yellow and the secondary color here seems to be this blue and here again there is this primary color of yellow for lego and there's, there's no second there's a bluish secondary color that is used in some places here the blue is the primary color and here there's this seems there's this I don't know what this color is called but this like light pink color probably again there's this primary color secondary uh, and then maybe like a black secondary color uh, sometimes you can use images and matching colors with images so you have the pr a green color shades of green and then you have a secondary color which is the red that's great a primary color this color and then the secondary is just black here Again, here we have this gradient, which is basically just shades of the primary color. And then the secondary color also just seems to be a shade or maybe these are the two colors, primary and secondary. And again, here we have gray and we have red. So yeah, look at examples, look at your favorite sites and just copy what they do and use a color palette of tailwindcolor.com while you're designing your website. Okay. Specifically for text, I want to share a few guidelines. Normally text should be almost always some shade of gray, some shade of black. Uh, you can have a slight tinge of blue or a slight tinge of green or red depending on your themes. Uh, but here's a good guideline. Your headings can be 90% black or just 22222 would be the color uh, hex color. Your body text can be 75% black or 4444. And any secondary text that is not important can be 60% black, which is 6666. And disabled text should be 40% black. So it's a bit confusing because black is zero. So 90% black is going to be very close to zero and 40% black or 60% white is going to be very close to FFF, right? But I hope you get the idea. Hex colors can be a bit confusing to uh, wrap your head around, but as you practice more, you'll get used to it. Okay. Closer to zero is dark, uh, away from zero is, is light. So 90% black is very close to zero. Let's do that. Let's come in and let's set these colors. Let us first come in into our body and let us set these, let's set the font size and the color. So the color we're going to set to 4444 or 75% black. So let's come in here to the body. We've already set the font size to one rem. I think that should work. We have just added the 4444 color and our body text is slightly gray, but it still looks fine. But I think the headings can be made slightly darker. So let's come into the headings and for each of the headings, let us set the font weight to 500 and font color to 222. So I think I'm going with 600 here. I like 600 it's looking good for me. So I'm just going to set the color to 22. And now our headings are slightly darker. So that's fine. Then what else? Well, we have this jobs table. Now on this jobs table, I want to make these titles slightly darker because they are more important, more prominent. So I'm just going to come in into the jobs table and into the row header, I'm going to add the color of 22, 22, 22, which is the same color I'm using for the headers. Um, now these are a little darker, so that's great. Then, okay, now these backgrounds, right? So remember I said we don't want to use the named colors, we want to pick from a theme. So generally for, uh, for backgrounds of tables, you can use maybe the primary color and a very light version of the primary color. So let's see, I'm going to go in here into tailwind color palette. And I'm going to pick the lightest version of indigo for my row background. So it is simply indigo 50. Or let me let me pick blue 50 just to be very safe. 
and when I click on it, it copies the hex code. So I can come in here into the nth child and I can paste this color. And now I have this very light blue that is behind the uh, behind some of the rows as a background color. And for this, let me pick maybe blue 100 or I could also pick the secondary color. But for now, let me just stick with blue 100 and I'm going to set this on the header row. I'm going to select the background color, not as Alice blue, but as this darker, slightly darker blue. So you can see now that it looks slightly nicer because these two are shades of the same color essentially. So this is a slightly darker blue. This is a slightly lighter blue. I could also maybe experiment with blue 200 if I am not happy with the contrast, but that's the most I would go. I would just go up and down within the same, uh, within the same shade. And maybe let me come in here and let us also set the background for this. So you have this footer here. Generally for footer backgrounds or for body backgrounds, you just want to use gray and you just want to use the lightest of grays. So I have a blue gray here, which is slightly bluish gray. So let me just copy the blue gray and let me come into footer and set the background instead of ghost white. Let me set it to blue gray. And now that looks slightly nicer or I could even just have used a simple gray as it is. Okay, FA, 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 and that looks fine. Finally, for the links on this page, I might want to use the blue color. So I can just go in and I can pick if um, the 500 blue for links on the page. So let me pick the A tag and let me say color 500. Oh, sorry. That color. So links on the page will show up like this. But now you can see that as I hover over a particular link, the color doesn't change. So this is where you can actually use a something called a pseudo class or a hover state. So if you want to change how a link looks on hovering, you can say colon hover. And now you can put in a different color. Let me make it 700. So let, let us check set the color to 700 over here for the hover state. So now when I hover over a link, I get a different color. Okay. And there are various hover states. We'll talk about them in a future lesson or various uh, pseudo classes that you can apply. But basically, whenever you're styling links, you should specify a normal color and you should specify a hover color. And sometimes this hover color, um, hover is used when you use the mouse, but when you tap using the keyboard, um, you can use, I think you can use focus or active or something like that. So when you are using the keyboard, then the focus color gets applied. So both hover and focus should generally be set together. Okay. So that is about setting colors. So now our page is looking rather nice because I'm using a consistent color scheme. That's good. What else? Well, we have a gray here. So the gray for the copyright, I'm again going to just grab one of the grays from yeah, maybe gray 400 or yeah, gray 400 should be good enough. And let me just paste that. Or maybe gray 500 should be good. So let me just paste gray 500. I think I was, yeah, that's gray 500. I think I'm happy with that. Okay. So our page is looking nice. We have picked a, a nice set of colors. So let's continue now and let us talk about forms in HTML. Now HTML forms are an essential part of creating dynamic web pages because they allow users to input and submit data to a web server, which can then be processed and stored. In fact, most web applications that you see on the internet are built using forms and forms are going to become increasingly important as we go further into the course and in the program. Now the form is created, a form in HTML is uh, created, and no doubt you've used several forms so you know what forms are. This is what they look like. You can put in some information. Forms are created using the form tag. So you start a form tag and then you put a form tag at the end and you put the entire inputs, etc., inside it. You can then use three types of tags. You can use the input tag to create these text boxes or other various types of inputs. You can use the select tag to create drop downs. You can use the text area tag to create big text boxes where people can enter full paragraphs of text. And there are various types of input fields like text. You can have password input fields, which is what you do when you log into a website. You can have email input fields that automatically validate that what you're entering is an email. You can have radio buttons, you can have check boxes, and then of course, drop downs, etc. as well. With each input box often you also have a label. 
So you have these labels that are associated with these form input tags. And these labels are important because they allow not just the person who is using it normally, but people who are, let's say, who have a poor vision and are using a screen reader. Labels are used by the screen readers to tell people what to enter into specific form fields. Labels are also used by search engines to determine what the structure of your form is. So there are many ways in which labels are important. So don't ignore labels when you're building a form. And finally, most forms have a button at the end, sometimes multiple buttons to reset or clear the data. Uh, but you almost certainly have a submit button or a save button or a send button that is going to actually trigger a form submission, which is to grab all the data from the form and send it to some server, some web server. And we send the data using the action and the method attributes of a form. So typically for a form tag, you have an action and then you have a method. Now, of course, in today's lesson, we don't actually have a web server. We are just building static HTML pages. A server is something that can take some request, do some processing on it and return a response. We don't have that today. So we're going to be using a third party service to collect these form responses. Uh, but over time, we're going to learn how to use uh, our own inbuilt servers. Okay. But this is what a form looks like. You have a form here. And then inside the form, you can have labels and inputs. I've put these labels and inputs inside divs because otherwise you will find that everything just lines up on a single line, which may not look nice. So let's create a form step by step. And in fact, we're going to create a form. Uh, you, so one thing you can do is you can just copy this code and you can just paste it into the web page and see what that looks like. So let me just show you first. And then we are going to create the form step by step again. Let me create a div here first. Let me call that application okay and let me then put in an h2 here and call it submit your application okay so now we have the submit your application section let me then put in this form here so i'll just paste this form and by the way if you just want to include a comment something that is not actually displayed on the page you can do that using this comment operator. So started with the open tag and then started with an exclamation followed by a hyphen hyphen. And you can just put so, put some text here. So some sample form. Remove later. So this is a way for you to just add some note for yourself. This is not going to be read by the browser. This is not going to be displayed on the page. But this is just a note that you can leave for yourself. You can just say to do sample form remove later. Okay. But now I've put in this form. So this form has an action. This form has a, pro a method. Uh, these are not things that we're going to use right now. Then it has a div and in this div we have a label. So we have the label name and then we have an input. Okay. And this is what it looks like. So we have name and we have this empty input. Then we have email and then we again have an input. Then we have message. Then we have an input. So we basically created a very simple form which contains a label and contains these input fields. And a couple of things I want to point out with regards to the structure of the form. Let's make that a little bigger. Is that normally for every input, you have to specify a type. Okay. So here we have specified the type text. So here you can enter any form of text. Instead, if you had specified the type number, for instance, then you would not be able to enter normal text here. You would have to enter numbers. Okay. So that's one thing. I'll just zoom in a little bit here so that you can see that I can't enter text. I have to enter numbers and you have various, various other kinds, kinds of inputs as well. You have the date input. Now in this case, it's going to open up a date picker. So that's nice. Uh, but I'm just going to revert this to text for now because it is for name. Then another thing that you often have to do is to specify an ID for each input. So what is a common practice is to specify an ID for an input and then specify the in the label, which input it is an I it is a label for. Okay, because the label may not of may not necessarily always be next to the input itself. Sometimes the label might be in a different div, the input might be in a different div because of the structure of the page. So you specify an ID. And then you specify that the label is for this ID using the for attribute, your form is going to work perfectly fine without this. You can see that the form still works. 
but it's a good practice to specify an ID for the input and specify a for attribute for the label. Okay, so keep that in mind. ID for the input and the ID of course should be unique and the for attribute um, on the label which which points to the ID of the input for which this is a label. Finally, I know I know it can get a bit confusing right now. Finally, when you also need to have a name attribute for every input. Okay, now this input itself is also called name. That's a different thing. But here is another input called email and it has the name email or I could just uh, yeah, or here there is a or I could just yeah, I could just call this something else. Mail ID, for example. Now, why, what is the value of the name attribute? So the name attribute decides that when you hit the submit button and some data is getting picked up from the form, what is going to be the name of each field? Okay, so if let's say we wanted to send the data to the server in this format. So let's say we want to send the data to the server with a full name property and an email address property. So when we click submit, the server is going to receive some form data and in that form data, it's going to have a property called full name whose value is going to be whatever you have entered here. Similarly, uh, the server is going to receive some form data and in that form data, there's going to be a property called email address and that email address is going to contain whatever email address has been put in here. Okay, so the name property is useful on the server once the form is submitted. We'll see that in action when we actually make a form submission. And finally, if a form is, if a form field is required, which means it has to be filled out without it, submission cannot be made, then you can put in the required attribute here and it doesn't have any value. You just set required. And if it is required, then as long as you fill it, you, you'll see that you'll not be able to submit. So it's, it just says, please fill in this field when you try to submit the form. Okay. So that is where you have the required property. So those are some of the properties that you can specify for a form. Okay, so now we're going to build a form step by step for our application. Remember, we had this application form here, which has name, email, phone number, position, resume and cover letter. So we're going to build that step by step. And there are various form input types. So I've just listed a few here that you can browse. You have the text input, obviously. We can create checkboxes. So if you just change the type here to checkbox, that is going to become a checkbox. Then we have radio buttons. So checkboxes are often used when you have like you want to show multiple checkboxes and multiple of those can be selected. So that's when you show a checkbox. And the radio input is often used when you want to only allow selecting a single option from a list of options. So again, you should experiment with this a little bit. It's all about getting some practice. Then to create a drop, drop down, we use the select tag. We're going to look at an example. If you want to allow the user to enter a larger amount of text, then you have to use a text area. Okay. Now one key thing I want to specify about text area in particular is that all inputs are generally self closing tags. So the input that you see here, this does not require a closing tag. It is self closing, but a text area is not self closing. So whenever you have a text area, you have to add the closing text area tag as well. It's just how HTML has been defined. So make sure that whenever you have an input, it, you, you don't necessarily need a closing tag. You can put one if you want, but you don't need one. And for text area, normally you do need a closing tag. So that's something to keep in mind. Then you can use a date input. Again, just change the type here to date and that's going to become a date. You can use a password input in case you want to build a login form where you don't want to show what is being typed. Um, I'll just quickly show you what that looks like. Let me reload this page. So you can see now that whatever I'm typing is not visible here. So that's the password input. And then of course you can have email input. So this is going to validate that the data is being entered is an email before submission. And then you can have a number input and that is going to make a numeric input field. And you can also specify attributes like minimum and maximum and also the step, like let's say you want it to be multiples of two or something, you can specify that as well. That is again achieved using the input type. Now there are several other input tags that you can use. So you can check out various other input types here. There are lots of these. You can have an image input. You can have a color input. You can have a range input. So you can have a slider. Um, you can have a search input. You can have a sub uh, submit is of course the input that is used to create a submit button. Uh, but yeah, there are a bunch of different input types. And now let us actually build out this application form. Okay, so I'm going to take this all away for now. 
and let's start building the application form. So I'm going to just first create a form, nothing, and I'm going to give it an ID. Let's call it application form. And now let us start by creating a div first. Again, we're putting things in a div so that they just show up nicely. And let us now create a single input of type text. And let's give it the ID name. And let us give it the name, full name. And let us make it required. Okay. And let's reload the page. Now we have this input box. That's fine. Let us put a label for this input. And in the label, let us put the value full name. Okay, so now we have full name and then we have this box. Let us maybe also add this a small empty line. So I'm using the BR tag here. It is a self closing tag that is used to add a new line. Um, it's not used a lot anymore. But in forms, uh, if you just want to add a new line after a label, you can quickly add a BR tag or you can wrap the label in a div. So now this now you can see that the input box comes below the label. That's one thing. And let us also set the for property that this is for the input with the ID name. Okay, so that's looking good. The form is looking good. Let us also style it a little bit so that it looks slightly nicer. So I'm just going to come in here and I am going to first select this application. So right now, this application div is always at the very left. So I just want to make maybe center it a little bit. So I'm just going to come in here and center it. So let's see. Yeah, let me just add it here. So we have this application div with the ID application. Let me give it the same max width of 800 px. And let me give it a margin of zero auto. So remember, auto margin on left and right automatically centers the div. And let me give it a padding of zero and eight pixels so that it's not sticking to the end. So now you can see here that there's a nice padding. And as I expand it, you can see that it remains centered. So that's good. Okay, so far so good. Then maybe let's also improve the input a little bit. So for the input, uh, actually for the label. So first, let me go in into application form. Application form. And let me select the label. And for the label, let me use font weight 600. So just make the label slightly bigger or slightly um, slightly bigger in size. And then let me come in here, let me say application form input. And let me add a padding here. So as I type here, you can see that it's very small, I don't have a lot of space around. Let me add a padding of 8px. So now there is it's, a, it's slightly bigger. Let me make that 4px. I think 4px should be fine. Yeah, so it's slightly bigger. Let me also increase the font size. So that the text that I'm entering is of a bigger size 1.25 REM. Remember the base font size is 16. So 1.25 of that is 20. Okay, so now this is looking a little better. And let me also add a margin top here so that it's not sticking to the label. So margin top of 4px. Yeah, so this is looking definitely looking a little nicer. And then I can put in the words Akashan is here and it's starting to look nice. Okay, so that was the input for the full name. Let's then add email and we'll add a couple more and then we'll start maybe a copy pasting some in the interest of time. So again, label for I'm going to call the email email and I'm going to call this email as well. The text that I'm going to put inside the label input type equals email and ID is email as well and name equals let's see email address. And this is also required. Okay, so now we have email too. And once again, let's add this BR so that this comes on the next line. And I can see that this email is very close to the previous form. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to say label margin 8px or actually Let me just set the margin top to 8px. 
that isn't doing much well let's just set the margin on the div okay so what's happening is that the label is an inline element just like span so you cannot set a margin for it let's set the margin for the div itself so application form div let us set a margin of 8px okay so now our application form we could even make this 16 if you want to make it just slightly more spread out now our application form is spread out a little better i think one other thing that i can do here is in the input i can just add a border radius of 5px so it's just slightly more rounded and border color of gray or i could use or i could just set border 1px solid gray and now it's looking slightly nicer okay so we're just slightly making these a little nicer um let's add maybe what next so we wanted to have the phone number so let's grab the phone number here so this is the class for phone number and yeah i think we can add this form group class to select the divs more easily so i'm just adding the class form group for the div so that i don't need to select it like this i can simply say dot form group yeah okay so now we have the phone number and you can see here in phone number we've actually added a placeholder so we've added this thing called a placeholder what it does is it fills out an empty value that goes away when you try to fill something inside it okay so i am going to come in here and add a placeholder for the name as well so placeholder equals let's say john doe and i'm going to come in here and add a placeholder attribute for the email as well let's say john or j doe at example.com okay so these are all various attributes that you have to specify and now we can see that we have this placeholder so this is looking nice and let's see maybe make this adding a little bigger maybe eight pixels look even nicer yep okay what next next we have the date of birth which is a date let me add that in here as well so now we are adding the date of birth okay now date of birth automatically gives us this nice date selector that's nice we can also specify a max and min property for date of births in case you need that what next so next we have this position applied for which is a drop down so here's how we create a drop down so we go in here and let's see yeah, we go in here and let us create an input let us create a label and let's say position applied for and let us give it for equal to position and let's add a br here okay so now we've just added the label and let us also give it the class form group maybe i don't need a margin all around maybe i can have a zero margin at that i can have margin just on the top and bottom and the left and right margin can just be zero okay so we have the label position form group then we create the select okay so we put select and inside select we put options or option so what are the options we have we have a front-end developer we have a full stack developer we have let's see a data scientist and we have what else we have a ml engineer right so these are the options now we have this nice select which has these options of course we may need to style it as well so again one trick i want to show you here is i want to apply these not just for input but i also want to apply these for select so i'm just going to add comma select and that automatically gives me this okay now i want to uh, i want to tell you a few things you need to have in select you need to of course have the id so that the position this is not compulsory but it's good to have so that the the label is specified properly then of course you need to give it a name 
So then in the name, I'm just going to say position applied. That is what is going to be sent to the server. Then what else? Is it required? Yeah, I want it to be required. What else do we have here? Yeah. So for each option, you need to specify a value. So what ends up happening is what you show on the screen and what is sent to the server may be two different things. So for each option, you have to specify a value. So I'm just going to specify the value front end dev or front end here. And I'm going to specify the value backend or full stack. And I'm going to specify the value data scientist. And I'm going to specify the value ML engineer. Okay, so this is just to tell you that what you show to the user and what you actually send to the server can be two different things. Okay, when the form is submitted, the server is going to receive this value, but the user is going to see this value in the drop down. One last thing that is often done is you have an option with an empty value and that just contains an instruction which is select position, right? Something like that. So the idea here is that by default, you don't want to select any position. Otherwise that default position can get picked automatically. You want the user to pick a position specifically. And that is why you have the select position. Uh, this is like the placeholder option in some sense. And that is often given the empty value. Okay. So that's the value. Then we have file inputs. So file input simply has input type equals file. And we are using file input for resume. And you can also specify what kinds of files it can accept like PDF, doc and docx. So let me just come in here. Let me put in the file input here as well. So we have this file input. So that's great. And then we have this form group uh, for the cover letter. So for the cover letter, we are using this text area component. So in, instead of input, we are using text area. And again, you specify the ID, you specify a name, you can specify the number of rows that you want in the text area by default, and that can be increased by the user. You can specify whether it's required and you can specify a placeholder as well. But just know that you have to have a closing tag for the text area. Okay, so let's add the text area here as well. Let us come in here, add the text area for the cover letter. And now here we are asking the user to enter a cover letter as well. Again, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to apply these styles, not just to input, but also to text area. And that way my text area is going to have a better selection. I might want to make the text area full width. So I can say form group text area width 100%. And this way my text area is going to take up the whole width or at least let me set it to like about 80%, let's say. Okay, so the text area is slightly bigger. And you may also have to specify a font, a font family for the text area. In this case, clearly it is picking up some random font family. So you also specify font family. Let me specify Roboto because it is just some normal body text and sans serif. Okay. And now we've specified a text area as well. Okay, last couple of things. One is a checkbox. So we're going to add a checkbox called I agree to the terms and conditions. And all we need to do here is just specify type checkbox for the input and it's going to show a checkbox. Okay. So now often for a checkbox, the checkbox is created slightly differently because a checkbox you may require to actually show the input. Uh, you may require to show the label next to the checkbox. So often in the checkbox, what you do is you put the input inside the label. Okay. And what that does is if you click on the text as well, that also ticks the checkbox. So that's good. Now, one thing we might want to do is for the input checkbox, I might want to make it a little bigger. So I can do that. Again, I'm going to show you another CSS trick here. Not something you need to know right now, but I can say form group input. And I can say only for the type checkbox. So now I'm selecting in the class form group, I'm selecting an input tag. And then I can say only those input tags which have the type attribute set to checkbox. And for them, I want to use the width to be 16 pixels and the height also to be 16 pixels. And that is just going to make the checkbox slightly bigger as you can see here. Okay, so that makes the checkbox bigger. And finally, we have the submit button. So we just have a div form group input type submit value equals submit. The value is going to be 
whatever you want to show on the actual button so you could say submit application like that and that is how you create a form so i'm just going to zoom out a little bit i'm going to go full um, i'm just going to go to the normal size so now you have a banner now you have this description now you have job opportunities and then you have submit your application full name email phone date of birth etc and you can fill out all this and then click submit application but of course these are all required fields so they will have to be filled in and if you want we can make the cover letter optional so let's do that so that we can submit without the cover letter for the purpose of testing let's bring this back here okay and let us remove required from here so that this is no longer required okay and now we should be able to submit an application but uh, let's also add some styles for the submit button i think a nice blue color would be good to have so again, I'm going to come in into styles. I am going to select form group input type equals submit. And I am going to set background color to blue and I'm going to pick a blue from my color scheme. So maybe I'm going to pick blue 500 and I'm going to set that as a background color. So that looks nice. I may have to make the text color white. So color white i can make the font weight five let's say 600 so the font weight is bigger so maybe 500 might do the job and i can maybe increase the padding 8px maybe 16px make it a little bigger yeah yep okay so you can specify some things i think the padding is not getting specified here but you can uh, specify it. it's uh, just a matter of specificity i guess um, but now my submit application button is actually looking nice and if i also want here's another property that you'll often use cursor pointer and what can what this does is this converts your cursor into a hand symbol when you have the submit uh, when you hover over the button and you can also change the hover style you can change the color of the button when you hover over it so you can do all sorts of things and this is something that you should look up and then you should attempt to do but yeah at this pay at this point you click submit application and that is going to uh, submit the application so let's try that so we say akash a at b.com some number i'm going to pick a date of birth I'm going to select a position i'm going to select a file so i have a resume i'm going to add a cover letter i'm going to submit okay it doesn't do anything because we have not configured the form to do anything yet okay so what we need to do is we need to send this data somewhere and normally this data is sent to a server but we don't have a server right now to process this data that is where we are going to use an online platform called form bold okay this is not something that you would do in the real world you can actually if you're building a personal website you can use form bold um, what this does is this allows you to just provide an action for your forms that you are putting into your simple website static pages and it is then going to capture those responses and also send it to you over email so how about i just log in here into form bold and create a new form let's call it jovian application form okay and any new responses that are filled into the form is going are going to be sent to this email and i'm going to create this form so you may have to verify your email to actually create the form but i'll let you uh, figure that out okay and now let's open this form so let's go into the form settings and in the form settings you will see this integration option so let's click on integration and here it's going to give this endpoint so just copy this endpoint okay this is where we want to send our form data so copy that and come back here into the form and what we can do is we can say action equals this link i'm just going to put it all here so that you can see clearly action equals this link okay and we also have to specify a method 
and you can see how you can see an example of how it, how this form should be used so action is this link and method is post so method equals post and let's just save that and since we want an html form with a file upload so i'm just going to select this option with a file upload so i think we also need to put in this enc type multi-part form data okay now don't worry too much about what these mean whenever you're using a form you'll have to set these sometimes these will be set by your own server so we are going to look revisit forms in a lot of detail later but for now we're just using a third party service that can capture these form responses for us when we hit the submit button okay let me save that and now i can come back here and i can reload the page and i can start filling something so akash a at b.com and put in a number put in a date here put in a full stack developer choose a file and put in some cover letter here agree to the terms and conditions and click submit now when we click submit it is going to send all the data and each data is going to be associated each or each piece of data picked up is going to be associated with the name property that we have specified the name attribute and it is going to be sent into the form okay so i click submit application and you can see that it has sent the data to this form and this form bold the service that we are using is asking us to maybe just verify traffic lights to prevent spam and once it checks that the form is submitted okay now i can come back here on the form bold page and i can go into the submissions and you can see that one submission was obtained uh, and these were the values that were filled in full name akash cover letter empty and the file is not showing up because there's a way to view files maybe in some other way but they've accepted the terms so if a checkbox is ticked it is marked as on and then the form and then the date of birth all of it is present and the date at which this form response was created was also captured by form form bold but that is something that you can pick uh, on your own server okay um, so the idea is not to tell you that you have to use form bold for all your forms the idea is to tell you that every form requires an action to be specified and a method so method and action is something we'll talk about in a lot of detail later so don't get confused right now but the form data when is collected and sent to the server which processes it in whatever way it wants it can process it and send an email it can process it and maybe make a database entry or it can process it and just show you on the screen like that however it is okay but this is how you create html forms by creating these um, by picking these tags and by using the input and the label tags and then styling them as required so to deploy this web page once again we can go to static.app and it is a simple application that a simple web application that can be used to simply upload a zip file so i'm going to come back here i am going to simply zip up this folder my second web page let me just zip it compress Oh, this was a copy let me let me create a zip file compress okay a zip file has been created now i'm going to upload it i'm going to select this zip file and i am going to just pick whatever domain name it's giving me i'm going to put in my email so i'm just creating a new account here so that's where i am putting in this plus 10 to create a new account um sydney jovian let me create a password let me accept the terms and let's continue and it should ask it should upload the CSS uh, the file so of course this contains our index.html it also contains the team and the banner files and it contains maybe a couple of other the styles.css file and I need to verify my email so I'm just going to go in into email and verify my email let's verify my email address and now what we have done is we have taken the code that we have written which contained the html file the css file and a couple of images we've put that in a css or put that in a zip file and we've uploaded that zip file to static.app and that zip file should now get deployed as a website at carefulb.static.app we have the website deployed we have this header over here do something great we have some information about jovian now it is using the colors and the fonts that we want on jovian we have these nice links that are colored using our theme our primary color we have these job opportunities over here and then we have a place to create and submit an application and i can go in here and i can say akash ns i can say akash ns at jovian.com 
I can put in my phone number and I can select my date of birth. Go back, select a date of birth from long ago. And if I try to submit without filling everything, I'll have to fill it. I can select a position, let's say full stack developer. I can upload a resume. I can pick a cover letter. So this is a cover letter. I agree to the terms and conditions and I click submit application. Okay. And that pushes the data to form tape form bold. That is the third party online service we are using. So our website is on static.app and it is sending data to form bold because static.app cannot run a server. It can simply show your pages as they are. Okay. And once that is submitted, I should be able to check in on my form board dashboard that there is a second application by me. This is the cover letter. This is the phone, date of birth, terms accepted, etc. Okay. So you can also see it in more detail over here. And now we can go back and we can fill out the form again. Okay. So, yep, you can try this out. And there is one last topic which we have not gotten to today, which is adding meta tags. So there are a bunch of these tags that go in the head tag. And what they do is they determine what shows up when you share that page online, or let's say when you share that page on Facebook, what is this preview image that should show up? What is the page title that should show up? What is the page uh, description that should show up? That is something that you can actually configure within HTML. Similarly, when Google finds your page, what is the information it sees uh, and it displays on in a search result. That is also something that you can configure using HTML meta tag. But I think this is a good point to stop. So quick recap. We started by looking at this problem statement to improve the previous Jovin careers website where we had this list of jobs and this application. We wanted to create a table of jobs and we wanted to also create an application form. Then we used the starter code which is my first web page, which basically contained the code for this. And we also want to make aesthetic improvement. So first we changed the wireframe. So we came up with this, we had this initial wireframe here, which looked a bit like, let's see. Yeah, we had this initial wireframe, which looked like that. We wanted to improve this wireframe. Uh, so we made it look like this. So we have this table and we have this submit your application form. So that gave us a visual reference for what we wanted to create. And of course, this is the iterative method of software development. You build something, deploy it, let people use it, then you come back and improve it. And then we came in and we created a table. So we created tables using the T table, TR and TD tags and also the TH tags. So you first create a table tag, you then create T rows using the TR tag. Then you create heading cells using TH and data cells using TD. And we just did that. We looked at some data that we had put onto a spreadsheet and we just uh, transferred that into HTML code. And that allowed us to create a table that looked like this. Of course, we this is not a very pretty looking table. So the next step was to style the HTML table to make it look a little nicer. And the basic styling that we did with CSS was adding borders around the table and the table cells. So you can see here we've added borders for the jobs table. Um, also, we've set border collapse equal to collapse. Otherwise, we get these double borders that we were looking at earlier. So to avoid the double borders like this, you have to set the border collapse property, just something to keep in mind. You can always look it up. Then we also wanted to make the table full width so that it occupies the entire width of the parent element, which itself is limited to about 800 pixels at the center of the screen um, if the browser is large enough. So then we also left aligned the headers initially and then we centered aligned them again over time. Then we also try to show different background color for the header rows and different background colors for the alternate rows of the table. And that is all achieved using CSS. And this is what our output looked like. Then we went ahead and we looked at some advanced table row and column merging using the row span and call span. Specifically the job title salary and posted on were configured to span two rows and location was configured to span two columns. And then we added two sub columns, city and country under location. And then we also split the, uh, the data itself into city and country, except for remote where we just set it to span two columns. And we also modified the CSS styles a little bit to better represent the data in this new structure. 
So this is what our table looked like after styling. Then we learned a little bit about text styles in CSS. We learned about how to use external fonts from Google Fonts. So you choose a font on Google Fonts, you add those fonts. So you select a bunch of fonts and you add them to your CSS. And then you use that font in your CSS using font family. And we use the heading and body fonts. Specifically, we use the inter font for our headings. That is what we use at Jovian and the Roboto font for body. You can use any other pair. There are a bunch of pairs you can find online. And to add them to our web page, we simply need, need these link tags. And additionally, we also need these CSS styles um, to use these fonts. So within the body, we've added some fonts. And then for I uh, added the Roboto font family and within the H1 to H6, this, so within the headers, we've used the inter font family. Okay. Then we saw some common text styles, some common text CSS properties. Of course, there's font family, then there is font size, and there are various ways to express sizes in CSS. There is font weight, which is how thick each character is. So you can use 400, which is normal, or 500, 600, 700, 800. There is line height, which is how much space there should be between lines. About 1.2 is common, but you can go 1.5, you can go smaller as well. There is font style, which you can use to italicize the text and you can check out other properties as well. There is text transform, you can make everything uppercase, you can use sentence case, which is to capitalize the first letter of every word, or you can use uh, lowercase. And there is text decoration, which can be used to underline, overline, or strike through text, okay? Again, you have to experiment with these and only then you become familiar and you don't have to remember them. You can always look them up. I don't remember them after 15 years of web development. Then we looked at how to express sizes in CSS. So we have these absolute sizes or pixels and we have a bunch of other absolute sizes which are not commonly used. In relative sizes, percentages are more common when we are specifying widths or heights for divs. But for fonts, we often use M and REM. M expresses the current elements font size as a fraction or a proportion of the parent elements font size and rem expresses the current elements font size as a proportion of the default font size for the entire page which is set on the HTML tag I believe. Okay, there's also these viewport dimensions that is left as an exercise for you. In terms of sizing, uh, we had some guidelines that for body text, 16 pixels is the common size and smaller text can be 0.875 rem or 14 pixels and larger text can be uh, 1.25 rem or 20 pixels. And then for headers, you can use different sizes from 2.5 rem to 1 rem from H1 to H6. And we prefer using rems for sizing because you can simply go and change the HTML uh, tag text or the root text of the body of the page and everything will get updated automatically. Okay. And then you can, of course, specify these styles in CSS. So again, type out all the code yourself. That is how you understand this. You should spend four, five, six hours this week just typing out all this code on your own. Then we looked at some guidelines around colors. Uh, the first thing we looked at was how to use colors in CSS. Of course, we have a bunch of inbuilt color names, but often you will find that they do not look very good when you actually use some of these inbuilt color names, but you have a bunch of these you can use from and if you want to use an inbuilt color, um, start with a color that is very muted, very light. So maybe just a light, uh, the last set of colors here. And of course you can use RGB, red, green, blue, and you can specify a value of zero to 255 for red, green, and blue respectively. And that is going to create a color for you. Zero is dark, uh, 255 is light. So you can go from black to white if you vary all of them equally with grays in between or if you pick different values for red, green and blue, you can create millions of color combinations. Now another way to represent uh, red, green, blue colors is using hexadecimal codes and this is the hex or the base 16 representation of red, green and blue combined together into a single string and this is what you often find on the internet because these are easy to copy and paste around instead of RGB. And then we have uh, RGBA colors with transparency. So you can use RGBA where you can specify red, green, blue values and you can specify the opacity value. One is completely opaque and zero is completely transparent and 0 0.5 is somewhere in between. So that the background color is going to show through or the background image is going to show through. Then we have CSS color properties. So you can use color, background color, border color, box shadow, text shadow, all these properties that have color and there are some other properties as well that can use color. Okay. 
In terms of picking good colors, ideally you should be using color palettes. You shouldn't be picking random colors from the internet here and there. A good color palette tool is Tailwind uh, colors.com where you can just use maybe one of these as the primary color and then use a bunch of grays for text and maybe a secondary color if you need to use a second color. Okay. And just use shades of the same color. Also have enough contrast. Keep it simple. Don't use too many colors and don't use colors just because you can. Sometimes black over white is as good as it needs to get. Also make sure that the colors are accessible to people with color vision deficiencies. Okay. There are some examples of good and bad color schemes that you can check out. In general, it's a good idea to maybe explore the color schemes of specific websites. And for text specifically, for headings, you can use 90% black with a tinge of blue or green as per the website that you're on, uh, that you're designing. For body text, you can use 75% black or 4444. For secondary text, you can use 60% black. And for disabled text, you can use 40% black. So these are good rules of thumb to make your pages look good. And we've just applied this to the various headers and the various of headers, footers, etc. in our code. Okay. Then we looked at forms in HTML. So you can create forms using the form tag. And in the form tag, you can then specify labels and inputs. And inputs can have various types. And normally we put these within divs so that each shows up on a separate line. And of course, you can also add a BR tag after each label to show the input on the next line after the label. And there are various types of form inputs, text, checkbox, radio, drop down. So most of them use the input tag. Some of them use a different tag. For example, there is a select tag that is used for creating drop downs along with the option tag. And then there is the text area tag, which is the not a self closing tag. That's one thing to remember. And we have data input, password input, email input. These are again all inputs. Okay. And we have number inputs as well. So then we created this actual application form here, which was, which had a bunch of fields. And we also styled it using CSS. So we looked at some various interesting ways to select things. So for example, we selected the label, change its font weight. We selected the input, select text area all together. We selected input of type checkbox using this special kind of selector and input of type submit, which is a submit button using this special kind of selector. So you have all these interesting ways to select and style forms. And over time, we'll start using frameworks. So you won't have to do much of this styling on your own anyway. And finally, once we did all that, we also then deployed this website to, uh, we also then used an online platform called form bold. So we signed up on form bold.com and we created a new form inside form bold.com copied the action that we need to set up into our form. And we have some example text here. So we need to put the action method and apparently this ink type into our form. And what that does is when the user hit submit, this data is going to be sent to this site called form bold. Okay. And that's it. So we just need to add these few lines and we can send our form data wherever we want. It can be a completely separate site, but over time we'll of course build our own server, which is going to accept this form data. And that's what we looked at. You can check out the section on HTML meta tags if you need. And finally deployment was really straightforward. All we did was create a zip file. And that zip file contained our index.html, styles.css, team and banner jpg files. And we took that zip file and uploaded it on static.app. And when we uploaded it on static.app, it created this free site for us. And in this free site, we simply deployed it and we tested it out. Hello and welcome to this live workshop on turning a Figma mockup into a web page. And this is completely unscripted. I'm going to pick up a design and I'm going to implement from scratch something that I've not practiced before. So you will see me making a lot of mistakes. You will see me, uh, you will see things go wrong, but I hope to show to you what happens when you are going through the process of turning a design into a proper web page. What are the challenges you encounter and how can you answer or overcome some of those challenges? So with that, let's get started. Today we are going to pick up a mockup from Figma. By the way, Figma is a design tool. So at most companies, you will find designers, specifically UI or user interface designers, use a tool like Figma to create mockups of web pages. And then as a web developer, you will have to turn those mockups into proper HTML, CSS, or sometimes you might use a framework like React, etc. 
and if not figma sometimes people use a tool called sketch sometimes they use uh, some other tools but every design tool more or less looks similar and let us open up this mock-up so typically as a developer you will receive a read only copy of the mock-up and you are going to be able to then inspect specific areas within that mock-up so looks like this is the web page that uh, we've picked out by the way i've picked this out from the figma community which is where a lot of free such free web pages can also be found in case you want to practice and this is what we'll try and create today so we have this web page where uh, this is created by Ferdi, Ferdi Sahin, and looks like we have their phone number, email, and we have a picture. Not sure if it's a stock picture or if it's a picture of the person who created the design. Uh, then there is this, this is often called the hero section. This is often called the section where um, you have some big text and maybe a, a call to action or a button. In this case, that button seems to be contact me. Then there is a section called what I do, talking about his uh, developer and designer experience. So this looks to be a personal website and there is some information about front-end development, back-end development, interface development that he's talking about here. Then there is information about some of his projects. Now, of course, most designers will just put in some random text or lorem ipsum text as this is called. Most designers will put in a lorem ipsum or a, a placeholder text. But of course, in the real world, when this, when this website goes live, some actual text can come in here. Okay, so this will be information about the projects created by Ferdi. And then there is also this uh, uh, footer at the bottom. All right. Um, there's actually a more. Uh, let me just sign up here so that we can actually see this. And I'll be able to inspect specific parts of this web page. I'll be able to look at the fonts, colors and things like that. And in fact, I am going to pick a slightly harder version of this. So this is what is given as an assignment in one of the courses that we are running. This is in fact the first assignment on HTML and CSS. But I'm going to pick a slightly harder version of this. So let me just find that. So I'm going to use this extended design mockup, uh, something that is actually a little bit harder. So here now we have not just the same hero section, but we also have this in this uh, skills and project section as before but we also have this section called pricing which seems to have like a pricing a, a bunch of pricing elements sharing information about various services and we also have this section about frequently asked questions so what we'll do is we'll try and cover some of these more advanced uh, design elements as well and maybe we'll also try and add some of these background elements so there seems to be this background element over here there seems to be this background element here and there seems to be this line over here that shows up just below WordPress developer. So we'll see how much of this we can cover. I have no clue if we'll be able to touch on all of this within the hour or so that we have. But uh, whenever you're given us a, a design mockup, this is where you should start. You should start by just studying the page and understanding what's on it, identifying the various sections within the page. And I've actually laid out a step by step process that we will try and follow today very, very roughly. Uh, but the prerequisites that I'm assuming here are HTML. So I'm assuming here that you have some knowledge of HTML. I am assuming here you have some knowledge of CSS. And I'm assuming here you know how to use a code editor like Visual Studio Code. If you don't, then you should check out some uh, beginner friendly tutorial or come join our uh, full stack developer bootcamp where we cover all of these in a lot of detail. Okay, so the first thing is to inspect the design mockup. Now, of course, we've opened up the link and we have created an account on Figma. So we can actually inspect the mockup. And once you've created an account, you can go into this inspect tab on the right. So if I just let me just zoom in here a little bit so that you can see things a little better. So on Figma, you have this inspect tab. And this is this inspect tab gives you a lot of very powerful details that you can directly translate into things like CSS properties, colors, fonts, etc. So let's say I want to check what exactly is the background color here, or maybe the background color for the entire uh, for the entire design, you can see here that the background color for this entire design seems to be over here, FFF 8F0. Alright, so that is how I can pick out the background color. And seems like this particular design was created or with a width of 1440 pixels and a height of 3596 pixels. So 1440 piece is a common width setting that people use. So we're going to use that same width setting. And I can go into individual sections. So I can go into this particular section here. And here I can see, okay, this is the width, height, etc. This is the actual text in case I want to copy it, the content. 
Um, this is the typography. So it seems like the font used is League Spartan. And then there is a certain font weight. There is a certain font size. So all of this information is going to be useful when you, all, when you start putting in some of the CSS for our page. And there's a bunch of information about the CSS as well that we'll try and use later. Okay. So first thing you should do is just inspect a few things and figure things out. Understand the dimensions and styles of various components and identify the fonts used on the page so that we can find them on uh, Google fonts. So for example, the font used here on this page is called League Spartan. You can see here. So I can just come in into Google fonts and I can search League Spartan. And here is that font, right? So most fonts that designers use will be picked from Google, will be available on Google fonts. So you will have to then include those fonts within your uh, web page to actually start using them. Okay. You might also want to export the images as PNG or JPEG files. So here, for example, in this mockup, we have this image and this image need may need to be exported. So you can just go to the export tab and you can just press plus and you can export this image. So let me just export this image as let's see, uh, let me just call it hero image. So this is since this is part of the hero section, the top section is often called the hero section. I'm just going to uh, put it on my desktop and call it hero image, right? And similarly, if there were other images on the page, you could also export those images. We don't have to do it immediately. We can do it slightly later as well. All right. So that would be step one, inspecting things. But let's now start coding. So step two is to set up the basic page structure and styles. And then step three is to actually go ahead and implement the web page section by section. So first, I'm just going to create a folder on my desktop and open it up in Visual Studio Code. I'm not going to use Git or anything here. I'm just simply going to let me see. Let me create a new folder and let me say, let me call it, uh, let me give it a name Figma to web page. And in this folder, I am also going to move in my hero image that I just downloaded. And I just want to open up this folder in Visual Studio Code. So let me just open up Visual Studio Code. This is the code editor that is often used by web developers. And on Visual Studio Code, I'm just going to go to File, Open Folder. And I'm going to navigate to the folder on my desktop, Figma to Web Page. So here I'm selecting the folder Figma to Web Page. And I'm going to click Open. All right. So now, we have this folder Figma to web page over here. And in the, this folder has been opened up in Visual Studio Code. And now I can start developing. So I can create a new file and I can call this file index.html. And this is going to be my HTML file, which is going to contain all of the HTML code. And I'll add a CSS file later on as well. And you can see that the same file got added here too. And let us put some very basic content into this file index.html. Let us just put the HTML tag. Again, I'm assuming here you have some knowledge of HTML, but in case you don't, uh, take a, a very basic tutorial should be sufficient to follow along with what we're doing here. Now within the HTML tag, we generally have a head tag and a body tag. The head tag is where we are going to put all the links like CSS, JavaScript, fonts, etc. And we also put a title here. So let's give this a title. What is this is the personal website for Ferdi Sahin. So F E R D I S A H I N. So let's just put F E R D I S A H I N Ferdi Sahin. And let us uh, in the body, let us, let us just create a div and let us just put hello world here in the div. Okay. So I've done nothing here, nothing so far. I've just created a folder. In that folder, I've created an index.html file. And that index.html file now has some HTML content, very basic stuff. And now I can open up this index.html file in a browser. So I can just double click. And here you can see that the file has been opened up in a browser over here if I zoom in a little bit. And now we are ready to get started. So let me just put this on the side. And I'm going to close this sidebar for now as well. So now we have done the first thing we've created a folder on our desktop, opened it up in VS code, we are ready to go. Then we are going to create an index.html file. And we are also going to create a styles.css file. That is something that we will also need to uh, add where we are going to add all our CSS and we will have copied over the image that we were using here. There's just one image. So let me create another file called styles.css. All right, perfect. I've created a file styles.css. This is where my text or uh, my CSS is going to go. And now I need to incorporate the styles.css file. I need to link this file from index.html into 
my uh, so that I can use the styles from this page. All right. And I'm just going to search. So how to link CSS file in HTML page. I should be knowing this, but I keep forgetting this. So I just look it up. So HTML styles CSS, how to add CSS. All right. And there are three ways to add CSS. We want to add the external CSS file. So the external CSS file is simply, we simply do this link rel equal to style sheet and href equals my style dot CSS. So I'm just going to add that link rel equal to style sheet. Of course, in this case, it's not my style dot CSS. It is styles dot CSS. That is the uh, CSS file that we are using. And this seems to be this doc type HTML that is there here. So let me just put in this HTML here as well. Okay. All right. So now we have set up the index dot uh, the HTML file, we have set up the styles dot CSS file. And we can verify that things have been set up by let's say going into and add, going into the CSS file and adding some styles, let's say let's add a background color, antique white, and let's save it, let's reload the page. And you can see that the color of the page, the background color has changed. All right. So I'll just reset that for now, and get back to where we were. Perfect. So now the next thing for us to do is to add the head title, which we've done already the link tag for the style and the body, and maybe add section wise divs. So we have a bunch of sections here. Let me come back here into the design. So I'll call this the hero section. Uh, and you can see here even the designer has called it the hero section. So this is the hero section, then under the hero section, we have this what I do section. And under the what I do section, we have this project section. And under under the project section, we have this pricing section and the uh, question section. All right. So let's just create a bunch of divs. So we have a top level div called hero. Then let's create another div called what I do. And then let us create another div called projects. Then let us create another div called pricing. Let us create another div called questions. And let us create another div called footer. There's also that black footer at the end. So I am going to have another thing for that as well. So one, two, three, four, five and six. So we have six sections and let's reload that. And this is we are this is what we're hoping is going to eventually turn into the actual web design the page that we are looking at. Okay. Perfect. So now we've created these sections. What next set up the basic styles, header, body, font, family, text size, etc. So let's start setting up some of the basic styles here. Okay. First thing first is the background of the entire page. So I'm just going to go in select the entire uh, this is called a frame in Figma. So I can just click on the frame name and get the frame and looks like this is the color that is being used here. So I'm going to go in here and I am going to come into styles.css and for the body, I am going to set background color to this color. Oh, okay. I think I didn't need to type. Yeah. So background is this color. And now we've added the background. So we're starting to make progress. We've added the background. Step one is done. What next? Well, I might need to just study the fonts that are used on the page and uh, include those fonts from Google fonts into my project. So here is one font, there is this font called League Spartan that seems to be used here. So League Spartan, okay, I want to use the League Spartan font and I found it on Google fonts. So let me just seems like I have some selections here already. Let me get rid of all these selections so that I can uh, go ahead and do this from scratch. So League Spartan is the font I want to use. And let's see, Sh let's get all the weights. And we will get rid of some of the additional weights. So Google fonts is the place where you can find all kinds of fonts and to incorporate a font into your website, you can just add a bunch of styles of the font. So you can see that there are various font weights, there's a thin font, there's a thick font, regular font and all. So I'm just grabbing all of these so that I might need to use any of them. I'm not sure I'm grabbing all but later on I can go in and edit the uh, the link tag or whatever I incorporate so that I don't, uh, uh, I don't have to worry about including additional fonts that I'm not using. But just to give you an idea, what you're going to get here is let's say I close this. So once you add a bunch of fonts, you can see this view selected families button on the top right. And from there, you can check you can review that okay, for leaks Spartan, you have selected a bunch of these fonts. And then to use that font on your website, you can then use a link tag. So to use the link tag, 
you simply copy all of these and then you go and add that within the head tag of your HTML page. But of course, Leak Spartan is not the only font. There are other fonts here as well. So let me go and check what other fonts are being used so that I can just incorporate all of them into my website at once. Okay, now this font over here seems to be Poppins. So Poppins seems to be a font that is used here. And there is this font Inter that seems to be used here as well. This seems to be Poppins. This seems to be Leak Spartan. This seems to be Poppins. This seems to be Inter and Poppins. Okay, so from what I'm gathering here, there, there seem to be three fonts here. One is the font that is used for very big, large headings. Then second is the font that is being used for these uh, smaller headings or section headings or big text. And then third is the body text, the actual body text, and that seems to be inter. So let me grab Poppins and let me grab inter. And then we'll, in, then we'll add all these fonts into our web page. So let me search for the font Poppins. So let's go back to Google fonts. Let's go Poppins. Okay, that is the Poppins font. I am just going to select all the variations right now. Probably not the best idea. I should probably check with the designer which all we need to use, but it's okay. We'll go and fix this later. Okay, I am I have selected a bunch of these fonts. All right, looks like there's a lot of these. So I've added the Poppins font. Let me go back in. Let me search for the inter font and I'm going to get a bunch of variations of the inter font as well. Again, I'll just select all of them just so that we don't have to worry about missing any important fonts. Looks like we got the inter font as well. Okay, great. So now you can see that our link tag has been populated over here. So we have this link rel pre connect, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And over here, this is the specific area where we have names of fonts. I can zoom in a little bit. You can see that we have names of fonts and then weights of those fonts as well. So let's just copy that entire link tag and let's go in and put that link tag into our head. So I'm just pasting the link tag here and I'll just right click select format document so that it, it just shows up a little nicely. And now we have incorporated all the fonts into our page two. Of course, we've not started using them. We've just incorporated them. So no change happens on the page itself. But let's come back here into the page and let's see. So we have, uh, it looks like inter is the main body font. So I'm just going to come in here into styles.css and into the body, I'm going to add font family inter. Uh, actually, I can just copy this from, yeah, I can just copy this from Figma itself. I can just click the copy button and that's going to copy all of these things. So font family inter, the base font size, I'm going to just set it on HTML just so that we can use EMS for relative font sizes. Font weight of four, uh, font weight of uh, 400 on inter. Okay. Then the font line height seems to be 24 pixels. Letter spacing, we probably don't need that. It's by default, it's I believe it's a zero. And then text align left, we don't need that. Okay. So just as I do that, I've changed the body fonts and you can already start to see that now we are getting something that is closer to what we expect. Okay. What about the color of the body text? So the body text seems to have this slightly, uh, slightly different color. And the, this is the color that they're using here. So the color of the body text is 552060D. So I'm going to come in here and set the body color, body text color. Let's come back here. Let's see. Body text color. Yeah, it's, it's all added here. So over here we have this color 55. 2060. So this is a nice thing about Figma. It gives you the CSS properties that you can use directly. Of course, sometimes the CSS properties may not have an exact mapping. You may still have to modify things a little bit depending on how the designer has set things up. But in most cases, you should probably just be able to copy things over. And now you can see that the color of the text has also changed. Great. That's fine. What next? What next? Well, uh, let us set up maybe so this is like a heading. This is an H1 and uh, there's an H1 tag. So for all the headings H1 to H6, I feel like, or maybe at least this is an H1 and then this is an H2 and looks like H1 and H2 are the only headings used. And then this is an H3, which also seems to have the font pop pop-ins. So for H1 and H2, seems like we're using League Spartan. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to say H1 comma h2 
I want to use the font family leaks part in. So let's see font family leaks part in. So I can just copy that over here or I can just copy all the typography at once. So let me copy the typography here for, for the entire thing. And let me come in here and let me paste it. Of course, sometimes we may have to edit what we paste. So H1, H2, let me just put font weight 700. I'll verify if this is correct. Actually, let's just do H1 for now. We'll do H2 later. Okay, and let's format this document. And all right, so now for H1, which is the heading of the page, we have set up the font family. We don't need the letter spacing and text align. I think that should be fine. We've set up the font weight. We've set up the line height. So I can come back in here and then maybe I can actually just put in this text directly. So again, I can click on this text. I can scroll down and or scroll up and copy that actual content. So just click go, to, go into the content tab and click copy. Come back here and maybe in the hero section, uh, let us just put in an H1 here. So let's do hero section and let us just put in H1 and let's paste this. Okay. All right. And I was just using a very big font earlier. That's why I, I zoomed in version. That's why it was so big. But now uh, that we have this H1 in a big size, I'm zooming, zooming back to 100% uh, visibility. Okay. All right. So now we have the H1, but the color seems to be off. Like you see here, the color for this H1 seems to be different. So let's grab the color. The color is shown here. So let's just grab this color 190D37. And let us grab this color and let us just go in here and let us set color to 190D37. And now we have the right color for the H1 as well. Okay. Great. Let's also fix the H2. Let's fix this style as well. So I'm just adding in the basic styles. The, we added the body text background. We ordered the body font size. We added the body font family. Let's add the font family for H2. So with H2, seems like we are still using League Spartan. And how did I decide this is an H2? I'm just going by my gut feeling here. The biggest uh, heading on the page should be an H1. The second level heading should be H2s. And then maybe these can be H3s. So we'll see. But for H2 here, I'm just going to grab the typography settings and I'm going to create another H2 style and I'm going to again give it the right styles. Let's get rid of letter spacing, text align. We don't need that. And let's just verify that an H2 is loading fine as well. So with 10 years of experience, etc. So let me come in here and let me come in and let me just verify what I do section. I'm just going to add an H2. Okay. And let's reload. Okay. Again, the color seems to be off. Let's verify that we're getting the right color. So in this case, the color just seems to be black or zero, zero, zero. Yeah. So I'm just going to grab the color zero, zero, zero. Ideally, although this could have been a mistake on the part of the designer, we do not mix too many colors on a web page. So my guess is that the designer may have intended to use the same color one nine zero D three seven for this H2 as well, but they probably just forgot to set it on Figma because these both look very dark. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to go with the design, whatever is on the design, let's just replicate that. And but that, that is a that is a question that I might ask the designer. And by the way, you can leave comments on Figma to ask questions, but or you can just check in with the designer directly. Okay, so now we have the H2 that is looking fine too. What else? Well, uh, we have this body text over here that is already enter. We have uh, verified that. So let's maybe add this body text in as well. So but the color and the color also has been set for the body text. No. Um, but this is not body text exactly. Uh, this is the body text and this we have made enter. This is like headline text of some kind. So this is big text. So what I'm going to do is I am going to set up a class for this. And I'm going to take a, I'm going to apply those, set, uh, those color and font settings to a class over here. Okay. So let me just grab this and let me grab this color and let me just call this class headline. So whenever I need to use, or let me just call it big text, maybe even headline may not be the right thing. So for big text, the background or the color that we want to use is this. And what is the font size? Let's study the font size here. 
So the font is Poppins, the weight is 400, the size is 18 and then the line height is 32 pixels. So let me grab that and let me put that in here as well. Yeah. And now we have the font size for big text. And if I want to verify if this big text, big text is going to show up properly, I can just copy this content over here and I can come in into index.html under the H1. Let me add a div and let me just give it the class big text and let me just paste the content here. Okay. And I can verify that. Okay. This looks more or less like what we have here, lorem ipsum dollars. Yeah, it, it looks to be, it's definitely bigger than the normal body text. Okay. I think uh, we have set up most of the basic styles at this point. There are maybe, th there is this one style and there is this one style here that we may need to deal with. Let's deal with them when we get to them. But at this point, I, I feel I'm feeling pretty good in terms of the background of the page. We've made a lot of progress. We've uh, brought in all the fonts. We brought in the inter font of course, which, and we may want to give it like a, um, like a backup font in case the font is not picked up properly. Then similarly, we may want to give a backup font to leak Spartan as well. I'm just going to put sans serif here. So whenever you're putting in font families, it's always a good idea to also provide backup fonts. And let me also provide a backup font here. And let me provide a backup font here for Poppins as well. Okay, great. So that is going to make sure that our fonts load up properly and we've provided the right backups. Fine. Next up, let us actually start building the web page section by section because we've set up the basic styles, header, body, font, family, text size, background, etc. So let us add the content for each section one by one first using HTML. And then let us check the CSS properties for that content. And then finally, let us add styles for each completed section one by one using CSS. So we are going to go section by section. So I'm going to start with the hero section or the top section, and I'm going to start by adding the content. So what do we have here? Well, there is this, the way you should approach these is you should go in, you should go outside in. So this entire hero section here seems to be a box, right? And then in this box, let me actually just copy this over to a whiteboard so that I can actually show you how I, how I would think about something like this. Okay, so here is the design we have. So here's the design we have. And now we're going to start annotating or drawing, uh, start drawing boxes around this design. Now in this design, we have, first of all, of course, this entire thing is in a box, right? So this is our entire outer div, so to speak. Now, up in this div, there are two parts, there is a left half and there is a right half. So this is the left half clearly. This is where a lot of the content lives. And then there is this is the right half. This is where we just have an image. Okay. So now you're already getting a sense that you need an outer div and inside that you need two divs, you need the left div and you need the right div. Now in the left div, we can start again breaking things up. So what you want to do is you always want to see, okay, is our things arranged horizontally or are things arranged vertically? So clearly first in the outer box, things were arranged horizontally. So that will inform our CSS settings then, but in this left half, things are definitely arranged vertically. So there seems to be this one box that I can draw around this contact information. Then there is this one box that I can draw around this high section. And then there is this one box that I can draw around this section, which is just uh, the headline. Um, or the sort of the big text. And then there is this um, the one box that I can draw around this big text, which is the body text, which is big in size. And finally, there's one box I can draw around the contact me button. Okay. So at this point, we actually have a very clear structure of the page and we can now start turning that into HTML content. All right. And I'm going to start giving some of these boxes IDs just for easy identification. But another thing that you can also do is you can just use HTML comments. So Let's do both maybe. Okay, so first let's just create, let's just add an HTML comment here. And let's say this is the hero section. 
All right, now in the hero section, we have, I'm going to get rid of all of this for a second. I'm going to add it back later with time. In the hero section, we have two boxes. So you always want to do the design outside in. So in the hero section, we have one box and this box is going to be the by um, hero text parts. And then this box is going to be hero image okay all right and now inside the hero text let's go back here so inside the hero text we have a bunch of vertical divs so one two three four five so let me just add those in as well just so that we have set up the structure before we are actually adding a lot of the content so this is going to be let's see So this is going to be email and phone. And let's just put that in here as uh, or we'll write that in here as well. Then after email and phone, we have hi, we have the name basically. After the name, we have this, let me just call this like h1 so the h1 is going to be here i'm going to create a div right now but maybe let, later i might just replace that with an uh, with a direct h1 tag and then we have this explanation uh, or this let's let's call this um subtitle or let me call it title and subtitle and then a button right so let's call this title and let's call this subtitle Okay, and then finally, let's add a button. So there's a there's going to be a button here. Alright, so now we've set up the basic layout, we've set up a couple of uh, we've set up an outer div called hero, in which we have the hero text div, we have the hero image div. And then in the hero text div, we have a bunch of divs one, two, three, four, five divs for each of the sections within that uh, section. Okay, so let's see. Um, the first thing we need to do is if I just reload the page, let me save this and reload the page. So right now we have nothing here, right? Right now we have uh, nothing in the hero, hero section. So the first thing we need to do is maybe start putting in some content so that we can start getting a sense of where things are, right? So this is the, um, maybe the first thing I'll do is I will put in the email and phone. So let me get the email and uh, let me get the phone information. I'm going to just go in here. I'm going to copy the phone information and let me put in the email and phone here. So let me just put, put that in right now. Okay. So now we have the phone. Then below the phone, we have this text. Hi, I'm Ferdi Sahin. So let me just copy in the text uh, for the Sahin. I'll put the email shortly as well. Uh, let me just, I'll put in the email right now too. Let me just go in here. We'll figure out how to add the icon first. So the idea with, any kind of web design is do the easy parts first and figure out the hard parts later. So, okay, now we've added the phone, we've added the email. I hope you can see here. I'll just zoom in for a second again. And then I've added that, hi, I'm Ferdi Sahin. I've added that part as well. Then let's add in this content as well, which is the freelance front-end web developer and Word, WordPress developer. So this is an H1. So I'm just going to add this in as an H1 directly. Okay. All right. So now we got the H1 here in, in here as well. And then let us get this sub, uh, this uh, subtitle. So which is going to be, I believe it is of the class big text. So let me just give it the class big text and paste the content. Okay. And now we have the class big text. So now, now we have the content starting to shape up. So we have the email and phone. And we have hi I'm Ferdi Sahin, which is just body text, normal body text. We have uh, freelance front end developer. We have this, and we have this button here. So let's let's add in this button here as well. And this, so we have this button, and this button button is called contact me. Let's put that in a div. Okay, so there's a contact me button. Perfect. All right. 
now there is this image this hero image over here let's come and get this let's grab this hero image as well so we have already downloaded this image if i show you here we have this hero image that has been downloaded already so i can go in and i can just import or use this image using the img tag so img src equals um hero image dot png and let me just for now let me just give it a height so that it's not too big but we'll adjust the size later so let me give it a height of 240 and we'll adjust specific exercise uh, styles later so hero hyphen image dot png yeah there it is so now we have the image here as well okay perfect so now we are getting to a point where for the first section we have all the content now the next step is to maybe start aligning things a little bit right and of course you can go back and forth with this you can add a little bit of content do a little bit of alignment then add a little bit of content do a little bit of an al alignment uh, but just to keep things simple for now i'm adding the entire section content and then i'm, I'm going to style it um okay so we first of the first thing we want to do is we want to show these two divs horizontally and we want to maybe make them both take up 50 percent of the screen area right so to make things horizontal and you can always look this up you can always say how to show two divs horizontally but let me just give this a class or let me give this div an id called hero section and into the hero section i'm going i'm going to go into styles.css so for the hero section I am going to say display flex. So this is a quick trick that I want to tell you anytime you want to show the children of a div horizontally, just set display flex. Okay. And just as I do that, nothing seems to happen because inside it, we have these two divs and we want both of those inner divs to be taking up 50% of the space, right? So let me just give them some IDs as well. So uh, let me say, uh, let me give this an ID hero text and let me give this an id hero image wrapper because it's, it's not exactly the image tag itself this is a wrapper around the image so hero text let's give that a width of 50 percent so it takes up 50 percent of the parents width and then we have the hero image wrapper let's give that a width of 50 percent as well okay and let's see what happens okay nothing seems to have happened which is strange so these are the issues you run into when you are doing things live at this point i the way i'll debug this is i will just right click here i will check inspect and let's zoom this out a little bit and I am going to then, yeah, I'm going to then maybe just check whether the div actually was added properly or not. So we have the hero section div and we the styles don't seem to have been applied. Why was the style not applied? Hero section, oh, yeah. So the styles were not applied because I'm, I have to select by ID so let me just make that hash instead of dot okay and let's reload the page and now you can see already that both of these seem to be taking up so this is the hero text section and this is the hero image section both of these seem to be taking up about 50 percent of the space now of course this image itself is not taking up the entire space so i might want to come into the image here and Maybe let's just put the image. Let's get rid of this div and let's just put the let's just give the image an ID and let's just call it hero image. And this is one question that you'll ask yourself a lot. When should I be using a div? When should I not be using a div? The answer is whatever does the job, but you can start start with something and then modify it as you need. So let's just give the hero image a width of 50%. Okay, so now the hero image has a width of 50%. That's fine but that is not fully doing the job for us so i think i'll just revert to the old style and then i'll just apply some styles to the outer hero image so let me go in here let me remove the oh that's because i had the height so let me add the id hero image here so i'll keep my hero image wrapper at, at width 50 percent 
and now I'll go into my hero image and I will give it width 100%. So it's going to take up 100% of the parent's width. Okay. So now the hero, hero image should be taking up about 100% of the parent's width, which it seems to be doing. However, you can see that this parent itself, this entire thing is kind of spreading across the page, which we may not want. We may want to just put a maximum width to this entire uh, to this entire section. And I think the maximum width that we are putting here is about 14, 40 pixels. So let me just set the entire maximum width for the hero section to 1440px. And let me set the margin to zero auto so that things always remain centered on the page. Okay. All right. So now it's looking a little better. So now we have now we have this page and on this page we have the on the right we have this hero image on the left we have this content and we can verify that both of them are taking up 50% of the space. So here we have the hero section, the hero section within the hero section, the hero text seems to be taking about about 50% the hero image wrapper seems to be about 50% of the width. Yep, great. So now we are getting very close to completing our hero section styles. I can see that there's a small padding or the small spacing here at the top somewhere. So I can probably, that's probably spacing on the body. So I may need to reset the margin to zero and the padding to zero on the body to get rid of that top spacing. Okay, that top spacing is now gone. Perfect. Great. Now let's fix this side. Uh, let's fix the left side of things. The right side seems to be fine. So let me just bring this back here into half size and let's start actually adding content into this particular section over here. So I can see here that we seem to, this seems to be about 33 pixels below the top. So there seems to be like a padding of 32 pixels. I'm just going to guess about 32 pixels. So I'm going to come into the hero text. Uh, I'm going to come into hero text and I'm going to add a padding of 32 pixels on the top, zero pixels for now on the right, 32 pixels on the bottom and zero pixels on the left. Okay. And let's do that. So now we've added some padding. So things are looking a little bit better. So that's great. Yeah. So now we've added a pad. Now we've added padding. That's good. What next? Well, let's start fixing things one by one. Maybe we need some left and right padding as well. Let's see what left and right padding we can add. So here it seems to be, there seems to be about a 20 pixel space, but between uh, the text here and the image here, I would probably take a similar 20 pixel padding on the left as well. So I'm just going to make this 20 PX. So these are places where often you may not be able to get exact details from Figma and you may either have to guess or you may simply have to uh, ask the designer. Okay, great. So now we have about, uh, now we have padding. So now things are looking a little nicer. Then uh, let's start fixing one by one things starting from the top. Now let's separate out. So here we have the phone number on the left and the email on the right. So let's separate those out. One very simple way to do this when you have one thing on the left and one thing on the right is to just use a float. So you could say div style equals float right and Again, this doesn't always work depending on the complexity of the situation. But if you want to do a very simple thing where you want one thing on the left, one thing on the right, that's what you can do. Just use float. So that's fine. Now we have added that information as well. And let's check the font size here. So the font size seems to be small and the font seems to be Roboto. Again, a fourth font. This seems like too many fonts on the page. So I'm just going to use the font enter for now. Uh, instead of Roboto because I don't want to import another font and I may need to check with the designer why they have so many fonts uh, because three, two to three fonts on a page is generally sufficient. But let us come in here, let us give this and let us give this a class or let's give this an ID because there's only going to be one of these or let us just give it a class called small text and we'll use it elsewhere as well. Small text. Okay. And now we will just pick dot small text and let us set the font family to enter. I'm not going to use Roboto here and sans serif font. Okay. Line height, etc. All that is fine. 
and I may need to check the color as well. Maybe there might be some change required in the color. But now it is smaller. So it's definitely what we are going for, slightly smaller than uh, what we have. Okay, the color seems to be just black, so 000. zero, zero. So I'm just going to set the color to... It copies as background, but it should actually be color. Okay, so yeah, so now the color is fixed and this is all good. Then we have this next section and there seems to be about a 52 pixels of gap. Normally these gaps should be multiples of four and like four, 16, um, 32, 48, but 52 seems to be what they're using here. So I'll just use 52 as per the design. So let me go in here and this is like, let me give this the, or let me give this a small, uh, let me give this an ID and let's give it the ID name uh, or like hi and name. So always coming up with good names is always hard, but uh, always try to give a descriptive name so that when you're just browsing through the CSS file, you know exactly what you are referring to. So hi and name, right? Hi and name has a margin top of 52 px. So let me add that. So now you should see here that there is a margin top of 52 px. All right, so this is good. Um, then let's also maybe check over here what's going on. So there seems to be too much gap here. The gap here is only 10 pixels. We may need, somehow this gap seems to be higher than 10 pixels. So I'm just gonna check here. Okay, looks like this is the default, this is the default padding or the default margin for H1. And right now the margin, the default margin for H1 seems to be set to about 32. But the default margin that we want is 10 pixels. So I'm just gonna set this to margin top 10px and let me reload that. By the way, I'm using the inspect element browser tools. This is something that you'll often have to do. Okay, no, sorry, that's not for h1. That's for, and that's not for HTML, that's for h1. Margin top 10px, perfect. Great, this is looking fine too. Hi, I'm Fadi Sahin, a freelance front-end developer and WordPress developer. What next? Lorem Ipsum Dill, okay. This again, the gap here seems to be 30. It's currently 32. Let's change the margin bottom as well to 30 px to match the design exactly. Okay, looks fine. I think we have probably fixed the margin here. And we can always verify by going into inspect element. So we go into inspect element, check the computed settings. You can check that, okay. Margin bottom seems to be 32 still. Oh, I've not saved it. Yeah. So now it's a little closer. It's a little better. So this is what you do. You look at the design, then you come into your HTML file and add some CSS properties. Then you go and inspect to make sure that things are exactly as you want them to be. All right. So that's fine. What next? Well, we have this contact button. Let's try and fix the color and the font is etc for this button. Okay. So the background color seems to be 2F, 2F, 2F. So that's what I'm going to use for the background. And then the width and height also seem to be provided here. So width is 44. Let's just copy them all. And let me come back here and let's go into the button here. And let's give this a, let's give this button a ID. Let's call it contact button. Let's come in here back into and let's paste in all the properties. So we are adding a height, we are adding a width, we are adding a left, I don't think we need this left and top, generally speaking, because we are already arranging things in the right order, so we won't need that. So that's why be wary of copying things directly from Figma. Sometimes you might got, get weird results. Um, but width and height is something that I can use and I can add a background, so let me grab the background uh, color as well. So let's see, background color, 2F, 2F, 2F seems to be the color that we are using. and Looks like the text color also needs to be changed. So the text color in this case, or the text size is 16 pixels. The line height is 19. Let me just grab that and put that in here. Font family, enter, font size is, font weight is 500, line height is 19, font size is 16 pixels. Okay. And there's a text color as well. The text color just seems to be white. FF, FF, FF. So color is just going to be 
can all right and there is some space above this so this about there's about 20 pixels of space above it so i'm just going to say margin top 20 pixels all right okay so our hero section is looking good now i'm not going to get into responsive design in this particular tutorial because now you may ask okay what how does it look like on mobile etc but at the very least if i compare it to what i have here i think this is looking fairly similar hi i'm Ferdi saheen freelance front-end web developer wordpress web developer uh, a, a subtitle and then a contact me button and clicking on the button may probably open an email uh, or something like that so let's actually just make the button functional instead of the button i'm just going to use an a tag and i'm going to put in a mail to link so that clicking on it will open up a mail and mail to ferdisaheen at mail.com so let me just grab that and let me put that in here and let's just say target equals underscore blank okay so that's going to open a email thing and i think we don't need this div at this point so whenever you feel that a div is not necessary you can always just go ahead and delete that div let's come back and let us change that to slash a and let us just format the document and save it okay that's not doing it well i think a tags you might also need to set display block for a tags in case you want to add margin and padding okay it's still not doing it i'm just gonna i'm just gonna keep it to a button for now let's forget that and so you have to sometimes make these decisions what should be which kind of a tag in in most likelihood you you will probably be just using a framework that will take care of these things for you but for now i think let's just keep this button which is not exactly functional so with that we are more or less done with the hero section uh you might notice that in the hero section our content here our image actually goes all the way to the right but the text does not go all the way to the left so we may need to fix that so that is what i mean by saying do the easy parts first what you might want to do is implement the entire page and then figure out exactly how you are going to implement this behavior because you also have to think about what happens when you resize the page and all uh, in in this case for now i'm just going to keep things equal width for now and i'm going to come back and maybe fix it later when i have the time okay or I'm going to go back to the designer and say, hey, this design looks a little odd because over here it kind of goes all the way till the end, over here it doesn't. How about we keep it centered on the page? And how about we make sure that all the content is centered on the page so that we don't run into these issues? Okay, so that is the hero section. There's also this thing here at the, in the background. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how exactly we can implement something like this. Let's see, in the background we have this ellipse of some kind. Uh, okay we'll have to figure out how to add this glow and it may not even be that easily possible and we'll have to figure out how to add this image and again that is something that we can possibly look at towards the end or something okay cool well I, I think we'll do one more section because we can of course as we keep doing this is going to take a lot of time so how about we do one more section let's do the pricing section and i leave the other sections to you as an exercise so let me come back here and let me get rid of uh, let me get rid of these other sections so i have this what i do section that is left as an exercise i'm getting rid of that by the way you can comment out an entire section like this so just start with exclamation mark hyphen hyphen and close with hyphen hyphen exclamation mark and then that way you can comment out an entire section so let me do that and let me do that with projects as well let me just comment that out for now I'm going to implement the pricing section. Let me comment out the questions and the footer as well. Okay, and let's go ahead and now let's start implementing the pricing section. So this is the pricing section. And in this pricing section, we have like the small thing here, this blue thing called pricing. And we have a uh, like a subtitle or a, or a heading 
H2, then we have this subtitle, and then we have a bunch of these boxes. So let's see, let's again go step by step. Let us first take this and create a box around it. Okay. And let's come back here into our, oops, a drawing tool. And let's draw some boxes. So in this case, there is obviously this big box right here. That's where I, that's what everything is under. In this big box, I can see that the direction of elements is downwards coming down. So there's definitely this one div here at the top, which is the pricing. And then there is this other thing here. And then there is this other thing here. So there are three things pricing, you can take a look at the pricing table based on the work I do and then you have that subtitle. And then there is this box that I can draw. So always try to draw full boxes in that direction. All right. So in the downward direction in the outer div, we have one, two, three, four boxes. So let's try and achieve this for now. And then we'll go inside this inner box later. Okay, so I am going to come back now. And let's start adding some of this content. So in the pricing section, I just think I, I need this the direction is vertical. So I don't need to do display flex or anything like that. Let me just add a div here. And let's just type it type out the word pricing. Let's add another div here. Actually, this seems to be an H2. So we can just use an H2 here probably. So H2, H2. And let's grab this content, which is you can take a look at what I do, etc. So let us just copy and let us paste this content. Okay, if things are starting to take shape, we will come back and fix things a little further. Then we have this lorem ipsum dollar cell. Okay, this seems to be the description like a subtitle. I think this seems to be the big text. It's about let's see sub. So it's 18 pixels. So this seems to be the big text, the same kind of big text that we have here. So I'm going to create a div, I'm going to give it a class of big text. And I am going to paste in this content here. Okay. All right. So now we have pricing, we have this big, we have this uh, header, we have this big text. And finally, we have this actual pricing boxes. So for now, I'm just going to create a div. And I'm going to say pricing boxes. All right. So that's everything that we need to going to put in into the pricing section for now. Now, let's start fixing the style one by one. The first thing is that you can see that the pricing section is also centered. It's a it's centered on the page. And yeah, so I'm just going to give it a maximum width as well. So I'm just going to go into the pricing section, I'm going to say ID equals pricing section. And what is the idea of the pricing? Uh, what happens in the pricing section? So it seems like it is 190 pixels out from this side. And it is about 190 pixels out from this side as well. So 190 190, the total width is 1440. So out of 1440 pixels, it is you uh, we are subtracting 190 1440 minus 190 minus 190. That is 1060 pixels. So the width of this or the max width of the pricing section is 1060. Max width is 1060 px. And I'm also going to set margin to zero and auto margin zero auto basically says top and bottom margin is zero and left and right margin is auto, which means that you want to compress things into the center. And let's come in here. And let's just reload the page. And you can now see that it is centered on the page. So it's slightly better than what we had earlier. Okay. Then uh, we have this thing here called pricing over here. It's a very small thing. It's in blue color. And then we have the same thing later called questions. So let me just call this over title because it's showing up over the title. So let's just call this over title. And let us grab its styles. So I'm going to create a class called over title. And let me paste the styles here. So left and top are not required. We don't need a border radius. So height is 49 pixels width is uh, no, we don't need a height and width either. I think we just need the text styles. 
So let's get the text uh, typography style. So we are using poppins and 12 pixels and line height of 18 pixels and we don't need these letter styles. So you have to be careful about which CSS styles you bring in from Figma. You use it as a reference, but don't use it as the ground truth essentially. Okay, and then let's add that over title to this pricing section. So div class equals over title. Okay. And it seems like it's all uppercase. So let me just make it pricing. Actually, we can do it in I think it's called text decoration. So let me see CSS uppercase. You can use a text transform property. So I'm going to use the text transform uppercase. Okay. And I'm going to put in the right color as well, which seems to be 2858FF. So color is 2858FF. Okay. So now we have the right price. Now we have the right color. I think we need to add a text align center as well so that this is centered on the page. Okay, great. So now this is centered on the page too. Perfect. And finally, I think this is it. But finally, one other thing we, we have to note here is that there seems to be a significant amount of gap between sections. So I'll have to estimate this. I, I don't see any direct way of Yeah, there it is. Well, 98 pixels is seems to be the gap between the pricing section and the yeah, 98 pixels seems to be the vertical gap. So maybe what we can do is within the pricing section itself, we can add that. Let's say each section can have a 40 pixels and a 40 pixels up and down uh, gap and we'll, we can fix the exact things later. So in the pricing section, I am just going to say well, it's 98, right? So let me let me make it 48 pixels. So let's see pricing section, I'm going to say margin top and bottom to be 48 pixels. Right. And I'm also going to add a margin bottom for the hero section. Um, zero auto 48 pixels auto so that between two sections, we have this 98 pixels of gap. All right. So this is looking fine. Now we need to fix this h2. So we have this h2 seems like there is a maximum width. So it's we are setting a max width of 700 pixels for this. So let's set a max width for 700 pixels for this h2. Let us also set maybe um, text align center. So in this in this specific case, I am going to say I'm going to give it a hiding, uh, I'm going to give it a ID or give it a class called section heading. And I'm going to come in because there may be other h2 s which may not be section headings and or dot section heading. And I'm going to say text align center. I'm going to say max width. Let's see 700 pixels. So max width 700 px. I'm going to say margin zero auto so that margin so that it becomes centered on the page. So whenever you want to center something within its parent, uh, horizontally speaking, just give it margin zero auto. And sometimes the zero may be different because you may want a upper and lower margin to be different. And I think the margin is not exactly zero, but it's eight pixels. So for the over title, let me add a margin bottom of eight pixels. Okay, so let's do that. And now you can see uh, suddenly that we now have this pricing section and you can say you can take a look at the pricing table based on the work I do. So this is good. Now we have the uh, section as well. Let's let's finally fix this too. So this seems to be the pricing uh, or the section subtitle essentially. So let's add a class called section subtitle. Section subtitle. And let us again give it text align center. Let us give it margin zero auto. Let us give it uh, what is the max width here? Max width seems to be 686, about 700. Let's give it max width of 700 px. And finally, and there seems to be definitely a eight pixel gap. So it's not exactly zero auto, it's eight pixels above. And for now, let me give zero pixels. Let's check the bottom distance as well. So let's see 48 pixels below, right? So eight pixels above 48 pixels below. And then auto. All right. So with that and text align center as well, oh, we need to add the section subtitle. 
So we can add a second class here, section subtitle. So this is how you add multiple classes. You can add not just one class, but you can add multiple classes to a div. So we have big text and we have section subtitle. So big text is going to ensure that it gets this font size and it gets this color. And section subtitle is going to ensure that it is centered on the page as we might expect, right? So now you, now you can see now we have this pricing section and in this pricing section, we have the title. In this pricing section, we have this and we have this content as well, okay? Great, so things are looking good. Let's finally go ahead and maybe try to also add the pricing boxes. I think if we can add one box, we should be able to add all the boxes. So let's come back here and let's, we, there are three pricing boxes. So let's create three divs. So let's call it pricing box one and div box two and div box three. Okay. And now into this div, I, let me give this a ID pricing boxes. Okay. I have given it a, I've given it a ID pricing boxes. So I'm going to come back into my styles file and for the pricing boxes div, I'm going to say display flex. Okay. We want to flex. Uh, we want the, th uh, the children of this div to be horizontal. So display flex and let me give all of these a class pricing box so that I can set each of their widths to 33%. Let's see, class equals pricing box. And let's add that to all of them. You can also use advanced flex box properties to do this, but for now I'm just going to use something very simple. And I'm going to set for width of 33% for a pricing box. Okay, and yeah. So now you can see that we have at the very bottom, we have box one, box two and box three. Okay, I forgot to add the class here. It added it in the wrong place. Yeah, so now we have box one, box two, box three at the bottom of the page. I'm just going to add a small div with a large height uh, at the end, just so that we can bring up some of these pricing boxes. So I'm just going to give it style equals height 600 px. This is just to add another div at the bottom so that I can scroll this up a little bit while developing. Okay, so now we want to create these boxes. So what do we want to do in these boxes? Let's see one by one what we are going to do in these boxes. Uh, by the way, you can see here pricing boxes, we may also need to add a little bit of a padding so, so that it's not sticking to the corner, but we'll figure it out. Okay, so coming back here to the design, what we've already done is we figured out that we need a vertical, uh, we need a horizontal layout here. That's why we use with display flex. And then we have these three boxes. Each box seems to have equal. Yeah, each box seems to have equal width. We've done that with 33% width. Now in a particular box, the layout seems to be vertical. Okay, so we have a bunch of these and in the vertical layout, if I start drawing boxes, we have one, two, three, four, and five boxes. Okay, so one is this PST to HTML, which is the service. One is the price, then one is the description. One is the, um, uh, these are, let's say, benefits and a contact button, right? So let's do that and let's add, let's start adding all of these. So in the pricing box one, I'm just going to do one box and let's see if we can maybe just copy paste and use similar styles wherever possible. So I'm going to create a div and I'm going to give it the class service. And what is the service here? So the service here is PSD to HTML. So let's just say PSD or PST to HTML. So that is a service that is the offered in the first pricing box. Then I'm going to have another div here. I'm going to give it the class price. So the price for the first service is $99, $1.99 per page. We'll fix the styling later. 
then let's add the description so let's say class service description so it's good to be a little specific with class names because description is a very generic um, very generic class name that may apply to a lot of things so let's copy that content let's put that in content in here service description then let's go in and let let's call these uh, service benefits so this is a list so i'm just going to create a single div for this let's give it the class service benefits okay and let's just put service benefits here and finally there is this service contact button right so let's put in a button here and let's just say service contact all right so now we have some content here and of course this is not looking exactly how we want but now for the first box we have some content in place now let's start actually laying out the box so this box by itself seems to be i uh, seem to have a white background so let's do that let's um let's and the different boxes have different backgrounds so maybe background is not something that we want to set well let's set it let's okay let's set on pricing box itself let's set the background and if required later we can change it so pricing box should have the background or background color white i've added the background color of white for pricing box so now you can see that each pricing box has the background color white oh the third one is not given the right yeah so these pricing boxes have the background white but they seem to be touching we don't want them to touch we actually want a 20 pixel gap between them or maybe a 10 pixel gap around the box so here's a quick trick that i'm going to use i'm going to create a new div called pricing card so div class equals pricing card and i'm going to put everything inside this card okay so i'm going to keep the outer div just to determine the widths of each widths of each of the boxes and i'm going to actually use a pricing card which is going to have the margin which is going to have the shadow and all of that okay so instead of adding the background color on pricing box let me add it on pricing card and background color is okay ff and let me add a margin of zero pixels at top and bottom we don't need that but left and right let's get a 10 px margin okay so now the benefit that you get is that inside the pricing box which determines simply the width 30 percent 30 percent 33 percent or let's actually just do that 33.33 percent just to be very accurate and then we have this card this card is going to be inside the box it is going to have some margin around it it is also going to be have its rounded borders and all so the radius okay the border radius seems to be about 10 pixels so let's add a border radius border radius 10 px okay now border radius has been added then uh, it seems to also have a shadow so there seems to be this drop shadow i think we can just copy this drop shadow setting and paste it in here oh so it seems to have a box shadow so now you can see here that it has gotten its shadow as well so that's good now we have a shadow then inside it seems to have about 20 pixels of padding inside it you can see that all the content is padded by about 20 pixels so let's add a padding all around of 20 pixels yep so now we have a nice padding as well and what you can do just for now is uh, i can just copy over the same content into the other boxes as well and we'll edit the content later but the benefit of that will be we'll be able to see that how we as we modify one particular class that's going to apply to all of the different boxes at once okay yeah so now we have okay now we have these pricing boxes and these pricing boxes seem to be looking at least on the outside as we expect them and now we can start modifying the service the service the class for the service is let's see so this is of probably the same class no it's a slightly different class but seems like it has a let's see it has this uh, font poppins so price service is the class so for the class service i'm going to add the font color or the font settings 
font family poppins okay font size 14 line height is 21 get rid of these two let's add maybe the color as well let's add the text transform uppercase and let's add the color i think it's the same color as the pricing uh, section over title which is this so let's add the color here okay so now the services are looking good psd to html sketch to html figma to html okay well i'm just going to edit those as well so i'm just going to say for box 2 i'm going to say sketch to html and here i'm going to say figma to html yeah so psd to html sketch to html figma to html 99 per page let's get the styles of 99 so the style here is poppins and line height is 54 size is 36 weight 700 so this is the price so let's add the styles for price dot price okay all of this looks good font size line height all of this looks fine and the color seems to be just black so i'm going to say color zero 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 okay the color is fine too then okay this slash per page so this information i think this is something that we can put under a span probably so i'm just going to put a span around this span and i'm just going to give this span uh, a class of price per okay so let me just copy that and paste it in the other ones as well price oops let's copy this whole span or price per page let's give it a class of price per page and let's copy the entire span and let us put that span in each one okay price per page in fact we should probably also we should probably also have uh, yeah all well, the pricing seems to be same okay so price per page and then we have the span so into the span price per page let's give the right colors price per page and let's give it the color poppins font weight 14 okay all of this looks fine and let's just add that let's reload the page okay price per page is the span or oh, it's price per page i think i made a mistake here in in typing yep and we need to change its color as well the color seems to be 8a 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 so let me just change the color here as well okay great so now we have uh, the price figured out so price per page is done as well then we have this subtitle or this description essentially so for this description again the font style seems to be poppins 14 pixels and 23 pixels the same i think it's exactly the same thing that we have here so service description is exactly the same as the price per page so service description yep 8a is a color no the color seems to be slightly different 8b 8b normally again you don't use so many different colors you have a fixed set of colors but this particular design seems to have it so let's just keep it that way let's make sure that there is enough gap so there's a gap of eight pixels above in this case there may not that gap may not have existed so let's add margin top 8px and we've added a little bit of a gap as well as expected and there seems to be a gap between these two too so let us add that gap too uh, what is that gap let's see eight pixels between these two so between the price and uh, so let's add a margin top for price of eight pixels yeah so that looks a little nicer that's again a little more spaced out and then we have these benefits all right now let me fix the benefits as a service benefits so this is going to be a list so i'm just going to create a list here in the first box li and in this li i'm oh sorry i'm going to use ul to create an unordered list and let's see how many benefits there are let's add those 
lorem ipsum 1 2 3 4 5 6 so the benefit in each case the value seems to be the same and so let's just create six copies of this all right yeah now of course i don't think we need this div specifically i think we can just do this on the ul itself so let's get rid of this outer div let's shift this back and first of all i think we don't need this margin here so it's automatically getting indented i think we don't need this indentation so let's see how we can get rid of this indentation where is it so it is so there seems to be this padding which we can get get rid of so service benefits service benefits so i'm just simply inspecting it i am then going into this I'm selecting that particular div and then I'm, I'm just inspecting its styles and it has a certain padding. So let's set the padding to zero. Okay, so now it is moved left, definitely. But let's also set the list style to unstyled or unset or okay. UL how to remove bullet points list style type none okay so list style type none okay then we have this check mark here that we need to somehow figure out how to add i am going to deal with this later for now i'm just going to maybe use an emoji so let's just search check mark emoji yeah, and I'm just going to copy this emoji of over here, the check mark button. And I'm going to deal with this icons and stuff. These are things that can always be added later. So I'm just going to go in for now as a quick trick and I'm just going to add this emoji over here. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so it's looking close. Now uh, let's add the color, let's add the actual settings, which is, yeah, in the, the color seems to be, let's see, let me select some text. So the width, it seems to be again poppins, but a bigger size and a slightly different color. So I'm just going to copy that and I'm going to put that under the font settings. So now font size is 16, font weight is 400, line height is 24 pixels and I'm going to copy the color which is 6666 so I'm going to say color 6666 okay yeah and what is I think this is looking exactly no this is not looking exactly the same seems like there is also an 8 pixel difference between each one so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to say service benefits li margin bottom 8px yeah and now it is a slightly more spread out and yeah looks fine to me i think maybe all these uh, all these settings can actually just be moved into the li itself right okay so it's looking pretty close weight font weight 400 line height 24 pixels and margin bottom of 8 and then finally there is this contact me button so let's add that contact me button so this is service contact button let's give it a class service service contact button all right and it simply says contact me right it, i think it just says contact me so let's go in here let's say let's call this contact me and let's come back and let's start styling this contact button okay let's close this for now so for the service contact button first thing seems to be that there is a the width is just full width so i'm just going to set width 100 percent so that it takes up the entire width then there seems to be a height or actually we can just figure out maybe what is the spacing that is there 
within. So there seems to be a 12 pixels padding at the top and bottom. So let me just put padding 12 px all around just to yeah, that looks roughly similar. Does it? Yeah. Or we can just set a height that that could be the other thing we can just set the height for the entire thing. Let's see the height is 44 pixels. So let's set a height. So often you'll have multiple ways of implementing this. Uh, I'm just going to set the height to 44 pixels. Yeah, I think it is about the same. Then there is a border radius. A border radius is 4px. Okay, great. Border radius has been set. I guess the border width can be set to zero or maybe one, one pixel. Yeah, let's see what is the border width here. Two pixels and 2f, 2f, 2f. So border is 2px solid hash 2f, 2f, 2f. That is a color. Then there's a background color. The background color in this case simply seems to be white. So we can just say background color FFF, FFF, which is just white. Okay, now we need to actually add some text colors. So the text color seems to be 2F, 2F, 2F. So let's add that text color. Okay. Then let us add the text size or the text seems to be enter weight 516 line height 19.36. Let's add all of that in here. So even though there are two different elements on Figma on our when we are creating the button, it's just this one thing. All right. And that's it. Now, of course, we may want some sort of a hover state here. So you may want to say something like this, where when we hover over the service button, some of the things reverse. So when we hover over the service button, maybe the background color could become 2F, 2F, 2F. And the text color could become could become white. So that is F, 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 F. But text color is just color, right? And maybe we also want to turn, let's see. I think this should do it. Yeah. Maybe we also want to turn this cursor into a hand button. So you can say cursor pointer. This is again a common thing that you will often end up using. It turns into a hand button over here, right? So now you see if I zoom in a little bit. So you see now we have this contact me button and now we have these preferences. And now of course we can copy that over to the other ones as well. So let me just copy the service benefits and let me copy the contact me button. Let's copy it over to the second one. Let's copy it over to the third one. Okay. So now we have a pricing section that is more or less what we expect. So this is what the pricing section looks like here. And this is what the pricing section looks like here. Now, of course, the second pricing section, the sketch pricing section seems to have a yellow background and a few other things. So that is something again, we may have to figure out how to do. And I'll show you the quick way to do this. What you do is go into that second box in. Yeah, so this is the Yeah, let, let's just add it. Let's just add box two here. Box two pricing box box two and into box two, you can actually go in and add specific changes. So you can say dot pricing box dot box two. So when it has both of these color, both of these classes, in that case, we want the background to be yellow, which is just this, this color over here. So I can change the background color to that. Okay, that's probably not added to the right thing. I think it's pricing card that we need to add to. And let's let me just call it card two instead of box two. So let's get rid of that. And I should be adding it on the second one. So this is the second pricing box. And in the second pricing box, let me add card hyphen two. And now you can see that it has changed to yellow color. Let's quickly modify these styles as well. So here it is just sketch to HTML is just black. So I'm going to say that within I don't need this. So I'm going to say that within card two, if I have a service, then 
the color should be black. Let's reload that. So the color has become black. Then everything else looks fine to me. Maybe this may need some change. The color here is also black or but 75% black. So we can kind of copy that. So within card two, if I am looking at a list item or specifically if I have service benefits, uh, or let's just do that within card two, if I have a list item, then I want its color to be that. And I can just change the color for that list item. And similarly, I can change colors if required. So it's 50% here, 50% black here. So I can just copy this color and I can apply that to what is this? Well, I believe this is service description and price per page. So within card two, if I have a service description, then the color is that. So you just add this additional selector and within card two, if I have this price per page, its color should also be that. Right. And now we have, I believe we have the expected colors. You can see here that I can check that card to service description is the selector for it. What else? Well, we have this contact me is black and white. So it's the other way around. So within card two, we have the only change is that background color and normal color are from the hover state and within cart and of course this is for the contact button so service contact button and let's flip the styles for the hover state so when we hover over it we want it to be the other way around so the color is going to be fff and the other color here is going to be 2f 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 Okay, service contact button. Well, that doesn't seem to have applied. We can just give it, we can just give that button a specific card or a, or a specific. Yeah, we can just give that button a specific uh, class here. So service contact button for card two. Let's see. card to button card to button. So let's just do that. So we don't need this multiple selectors, we can just do card to selector. So depending on what you want to achieve, sometimes you may have to come up with uh, like specific classes. But generally speaking, it's with a bit of experimented experimentation, you should be able to figure it out. Oh, oh, wait, I think I understand what the mistake I made. I did not put the word hover here. Yeah, that should do it. Card two. Yep, that that does it. So now we don't need this card to button class. So yeah, you'll often make these kind of silly mistakes when you are working on CSS, but this is looking good. So now we have this Ferdi Sahin freelance web developer pricing. And all of this is fine. Let's maybe add the footer as well. Um, which should be very quick to add. So the footer is just this black band, which contains uh, which is of height 58 pixels or which basically has some text and it has like a 20 pixel padding internally. So let me just add the footer. And I think that will just complete the page for now. So let's go here. Let's go here. And let's give this the ID footer. And this footer has some text. The text is simply for the Sahin copyright. So let's go in, let's put in the text here. And let us just give it some styles. So let me come back into index.html. Oh, sorry, into styles.css. And let me go into footer. So the first thing with the footer is that it occupies the entire width of the page. So I'm just going to give it width 100%. Then I am also going to text align center. So I'm going to say text align center. I'm going to add a padding of 
20 pixels 20 px so yeah now we have that we of course have to add a black background to it so zero 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 uh, so let me add a background color zero 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 okay let us change the text color over here um, I think I'm going to get rid of that additional div I had or maybe reduced its height to just 100 pixels so that it's a little closer and you can see things more easily. Now we can just get rid of it completely. Yeah. Um, let's add maybe a margin top to it so that it's not too close to the content. So I think the margin top of 48 pixels should be fine. And let's change its color. So the color seems to be white. So let's add a color FF, FF, FF. The color of the page is uh, footer is white. Let's grab the properties, the text properties. So the text properties just seem to be the typography is just poppins. So poppins 12 px, 18 px. So let me just put that in here as well. Yep, and that's it. So now the footer has been added and the pricing has been added and we have, I believe we've achieved what we wanted to set, what we set out to achieve, at least in terms of the adding the two sections. The only thing that I'm a little worried about is that this edge seems to be lining up with this edge over here, right? Uh, which is not happening in our design. Our design is a little more spread out and so maybe what we might want to do is we might want to restrict the width of this section also to match with this section. Let's see. So this is about uh, what is the width of the pricing section. So we have this pricing section and the pricing section I believe has a maximum width somewhere set. The pricing section has a maximum width of 700 pixels. No, no. It has a width of 1060 pixels. So maybe let's set the same maximum width for the hero section as well. Let's set the maximum width to 1060 pixels. So now everything is centered on the page. You have this pricing section which is centered and then above it you have this section which is also centered like that. Now this is something that you may want to discuss with the designer. In the design you see the image actually sticks out a little bit. But there are two issues with this. If the image sticks out like this, what happens is that one, it, the content is no longer centered on the page properly. And second, what happens when you have a wider screen? Is the screen, is the image still supposed to stick to the side? Probably not, right? Because if you have a really wide screen, it's not that you're gonna, like let's say the screen was this wide from this end to this end. You wouldn't want the image to just be so big that it sticks out or be somewhere in the corner. Um, so what we have now feels like a reasonable, feels like a reasonable middle ground to me. Uh, but of course, it's only the designer who can give the final answer here in terms of how they want the image to look. Right, so this is something that you may want to go back and discuss with the designer. One thing that I will do for this image is I'll probably give it a radius like this on this side as well, just to make it look a little nicer. So it has a radius of what? It has a radius of about 200. So let me just go in here and let me add that same radius for the image in my code as well. So I'm going to go to the hero image and I'm going to say border bottom right or border bottom radius okay like that so that's what i'm going with and or the other option is that i when i export the image i don't export it with the radius at all i just keep it blank um but i think this looks largely looks fine of course the content is sticking out a little bit a little more than I would have hoped so I may even reduce the width of the image slightly so instead of going 50 50 I may go let's say 60 40 with content and image okay 
So this is where you may like in, when you come to the implementation, often things don't work out exactly as a designer expects. So some things maybe need may need to be changed. Might be that we maybe we can reduce like a little bit of the description so that we have one less line in the description. Let's see. So this is the subtitle. And in the subtitle, let me get rid of this entire section like that. Let me reduce a little bit of the top margin over here. So before the high, I'm Ferdi Sahin. Let me, yeah, let me just change that to about 16 pixels, let's say, or 20 pixels. Okay. And that looks good. I think this is, this page is looking fairly good. If we have this phone we have this email here both of this and both of these pieces of information we have this high freelance front-end developer and wordpress developer a subtitle and a contact me button then we have this a, a little bit of a gap we have pricing you can take a look at what the pricing table at the pricing table based on the work i do then we have again some description then we have these three pricing sections then we have these contact buttons and then finally at the bottom we have this for the same copyright 2022 all rights reserved so that's fine too and maybe the only last thing that we may need to do is add these icons over here this icon over here and maybe also add these icons these check mark icons that we have over here so let's do that and i think then with that we'll close for the day of course let's see if we can also incorporate this but i'm just going to add this icon for now so i am going to export this so i can go into export and let me export this as a png file or I can also export it as an SVG file. SVG is good when you have to resize things. So let me expose, export this as an SVG. And let me export this as phone.svg or phone. Then let me export this. And again, I'm going to export this as an SVG and export as email.svg. And finally, I'm also going to export this check mark over here. So I'm just going to go and export that again as SVG as check.svg. Okay. Now we just need to incorporate or bring in these SVGs. So let's see HTML include an SVG image. How to use SVG images in CSS? Well, Looks like we can just do this. We can say IMG SRC and we should be fine. And we can give it a height and width. So what is the height here? 16 by 16, right? So I'm just going to do that for, I'm going to come in into my text here and I'm going to come in before telephone number. So I'm just going to first create a span so that I'm, I have a span around the telephone number. And then I am going to create this IMG SRC equals phone.svg and let me just set width and height directly here width equals 16 height equals 16 and let's say alt equals phone we should always put an alt tag for an image there you go it's almost there more or less i, I think it we probably don't need such a big thing maybe 10 by 10 might actually do it Yeah, maybe 12 by 12. So that takes care of that for us. Yeah, I think that's what it looked like here as well, roughly, right? Let's get, let's add the email. So let's again get this IMG here and we'll just change it to mail.svg or email.svg. Yeah, that's roughly what it looks like as well. You could say that, okay, maybe it is like shifted down a little bit. So we could do something like this. We could just give it like a small margin to adjust, to adjust things a little bit. So what we could do, here's a quick trick. Anytime you want to center an image next to a page, you can, there are more complex ways to do it, but a very quick way to do it. I need to move the image down just a little bit. So you want to keep, you want to maintain the rest of the things as they are, but you just want to make, move the image down a little bit. You can say margin bottom, 
minus 4 px okay what that does is that does not actually add any additional space it simply shifts the image up or down okay so negative margin is a very interesting thing that it does not add additional space it simply shifts the image left or right or up or down as you say and similarly i'm also going to add a margin bottom minus 4 px over here so play with negative margins but now you can see that things are all nicely lined up and let's go in and add all of this here as well so i'm just going to copy this img and i'm going to put it in the place of this tick mark over here so i'm simply going to replace well let's do this let's do a find replace so i want to replace the tick mark with this img tag over here let's first replace one then we'll see if that is what we want to do for the rest as well right so let's put that in here let's get rid of this margin bottom i think we may not need it and let us just put check dot svg and let's reload the page okay i think we may need a slight bottom margin to adjust it so whenever you have icons next to text margin bottom is your friend so margin bottom and negative margin bottom in most cases minus 2px let's check that yeah that looks fine so now let's grab that and let's say that wherever we have this tick symbol or this tick emoji i'm just going to replace them all with that okay and i've replaced everything and now you can see that my tick symbol is showing up as expected yep I could even just, uh, if I wanted to make sure that these width, height and etc. and style margin bottom, if I don't want to repeat this everywhere, uh, maybe another thing that I can do is instead of just repeating it like that, I can just create a class called dot checkmark. And for dot checkmark, I can say that I want margin, I want width to be 16 px. Is that 16? Yeah, 16. I want height to be 16 px and I want the margin bottom to be minus 2 px and now I don't actually need to do this I can oh the alt tag is also wrong I don't probably don't need an alt tag here I can just give it a class class equals check mark Okay, and I can replace this so I can now go back into the find and replace. And what I want to replace is this. And what I want to replace it with is this IMG SRC and class equals check mark. And let's replace them all. And we get exactly the same result. Right. With, of course, this time we're using class, we're not repeating a bunch of styles. So in case we need to change the height of the check mark or something, let's say we want to change this to 20. We can do that very easily. Not that we have to, I think it looks fine. Okay, so I think this is a good place for us to stop. We have replicated the hero section closely enough. I personally did not agree with the design decision to extend the image outside of the center because that creates problems in centering and uh, the content visually and that also creates problems with larger screens. So instead what I went with is I simply centered the image. I simply centered the image or the entire content of the page here and I have gone ahead and I have added this heading. And of course, reduce the sizes a little bit so that things probably fit in vertically. Then we added the pricing section. You can take a look at the pricing table. And in the pricing table, we added all the specific sections. So I'm sure when you when you looked at it, uh, the design may have seemed fairly complex. But as we just start approaching it step by step, as we break things down, identify, okay, what are the boxes looking like? And are the boxes arranged in a vertical direction or a horizontal direction things become a lot easier and then you just have to go element by element make sure it has the right styles and you can achieve any any design uh, no matter how difficult it looks and of course there are cases where you need like custom shadows you may need to overlap things on one another like let's say we wanted to do this how exactly would we do that 
Well, let's grab it. Let's maybe export it. Let's see uh, what we can do with it. Let me again export this as an SVG file. And in an SVG file, let me just export it to um, line below, or let me just call it yellow line. Right? And let's see how exactly we can fit this. So we want this to show up right below the H2, right? So let me just show that or right below the H1. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna come in here and I am going to say below the H1, I'm going to add this image, IMG SRC equals yellow line dot SVG. And I am just going to give it the ID yellow line. Okay. So here's what that looks like right now. And again, I can use my margin trick. So um, hash yellow line, I can say margin top this time, and I can add a negative top margin minus 30 px. Let's see what that does. Yep, that's getting us close minus 40 px. Nope, doesn't do it minus 50 px. Okay, maybe I can put this yellow line inside the h1 tag, because the h1 tag has its own margin, which I cannot get rid of. So let's come back here. Let's take that yellow line. Yeah, and let me put that inside. Yeah, that is better. That is better. But it's still not doing it. I think maybe my minus 80 px still doesn't seem to be doing it. Well, what if we put this in a div? So this is where you'll have to experiment. This is where it becomes like a fairly tricky CSS kind of thing to do. And let's see if we can get IMG SRC ID yellow line margin top is minus 80. What if we, we set margin top to minus 200 pixels still doesn't seem to be doing it. Okay, well, I I think I'll, I'll, I'll just give up at this point. Uh, but maybe what we might need to do then is we might need to adjust some of these gaps, because now we no longer need this margin below the h1. So I can go back into h1. And I am going to remove the bottom margin, which is 30 pixels. Yep. Let's see now do we still have a bottom margin here? No. Oh, we do. And I'm just going to set margin bottom to zero. Yeah. So that is close enough. There are other styling properties that can be used to achieve exactly what we are looking for. You can use something called position absolute, I believe. Um, or, yeah, position relative and absolute and then you can set exactly where it is from the top. Um, that might be able to do it. Let me give it a quick attempt. Position absolute uh, or position relative here. And here I'm going to give it position absolute. Okay, that is doing it. Probably I probably don't need this. And yeah, now I can say margin top. minus 10 px probably like that. And if I want to up, if I wanted to appear behind behind the text, I need to uh, put the text as the next thing here and not the first thing. Well, or we could use something called z index. So again, z index is minus 10, let's say something like that where it shows up behind the text. Okay, this is good. Now we can probably add back that h1 padding that we had. So let's see, we had a margin bottom 30 px. Yeah. So now this is almost exactly okay, it's a little higher the yellow line instead of it being minus uh, 10 px, maybe we can go minus 15 px. 
yeah and now it's almost exactly what we're looking for we have wordpress developer and we have uh, wordpress developer so what you can do is you can have a position relative on the parent position absolute on the child and then you can move it around anywhere within the parent okay so that's just something that you can do in case you need to achieve layouts like these but otherwise this is looking good i think i'm going to stop here there is a title section there is an email section and we can of course hyperlink this we can hyperlink this all of those things are possible uh, this is looking good freelance front end web developer and wordpress developer and this is looking fine contact me looks good uh, pricing the boxes with pricing and then the layout and the last thing i'm going to do is i'm going to quickly show you how to deploy this in case you are going to share this with somebody so here's what you can do just zip it up go to compress figma to web page just zip that up and we're not going to use git or anything here i'm just going to use this free platform called static.app let me just sign out here so that i can show you yeah and here static.app allows you to just take a zip file and you can upload that and deploy it inexpensive rabbit okay let me just add sydney plus 99 at jovian.com okay and let's yeah so this is a site where you can upload a zip file and then you can just You'll, you'll have to verify your email. Let me go ahead and do that right here. Doing it on another screen here. Okay, I'm going to activate my email. Done. And once my email is activated, it has taken the zip file and it has simply uploaded it on the cloud and it has given us this URL. It is. It takes a minute or two to set up. But at this point, yeah, it is still unpacking the archive. Looks like. Yeah. So at this point, our website is deployed. And you can also then connect static.app to your own personal domain. So I'm just going to share this link with you so that you can actually verify that this is this website is actually deployed. But this is all there is, you have a layout like this, which is given to you in Figma. The first thing that you do is inspect the design mockup, you identify, okay, what are the different dimensions or different components? Uh, and there's a guide here that you can check out, which uh, an overview of Figma for developers and how developers can use Figma. But the idea is you just inspect the design, you identify what are the various sections, you identify the fonts used on the page, you identify, you find them on Google fonts, you export any images or JPEG files that are being used within your web page. Then the next step, step two, is to set up the basic page structure and styles. So you create a folder on your desktop and then you open it up in VS Code or if you're using Git or something fancy like that, then you can do that too. Create an index.html file, create a styles.css file. That's what we have here. We have a index.html, we have a styles.css and copy over all the images that you need. So the hero image was the only image and then we had a bunch of these. Then you add the basic styles, so you add basic HTML tags, head, title, link, body. Uh, we added all of those uh, first in our file. Then you add the various section wise divs. So you create a div for each section because each section ultimately is going to be a box on the page. And you set up some basic styles for the body, you set up basic styles for the header, you set up backgrounds, font families, text sizes, colors, etc. Then you go ahead and you implement the web page section by section. And the key there is to first identify in the box whether the box is in a whether things are arranged in a horizontal direction or a vertical direction so you always want boxes and the box has to be uh, has to have something in a vertical direction or something in a horizontal direction and then you then create boxes within boxes right so you're always looking to create a layout like this where you have or a layout like this where you have a box and then within this box, one possibility is that you have boxes that are laid out horizontally like that. Or the other possibility is that you have a box and within this box, things are laid out vertically. 
and so on. And then of course, again, within that horizontal box, you can have like a bunch of vertical boxes like that. Right. And then within each of those vertical boxes, you can again have a bunch of horizontal boxes. So if you start thinking of your web design as something like this, as a bunch of boxes inside boxes inside boxes, with each box having its children laid out in horizontal or vertical order, then your web design becomes really simple and you'll never run into a, a lot of the CSS issues that often plague web developers. So in this case, for the pricing table, we had a vertical layout first. So the box, 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 and then a big box. And then inside the big box at the bottom, we had a horizontal layout, box one, box two, box three, equal width. That's where for horizontal layouts, you use display flex. And then for each of these inner pricing cards, we also used a trick where we added another inner div, which will have its own radius and uh, border and all so that the outer divs were just for creating the widths and the inner divs were creating the cards. And then in the pricing card, we have a horizontal of a vertical layout. Okay. So that's all you need to know. That's all you really need to know in terms of taking a web design and then converting it or uh, taking a web design mockup and converting it into a web page. Of course, there are these special cases like this, where you have to figure out how you're going to add that. But the way you do it is by using some negative margins here and there, maybe using a position relative for the parent absolute for the child. And you can always just search position relative absolute examples. And there are a bunch of tutorials on this, like nobody knows exactly how to do these things. You have to learn you have to search for them. And position is generally one thing uh, when you have like one thing behind another that you can deal with. So similarly, you can maybe get this one element this this nice glow that you have here, you can get this element somehow, you can try to get this element this glowing thing. Uh, and you can export that ellipse as a PNG file or an SVG file. And let's see, yeah, and then you can just incorporate that within your code as well. Okay, all of that is doable. So yeah, so you add content for each section one by one using HTML by uh, using that box structure, then you use Figma's inspect tab. So remember here, you select anything and you can see exactly what properties it is using. It's not that you will be able to copy these over directly, you may have to make some changes to it. But you use Figma's inspect tab to check values of CSS properties, add styles for each completed section one by one using CSS, and then try to replicate the mockup as closely and as precisely as possible. And that's where we get into these minor details like over here, we have this at character, which is vertically centered. So maybe we can achieve the same thing over here like that. And often there may be some trade offs we will have to make in when you actually go ahead and implement the design. For example, we reduce some spacing here, we decided that we are going to center the image on the page and add a border to it because uh, otherwise, it just looks a little odd that the image is not only sticking out, but it's also then there is some space on the right, which is empty. Okay. So that is everything that we're going to cover today. So thank you for joining. And there are a bunch of First of all, I would love to know how did you find the session, you can drop a line in the chat, and we'll see. But there are a bunch of comments or questions as well. Let's see. How do we get the Figma file, we will share we will add a link in the description. But let me also share that link with you right now. So this is the Figma file that you can use. Then you should use the button tag inside an a tag for mail. Yeah. Okay, so that was a nice tip that I can actually put the button tag inside an a tag. So that's great. I will definitely do that. Or we can actually just fix that right now, I believe. That's okay. It's okay. We are out of time. Hover state is not added. Yeah, so we've added the hover state, not for this button. Yes, we should add it for this button also. But we added the hover state for these buttons. Would you recommend to use live server so that you don't have to reload the website? Yeah, so you can use a VS code extension like live server. So there is this VS code extension called live server. You can use it if you're using VS code on the cloud like GitHub code spaces, or you can also use it locally. And the benefit is that anytime you make a change to the file, it automatically reloads the page. So you can use that too. I just wanted to keep things simple for today. And yellow line rotated 45 degrees. Well, it's not rotated here. But yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, I think we will close at this point. So thanks a lot for joining. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. And if you want more tutorials like this, come join our WhatsApp community, we'll uh, drop a link in the chat.
it's just jovian.com slash whatsapp so you can join our whatsapp community and um, you'll get to know about more future events we have events happening every week more or less you can also just go on jovian.com slash events and learn more about these events so yep i hope that is helpful now and i'll see you next time thank you and have a good day or good night bye bye so let's get started understanding version control git and github is crucial for any developer or any team working on a software project so far we have been building our websites just by setting up folders on our computer opening them up in vs code but to professionally build websites you will need to track the code in a version control system so these tools allow you to track changes they allow you to collaborate with others because you're typically not going to be the only one working on a web application or website and they also allow you to deploy your applications easily and efficiently to the cloud and by mastering these skills you can streamline your development workflow so today we are going to learn what professional web developers use when they are working on these projects so in particular we are looking at these topics we will talk about using github repositories to store and share your project source code we will talk about using github code spaces which is an online code execution and online development platform in conjunction with a browser based vs code for web development we will talk about talk about developing and previewing changes to a website using github code spaces we will talk about creating git commits and pushing changes back to a github repository then we talk about deploying a website to the cloud directly from github using the vercel cloud platform and we'll try to understand the github collaboration workflow which involves branches and pull requests and finally if we have the time we will also touch on installing and using git locally on your computer and connecting it with github now the best way to learn these skills is to follow along step by step and type out all the code yourself git can often be confusing at first so i want to start with that disclaimer because there are so many different terms that you will hear git pull merge commit etc but it starts to feel natural with a lot of practice and you will see us repeating the same flows over and over for the rest of this course and the rest of the program so by the end you will become proficient in git whether you like it or not now of course this tutorial assumes some prior knowledge of html and css so if you haven't completed the previous lessons so if you haven't completed the previous lessons please go ahead and complete them first so we will explore these topics by attempting to work on a specific problem statement we want to improve the development workflow for the jovian careers website so in our previous tutorials we have built this careers website which has a navigation bar which has this banner which has some information about jovian an image which has a table showing the job opportunities at jovian and it has a form where anybody who is interested in applying for a job at jovian can submit their application and finally it has a footer at the bottom as well and we built this by setting up a folder on our computer locally and then uploading a zip file to static.app and that is how we have this deployed version so what we want to do is set up a github repository to host the source code and facilitate collaborative development we also want to deploy the website directly from github to the cloud using the vercel cloud platform and we also want to add some appropriate meta tags which we'll talk about today to ensure that when you share this website with somebody let's say on a social platform or as a link on a messaging platform then the page previews properly so all of that is something that we'll try and cover today so here is how, where you can find the code for this tutorial we are going to start with the starter code which contains all the code for this website that you're already looking at which we have developed so far until uh, in the previous tutorials so let me open up the starter code this is going to be a zip file i'm just going to save it here on my desktop and once it's downloaded i can then you can see here it's downloaded on my computer i can then just decompress it so now i have this folder so in this folder i have the index.html file i have a couple of other styles file i have a couple of images and this index.html file contains the actual application page the jovian careers page okay but of course we are not going to do this development locally we are going to do this development now using github now i'm sure if you have 
if you are pursuing web development, if you have done any programming, you must have heard for heard about GitHub. And you must have also heard the terms Git and version control. So first, I just want to demystify these terms before we start using them. Now, Git is a popular version control system, which enables developers to track changes to their code base and collaborate with others. And GitHub is a web based platform that provides hosting for Git repositories and tools for collaboration. Okay, so let's break down each of these terms one by one. What do we mean by version control? Version control is any system that tracks changes made to a file or a set of files or a project. So it enables developers to keep track of different versions instead of you having to create multiple copies saying v1, v2, etc. You can just put everything into a version control system systematically. It also enables developers to collaborate with others so that you can have one common version and two people can build off it, then you can bring those changes back. And sometimes when required, it also allows developers to revert to previous versions of their code if needed. And it enables developers to work on different versions of their code simultaneously. So as a developer, sometimes you work on multiple features at a time. And again, you need a version control system for doing that. So there are many version control systems. There's one called SVN that was very popular early, early on in the 90s. There is, of course, Git, which we'll talk about today. And there is something called Mercurial. So version control system is any system that allows developers to track various versions, track changes of files or projects. Now, you can learn about the various version control systems and the differences between them. I have linked to a site. But we are going to focus on a specific kind of version control system called Git. Now, the key concepts behind Git are that you have typically a remote server. So typically, this remote server could be something that you have set up, your company has set up, or it could be an online platform like GitHub. So you have a remote server where the ground where the master version or where the main version of your code is stored. And this code is called a repository. So your code is stored in something called a repository along with all its previous versions. And then whenever you as a developer want to work on this code, you first have to pull it onto some computer. So it could be a local computer, it could be another cloud computer. And then you make some changes on your computer. And then you send the changes back to this remote server. And you're not just the only developer on this, there can be other developers who can be doing the same thing. Okay, so Git is this particular kind of version control system where you have now often this central server, which stores the repository of code. And then you take a copy of the code, make some changes and push your changes back to the central server. And that is how people collaborate. Okay, so that is how Git works. And here are a few concepts in Git that we will try and cover today. So the first thing in Git is that it, ha it uses something called a branching system that allows developers to work on different versions of their code simultaneously without affecting the main code base. Okay. The second thing is that developers can make changes to their local copy, and then they can push those changes to a central repository. Next, suppose two developers are making changes to the same file or the same set of files, then Git also allows developers to merge their changes, the changes made by different team members and resolve any conflicts in case both team members are making changes to the same file. Finally, Git also has the ability to track changes made to individual lines of code. So when you're trying to merge some of your changes back to the cloud repository, you can check what individual lines of code have changed. And you can also roll back to previous previous versions of the code. Okay, so it is one of the more sophisticated and one of the most widely used version control systems. And don't worry if these concepts don't make sense right now, we are going to cover all of this in much more detail over the course of today's tutorial. Okay, next, what is GitHub? So we talked about version control, any system that can be used for tracking changes across files and folders. Git is a particular kind of version control system where there's a central repository and then you can take copies, make changes and push them back using branches. Then we have something called GitHub. Now remember in Git, there is the central repository that can be a repository that you have set up, your company has set up, or you can use one of existing central repositories. And GitHub is the world's largest central repository for Git based projects. Okay, so GitHub is a web based platform that provides hosting for Git repositories. 
and it provides a range of collaboration tools on top of that hosting for developers. Other similar platforms are GitLab and Bitbucket. So you can use any of these. All of them have free plans, but GitHub is the most popular one. It, had, it has tens of millions of people using it. So you should probably start with GitHub. Now on top of Git, GitHub offers several additional features. The first thing it gives you is a web-based interface for managing Git repositories, making it easy to view and manage code. It also offers a wide range of collaboration tools on top of Git. Uh, things like pull requests, code reviews, and team management features. Again, we'll touch on these. And finally, GitHub also provides hosting for open source projects. So most software that you use on the internet is built using open source projects. And these open source projects are typically hosted on GitHub. So GitHub is a great place for you to discover open source projects and even contribute to open source projects. And it has a vast community of developers where you can interact with others and you can interact with developers of open source projects and make your own contributions. Finally, GitHub also provides integrations with other tools specifically around deployment, project management, etc., to make it a complete software development workflow. Okay, so GitHub is a hosting uh, is a hosting platform for Git and it offers a lot of additional uh, features on top of Git. Okay, so I hope that clarifies the difference between Git version control and GitHub. They are like layers. Version control is a basic kind of a system. Git is a specific kind of version control system. And GitHub is a hosting platform for Git repositories with some additional features. So let's start by first creating a repository for our project. So projects on GitHub are known as repositories. So we'll go ahead and create a repository. So the first thing you might need to do is go to github.com and sign up if you're not signed up already. In my case, I have already signed up. So I'm simply going to sign in. So I'm just going to click sign in and that is going to sign me in to GitHub. All right, so once you sign in, this is what your dashboard looks like. And on your dashboard, the first thing you want to do, at least when you've created your account for the first time, is to click the new button to create a new repository or a new project. So let's create a new repository. Uh, we are going to call it Jovian Careers Site Live because I'm doing this live. And let's add a description for this repository. So a website to show job applications at Jovian or job openings at Jovian and accept applications. Next, you can choose whether to make this repository public, which is open source for the rest of the world to see and build upon, or you can make it private. Now you can make it public and people can see the code, but they cannot make changes to your repository. You still control who can make changes. But if you make it private, only you will be able to see it. And if you add collaborators, only they will be able to see it. And you can also choose which of those collaborators can actually make changes to the repository. So for now, I'm just going to make it public so that you can actually see the code by the end of this lesson yourself. Next, you have a few initialization steps. So if you are creating a repository on GitHub and you plan to develop from this repository, then you should initialize it with a readme file and some of these other things. On the other hand, if you already have a repository on your computer, you just want to upload it to GitHub, then you can skip these initialization steps. Okay. In my case, I'm just going to select this initialization step, add a readme file. What that's going to do is just create a file called readme.md wherein I can put in some documentation about my uh, project. So I'm going to keep that. And then there is something called a git ignore file that gets added. So often when you are creating a git repository, there are certain temporary files that can get created as you're executing your code. And you may not want to put those temporary files or compiled files into your git repository. So that's where a git ignore file comes in. Don't worry about this. We'll touch on this later. But for now, because we are going to create a JavaScript and HTML and CSS project, so the top, the git ignore template that you can select is node. So node simply stands for node.js, which is a tool used to run JavaScript and HTML and CSS based projects locally on uh, people's computers. So you can just select the git ignore template node. And if it doesn't make sense, don't worry. It's not important right now. And finally, you can also select a license. So when you put up any code on the internet, specifically on GitHub, 
you can inform people what you what they are allowed to do with the code are they allowed to build on top of the code are they allowed to use the code for academic purposes are they allowed to use the code for commercial purposes you can specify all of that and one of the most common licenses is the mit license which basically allows the user of your code to do anything they want to do with the code whatsoever without any warranties okay so that is just a common template so what you'll often do when you create a new github project is you'll add a readme file you will select a git ignore template for javascript or html css projects these this is typically node but let's say if you were doing a python or a data science project you could select python and so on and you will also select a license in many cases mit license should suffice and you can learn more about all of these the readme file the git ignore and the license by checking out these links okay now finally as i said git has a concept of branches so the first thing you have to do is when a git github repository gets created it has a default branch and the default branch is often called the main branch okay the main branch is where the main version of your code lives but you can then create multiple branches as you're working on specific features and then you can uh, bring those code from those branches back into the main branch now for now uh, we will go ahead with main as the default branch but know that sometimes in some older repositories the the default branch name was called master m-a-s-t-e-r but the new convention is to call the uh, default branch main so that's what we'll go ahead with okay <clears throat> so let's hit create repository and now our github repository is created perfect so you can see now you have this a fairly complicated looking interface you have a nav bar here then you have a bunch of buttons and you have a bunch of tabs and you have again some options etc so i know it looks complicated but we will touch on all, almost all of these tabs over the course of the next several lessons and over the course of the program but for now what i want you to pay attention to is this area so here is your username you will see your username here and next to your username you will see the name of the project so the name of the project is Jovian Career Site Live. Typically, these are all lowercase and typically these are all separated by hyphens. And then in the code tab, you're going to see that in the main branch, which is the only branch we have right now, we have three files. So our repository has been initialized. You can see that there's an initial commit. Uh, we'll talk about commits as well. One minute ago with three files. One is a readme file, one is a license file, one is a git ignore file. And you can open up this license file and you can see what it contains. Similarly, you can open up this git ignore file and you can see what it contains. And you can open up this readme.md file and you can see what it contains. So again, this is all created using Markdown, which is a fancy way of writing text. So there are three files in our repository. And at the moment, our GitHub project or repository has been created. So we can already go ahead and share this with other people. Let's say we want to share our code with other people. We can take this link and share it with them. But of course, we don't have any code here right now. So the next thing we're going to do is actually import our code into this repository. Now, there are two things we can do. We can actually start writing, a, uh, writing some code or we can start importing some existing code that we already have. In both cases, we need to open up this Git repository in a code editor. Now you can download this Git repository to your computer and then open it up in VS code or any other code editor. Or you can also use some online platforms for developing on this GitHub repository. Specifically, GitHub provides something called GitHub code spaces, which you can think of as your own personal computer attached to this GitHub project or repository, but living on the cloud. All right. So GitHub code spaces is a cloud based development environment that allows you to write, test and debug your code directly in the browser. So it allows you to quickly set up a development environment without needing to install any software locally. It provides a consistent development environment across different machines because you're writing all your code in the browser and the browser is connected to some machine on the cloud where all of the dependencies are already installed. It also makes it very easy to collaborate on code with other developers because you can have real time shared code spaces. So if you're writing code within a code space, you can create a shareable link, invite somebody else to come and collaborate with you live. 
and it lets you work from anywhere. So you don't have to work from a particular computer. You can just open up your GitHub repository and launch a GitHub code space online and start typing code into it. Okay. So you can think of it as a personal computer on the cloud that you can access from anywhere. And you can check out GitHub's documentation for uh, setting up code spaces. But starting a code space is really simple. What you do is you go to your repository folder and or you go to your repository on GitHub and you click this code button here and you have two options. You have local and you have code spaces. And here you can click create code space on main. So what this is going to do is this is going to set up a, a, a computer for you on the cloud and it is going to associate that computer with this GitHub repository. So you can see here, if I zoom in a little bit, it has set up this cloud based computer for me and it has opened up Visual Studio code on that computer and it has given me a browser based interface to connect with Visual Studio code on that computer. So there's a lot going on here. So instead of opening Visual Studio code on our own computer, we have opened up Visual Studio code on a GitHub code space, which is a computer running somewhere on the cloud. All right. So this is what it looks like. Remember we on our GitHub repository, we had these three files, git ignore license and readme.md. So if you come here, now you can see that we have the same GitHub repository now open for editing in this code space accessible via these via this browser based Visual Studio code interface. Okay, so within the browser, we have Visual Studio code and I can open git ignore and I can make some changes here. And I can open this license file and I can make some changes here. And similarly, I can open this readme file and I can make some changes here. Okay. But what we want is to actually put in the code that we ha already have from our previous tutorial which is the index.html styles.css and a couple of other files. So here's what we'll do. As you work on more complex projects, it is going to, uh, it's, it'll be a good idea for you to separate some of these configuration related files like git ignore license, etc., with your actual source code. So what I'm going to do is create a folder here. So I'm going to right click and select new folder and I'm going to create a new folder called SRC. So now I have created a new folder called SRC. And into this folder, now I can add an index.html file. So I can say index.html. And now I can maybe put in some HTML code here. And maybe I can start writing things and so on. But I already have a bunch of these files. So I can just upload these files. So let me delete this file once. Let me just delete this file index.html. And let me upload these files from my computer onto this remote machine. So I'm going to say upload. I right clicked on SRC and I'm clicking upload and now I'm going to open up the folder my second web page and now I'm going to select the files that I want to upload. So I want index.html, I want styles.css, I want team.jpg and banner.jpg and I'm going to click open. All right. So now all the files from my computer have been taken and uploaded into this cloud code space, this cloud machine, which I'm accessing using VS code from the browser. Okay, now I can now we can actually go ahead and delete this folder entirely. I don't need it. But all of this code is still going to be here for me. Okay, so remember, we had this Jovian career site that we built the last time. And this was built using this index.html file. So let us yeah, so let us look at this index.html file. It obviously it has a head section where it has a title and it has a bunch of fonts that are included. Then it has a body section which contains a nav bar, it can which contains a banner and it contains this heading. So we have a nav bar, banner, heading. Then we have this about description section where we have some information about Jovian and we have uh, links to the two programs. And then we have this team image over here. And then we have a list of job opportunities, which is a table. So that is the job opportunities table that you can see here. And finally, below this, we have a form. So form contains a bunch of form inputs. And then there is a footer below the form, which is what you see here as well. So there is a form. And then there is a footer below the form right at the bottom. Now, of course, these HTML elements are styled using CSS. So we've set a base font size on the HTML. And then we've set some body fonts and we have set some header fonts as well. We've also set specific sizes for the headers. We have set specific colors for headers and for body. We've also set a bunch of other colors and then we've set a bunch of other CSS styles 
to make our page look as we want it to look. And we have set some styles for the table, we have set some styles for the form, and we have set some styles for the footer and for the button. Okay. So that is what our code looks like right now. So for now, I'm going to close this deployed website. And now let's try and figure out how can we actually preview this. Okay, so now we have some code already on this code space. But this code is no longer on our computer. This is on the remote machine. So there's no place where I can double click and open it in a browser and preview it. So there is an extension or a plugin that we can install into VS code for previewing these files. All right. So this is one of the nice things about VS code that depending on which language or which kind of project you're building, you can install some plugins to ease your development. So I'm going to go click on extensions. And then here, I am going to search for live server. Okay. So just search for live server L I V E S E R V E R. It is created by this person called Ritwik Day, and you'll know because it has 32 million downloads. So that is how many people actually use VS Code and also use this extension. And I'm going to click install in code space, and that is going to install this plugin into my code space. Now, once this plugin is installed into the code space, I can close this extension tab. And by the way, the extension menu is here on the left. So in the sidebar, it is this. Uh, fourth or fifth option. Yeah, it's the fifth option in the sidebar. So that's how you come to extensions. And now now that I've installed this extension, I can come back here onto my file explorer. And now I can see here that on my index.html file, if you see at the bottom here, I have this go live button right at the bottom here. So this is a new button that has been added by the live server. Or I can also just right click on index.html and I can say open with live server. Both of these are going to do the same thing. So I'm just going to click the go live button. What that does now is it is going to now set up our code space to expose this file to the browser at a separate URL like this. Okay, so now I can let me put this on the left. And let me put this yeah on the left and right. And let's close these. Let us also close the sidebar. Now you can see that here I have my code space running on the cloud. So my VS code running in the browser. And I have a live preview of my code running here open via using the live server in, on the right. Okay. Now here is one nice thing about the live server. Let's say I want to go back and I want to change here. I want to change about Jovin to welcome to Jovin. And I just hit save that goes ahead and that automatically refreshes the page. So the live server makes it slightly nicer to develop. And I can also go and do this with the styles.css file. I can say, let's say change the default font size from 16 pixels to 18 pixels. And I can save it. And you can see that now the styles file has been updated. And now we have, let's make it 20 pixels maybe. And now you can see that these things are a lot bigger. Okay. So this is one of the nice things about the live server. All right. So, oops, I think I pasted something. Yeah. So this is one of the nice things about the live server. You can go in, you can make some changes here. So you can say, maybe I want to get rid of the word highly and I just save and that changes this automatically. Okay. So that is how you view the code that you are building, that you're writing on, especially when you're building a simple HTML and CSS page. Later on, when we look at web frameworks and uh, things like react, etc. Then we'll touch on other ways to look at previews. But on GitHub code spaces, this is how you look at a preview of your code. Okay. So just to quickly recap, to start a code space, you go to the GitHub repository, you click on the code button and you select open with code spaces, you can create a code space on your main branch if required. And if you ever need to, you get two free code spaces. So if you ever need to delete previous code spaces, just go to github.com slash code spaces. And over here, you can go into your specific code spaces repository wise, and you can go ahead and delete them in case you have a new repository that you want to develop using a code space. Okay. And then you can select a code space configuration. Typically, the basic configuration should be good enough. Then the code space gets created, it takes 10 15 seconds. And then you can just open up Visual Studio code in the browser. Or you can actually also connect your local Visual Studio code to the code space. We're not going to go into that today. But uh, browser based development is good enough for most projects. And then you can continue working on your code spaces project. 
All right. Now, in terms of how you do actual development, well, what you do is you can, uh, one thing that we recommend is that now anytime you're putting your actual web code, uh, you should create an SRC folder so to separate it out from the readme, git ignore, etc. just to keep things clean. And now you can add files like index.html, styles.css within the SRC folder and you can add code within them. And you can also upload existing files or images by simply right clicking. So you can open up the sidebar, right click anywhere, click upload file and upload a bunch of files. And if you want to preview HTML files within code spaces, you just use the live server extension. And this extension allows you to see your web pages as you develop them. And for that, you just go into the extension section here in the sidebar and you search for live server, install it. And then you go back and just click go live. And you can also shut it down. There's a button right at the bottom to shut things down as well. And once you do that, you will be able to see a live preview and you can make changes. So for example, if I change welcome to Jovian back to about Jovian, that is going to quickly change over here as well. Now this is all well and good. I'm making all these changes, but if I go back to this repository, you will see here that it still does not contain the code that I have actually added. So I've added a bunch of files, but they don't seem to be here in the GitHub repository. Well, remember this, remember this setup. So we created a repository on GitHub and then we pushed that code or we pulled that code into a code space, which is essentially a remote computer on the cloud. And now we've made some changes into our code space machine using VS code. Now we need to push these changes back to GitHub to actually save them back to the remote repository. So that's what we're going to look at next. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, it's a three step process and we're going to first stage our changes. Next, we are going to commit our changes. And finally, we are going to push our changes. And this is where some of the GitHub terminology will start kicking in. You might wonder why do we have three step process? Why can't I just hit save? Well, this is just how Git was designed to handle a bunch of different use cases. And that is uh, what we are stuck with, unfortunately. But uh, you, once you do it enough, you start to get used to it. And I'll show you some easy ways of doing this without having to type or remember a lot of things. Okay. So here is how it works. The first thing we need to do is we need to open up a terminal. So Git added score is a command line tool. So you need to actually type out some commands on a terminal or a command line. So we need to open up a terminal to run some of these commands. Now, of course, we have our code space somewhere on the cloud here. So we will need we can't open up a terminal on our computer, we need to open up a terminal on this remote machine, which is in the code space. Fortunately, VS code provides an inbuilt terminal. So you can just click on these options here. And you can say view and you can select terminal. So view terminal. And now that is going to open up this terminal window. Okay. And what is a terminal? A terminal is simply a place where you can issue commands, you can write commands, and those commands will get ex executed on the computer. So before we had graphical user interfaces, uh, operating systems were just terminal based text based uh, platforms where you could issue commands. And even today, most developers use these command line or these terminal commands to run a lot of their code and to uh, interact with Git, for example. Okay. All right. So now we've opened up this terminal. So it has this, you can see that this terminal, it, it has a bunch of information already. It tells you who is the current user. So the current user is Sydney Jovian. That is the name of our GitHub user. It has the current directory or the current folder on the code space where we are currently at. And it also tells us the branch that we are currently at. So it's an informative prompt. And now here we can start typing our terminal commands. So the first command that we need to do, or we need to type is called git add. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is, uh, or actually even before we do git add, we can just type git status to see what status our repository in is in. Are there any new changes that we have made since we have checked out the repository from GitHub. So if I type git status, you can see here that it says that you are on the branch main and then there are a few untracked files and there are a few untracked files and they are the files in this folder called SRC. So the entire untracked, the entire SRC folder is untracked. By untracked, we, we mean that Git has no idea about these files. It has never seen these files before. So the first thing we need to do is we need to stage these files. So we take the files from our working directory and we stage them 
which means we tell git that okay these are some files that i'm interested in potentially putting to putting back on github so i'm going to stage them by saying first of all i'll just reset it uh, so anytime you want to reset the terminal just type reset and i'm going to just stage this by typing git add src and src slash what are all the files that i want to stage i want to stage index.html banner.jpg styles. Uh, CSS and team.jpg. Well, I'm just going to type git add src and that is going to add all the files present within the src folder into the staging area. Okay. So now if I type git status again, this time you're going to say that it's not saying that there are any untracked files. So there are no more untracked files. There are some files which are ready to be committed. Okay. So now in my staging area, which is nothing is yet put into the git repository yet. We now have a four new files. Okay, great. So now that we have staged these files, so from working directory, we've staged these files. The next step is to actually record a new version of this entire repository by performing a commit. So here is what we do after adding a git dot, a uh, git add. So I've reset things again. Now I type git commit and then I say minus M and then I provide a message. So adding the HTML and CSS files. Now I have to provide this message within quotations. So you can see here, git commit if I have, if I need to zoom in a little bit, likely this is fine. Git commit minus M and then I provide a message and the message is within code. So now I'm creating, I'm recording a new version of my code by creating a commit and I'm giving it the message, adding HTML and CSS files and I press enter. Okay. And now it says that, okay, now it has actually inserted four files into my repository. So now you can see that now we have the create mode. Uh, now we have created a file called SRC banner.jpg index styles and uh, team.jpg. Where are these files created? They were already present on our code space. Well, they have been now created and saved within our repository formally saved. Okay. And now if I reset once again, and I say git log, now git log is used to view a history of all the commits. And now you can see that there are two commits or two times that I've recorded a version. A commit is simply a version of the code. So there was this initial commit that was done at such and such time by such and such author. The initial commit was done and then I have done a second commit. And in the second commit, I have added this HTML and CSS files. So that is also something you can see. Okay. You can in fact do git log minus minus stat. And that is going to tell you what is the change in each commit. So here you can see that in the initial commit, we added a git ignore license and readme.md file. So I'm just using the arrow key to go up and down. And in the new commit, adding the HTML and CSS files, I have SRC banner index styles, and these are the number of lines in each of these. Okay. Now, Often when you run some git commands, you will have to do this scrolling using your cursor up and down cursor. So here's a quick trick to exit this. Just type Q to exit this. Okay. Anytime you're stuck in some git command output, just press Q and you should be able to exit. All right. So let me reset that again and let us check git status. So now it says we are okay. We are on the branch main and there is nothing to commit. Our working tree is clean, which means we have no untracked files. We have no tracked files with, with changes to be committed. So that's fine. So we have taken our working directory changes. We have first staged them. And then after staging, we have committed these files. Let's see if these have shown up on GitHub yet. No, these do not seem to have shown up on GitHub yet. We still have a git ignore. We still have a license and a readme.md. So once again, coming back to this, what we are doing here is so far, we're still just recording new versions of our code on this code space machine. We need to push these changes back to GitHub. That is where the git push command comes into picture. And you can see here, there is actually a hint here saying that your branch, so our main branch, the main branch on our code space is one commit ahead of origin main origin typically refers to the remote server, the whatever repository remote server from where you've actually pulled this code. So we are ahead of our origin or we are ahead of the remote server by one commit. So we need to push our commits. So here's how we push it. Let me reset that again. Let's just type git push and then we provide origin. So we want to push 
to origin, which is sort of the remote server. And we want to push the main branch. So git push origin main and I press enter. And now you can see that we are packaging up all of these new com new changes that have been recorded in the new commit. And we are pushing this to the cloud server. Okay. So now what happens is we have made some commits here. We've pushed them back to GitHub. And now the next time we run a co code space or somebody else runs a code space on the same repository, a collaborator, maybe they are going to pull the latest changes. All right. So that is how you actually push your changes back to GitHub. So once again, I reload the page and now you can see now finally we have this SRC folder over here. And in this SRC folder, we have this index.html file. So that's great. That's exactly what we expect. And we have the styles.css file and so on. Okay. So that is one way in which you push your changes back to GitHub. Sorry about that. So that is one way in which you push your changes back to GitHub. So just to recap, you open up the inbuilt command line terminal using the browser based VS code window. Then you review the changes that you've made using git status and git diff commands. I'll talk about git diff in a second. Then you can stage the changes that you have made by typing git add a specific file name or you can just type git add dot and that is going to add all the files that have been modified or added. Then you can commit your changes, the, the changes that you staged by typing git commit minus m followed by a commit message inside quotations. Commit messages are very important because they give you a short description of the change you're making. And finally, you can verify that the change was made using git log. And you can push your changes to GitHub by simply typing git push origin main or in the case of the main branch, you can just type git push. So this is typically the workflow you have. You add some files, you commit them and then you push them. And if there are new changes that are made on GitHub, you pull them back onto your computer. Okay. So if I run git pull origin master, for example, you will see that or sorry, git pull origin main. So if I run git pull origin main, for example, you will see that I'm already all up to date. Now, what is origin? Origin simply refers to that remote server from where you've pulled the repository originally. So it is the origin of your code. It is the original place from where you've pulled your code. Okay. So, and again, this is where Git gets confusing of origin, remote, this and that. But um, that's what origin means. Okay. Now, one other thing I want to tell you is let's say we make a change here. So we say about instead of about Jovian, let me change this back to welcome to Jovian. So the live server should also reload to show welcome to Jovian. And now just to quickly recap the flow, I can check git status and you can see here that now we have modified the for now we have modified the file src slash index dot html. Okay. So now it is telling me that something has been modified. Now whenever a file is modified, you can actually see what changes have been made by typing git diff. So when you type git diff, GitHub is going to show you in red, it is going to show you which files have been removed, which lines have been removed. And in green, it is show, going to show you which lines have been added. And everything else in black is simply the uh, code around that line. So it is telling us that in index.html, we have removed one line and we have added one line. Okay. And that is how GitHub tracks or Git tracks changes. It tracks deletions from a file and it tracks additions from a file. Okay. And once again, we can now do git add dot, we can then commit, we can then push. But there's another way to do it directly within uh, VS Code. So you can click on this third button here called source control in the sidebar. And what this tells you is this shows you under this changes section, it shows you all the untracked or modified files. So it seems like there is this index.html file that seems to have been modified. And there's also this settings.json file. Well, maybe I don't need this file. So I'll just delete this file for now. Let me just come back here and let me just delete this entire folder. Maybe it got added somehow. I don't need it right now. But anyway, coming back here. So now I have this index.html file. And in this index.html file, if I click on it from the git sidebar, I will be able to see the changes that have been made. So you can see that in index.html, it is showing me a comparison between the original version, which contains about Jovian to the new version, which contains welcome to Jovian. So we have removed about and we have added the welcome to, or you could also think of it as we've removed this entire line and added this entire line. Okay. 
if we made some more changes for example in index.html let's say let's also remove let's also add the word most highly reputed and let us come back here and let us check you can now see that apart from this one change we also have the second change over here so you don't actually need to run the git diff command you can simply come in into the into the git sidebar and you can check the changes let's maybe go back and also make a change into styles.css let me change the body font color instead of 444 let me change it to 404040 slight change and once again i can go here into the git git sidebar and i can see that there is a change made in styles.css and there is a change made in index.html now i can go ahead and stage th these changes one by one so i can review the changes in each of the files by looking at the diff or the differences and then i can stage these i can click plus here and i can cl click plus here so remember the flow we first have to add the files use uh, to stage them so i can click plus and styles has been staged or i can unstage it like that but let me just stage this and let me stage this or i can also stage them both together by using this single plus button now you can see that we have a couple of stage changes and no other changes no unstaged changes so internally vs code is simply running these git commands for us so that we don't have to run them but you should be still familiar with git commands in case you don't have the sidebar or you're able to, you're not using vs code okay so now that the changes are staged we can type a message here so let's say updated index and styles and now we can click commit okay now the changes have been committed so we've added the files and now we've committed the files but now we still have to send these back to github so now we can click sync changes and now it says this will pull and push commits from into origin main and i'm just going to say okay and now my changes are going to be sent up completely okay so that is the other way to send updates to github make some changes come here then stage those changes and then commit those changes with a message and finally press the sync button and that is going to push the changes up to github all right so two ways to do it i generally prefer doing it from the terminal just so that i can keep getting some practice so i prefer doing it from here from the terminal but feel free to use the user interface as well both are equally good enough both do exactly the same thing okay so as an exercise i encourage you to look up the documentation or look up some tutorials to understand these git commands git status which tells you what untracked files you have or what are the files with some changes git diff which shows you what are the exact changes in each of the files git add which can be used to stage your files so go and go from the working directory to the staging area and you can add individual files or you can add all files or you can add a folder at once then git commit which is used to actually record a new version then git log which is to see the history of commits that you have and finally git push to push these changes to the remote server or origin server and you also have git pull in which case which is used to pull the changes from the origin server in case somebody else has pushed some new changes okay now all of these commands also support some options so you can check out some what their options online and you can also use git help but the thing with git is you have to practice you have to try these out a few times you have to get stuck a few times and only then you start to feel comfortable but we've already covered six git terms and there are a lot more that are going to come but at this point i want to switch gears and talk a little bit about cloud deployment so now we have our jovian career site live you can see here that we can see um, we can see its history that three commits have been made so far on github we can see that there's an src folder and that was recently updated with the index and styles that we committed directly from vs code and there are some other files from the initial commit how do we take this and how do we easily deploy it to the cloud we're going to do that using this platform called vercel vercel is a cloud platform that makes it really easy to deploy websites and applications and it offers a seamless integration with github and other version control systems allowing developers to deploy their projects almost seem almost instantly without any additional coding or any additional work so here is what we are going to do we are going to sign up on vercel.com so let me just sign up in case you're not signed up already you'll need to sign up i am already signed up and signed in so i'm good to go then uh, you will be taken to the vercel dashboard as soon as you sign up let me zoom in here and you can add a new project so i'm going to select new project 
and when I select new project, uh, it is going to ask me access for my GitHub repositories. So once one, when you're signing up, try to sign up with GitHub so that you can give permission to sign up using GitHub directly. But second, when you actually try to create a project, Versal is going to need access to your GitHub repository so that it can, it can pull out the code and it can then deploy them to the cloud, not just public repositories, but also private repositories. So you can either give access to all repositories or you can give access only to select repositories and you can select which repositories you want to give access to. In my case, I'm going to give access to all repositories and it is going to have access to read and write because it is also going to write some things into your pull request, which we'll talk about later. But in general, yeah, you need to give Versal full access to your code so that it can pick it up, even private code and deploy it to the cloud. Okay, now let's click install. So that is going to install the Versal GitHub application essentially. And now at this point, you will see this new project box. And in this new project box, you can select which GitHub account to use in case you've connected multiple GitHub accounts. And from that GitHub account, you can select which site you want to actually deploy. So I am, so my repository is called Jovian Career Site Live. So I'm just going to click import Jovian Career Site Live. And now I have to configure the project because Versal has configurations for all kinds of various different projects. So you can see here that it has a bunch of different um, pre-configured frameworks. And first you can set a project name. I'm just going to keep the project name on Versal, the same as the project name on GitHub, no change here. So Jovian Career Site Live. The framework preset, I'm going to select other because I'm not actually using a framework. I'm just using simple HTML and CSS files. Then I need to select the root directory which needs to be deployed. So remember we created this SRC directory. We don't want to deploy our git ignore file and license and readme.md. That's not something we want to put on the website itself. That's something that we want to just put on GitHub. Um, so let's select the SRC folder or the SRC directory as a root directory. So I'm going to click edit here and I'm going to just select the SRC directory as the root directory and click continue. So we are telling Versal that we have a simple website, no framework, and we are simply going to pick the code from the SRC directory and just directly deploy it to the cloud. And there are other settings which we don't need right now. So I'm just going to click deploy. Now, as soon as we click deploy, Versal has pulled out all the code from our GitHub repository. It has set up a machine on the cloud, conceptually speaking, and it has deployed the code. And you can see here that this is what the deployed site looks like. Okay. You can actually click continue to dashboard. And here you can see that we have a preview of what the deployed site looks like. And we also have links to a couple of deployments. So by default, your project name dot versal dot app is the location of the deployed website. And let me just zoom in here. So you can see now we have deployed our website. So now we are developing on GitHub code spaces and we are pushing our changes back to GitHub. And then we are, we have connected our GitHub repository to Versal and Versal is picking up the GitHub repository, the main branch, and it is deploying it automatically, right? You can see here that it is deployed automatically. So that is how easy it is to deploy. And the next thing you can do is anytime you make a change, let me come back here in index.html and let me just change this to about Jovian. And I'm just going to make a quick commit here. So I'm going to stage the change. I am going to commit and Sometimes when I, uh, when I try to commit without a message, it will ask me to put in a commit message. So let me just say change to about Jovian and let me close that. So now it is committed. Now I'm going to push again and okay, let's push it. Now the changes are going to get pushed. Now the changes are pushed here to Jovian career site live. You can see that we just changed to about Jovian. And once you push, what happens is you can see that a new deployment is going to be made by Versal automatically. So you can actually see a history of deployments. You can see just three seconds ago, a new deployment was made and this new deployment was made on the commit change to about, about Jovian. So on Versal, welcome to Jovian changes to about Jovian. So anytime you make any changes to your GitHub repository and push the main branch, 
or you make changes on code spaces, push the main branch to GitHub. Versal automatically picks up the new change from the main branch and automatically redeploys it. Isn't that nice? That all you have to do is just go on coding here and keep checking your live preview whenever you're ready. You can just go in and you can just add all your changes, commit them and push them. And once they are pushed, Versal will pick them up and deploy them. And that is a deployment workflow that you are going to work with more or less. Right. So you go to versal.com, sign up for an account. Once you sign up, you create a new project and you choose the repository that you want to deploy. It supports GitHub, GitLab and Bitbucket and you'll have to connect and give access to Versal. Then you choose the project root folder. In this case, it is the SRC folder and then you click deploy and then it creates a deployment. So it builds your project, deploys to the cloud and whenever you push new changes to your repository, especially the main branch, Versal will automatically build and deploy your project. So that creates a very nice workflow. Now, one of the goals in the problem statement was to add some meta tags and improve the previews of this web page. So now we have this Jovian career site live.versal.app. But one thing you'll see here is if I zoom in a little bit here, you, you see, you see, it says my first web page at the top here, and it also doesn't have an icon. So it'll be nice to maybe get a Jovian icon in here as well. Another thing that you can check is if you try to share this on LinkedIn or Twitter or elsewhere, it's not going to show a nice preview. Okay, normally when normally we expect to see a nice preview of our Yeah, normally we expect to see a nice preview of any website that we share on the internet. So but that is not showing up. So normally what happens is when when a website is found by Google, or when a website is shared on, let's say LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, it, they automatically pick up this preview image. There's something that can be configured and they automatically pick up maybe a title and a description, all of this. So where does this come from? Well, all of this is done using some special tags, special HTML tags called meta tags. HTML meta tags provide information about a web page to search engines and browsers, and they are placed in the head section of a HTML document and they're not dis displayed on the page itself. So you can actually use a platform like heymeta.com. Uh, you have these tools like heymeta.com to actually check what the preview for a particular web page is going to look like. So let's say if I just copy this my first web page link and put it here and I check what the preview is going to look like. So you can see here that there is no preview image and the title of the web page is simply my first web page, which is not very informative and there is no description as well. So there's no description. There is no image, none of that. On the other hand, most modern websites, so let's say www.jovian.com. If you share this link with somebody on social platforms or maybe just check on heymeta.com, you'll see this preview image, build a successful career in Trek. This is not there anywhere on the actual page, but this is just for the purpose of preview. And you will see that it has a per nice title and it has a nice description as well. Um, so all of that is something that is going to show up automatically. So all of this is achieved using meta tags. So there are several types of meta tags, each with its own purpose. So here are some of the more common meta tags that will be used in most web pages. There's something called a meta care set. This is used to inform the browser. What is the character set? There are several character sets. There's something called ASCII, something called UTF, etc. So what is the character encoding that this page is using? So this is often something that is set to UTF eight. Then there is something called the viewport meta tag. This is used to inform the browser how to scale up or down, how to zoom in on or, or out the website on a mobile screen. Again, there is a standard value that is preferred for more modern websites. Then there is this meta name description and this description is actually picked up by platforms when you share this link when you share the website as a link. So the description is not actually shown on the page, but it is just picked up as a preview by Google. And whenever you share the platform elsewhere, you can also set a meta author, not particularly useful these days. And you can also set meta keywords and meta robots. Uh, meta robots provide some instructions whether search engines should index this page or not. And meta keywords is used to specify some keywords that are uh, that were used in the past for search engine indexing, but are not now very less important. Okay. There are also platform specific meta tags. So you can take your URL, your website URL and make it show a different way on Facebook and a different way on uh, Twitter, for example. 
So there is this property called OG title. So this is the title that is going to be picked up by Facebook, LinkedIn and several other sites. OG stands for open graph. And there is this property called OG description, which is uh, picked up for description on Facebook. You can also specify this image using OG image. This is the image that shows up here. And finally, you can specify similar title, description and a card setting for Twitter as well. Okay. So those are all the meta tags that you can have on your web website on your web page. And apart from this, you can also have a title meta tag and a fav icon link tag. So the title, uh, this title is not a meta tag exactly. It is simply used to set the title of the page. So this is also important because this is what shows up on the browser tab. And you have a link, a link tag, which contains something, uh, a link to an image called a fav icon. And that image is the image that shows up over here. So right now you're just seeing a small web image here but instead let's say here you have the github logo and elsewhere you will see the jovian logo on jovian let's say i open www.jovian.com you see the jovian logo so putting a logo here in the browser tab is done using the fav icon okay so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and add a bunch of these meta tags to our web page so we can take all of these meta tags we have car set utf8 name viewport description keywords author robots etc and we are going to add them all to our project and specifically a couple of images also need to be added. See, we have this one meta tag called OG image and that we are going to set as Jovian meta.png and the file Jovian meta.png is here. So you can download it in case you want to add it. Yeah, this is the, this is the image that we're going to use as Jovian meta.png. So I can just save this image to my desktop and then upload it to code spaces. And we also have a meta image for our fav icon. So this is the fav icon that we're going to use. This is the icon that is going to show up on the browser over here. Okay. So again, these are not things that you learn in a introductory HTML course, but to build good practical modern websites, you need to have good meta tags. Otherwise your websites are just going to look random on the browser or when people share them. Okay. There's more information you can learn about meta tags here, but uh, these are the tags that we are going to add into our web page. All right. Well, so now we want to add meta tags. So we basically want to add all this code into the head tag of our index.html file. And we know how to do this. We just copy the code, put it into index.html, then stage the index.html file, then commit it, then push it. But uh, before we do that, we're going to take this opportunity to maybe also learn the GitHub collaboration workflow. Because what is going to happen in the real world is that you, you're not going to directly make changes to the main branch. As you can imagine, let's say Jovian, the website is running. And before we actually make push any new changes, we may want to get them reviewed. We may also have a situation where multiple people are working on multiple changes. And if they're all consist constantly pushing to the main branch, then they may all be just overwriting each other's code. So that is why GitHub has this collaboration workflow powered by branches. So what you do is you have your main branch or your master branch from your master branch, you create a feature branch and we'll talk about branches in just a second. And then in that feature branch, you add a bunch of commits. So one by one, you keep adding commits into your feature branch. Then what you do is you create a pull request. So you using all the changes that you've put into your branch so far, you create a pull request on GitHub. And in the pull request, you can basically list out the changes you've made. The pull request will also have all the code changes between your branch and the main branch and the team can then review your pull request. So somebody from the team can look at the changes you have made and they can make comments on your pull request. So they may make some comments and then you can then make more changes, make new comments based on those comments. You can fix the things that are not working as expected. And once all the comments are resolved, somebody from your team can possibly approve your approve your changes. And once your changes are approved, you can then merge those changes into the main branch. Okay, so you can take the new changes and you can merge them into the main branch. And then of course, we have Vercel set up already. So as soon as the main branch gets changed after all this discussion and review, then it is going to get deployed automatically. 
So this is how we safely develop software. We take out a branch, which is basically we extract out a copy. Conceptually speaking, we make changes to that copy. We keep adding commits. We then set up a pull request uh, people comment on it. We make changes to it. We do whatever testing we need. We'll also see how to generate a copied version of our site, which is which can be used for testing. And then once we are ready, we approve the pull request, merge it back to master and that is going to trigger a deployment. So that is how the GitHub collaboration workflow works. And it's not just uh, that you will be using a single branch at a time, but here's what might happen that you may have your main branch somewhere and then somebody, you may start a new branch, you may start making some changes and then some changes may get added to the main branch from other people. And then somebody else may start another branch and then your branch may get merged and then their branch may have to get merged. So this is how the GitHub development workflow works. You, anytime you want to build a new feature, you create a new branch, make changes on the branch, get that reviewed, get that, uh, get that approved, merge it back into the main branch. And the main branch is the source of truth for what is going to go live on Vercel or whichever deployment platform you're using. Okay. So this is the, this is the workflow that we're going to follow. And the first step in this workflow is to create a branch. So what is a branch? Well, a branch branching is a very fundamental feature of Git and GitHub that allows developers to work on multiple versions of the same code base simultaneously. So you can use it to work on five tasks at a time or five features at a time or five different people can use it to work on different features without disturbing each other's code. Okay. And a branch is essentially a separate copy of the code base, conceptually speaking, that you can make changes to without affecting the main branch, which is usually called main or master. So here is how you create branches within Git or using Git or within GitHub code spaces. First, we open the terminal. So once again, I go in here, I say view terminal. Now I have the terminal open here and let me close the sidebar. So the first thing you do is you type git branch and then you type a type the name of a branch. Okay, so you'd say git branch and I just want to add meta tags here. So I'm just going to call this branch add hyphen meta hyphen tags. So you always use lowercase letters like add hyphen meta hyphen tags all lowercase and you always generally separate by hyphens. You can also separate by underscores if you want. One other convention is to also maybe put your username before the branch. So I, you could, I could also create the branch as such Akashin is slash add meta tags. But this is a good convention so that multiple people don't end up creating branches with the same name accidentally. Uh, in my case, I'm going to just, I'm going to just use the shorthand AA for myself. So AA slash add meta tags. That's what I use at Jovian. Okay. So we are creating a branch called AA slash add meta tags. Okay. The slash does not have any special meaning. It is simply a separator that I'm using. I could also have said AA hyphen add meta tags and it would be the same thing, but it's just a little nicer to look at. Okay. A, a hyphen add meta tags. So now I'm creating a branch. So a branch has been created, but we are still on the main branch here. You can see here, I'm still on the main branch. So now we need to switch to this new branch that has been created. So now the way to switch to a new branch is using the git checkout. So you say git checkout and then you type the branch name. So a, a slash add meta tags. Now we have switched to, to the branch a, a hyphen add a, a slash add meta tags. Great. And that is something that is displayed here as well. Now that we have switched to the branch, we can now start making commits into this branch. So here is how I might go about making some commits. So I might first, let's see here. I might first maybe just replace the title and the fav icon. So let me just grab the title and the fav icon here. And I'm just going to replace that over here. Okay. And I will just test that. So now when I reload the page, you can see that now we have Jovian careers and okay, this still doesn't have the fav icon. Maybe the fav icon will come in when we actually deploy, but looks like at least the title has changed. Okay. So I've made one significant change. So I'm just going to stage this change. I'm going to say added title and fav icon. And I'm going to commit. Okay. I'm not going to push my branch yet. I want to make a few more commits before I push my branch. Okay, then maybe I might figure out, okay, I might talk to the marketing team. I might, I might want, I might figure out what they want to, as the OG and the Twitter meta properties. So I will add those. And then I might talk to maybe the engineering team and figure out that, okay, what are the other meta properties I require? Let me grab all of the remaining meta tags and let me come in. 
and let me just paste them here okay so i'm just simulating an example where you will be making small changes step by step and making multiple commits so i've gone ahead and made these and of course now for this og image and for this twitter image i need to actually upload this image file and i also need to upload this fav icon file okay that's why the fav icon is not showing so i'm going to let me first add the meta tags i'll create another commit where i upload the files so again i can go in here i can say add the changes I can commit, so let's say added meta tags. I can commit, great, perfect. And now I can go ahead and I can actually upload the file. So I can come back here, I can say, right click, upload. Let me grab Jovian meta.png, Jovian favicon.png, upload them. They are added as well. And once again, I can go in, or I can also do this from the command line. So I say view terminal and i say reset and let me just do git status okay looks like there are a couple of new files so let me do git add dot and let me do git commit minus m add fav icon and meta image okay all right so i've not pushed my changes yet so i have a bunch of commits here on this particular branch if i just check git log or i can actually just if i just want to see the list of changes i can say git log minus minus one line okay so i've so my branch aa hyphen add meta tags is at the commit add fav icon and meta image before that i have another commit before that i have another commit so i've made a bunch of commits now once i have made a bunch of commits Once I have made a bunch of commits, I can then open a pull request. So to open a pull request, here's what I need to do. First, I need to push my branch or my changes to the remote repository. And the way I can push them is by saying git push origin followed by branch name aa hyphen add meta tags. Okay. Of course, I can also achieve the same thing by just clicking publish branch here, but I'm just going to do it from here. And once that is done, you can now see that a new branch will have been pushed to the GitHub repository. How do we verify that? Well, if I open the GitHub repository and I just reload the page, you can see this, there's this message here that this uh, tag, this had recent pushes. Uh, of course, there's this trigger, but you can also see here that we have two branches now. So earlier, this was just saying one branch. So I can actually go and select the other branch. So the commits that I've made together, I can package them as a branch and I've pushed it to GitHub. And now I have this on the main branch, you can see here that SRC index.html doesn't have any of the meta tags, my main branch is unaffected. But if I change to the branch add meta tags, on this branch, you can see that all the tags are present. Okay, so this is how you push branches. Now, what you can do is you can make more commits, you can push the branch again. So you decide what you want to do. Typically, any small change I make, I make a commit. And then once I have a bunch of small changes that are significant enough, I push the branch. Okay. But coming right back. So now we have pushed, let me come back to the main branch here. Now that we have pushed the branch, then now that we have pushed the branch, the next step is to create a pull request. So how do we create a pull request and what are pull requests? So pull requests are a way to propose changes to the code base and get them reviewed by other developers and then get them merged back into the main branch. All right, so let's create a pull request. So first we are going to come back here. We are going to go into the pull requests tab and into the pull request tab again, you can see that there is notification here. GitHub tries to be helpful where it tells you that if you recently pushed a branch, it'll tell, it'll ask you if you want to create a pull request. But in case this notification is not showing up, you can click new pull request. Okay. And now you can select the base branch, which is where you want your changes to eventually go and the branch where you are making your changes, which is add meta tags. Okay. So now I've selected that these are the two branches and I can actually verify what are the changes. So it seems like from the main branch, I want to remove this existing title and I want to add a bunch of these meta tags and seems like I also want to add a couple of image files. Okay. So I can review the commits that have been made on this branch. I can review the changes between the main branch and this new branch that I'm, I'm proposing. 
and then I can click create pull request. And here I can give the pull request a name and typically you want to give this a description of the change. So added meta tags, title and fav icon. And it's all also a good idea to maybe provide more detailed description of the changes. So you can say changes. One is added or updated the title tag. Then you can also mention, okay, added images or fav icon and meta poster or meta banner. Then you can say added meta tags, including OG and Twitter tags. And finally, you can also mention added the fav icon link tag. Okay. Now let's say you've tested these changes. You might also want to say what you've tested. So test cases checked. So you can say something like verified the title showing up. And maybe you might want to verify later and add later that you've verified the fav icon showing up and you verified the meta tag showing up. Okay. And then you click create pull request. So that's great. Now the pull request is created. And now somebody else on your team who is a collaborator on this repository can go ahead and review this pull request. So let me first go ahead and add a collaborator here. So I'm going to go into settings. I'm going to go into collaborators and I'm going to add a collaborator here. Let me just add Akash and S and I'm going to invite this collaborator. Let me go back to the pull request. Okay. So this this pull request now has a description and there is this files changed which contains information about the files that have been changed so people can review that as well it also contains information about the commits that have been made so now let me go in and log in from a different account so i have a different account logged in here and i'm just going to accept the invite first so i've been invited as a collaborator here so i'm going to accept the invite so anytime somebody you invite somebody as a collaborator they get sent an email and they can accept the invite okay now that i've accepted the invite i can go here into the pull requests tab and i can go check the re pull request you can i can see that okay sydney jovian has invited me uh, or has created this pull request i can check okay these are the changes that have been made i can maybe go in and then i can go in and maybe leave a comment so let me say, for example, I don't like this title. I want it to be a little longer. So I can say, make the title longer, please. Maybe at least 24 characters. Okay. And then I can just uh, start a review and I, I can add a bunch of these comments. So I can add a comment maybe about the meta tag, meta title here as well somewhere. Let's see. This can be improved a bit. and so on. And once I'm done with reviewing, I can just say, um, I can request some changes or I can approve and I can click submit review. And once I've clicked submit review, then these changes have been pushed back. And now Sydney Jovian can once again go through the changes, go through the comments that are made and make those changes. Okay. So, so again, we are just trying to implement this workflow here where you create a pull request and then somebody posts a bunch of comments and then you create new commits to fix those comments and you keep repeating this process till they're happy with it. Okay. One other thing I want to show in this process is that if you see there is a Vercel bot that has added a comment here. What Vercel has done is whenever Vercel notices a pull request in your GitHub repository, it takes the code within that pull request and it automatically creates a preview deployment. So I can click this visit preview and I can actually preview the changes. Okay. I can see here that now it says Jovian careers instead of my first web page. And there seems to be a bunch of, uh, uh, this image seems to be showing here as well. And there are no changes in the actual page, but if I were to maybe take this and maybe go into meta tags.io, uh, a platform for checking meta tags. I can actually check that. Okay. It is showing Jovian careers and it is showing a description here. Image is not showing up. I can investigate why the image is not showing up, but it looks like the meta tags are now showing up. Okay. So this is one of the nice things about using 
Vercel, what it takes, it takes your branch, your pull request branch, it deploys that and it adds a link to that without disturbing your original page. So you can see Jovian Career site, this is like that branch preview, but your original site, which is over here, Jovian Career site, still says my first web page, it is not updated. So your main branch is safe, but for your pull request, you have a preview uh, deployment that you can study, okay? All right, so let's go in and fix these quickly. So I'm just gonna go in and fix these comments. So there is a comment here that says, make the title longer, please, maybe at least 24 characters. So I'm just gonna add maybe here, build a successful career in tech. I'm going to add the same title here back in the OG title like that. Okay. I've made, I've fixed the title, learn more about job openings and submit your application now. Well, I don't think I'm going to update that. I think I'm happy with the way things are here. So I'm just going to click commit and let me see. I'm just going to stage my changes and let me say updated title. And I'm going to click commit and I'm going to publish the branch. So now once a pull request has been created, anytime you publish the branch again, the pull request will automatically be updated. Okay. So let's come back here and let's reload this page. And you can see that this new commit has been added and Vercel is automatically going to take this new commit and it's going to deploy it. So it's nice like that. So if I go back and check the deployment this time, it has not just Jovian careers, but it has Jovian careers build a successful career in tech. It has the full thing that I've mentioned. Now I can go in and I can say, okay, resolve this conversation. So this is fine. And then um, here I can say, I think this is fine as it is. And I can resolve this con comment and resolve this conversation as well. Okay, so this is what you want to do. You want to resolve all the comments and then uh, the reviewer may go back and make some more comments and then you resolve those comments and so on. And the reviewer and you both can use the preview deployment to test out your changes, preview the changes live as well. Okay, now the reviewer can eventually be, uh, can eventually come back later in the day or maybe the next day and see that, okay, all their changes have been resolved. So then they can go ahead and they can approve the pull request. So they can go back into this files tab and they can go in and they, they can approve the pull request like that. And once the pull request is approved, then the changes can be merged back into the main branch. Okay. So, so far, yeah, so, so far we are still at this stage where we have deployed, we have done a, a, a done a preview deployment and the pull request has been approved, but to merge it back, we can come back into the pull review page, the pull request page. And at the bottom, we can see that once all the approvals have been, uh, have been received and you can set conditions this at the repository level. Then you can click merge pull request and you can give it a, a commit message and a commit details. And then you can click merge and that is going to now merge this to our main branch. Okay. So now this is merged. And now if I come back into the code tab and I see the main branch, you can see here. Now it has this new commit called updated title. So this is the work. So this is the workflow that we have. We created a feature branch, added some commits to it, pushed the branch, created a pull request. Then we invited a reviewer to comment. The reviewer commented. We made the changes. We also looked at the preview deployment, which Vercel automatically gave us uh, very kindly. And we made sure that everything was working fine. And finally, the changes were then merged to the main branch. And of course, Vercel picks this up again and does another deployment. So now if I go back and just reload the main Vercel page, you can see that now the fav icon is updated. The title is here is updated and I can also check. So there's a place here that you can check meta tags. I believe it's called kmeta.com. Yeah. So I can also check all the meta tags now on Jovian careers website, live.versal.app. So now our careers, Jovian careers website has this nice title that is going to get picked up by Google, Facebook, Twitter, etc. It has this nice image that will show up as a link preview when you share this link on LinkedIn or elsewhere. And it has this nice description over here as well. Learn about job openings at Jovian and sub submit your application now. 
So great. So we learned the we learned about meta tags, but alongside we also learned about a GitHub collaboration workflow, which is branch, pull request, get it reviewed, iterate on it, and then merge it once you have received the reviews. Okay. So that's about branching with Git, and that is about creating pull requests. And I would encourage you to exercise this a little bit. So create multiple pull requests with minor changes and then verify that each pull request gets its own preview deployment. So if you have five pull requests, there are going to be five preview deployments. So Versal gives you unlimited preview deployment deployments for free. And then verify that the main site is not affected till a particular pull request is merged. Okay. Also, one thing that you can try to do is try to see what happens if you have two pull requests and then you merge one and then you try to merge the next one. So these are some exercises for you to try out. Git is a very applied skill. So you have to try out all these things, whatever questions you have, just try it within five to 10 minutes, you'll actually have your answer. Now, let us talk about keeping your branch up to date. So here is a scenario that might happen. We already have two users. Now we have two collaborators. One is Sydney Jovian and the other collaborator is and the other collaborator is Akash and S. So that's why I have these two windows in black and white. So here I am signed in as Akash and S and here I am signed in as Sydney Jovian. Of course, the repository still belongs to Sydney Jovian. We are both collaborators on it. Now let us try to make changes in such a way that two people are working in parallel and once changes get merged into main while the second is still working. Okay. So let's do this. Let us first go into this code. So this is on the user Akash and S and I am going to create a code space to start editing. And it's going to take a second or two to set up the code space. But once it's done, I should be able to start editing some things here. Okay. So inside SRC, I have index.html and let me just go in here and let me just change this to, let me edit the title again. Let me change this to welcome to Jovian. And let me change something in the description. Let me remove highly reputed. Let me just make it most reputed technical university. So I made a couple of small changes here. And let me also remove the word Jovian from the names of the programs. Let us just call it full stack developer bootcamp and data science bootcamp. And let me just commit it. So let me go into source control. Let me add the changes and let me say made some changes to index.html and let me commit it and let me sync the changes. Okay. I have synced it. It looks like I made those changes on main, right? So let me now create some more changes and let me make those on a branch because normally this is not something we should be doing. We should be creating a branch. So let me add back. Let's say, let me add back the word Jovian here. Let me add back the word Jovian here. And let me add the word open job opportunities here. And this time I'm going to first create a branch. So let's see, let me create a new branch. Let me call this branch open job opportunities. And now the branch has been created and now I'm on the branch. Now I can add my changes to the, to my branch and let me commit them. So added open job opportunities. Okay. And now let me publish the branch. So what I've done now is I have made some changes on main and that will just go out to everyone for sure. But then I've also created a branch out of main, which I'm going to then create a pull request on. So I can then come back here and it looks like, okay, this new branch has been pushed. Let me click compare and pull request. And let me just say added job open job opportunities in index.html. And that's the same description for now. Let me create a pull request. And the changes that have happened here are simply, well, 
the, from the main branch, I have simply removed, added the word Jovian back and I've added open job opportunities here. Okay. So just to show you what happened, what we did was we had the main branch and then from the main branch, we made another commit. So we made some changes onto the main branch. This was done by Akashness. So this was the main branch. Then we branched out of the main branch and made one commit. And of course we could have made multiple commits on that branch. So this branch is the open job opportunities branch, right? And this branch has been made by Akashness. And we've set up a pull request for this branch as well, right? So let us call this pull request one. Now we have set up a pull request, pull request one called added job opportunities in index.html. Now let us come back to Sydney Jovian. Okay. And let us go back here to the main branch first. So there is a selector here that I can use to go to the main branch. So let's say here, I've just checked out the main branch. Now the main branch on Sydney Jovian is a little bit behind my uh, old branch, the branch that has been created by Akash NS. So let's say Sydney forgot to pull the latest changes before, before working on a new change, right? Let's say Sydney is uh, working on some changes about related to the dates of the front end developer, back end developer, etc. So what Sydney does is creates a new branch to make his changes. So I'm going to say branch, create a new branch. And let me just say job date changes and create this branch. So a branch has been created by Sydney for his work. And now Sydney is going to make the changes to the jobs. Let's say this is March instead of March 3rd, this is March 13th instead of Feb 1, this is Feb 11 instead of December 22nd, this is December 20. And here we change the salary to 85,000. Okay. And now let me commit these changes into the branch. I have staged them. So job changes and commit and let me publish this branch and now let me again come back here and let me create a pull request okay so once again these are job changes so job date changes and this is again something that i would want to merge okay and the only changes here are the changes within the dates. So let's once again recap what's happening here. So your Akashness has first made a change to the main branch itself and pushed it and then created a new branch and created a pull request on top of it. Then Sydney forgot or did not have a chance to pull the latest changes on main. So Sydney created a, a few changes from the last version of main and then made a couple of commits, let's say, and then set up a pull request. Let's call it PR2. Okay. So already things are a little out of hand. Sydney is Sydney's main branch on his own computer is a little bit behind and Akash's main branch is uh, a little bit ahead. And of course, this is also the main branch on GitHub itself. So that's why you have a origin has its own main branch, but Sydney has its own main branch, which is a little behind. And now there is this pull request. And now one of these pull requests is going to get merged. Let us say the pull request number one gets approved. So let's say somebody on the team goes ahead, reviews the pull requests that are all present. So let's say they go into the pull request created by Akash NS and they go ahead and approve the pull request. Okay, so they just approve it and they just merge that pull request. So now what has happened is that Akash's changes have gone into master. So now we are at the situation where this pull request has been merged back into master. And however, this pull request is still tracking the old main branch. So now what we need to do is we need to update this second pull request to show changes based on the new new main branch. Okay. So here's what we need to do. We need to take the changes in the main branch and then incorporate them into the currently open pull request. How do we do that? Well, here is a step by step process. 
First, we check out the main branch, then we pull changes from the main branch, then we check out the feature branch, and then we merge the main branch, and then we push the changes, okay? So we'll do it step by step, and it will make more sense. Okay, so now I am here on Sydney's branch, and on Sydney's, I'm on Sydney's pull request branch. So I'm on the branch which Sydney has created for pull request number two. And this is based off of a main branch which itself is very old, okay? So I'm gonna show this on the terminal, but you can, you can do the exact same thing from, your, uh, from the user interface as well. So first, I am going to, so I'm currently on the branch job date changes. I'm going to switch to the main branch. So git checkout main, okay? By typing git checkout main, I have now switched on Sydney's code space, I've switched into the main branch on Sydney's code space. Now, of course, Sydney's code space uh, main branch is behind the main branch on the server. We already know that because one direct commit was made and then one pull request was merged. So I can do, um, the first thing I can do is I can do git fetch minus minus all. What that does is that fetches the changes that are there on the remote, but it does not apply them yet. So it does not pull the changes. It simply fetches information about the changes. Again, more terminology I know, but we right now what we know is we, we have now fetched information about what are all the branches that are present on the remote server and where are the, where are they compared to the branches that are present on this server. Okay. Let me now reset and let me type git status again. And now I can see here that your branch is behind origin main by eight commits. So it looks like I'm fairly behind because a bunch of other pull requests were merged. But here's what I can do. I can say git pull origin main. So now what I'm saying is that I have my local main branch, which is a little bit behind. And then there is this origin main branch, which is ahead. If I type git pull origin main, then all my changes are going to get my uh, my main branch is going to get up to date with the origin okay so what has happened now is that sydney's local copy of the main branch has become up to date by uh, with the main branch on github okay that's fine now let us come back to our job openings branch so i can just type git branch to see the names of the different branches that are available and I can switch to the branch. So I can say git checkout job date changes. Okay. Now I've checked out job date changes. The trouble is my local main branch is now up to date. My local main branch is now up to date with what, what is there on GitHub, but my job main branch, uh, but my jobs feature branch is still pointing to that old main branch or that old main commit. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to pull in these new changes into my job branch. Okay. So now we do get pull or not pull. Well, actually we need to merge in these new local main branch changes into the job branch. So we say get merge main. So what we're telling Git now is that I'm on this job date changes branch. Take the latest changes from the main branch on my computer, which is already tracking the latest changes from, on, from GitHub and bring all those latest changes back into my feature branch. Okay. So I type git merge main and this will ask me to then type a message. So I'm just going to say merge main into job date changes. And once you're type the message, you can just close. And now magically, what it has done is, is, is it has taken all the changes that have been made in the main branch on GitHub. And we first pulled that into the main branch on our computer. Now all those new changes have been put into our feature branch, which is job date changes. Okay. And you can verify that here is how you can verify that you can see that we have Jovian data science bootcamp mentioned here. So that is there. You can see that we have uh, most reputed technical university. So all the changes that were made by Akash have now been incorporated. So what we have done essentially is we have taken the changes that have come newly and we have incorporated them into the second pull request branch. Okay. 
one last thing to do here is that these changes are still local on our code space. So I need to push these. So I need to say git push it to the pull request. So git push origin job hyphen date hyphen change changes and this should get pushed. Okay. Finally, now we can come back here and we can see that job date changes has now been updated. Job date changes has now been updated with the merged changes into the main branch. Okay. And now it is tracking against the latest main branch that is present. And now somebody can come in and somebody can approve it. And then this can be merged in. Now we can go in and now we can merge this change and put that back. Okay. So I know that there was a lot going on there, but I'll just first revise this. So what we do is whenever new changes have come onto the main branch on GitHub and we want to incorporate them into our feature branches, here's what we need to do first within our code space or wherever we are, uh, we are doing our development. First go to the main branch, our local main branch using git checkout main. Then we get the latest changes from the remote by by running git pull or git pull origin main so that our local main is tracking at the same place where our latest changes are on github then we check out our feature branch we say git checkout feature branch name then we merge in the changes from the main branch that we have locally now into our feature branch and finally, we push these changes to the remote repository. So we take our feature branch and push it to remote so that the pull request gets updated. Okay. So this is the workflow that you will do over and over as a developer. You'll check out the main branch, git pull, check out the feature branch, merge the changes from the main branch, and then push your feature branch back to GitHub. And these steps will ensure that your feature branch is updated with the latest changes from the main branch. Okay. So as you have a created a feature branch and you made some commits on it and made a pull request, if new changes have come onto the main branch, you can simply pull those changes in by following this workflow. And then you can push your uh, main branch back, uh, push your feature branch back and your pull request will get updated. And then the merging will happen seamlessly. Okay. So that's how, mer that's how merging works. This is called, uh, yeah, you're basically merging changes from the main branch into the feature branch. And Git is smart enough that if the changes were made within the same file, but to different parts of the same file, then things will work out just fine. Uh, Git will be able to combine all those changes from multiple users, multiple commits together. Okay. And again, I encourage you to practice this, create a branch, make some changes, create a pull request, create another branch uh, and make some changes, create a second pull request. Now approve, approve and merge the first pull request and then update the second pull request to incorporate the new changes from the first pull request and repeat that process a few times using the command line and using VS Code's user interface to see if you understand how this whole thing works. Okay. Now, there are certain cases where two people in two separate PRs have updated this exact same line of code, in which case there is going to be something called a merge conflict. So let us try and simulate a merge conflict situation now by both users updating just the title of the page. Okay, so let's do this. Let us first go back here into the code space that is being used by the user Akash NS. And let me open up a terminal. I'm just going to do everything on the terminal so that things are super clear. So we are currently on the branch open job opportunities. I'm going to first check out the branch git checkout main. Okay. Now I'm on the main branch on my Akash NS code space. Then I'm going to run git pull origin main so that I have the latest changes. Perfect. I am going to get the latest changes on the Sydney account as well shortly. But now I'm going to create a new branch. I'm going to create a branch git branch AA hyphen title change one. Okay, I've created a new branch title change one, I'm going to check out that new branch, Git checkout AA title change one. So now I've checked out a new branch. So I have the latest main branch from the latest main branch. I've checked out a new branch. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to change the title of the page, which is 
I'm just going to change it back to Jovian Careers. Okay. So I am changing the title of the page to Jovian Careers. That is one change I am making. And I will also change here Welcome to Jovian to About Jovian. So two changes I'm making. I have changed the title to Jovian Careers and I have changed well about Jovian to uh, welcome to Jovian to about Jovian. So those two changes and you can verify these changes by using git diff. I can see that those are the only two changes I have made. Now I'm going to commit these changes. So I'm going to say git add dot. And I'm going to git commit minus m change title and about Jovian. Okay. Now I have committed my changes onto my local branch. And now I'm going to push my local branch to the to GitHub. So I'm going to say git push origin AA hyphen title change one. So now my branch, which is based on the latest main and has a couple of changes, one to the title and one to about Jovian, has been pushed. And now I can create a pull request using this branch. Okay, now I can go in here and I can say create a pull request. I'm going to just call it change title. So I've changed title to Jovian careers and then change description heading to about Jovian. Okay, and I'm going to create a pull request. Perfect. So we understand this flow so far. We created a branch. We made some changes. We committed and we pushed it, created a pull request. And we can verify that it contains only these two changes. It contains a change, Jovian careers, and it contains a change about Jovian. Perfect. Now, let's say before this pull request was merged, Sydney was also working on some changes where he's going to change the title. So I'm going to say file view terminal or sorry view terminal i'm opening up the terminal again let me reset it let me also go back here to the master so let me say git checkout man or let me say git checkout main so now i'm on the main branch back let me also do git pull origin main so i have the latest version of the origin main okay so in the latest main our title still has jovian careers build a successful career in tech and the title here for the description is still welcome to Jovian because the changes were made in a pull request that is not yet merged to main. Okay. So I hope this is clear to you that our main branch is still, still has the old title and the old heading. Okay. Now I'm going to create a new feature branch. So I'm going to say git branch SY for Sydney title change to okay fine and now i am going to come in here and i'm going to remove this part okay so i'm just going to remove the part build a successful career in tech uh, i'm going to keep the part build a successful career in tech so maybe two people got different instructions Akashan has made the change to about Jovian. He was asked to shorten the title and sydney also got the instruction to shorten the title and he changed it to build a successful career in tech and maybe I also go in here and change something about the job opportunities. So I don't, don't want it to say open job opportunities. I want it to say job openings. Okay. And I have, I will also check out this branch, get checkout sy slash title change to. And once I've checked out the branch, I'm going to add the changes. So get add dot. Then I'm going to say git commit minus m. Change title and job opportunities. Okay, now I've committed. Now I'm going to push this branch. So I'm going to say git push origin sy slash title change to. Now my branch has been pushed to the origin, which is GitHub. Now I can come back here and create a pull request. And here I am changing the title. So change title and job opportunity. So here I'm changing the title to build a successful career in tech. All right. 
Yeah, so the title is changed to build a successful career in, in tech and then the change the job section header to job openings. Okay, let me create a pull request here. And let's see now. So here now, there are two changes on the title and on job openings. Here also there are two changes on the title but a different change to the title and on the job openings and both changes are made against the latest version of master. Now let us merge one of the pull requests. So now let us go in here and let us merge this first pull request. So what will happen is that when by merging this pull request, which changes the title to Jovian careers in our main branch, we are going to get back Jovian careers as the title. Okay, so I'm going to go in here and I'm going to check mer click merge pull request, confirm merge. And the pull request has been merged and I can verify if I go into code and check the main branch and check index.html. It is going to have the change title Jovian careers. Okay. So now the first pull request has been merged. The title of the page has changed to Jovian careers. And the header of the first section has changed to about Jovian. However, obviously for Sydney, the title of the change, uh, the title of the page is whatever they have set in their feature branch. And the heading of the first section is welcome to Jovian and not about Jovian. And of course, they've also made an additional change called job openings. So now Sydney's feature branch is behind the main branch on GitHub. So Sydney needs to update their feature branch. So let's update the feature branch step by step. So I'm going to open the terminal again. I am going to reset things. And remember the step by step process for updating the feature branch. First you go to git checkout main. First you get to the main branch because our local main branch and code spaces is behind the main branch on origin. Then we can check using git fetch minus minus all or just git fetch how far behind we are. Okay, so we can say get status to so check that we are behind origin main. So we are behind the changes by two commits. So let us run get pull origin main. So now we are pulling the changes from the origin main branch on GitHub to our code space on the Sydney code space. Great. So our, now our main branch is up to date. But our feature branch is still tracking the old version of the main branch. Now we go back to our feature branch. So let's check the name of the branch. Okay, the feature branch is SY title change to so git checkout SY title change to. And by the way, you can verify here that so far we are on the main branch and on the main branch, it says Jovian careers, which is the change that had been made by Akash in this. And the title of the first section is about Jovian, which is also a change that was made by Akashinus. As soon as we go into the feature branch, now we have the title that was set by Sydney here. And now of course we have welcome to Jovian because this is tracking the old main branch. And we have this job openings here. Okay. So now we need to merge in the latest, the new main branch that we have just pulled in. So we say git merge main let me just reset that and type that again git merge main and here is what happens okay finally we've done all this setup to get to a point where when i try to update my feature branch using the new changes that have come into the main branch i run into an issue because both of us are trying to update the same line Akash NS has updated. So there are two things. See, you have a current change, which is the change in my feature branch. So in my feature branch, I have updated the title to build a successful career in Trek. However, when I try to merge in the main branch, the main branch that has come from GitHub, the latest main branch because of some other pull request has the title Jovian careers. So both the main branch and my feature branch have been independently updated on this one particular line. And you can see only this one particular line is an issue. This, this becomes about Jovian as expected, no issues here. 
and this becomes job openings as expected, no, no issues here, right? So this change came in from the main branch, no problem. No, because we didn't change it in the feature branch. This change came in from the feature branch, no problem, because it was not previously changed in the main branch. But this change was made in the uh, main branch as well, which is called Jovian Careers. And this change was main, uh, made in the feature branch as well, which is called Build a Successful Career in Tech. So this is what Git does. It inserts this like random characters here, which basically tell you that what you have on your current branch and what you have on the main branch. And you can either edit it manually, you can kind of erase all these characters, or you can just use one of these buttons, whether you want to accept the incoming change, which means the incoming change is what is coming in from the branch you're trying to merge in, which is what is coming in from main. Or you can accept the current change, which is what you have in your feature branch, or you can keep both changes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to click accept current change. So I want my feature branch change to override what has come in from the updates in the main branch. So I'm going to click accept current change. And now in my feature branch, I have overridden, I have resolved the merge conflict and I've overridden the change that was made in the main branch. And now I need to create another commit. Okay, so now I can say git add dot git commit minus m resolved merge conflict. Okay, now I've made this change, I need to now push my feature branch to update my pull request. So now we can say git push origin sy title change to. Okay, and now I can go back here and reload my pull request. So if I did not make this a uh, fix this merge conflict and I try to merge this pull request, it would say that the pull request cannot be merged because it is conflicting with the latest version of main. But now that I've fixed this merge conflict, you can see that I have said that from the main branch, I want to change Jovian careers, which was the latest version of the title on the main branch to build a successful career in tech. And I want to change open job opportunities to job openings. Okay. And then we can go ahead and merge this pull request. Right. And that's it. So now we should on the main branch, we should have incorporated changes from both the places. Right. So if we look back at the pull requests, we have closed a couple of pull requests. One of them changed the title to Jovian careers and about Jovian, which merged first. The second one changed the title to build a successful career and change the job section header to job openings, which merged second. And while merging the second one, we chose to override the changes from the first one. We could also have chosen to keep it at the point of the merge conflict, we can decide what to keep. So the end outcome of all of this is going to be that if we just check the title here, so the title becomes build a successful career in tech. We have about Jovian, this came from PR1, from the PR by Akashinis. We have job openings, this came from PR2, the PR created by Sydney Jovian. And this is how you reconcile changes, okay? So just to recap, how you resolve a merge conflicts occur when Git is unable to automatically merge changes from two branches. And this can happen when two or more people have made changes to the same file or the same line in of code in, in a file and the changes made in one branch conflict with the changes made in another branch. Okay. So these are the steps to build a, a fill, uh, fix a merge conflict. So when there is a merge conflict, VS code will display a notification in the bottom right corner and will also show a way to merge changes. There you can see the conflicting files. So you can see it like this and you can have multiple files. You can have multiple conflicts within a single file. And then for each file, you can choose which changes to keep and how to select and select the right version. And once you have resolved all the merge conflicts, you need to make a new commit and then those changes can be pushed safely to the remote repository. Okay. And just to make it super clear, I'm also going to draw this out here for you. So here we have the origin main branch. So this is the, I'm calling it the origin main. Okay. And based on the origin main branch in each of our code spaces. So let's say this is the code space for Akash and S and this is the code space for Sydney. Based on the origin main branch, each of them has their own main branch. What Akashan has did was first make a change to the main branch directly and then push that back to origin. So that's how origin got updated. Then Akashan has created a 
feature branch and then created a pull request from the feature branch called PR1. Then Sydney, based on the old version of the new uh, of the main branch, not using the new version of the main branch, made some changes and created a pull request called PR2. Then we merged the changes from PR1 into the main branch. So this PR1 is tracking a side branch and we merge those changes back into the main branch. So now the main branch is in conflict. So these two cannot be merged. There's a conflict because both of them have edited the title. So then we tried to, here's what we tried to do. Into our main branch, we try to pull in these changes. So into our main branch here, we try to pull in our changes and we try to get a new version of the main branch. Then we try to merge those new version of the main branch back into our feature branch. And that is when we resolve the merge conflict. And then we pushed our feature branch back. And now the feature branch was compatible with the main branch. And so these could be merged together. Okay. I know it's confusing. You have to work it out on paper by yourself. You have to try to create a couple of uh, pull requests. You can also go through uh, this explanation again. Um, but only when you do it, you realize it. But all said and done, what we've been able to achieve is we've been able to resolve a merge conflict. All right. So that is the final topic that we are looking at today, resolving merge conflicts. There is another optional topic on using Git locally. I will not get into it today because we've covered a lot of material already. We have looked at a bunch of different things, but there is a way for you to use Git locally. What you can do is you can um, download Git on Mac OS or on Windows or on Linux. So you will get this Git command line tool on your computer. It will look something like this git minus minus version it will show you git okay then you can actually you'll need to configure git so you'll need to configure a username and you'll need to configure an email before you can start creating repositories making commits now what you can do is you can either create a repository and push it to github or you can get an existing github repository down onto your computer if you want to first create a repository on your computer that is done using the git init command and that will create a new a directory called .git in your present working directory. And then you can make commits locally on your computer. And then you can add a remote repository on GitHub and you can then push your changes to the remote repository. So there are some instructions here. And you can also, if, if other changes are made on the repository online, you can pull those changes back. Okay, so that's one flow where you create a repository on your computer, add some commits to it and push it to GitHub. The other flow is that there is an existing repository on GitHub. In that case, to get the first version of that repository, you do something called a Git clone. Okay, so more terminology. Uh, you clone that repository, which means you get your first version of that repository. Then you can make commits into that repository and then you can push that repository back onto the cloud. Okay. So I've linked to a tutorial here that you can go through in case you want to use uh, in case you want to use github on your computer so follow this youtube tutorial it's about 40 50 minutes long and it'll get you through all of these as well but here is where we are going to wrap up today so here's what we looked at we looked at using github repositories to share your project source code and the simplest usage is very simple you go on github.com you click create repository put in some information add a readme file add a add a Git ignore file, add a, a, a license file and you create a repository. Very straightforward, right? So the simplest way to create a repository is just to go on github.com and create a repository. Then opening up a GitHub repository on code spaces is also very straightforward. You just go onto the repository place, a page, you click the code button and you say edit in code spaces. So till now there's no Git commands even that you need to run. You just have to open up um, a code space and you can use VS code for development. Then while you're developing the website uh, using code spaces, you just make changes. You can upload files or you can create new files and you can add code within those files. And you can then preview them using the live server extension on Git. So the live server extension within VS code can let you preview changes while you are developing. That is again, fairly straightforward. The next step, now all of this is still happening on the main branch, the single branch that you get is to create git commits. So what you do is you take some changes you've made, you first stage them, 
and then you stay then you take those stage changes and then you commit them so you record a version a new version locally and then you push those committed changes back to github and that way the github repository gets updated so always remember this always remember this picture what you do is you do some local development and then you push the changes back into the remote server you push the changes back into the remote server uh, which is github okay then we learned how to deploy a website to the cloud directory from directly from github using vercel and again it's really simple you just go to vercel.com sign in connect it to your github repository and then just click deploy and every time the main branch is updated which means every time you push some changes into the main branch then your repository uh, is going to get updated and your website is also going to get automatically deployed very easy and you can also connect a custom domain if you want so all of this is largely enough for working on personal projects but we also have the github collaboration workflow so what happens in the github collaboration workflow is that on your code space you take a branch out you make some changes within the branch you make some commits within the branch you push that branch to github then you set up a pull request and once you set up that pull request then somebody else can review that pull request and versal also creates a sample a preview deployment without affecting your main branch and once that pull request is approved you can merge that pull request back and the main branch gets updated and so a new version of your project gets deployed automatically by versal so that is a safe way for you to work on multiple features at a time without affecting the main branch without affecting the main deployment and whenever you're ready to bring things back you can merge you can approve that pull request or somebody else from your team can approve the pull request and bring the changes back into the main branch okay so that is the github collaboration workflow which is also fairly straightforward create a branch make some commits create a pull request get it reviewed um, keep iterating on that branch and finally you merge those changes after the pull request is approved back into the main branch okay now where it starts to get complicated is when you have these merge conflicts when you have to keep your branches up to date and you have to and there are conflicts where multiple people can have updated the same file now although we've covered it today don't worry if that does not make sense right now because that's not something you're going to run into immediately and that is something that we are going to cover at a later stage multiple times so you will become familiar with the flow over time okay so but how it works is uh, you have to first get the latest changes from the main branch onto your code space then go into your uh, feature branch and pull in those latest changes from main you know, from, or merge in those latest changes from the main branch into your feature branch and then resolve any merge conflicts as they show up and push your feature branch back to update your pull request and that is how you keep your pull requests up to date okay it's complex no doubt but only when you do it a few times you get used to it so all the code for the tutorial is found here you can find the finally from this point on we'll just be using github repositories and you should also just be using github repositories for all your work going forward so you should do that and you can check out the finished site here as well which contains all the meta tags etc in place as well so we also looked at meta tags and how they can be used to set up a preview image some description and a preview title when a link is shared online now git can be confusing because of all the various terms and commands but it does become second nature with practice i still look up uh, commands on git because even after using it for 15 years there are so many terms that i often find myself at a loss in terms of what i what i need to do but in particular just try to remember these common workflows when the simplest workflow is you make some changes you check those changes using git diff or using the visual code api visual studio code api you add those changes or stage those changes using git add dot then you commit those changes using git commit minus m and then finally you push those changes to update your repository okay this is what you should be doing right now you don't need to do anything more than this the next uh, level two is understanding the github collaboration workflow where you create a branch and you make commits on the branch you push the branch you create a pull request uh, for the branch to be merged into the main branch that is reviewed by other people you iterate you make changes based on the comments and then you merge that back into the main branch the third and the most complex workflow which will take some time to get used to is the branch update workflow where you have to first 
whenever your branch has fallen out of date uh, because the main branch has been updated a few times first you go back to the main branch on your code space get the latest change from github check out your feature branch merge the main branch and fix any merge conflicts and then push the feature branch to update your pull request and you're good to go okay try to practice it try to set up a couple of accounts or maybe even um, with the same account you can create two pull requests with some merge conflicts and practice it and here are some resources you can check out to learn more so there is the git documentation of course which is the official documentation and reference that you can check out there is the github learning lab so specifically dealing with merge conflicts etc you can check out github learning lab uh, so all of this you can see that there is this section on reviewing pull requests there is this section on reviewing merge conflicts so this will set things up for you in such a way that it will give you a starting point and then you will have to do some reviews you will have to resolve some merge conflicts there are some tutorials on atlassian some tutorials on git kraken you can check out these as well uh, again git is that kind of thing that you can keep exploring more and more you don't have to become an expert on git right away if you can just do the first version you are good to go if you can do the second that's great over time as you start working in a team you will be able to start working on the third version or the third workflow as well okay there's a git cheat sheet by gitlab you can go check out this cheat sheet it contains some of these common workflows so that you don't have to think about all the different git commands together and you should also check out the documentation for vs code so if you just search vs code version control you will find that there is this detailed set of videos and tutorials on how you can perform every git related action directly within vs code without ever having to type a single command so most of the time you'll just be using this at work so check this out as well as well there is this nice youtube tutorial that you can check out for a for local git development we did not cover local git development because we are going to use we are going to be using code spaces for the rest of this course and for the rest of this program as well uh, but if you want to do some local development on git then we have some instructions on installing git on your computer and then you can check out this tutorial for things like git config git init git clone etc of course you should check out the documentation for vercel if you have more questions about how vercel works but the flow we've shown here which is connected to your github account pull in the github repository code select the root folder and just hit deploy and then automatically anytime the main branch is updated it's going to create a new deployment and anytime you create a pull request it's going to create preview deployments that can be used for testing without affecting the main deployment and then anytime the pull request gets merged the main deployment gets updated automatically so it makes things really seamless and it is used in production it is what we're going to be using extensively in this program and you can learn more about their Vercel and GitHub integration here as well. Responsive design is a crucial aspect of modern web development and it ensures that websites adapt gracefully to various screen sizes and devices. And by utilizing responsive de design principles, you can effectively build user interfaces and accessible websites that can cater to a diverse set of audiences from any set of devices. And in fact, this is important because over 70% of web, web traffic today comes from mobile and maybe another 10% from smaller tablets. And there's only about 10% of traffic that comes from the large desktop screens that we typically develop our websites on. So there is a bit of a disconnect in terms of what developers look at when they're developing websites and what people look at when they're actually browsing these sites. So we'll talk about using CSS media queries and breakpoints to implement a mobile first and responsive web design. We will also talk about leveraging the various properties of, offered by the CSS Flexbox layout model to build fluid and dynamic layouts. We will then learn how to create separate wireframes to determine the layout of a web page at various breakpoints. And this is how designers will often share designs with you. And finally, we will talk about implementing, testing and deploying a, res a responsive website using CSS media queries and Flexbox. And of course, the best way to learn these skills is to follow along step by step and type out all the code yourself. If you are not been doing that, if you have not been typing out all the code yourself, you're making a big, big mistake. It is going to severely slow down how much you're going to learn. So type out all the code yourself question everything that you do and if you get stuck at some point please ask us uh, we have also just added a lot more one-on-one -on -one support call slots and we're also decreasing the amount of time that we take to respond to your queries 
So please feel free to get all the help that you need. All right. So here is a problem statement that we look at today. Now, in the previous lesson, we built a Jovian careers website. So this is what the website looks like. We have a nav bar here with the Jovian logo. We have this banner image that says do something great. We have an about Jovian section that talks about our mission and talks about the two programs we offer along with a picture. We have an employment opportunities table. We found that a table was a nice way to showcase some employment opportunities. So that's great. And then we have this submit your application form where people can fill out their name, email, phone number, date of birth, select a position, upload a resume, add a cover letter, agree to terms and conditions and submit the application. And finally, at the bottom, we have a footer. So this is the website that we have been developing step by step over the past few lessons. However, this same website, if you've tried to open it on mobile, you will see that it doesn't really show up properly. What happens on mobile is this image takes up a lot of space. There's a lot of blank space above and below it, above and below this do something great part. So we might want to reduce the, uh, the height of the image on mobile. You may also notice that on mobile, it doesn't really make sense to show these side by side, the text in the image. Maybe it'll be better to show the image below instead of on the side. Then you will also notice that the table does not show up completely on mobile. The table actually goes out of view and that requires horizontal scrolling, which is not a great experience on mobile. And finally, the application form as well, it feels a little cramped on mobile and it would be nicer if there was more space on mobile for each of the input fields. So we will try and improve this website to make it more mobile friendly or what's called responsive. And here's what we're going to do. We are going to use different layouts for different screen sizes to ensure that the page shows up properly on any device. So it's going to look different on mobile. It's going to look different on tablets and different on desktops. We're going to use CSS Flexbox to make the layout more fluid and ensure that it adapts properly to any screen width. And we will also set up a GitHub repository, a new one, so that the old one is not affected. Now, normally you will continue working on the same repository. However, just so that you have access to the old code as well, we will set up a copy of the previous GitHub repository. And we will also deploy this new GitHub repository to the cloud using Vercel. Okay. And of course, we are assuming here that you are familiar with the previous lessons, which is HTML and CSS basics, advanced HTML and CSS, and version control with GitHub and cloud deployment with Vercel. The code for this tutorial can be found here. So this is the starter code. So I'm just going to open this up here. This is the this is a GitHub repository which contains the starter code. You can see here that there is an SRC folder here and inside the SRC folder, there is a there is an index.html file and there is a styles.css file. These contain the HTML and the CSS for this Jovian career site. Okay. You can also check out the starter site, which is what we looked at just now. So this is the starter site that we are going to work on today. And I encourage you to take this URL and open it up on your mobile phone to ensure to confirm that it actually does not look very good so that you can compare it with the changes that we're making today. And you can find the completed code in the finished site here. Now to work on this tutorial, we will create a new repository containing a copy of our original repository. Let us open it up here in a new window. So this is the repository that we want to create a copy of. Okay. Now, normally, if you want to create a copy of a repository that is owned by somebody else, you can just click this button called fork. And what fork will do is take the GitHub repository that is part of somebody else's profile and copy that completely to your own profile as a separate copy so that you can do your own development there. Um, but sometimes you have to fork your own repository and GitHub does not allow forking your own repository. So I'm going to show you a quick way in which you can create a complete working copy of your uh, GitHub repository as another new repository. So here is how we do that. Go to github.com and on github.com, click the new button here. So I'm clicking the new button. And when you click the new button, you will get the option to create a new repository. So let me call this repository Jovian Careers Responsive Live because I'm going to create a responsive or a mobile friendly version of this site and I'm doing this live. So I'm just going to calling it Jovian Careers Responsive Live. 
a responsive version of the Jovian career site. Okay, I am going to leave this public and I'm not going to add a readme, gitignore or license. So this time I'm creating a completely empty GitHub repository. So once I click create repository, now a completely empty re repository gets created. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to take this GitHub repository and import all the code from this GitHub repository into my new repository. Okay. This is the repository for the previous lesson. I don't want to disturb it. Now, normally in a job, you will probably be continuing to work on the same repository, but just for demonstration, I'm showing you how to create a copy so that the previous lesson doesn't get affected. Okay. So there are many ways to add code into a empty repository. You can check out some of these, but here is one called import code. So what you can do here is click on the import code button and then grab the URL of the old repository. So here is the old repository. I'm grabbing the URL Jovian career site, and I'm going to copy the code from or import the code from the old repository into this new repository Jovian careers responsive life. And I'm going to click begin import. Okay, now this is going to take a couple of minutes to maybe import the entire code depending on how much code you have in your repository. Alright, and once we have this, we will be able to now see our new repository and make changes there without affecting the old one. Okay, so our import is now complete. So let's open it up. And I can close the old repository. So now I have a new repository with my starter code all in place without affecting the old one. Okay. All right, so that's what we just did. We created a duplicate of a GitHub repository by creating an empty repository, not including a readme, gitignore or license, pressing the import code button and providing the URL of the starter code. Okay. Now, of course, as I mentioned, if you are on somebody else's repository, you can do all of this very quickly using the fork button. So you can see that there is a fork button here, which is disabled for me because this is my own repository, but will be available for you when you need to. Okay. The next thing we'll do is we will also deploy our new repository to Vercel. So I'm just going to open up Vercel.com and Vercel, as we know, is a deployment platform that has good integration with GitHub. And once you're logged in on Vercel, I'm going to add a new project. So I'm going to say add new project. And if Vercel is not already connected to my GitHub, then it will ask me permission to access my public and private GitHub repositories, which I have already granted. So here I can see on Vercel that I can, I have the option to import the Git repository Jovian careers responsive life. So let me just go ahead and import that. And that is going to create a project. And I'm going to use a framework preset other because I'm not using any framework. It is just a static site with some HTML and CSS. And then I'm just going to click edit and I'm going to go into SRC because I don't want the entire folder to be deployed. I don't want the entire repository to be deployed. You can see here, I simply want the SRC folder to be deployed because that is where my index.html file or my default web page is present. Okay. So I'm just going to select the SRC folder and click continue. And then I'm going to click deploy. And just like that, in just a few seconds, the repository will get deployed and I will have my new website, Jovian careers live Jovian careers responsive live. Let me see, I can just continue to dashboard. And now I have my new project Jovian careers responsive live dot Vercel dot app. Okay. So now the repository is completely deployed to Vercel and any changes that we make will now be affecting this new site. Okay. Perfect. So that's our basic setup in place. So that's good to go. Now let us come back here and also open up this code using GitHub code spaces so that we can actually start writing some code and start editing things. So I'm going to click on code and here now I can create a new code space on main. And remember a code space is a local machine for us on the cloud given by GitHub associated with this repository. And we'll be able to write our code in that code spaces machine. So let's click create code space on main. And by the way, if this button is disabled, you may have to go ahead and delete some older code spaces. So you can go to github.com slash code spaces. And I think GitHub provides two code spaces for free. So you may have to go in and maybe delete an older code space. So you can just go to an older code space and click delete. 
and that's going to delete your old code space so that you can now reload this page and actually access this button okay so you can have at least only two free code spaces otherwise you can pay and you can get unlimited number of them but free should be fine you can just delete code spaces when you need okay so let's click code and then let us click create code space on main and let me bring this over here now what this is going to do is open up a machine on the cloud get the code from the repository and give me a browser based interface of visual studio code to edit and test and develop the code from this repository okay so github is for storing the code visual studio code code spaces is for actually developing the code and then i can take my changes and push them back either onto the main branch or i can use the github collaboration workflow where i can create a pull request and get that reviewed and so on okay all right so looks like our code spaces system is now open and ready for development so i'm just zooming it in a little bit so you can see that this is a visual studio code interface and let me just close that now here we already have the repository the root file of the repository open you can see that we have an src folder we have git ignore license readme all of these were imported in from the original repository i can open up the src folder and open index.html and here in the index.html file i can see the entire code for my website jovian careers so you can see that we have a head we have an html tag inside which we have a head tag in the head tag we have a bunch of meta tags to set how this page previews when we share it online we also set for example the title and the fav icon of the page then we have the body tag and in the body we have the nav bar and this is the nav bar we have a banner image this is the banner image we have a header we have an about section with an image and some description then we have a table here the table contains the employment opportunities then we have some a form here an html form and that form makes a submission to form bold which is an external service that we are using for form submissions and finally we have a footer here which is the footer right over here okay and of course we have all of the styles here captured in styles.css so each section has it own, has its own various set of styles which is what we have captured in styles.css so there are some basic styles for html body h1 h2 etc and then there are section wise styles for each section and then the subsections inside those section and so on okay and we have certain images as well which we are incorporating within the page and of course we have uh, we are connecting the styles with the main page using the link here the link rel equal to style sheet plus we're also using some external fonts from google apis uh, from uh, google fonts okay so this is the basic setup that we've explored so far all right so now we've looked at how to deploy to the cloud using vercel we've looked at how to start development with github code spaces now let's talk a little bit about responsive web design responsive design is an approach that ensures that websites adapt gracefully to any screen size any device and any orientation and that is the purpose here is basically to optimize the user experience by making the content visually appealing and easily readable and accessible okay now responsive design starts from the user interface design so even before you have started coding the page user interface designers will often create design mockups in 3 to 4 sizes depending on the available screen width so they will create a mobile design so let's say they're designing a website they will first create a mobile design and in the mobile design everything just goes top to bottom you generally don't don't have a lot of things side by side because the limit on the because the screen width is very limited and in fact just as a common practice something around 576 pixels and below is considered a mobile screen just for reference so typically you will get a mobile design which is about which is something under 576 pixels in width then they will often give you a tablet design now the tablet design will have maybe two columns in certain places in certain places they will still have one column so certain things you have slightly more space horizontally on a tablet and that's why there might be a slight change you can see that these two sections were brought in here on the side on a tablet screen and typically tablet screens are about 550 to 750 pixels and then you have desktop screens desktop screens are screens that are bigger than 768 pixels so this is where you have a lot more space this is where maybe you can use three columns this is where maybe you can have more space on the left and right 
And finally, optionally, sometimes you will find a, a layout for large desktop. So often now as we are getting to bigger and bigger screens like 4K screens and 8K screens and so on, we have the opportunity to use a lot of, leave a lot of blank space on the left and right. So sometimes, especially if your website is going to be viewed by people primarily on the desktop, you may get a fourth mockup or a fourth design for very large desktops, okay? And typically this refers to a desktops with a screen width of greater than 992 pixels. If you don't get a design like this, then you should just take the hint that you should take the desktop layout and just limit its width so that the content remains centered on the page instead of completely spreading left to right, making it hard to read, okay? So your designer will often give you three separate layouts at least and sometimes even four or sometimes you may just get two layouts one for mobile and one for desktop and you may have to guess what the tablet layout looks like okay now the specific widths at which these design changes are made where the design changes significantly are called breakpoints because the previous design breaks at the at that point and a new design takes over from there okay so the breakpoint for mobile screens is 576 pixels. Beyond that, it's the tablet screen. And then the breakpoint for desktop screens is at 768 pixels. Beyond that, it is a beyond that it is a, a large uh, yeah, beyond that it is a desktop screen. So the breakpoint or the highest breakpoint for tablet screens is 768 pixels, and beyond that it is a desktop screen. And then sometimes beyond 900 pixels or so, it is a large desktop screens. Now these numbers are not set in stone. These are just some common values, but different sites, different frameworks that we use for CSS have different values, but these are just some of the more standard ones, okay? Now, your role as a web developer is to implement layout changes at specific breakpoints while ensuring that the page adapts gracefully at all intermediate screen widths, okay? And that is what we're going to learn today. Now, one important thing to keep in mind whenever you're trying to make a website responsive is that to make a, to implement a responsive web design, you must include this following meta tag within the head tag of your web page. So this, there's this meta tag with the name viewport and it has a content width, device width and initial scale equal to one, or sometimes this is written as 1.0. And you have to take this and you have to put this inside the HTML head tag of your HTML page. Okay. Now in this case, I already have it meta viewport. Let me zoom in here slightly. Yeah, you can see here, I have the tag meta viewport with device width initial scale 1.0. Why is this important? Well, back when mobile, uh, mobile smartphones just came out, there were no designs that were optimized for mobile screens. So there were certain tricks that were employed by mobile devices to zoom in and somehow scale and make the text more visible. Nowadays, those tricks are no longer required because developers implement responsive designs. So that's why to indicate to your browser, to indicate to the device that please don't apply any tricks to make the content look good on mobile, I will handle it myself. You include this meta tag, okay? So all you need to know is whenever you're making your design responsive, make sure that you have this meta tag included in your design. So one good way to build your responsive design skills is just by checking out some examples of responsive design. So here's one. You can check out a bunch of examples here. So here is one Dropbox. The home page for Dropbox is a good example where this is the mobile view, this is the tablet view, and this is the desktop view, which also contains a form. Here's, here's another one. This is Dribble. It shows images. So here you can see that on mobile, it shows two images side by side. On desktop, it shows four, five images side by side, and then on tablet, it's somewhere in between. GitHub is another example that there is often you will find this pattern that in the desktop layout, there is space on the left and right. There is possibly a form in uh, somewhere on the right. And then on tablet, the form comes in the center and on mobile, the form can go away altogether. Okay. And there are a bunch of other examples that you can check out as well. Similarly, there are again, some more examples here for you to check out. So whenever you're trying to make your website responsive, it's useful to look at how other websites are doing it. You can see here examples of uh, design modo. So they have this layout for mobile, tablet, and desktop. You can see this architecture site. They have a different layout for ta desktop, tablet, and mobile. And here's another one. This seems to be like a personal website. So to become a good web developer, you have to go and explore what other people are doing. 
there are no ground rules there are no set rules for responsive design in fact these trends are constantly emerging so just explore and pick whatever you feel is working well now how do you develop a responsive website so you can inspect how a website looks on mobile by simulating other devices within your browser's developer tools so that you don't actually have to go and open that website on your mobile each time you want to test it that's a good idea you should always do a final device test but you can just do that within your browser itself let me show you an example let us open up this let us open up this Jovian career site and let me just zoom back 200%. So this is what the career site looks like on desktop. If I right click and I select inspect. Now that opener opens up these developer tools and I can just put these developer tools on the right. So there is this button here on the corner, this three dots button. And I just click this three dots button and dock the developer tools to the right. Okay, so now my developer tools are on the right side. It's exactly the same, but I'll show you in a second why putting it on the right here. And now there is this button over here and I'll just zoom in and show you. So this button is called toggle device toolbar. So if you just press this button, now suddenly your browser turns into a mobile device and you can go in and select a specific device as well. Let's say, let me select iPhone 10 R. So this is iPhone 10 R and this is what my mobile and this is what my and this is what my website is going to look like on iPhone 10 R. Okay. I can even check that the screen width here is 414 pixels. Let me just zoom in there a little bit. So the screen width here is 414 pixels. So that tells me that this is an iPhone 10 R or I can even just select the option responsive and I can just vary the width of the screen and see how my website changes. So normally you will not be viewing a website on under 360 pixels. So normally you might want to start around 360 pixels and just vary the width of your screen slightly and see how the website looks as you increase the width. Okay. So this is a great idea. This is a good way for you to inspect how things are going. You can see that definitely there's a big problem here. The table doesn't look good at all on mobile and it starts to look a little better when we go into tablet or maybe even desktop screen okay and one good idea for you would be to open up developer tools on your browser turn on device mode and see how various pages and websites look with different device widths you can check out jovian so let's check out jovian.com our home page let's start with mobile this is what it looks like on mobile so on mobile we just have this text we have this explanation here we have these two things and you can see that the text is centered on mobile then we have this logo cloud and then we have a form below it and then we have all of these benefits that are shown one below the other as we go on a tablet screen you can see now that the text is still centered and but now we've put a maximum width for the logo cloud we've put a maximum width we've added space around the form and now we are showing two of the benefits on the same row as we go further, let's go onto a desktop screen. So now we've gone beyond the 900 pixels or so, which is a desktop screen or a large screen. And now you can see here that we have a bunch of options here in the nav bar. Then we have left text and we have a form here. And then we have now all four benefits listed on the same page on the same row. And of course, there are similar changes that are there on each section as well. You can see here intensive programs here goes one in each row instead of two of two per row okay you can see that okay maybe this is something we need to fix so looks like in the pricing div we haven't taken care of spacing and this is what happens when you are building responsive websites there will be slight cases here and there a certain place where you've not thought about how things should look and you'll have to go and fix it and that is why it's important to check across the entire range of bits okay let's check another one nytimes.com so this is what the New York Times looks like on mobile. You have a very little space on mobile. That's why there's just this title and then there is this nav bar. And we'll touch on how to show these nav bars at a later point. And then there is just this date and there's the sale offer going on. Then there is just one story and then another story below it and so on. But as you start to increase the width, you can see that now we go from one story to multiple stories. And we also get this second bar here, which 
opens up a bunch of categories and we also get something here on top we also get maybe a login button and all so things change significantly based on the screen that we're on right and you can see now we go into three column layout when three columns are available so a lot of time is spent by designers deciding where exactly to change the layout what the breakpoint should be and what the structure should be for the site and really this is where a lot of the time is spent just fine-tuning small things and testing things carefully okay so i encourage you to maybe explore a few more sites and see how they work now certain websites redirect to a completely different page when you try to access them on mobile for example if you were to open gmail on mobile it will redirect to a slightly different page or show a completely different design that was a common practice earlier but now that there are many tools to or many techniques to build completely responsive layouts it's not recommended any longer so try to find some websites which follow this outdated pattern and avoid it when you are building websites instead what you should do is build something called a take something called a mobile first approach which is what we look at today let's talk about css media queries CSS media queries are a powerful tool that allow you to apply different styles to your web page based on device characteristics such as screen size, resolution, and orientation. And here is the basic structure of a media query. You say at media, and then you specify a media type, and then you specify a condition, and you can have one or more conditions. And then you open up these brackets, and inside these brackets, the CSS rules that you write will only apply when you are looking at this particular media type and you're looking at this particular condition okay now when you're working with responsive web design the media type is almost always going to be screen so there are three types of media there is the screen and then there is print and there is all now print is used the print media type is used when you try to print a page or export it as pdf which is not something we are going to look at today so in our case the media type is almost always going to be screen or it can even be all and the condition is something that you can set based on the width of the screen or the orientation of the screen or there are a bunch of other properties that you can use so here is an example let's say we want to change the background of the body when the screen width is at least 768 pixels let's say on mobile screens we want to have a separate background and then on on large screens or desktop screens we want to have a separate background so here is how we might do it we can say at media and then we can say screen because we only want to affect the screen layout not the print layout and then we can say and and now we can specify a condition min width is 768 pixels so when the minimum width of the browser is 768 pixels then we can specify that the body should have a background color of light blue okay so let me just copy that and let me put that into my css file so here I am in my CSS file and right, maybe right below here, the main body declaration, I'm going to add this at media screen and main width 768 pixels. That means at a minimum width of 768 pixels, when the condition holds true for the body, I want the background color to be light blue. Okay right now i need a way to actually preview the changes that i just made what i'm looking at here on the left is the deployed website but i'm making changes in my github code space so what i need to do is i need to launch this github code space this index.html file in a preview and remember for preview we actually use an extension called live preview because our code space is a system somewhere on the cloud and we need to now view the HTML code in our browser as a web page. And for that, we can use this live server extension. Okay. So let us open up the live server extension. So search for live server by Ritwik Day and click install in code spaces. And again, all of this is covered in the previous tutorial. So you should review that in case this doesn't make sense. And now let's come back into index.html and let us right click on index.html and click open with live server okay so now what this is doing is this is going to set up a simple server which is going to serve the file for us so that we can now view it in our browser and let me just bring that and put that here on the left let's bring this back here on the right 
okay so now i have this styles.css and i've mentioned here that whenever the screen width is more than 768 pixels my body should get a light blue background clearly it has gotten a light blue background which is not looking good but it demonstrates what we are looking for but let me go in here and let me also click inspect and let me just reduce the width of the screen let me reduce it down to maybe an iphone 10r so you can see that uh, when i'm viewing the same page on a mobile device on the mobile device it is still has a white background but on this device over here it has a blue background and you can see the exact change happens at 768 pixels so as i increase you can see that just before 768 pixels it is still white but at 768 pixels it turns blue okay so you can do all sorts of things like that let me change another thing let me maybe set the body font size to 10 pixels or to 20 pixels well, let's just make it 24 pixels so that the font size also changes drastically so here you can see that i have below 768 pixels and then as soon as i cross 768 pixels the body font size should change well okay it didn't um, i just need to reload the page maybe yeah maybe if i just remove this it might change Well, it doesn't seem to be changing right now but it will uh, depending maybe i just have to like set the uh, properties properly but you can set any property here and the font size can change significantly for that particular tag and or for that particular selector based on what property you set here okay so for now i'm just going to revert it and below 768 pixels the background is white above 768 pixels the background is blue okay so that is how you use media queries and let me just get rid of this for now but one other thing you can do is also combine a bunch of conditions so you can say something like this that you want a particular css rule to apply only between min width of 600 pixels and max width of 1024 pixels so at 600 pixels you want it to start and that same set of rules you want them to end at 1024 pixels you can imagine how using this you can set up maybe one layout for under 400 pixels one for 400 to 600 one for 600 to 800 and so on all right let's look at an example of this let me just take this and let me put it in here now i'm going to put a couple of layouts i'm going to say that at let me just make it 400 and 800, 600 pixels just so that we can actually view the changes very easily so now what i'm saying is that under 400 pixels i have a white background and then as soon as i touch 400 pixels the background turns blue but as soon as i cross 600 pixels the background turns white again okay so do you see what's happening you can combine multiple conditions like this and you can also do something like this let's say i want to only have a condition for max width so then i want to say that only under 600 pixels the color is blue and over 600 pixels the color is going to be white so as long as this condition or all conditions are satisfied these css rules apply and i don't just have to put body here i can maybe put change the h1 color change the h1 size here i can put maybe uh, change some other size here as well so i have all those controls that i can modify okay now of course you don't only have to look at the screen size you can also use the orientation so let's say you want to use a certain font size only in a certain orientation you can do that too let's just maybe try that so only in the landscape orientation we want the light blue color so orientation landscape and the orientation is also orientation is also a piece of information that is sent by the browser itself so let us go to iphone 10r and let us change the orientation here so there's a button here you can see that there's a button right here to change the orientation you can see that now this is in landscape orientation and in the landscape orientation it has a blue background and i can change it back to the portrait orientation or the vertical orientation and in this case it does not have the blue background right so let's bring that back and let us get rid of this so that is how media queries allow you to change the layout of a page at various breakpoints and that is what we're going to use today Okay. you can combine multiple conditions and you can check out some information about media queries here 
but we've covered the most common use case you'll be using the screen media type and you will be using maybe the max width or min width to set breakpoint specifically as we said earlier breakpoints are the points at which your design changes to adapt different screen sizes based on the designs that your ui designer have has given you you may have to set some breakpoints and these are generally set on some common device screen widths so media queries can be used to set breakpoints and apply css rules for each layout for example if you want to write completely separate css for mobile tablet laptop desktop and large desktop screens you may do something like this you may have one section in your css file which only deals with mobile screen so you may say media screen and max width 576 so under 576 screen width all these rules are going to get applied okay then you may have maybe another media query here called media screen and min width as 576 pixels and max width as 768 pixels so between 576 pixels and at maximum width of 768 pixels so between these two widths all this all these css rules will get applied and then you may have maybe another one between 768 and 992 and you may have another one between 992 and 1200 and maybe you may have one for 1200 and higher right so depending on how many breakpoints you've decided on for your website you can set up these min and max conditions and then you can write completely separate rules for each of these okay so this is one way you can go about doing things but a slightly better way is what is called mobile first design so the way you should be building most web pages today is by starting out with a mobile design so first you should just design your web page or build your web page for mobile and then slowly enhance that same web page to make it look good on a, on a tablet and on a desktop screen and maybe on a large desktop screen as well right so in a mobile first design the base css styles are for mobile devices so you do not have a media query for the mobile devices you just write all the base css styles and apply that to mobile devices and then media queries are used to progressively enhance the design for larger screens right so what you are basically trying to do is you're going to implement this design first and then slowly you are going to add a breakpoint and then at a certain breakpoint you're going to maybe make you're going to maybe change this layout and maybe go shift to a two column layout and then slowly you're going to add another breakpoint and at that particular break breakpoint you're going to add a bunch of these categories and you're going to shift to a three column layout and so on all right so that is what we're going to do we're going to start with the base styles and then you can have whatever new styles you want to introduce for tablets you can simply say media screen and min width 576 so you're telling the browser only for screens with more than 576 pixels apply these new css rules and some of these css rules will override the old css rules that have been set in the base styles so that's how media queries are more selective so they can override the existing styles and then we have similarly these uh, a next set of uh, a next set of rules min width 768 and these rules are going to override the rules that have been created in these and these so they also follow the order and they follow the specificity that is how css works so all these rules are going to override the previous rules that you have set and then you can similarly have maybe another where you can say media screen and min width 992 so only when the screen width crosses 992 these new rules will get applied only a selective set of rules and they will override any rules that have been previously applied okay this way you don't have to repeat a lot of css for every screen rather you can style you can start with the mobile design and you can just add a few properties here and there to make the website look nicer on tablet and this is a great approach because if you start out with the desktop layout and you try to compress it down to mobile you're going to face a lot of difficulty rather if you start out with the mobile layout often the tablet and desktop layout will simply either have more information or rearrange some of the things in a uh, into multiple columns and that is easier to achieve rather than taking more information and compressing it down into one column okay so even as a designer you should always start from the mobile layout and then slowly build out the desktop so by removing the max width condition for the first breakpoint and using only min width queries for the rest we ensure that the base styles apply to mobile devices only and then they apply to all devices further as well but progressively we also enhance the design as the screen size increases okay so try experimenting with this try setting up some of these breakpoints in the css file and experimenting with this to 
make changes to the careers jobin careers website make it more responsive now observe how the mobile first approach is different from the previous approach where you have different set of styles between each set of breakpoint okay all right so one other thing we need to cover before we go ahead and actually implement the mobile design is something called the css flexbox layout because it's not just that you're going to change the layout at certain breakpoints between those breakpoints as well sometimes you will have to make the layout a little more fluid so that things go from maybe two columns to three columns or maybe the sizes of things increase and decrease and maybe you add space on the left and right so to handle these kind of fluid layouts css has something called flexbox and this is something that was added to css about 15 years ago uh, about 14 about 12 years ago to be exact so this this is something that was added to css about 12 or 13 years ago when mobile layouts became more common when mobile mobile phones became more common to allow for creating fluid layouts that can be flexible and that can grow and that can automatically shift into multiple columns etc as required okay so we're going to look at the css flexbox setup we're going to learn a little bit about flexbox it's not a detailed flexbox tutorial we're going to learn the most common flexbox properties and it is a versatile method for arranging elements within a container in a flexible and adaptive manner and it simplifies complex layouts making it each making it easy to achieve responsive designs and accommodate of varying accommodate varying content sizes now the flexbox layout can be applied to an html element by modifying the css display property and it was added to css in 2010 and it was implemented by most browsers in the early 2010s and the CSS display property, this is something that we've already seen here. It determines how an element is displayed on a web page. So just to give you an example, I am going to first just create a new file called display.html. And in this file, display.html, I am going to create a bunch of tips. So let me just put in body and in the body, let me put in a bunch of divs. Let's create a div called item one, item two, item three, and item four. Okay. And let us open up this page using the live server. So let us right click and say open with live server. And we'll open it up here. All right. Any the way to open up any page in live server is by simply right clicking and selecting open with live server. And you can see that we have a bunch of these divs here and I'm just going to set the display property for each of these divs. So first I am going to set the display property for item one. So let me just give it the ID item one. And let me give this the ID item two. Let's go ahead and give them item three and item four. Yeah, so you have a bunch of items here and let us go ahead and set the display property for item one to display block. Okay, and let's put that inside a style tag. So that is how we are applying CSS. So there is no change when we set the display of item one to display block. What happens if we change the display of item one to display? in line let's actually add a border around item one so that we can get a better sense yeah you can see here that when you have display block which is the default value item one takes up the entire width of the screen instead if we set display in line you can see that now item one does not take up the entire width of the screen and in fact it will show up in line with other things that are also in line. So let me just go ahead and for item two as well, let me add a border one px solid red. And let me set the display to in line as well. Okay. And you can see here that item one and item two both show up on the same line because they are set to in line. So display in line does not take up the entire width and allows a particular div to get embedded in line within some text or within other inline items. But if either of these was block, 
you can see that that no longer is true all right so that is display inline and then there is something called display inline block which i will leave to you as an exercise so i'll let you figure that out what that does and how that's different from display inline then there is something called display none i can say item 2 or item 3 display none now it just disappears so when you don't want to show a particular div and we'll see an example of this later today then you just said display none now the final property that we are going to study which is what triggers the flex box layout is the display flex property okay so we're going to come back and we're going to take a, a closer look at the display flex property is which is what makes a particular div a flex container and allows its children to be laid out laid out as flexible boxes okay very important we're going to uh, look at that in just a second but there are also several other display options so i encourage you to check out the other display options as well and i encourage you to also maybe try out this exercise which goes into the various options that you have for the display property but these are the most common ones that you'll use display block inline flex and possibly none okay so with that let's close this let us talk about flexbox now the first key thing you want to understand about the flexbox layout is that it works with containers and items so you always have an outer div which is a parent or a container on which you set the display flex property and then you have the items and the items are then laid out in a flexible fashion based on a bunch of css properties that you set okay so the display flex property when applied to a container or a parent component causes the items or children to be arranged using the css flexbox layout and the arrangement can be controlled using various container level and child level properties as we will discuss in just a sec so let's go ahead and create a new file called flexbox.html i'm going to right click here and create a new file called flexbox.html into this file flexbox.html i'm going to add a bunch of html and css code to set things up let me also open it up quickly in the live preview so open with live server let us open it up over here and let us come back and let us set up the code for this so i'm just going to copy this code and paste it in here and we'll just walk through the code and then start studying a bunch of okay so this is what our content currently looks like we have a box so we have a div we have a div with the id container over here and then inside that div we have four divs one called item one another called item two another called item three and another called item four so we have these we have this container div that's clear the container div has four item divs and each item div has the id item one item two item three item four respectively and all of the item divs have the class item okay and let us look at the css so so far we've not used flexbox flexbox at all for the container we have set a background color of coral you can see that it has this orangish background color and then we've also given it a background one pixel solid black background a border of one pixel solid black we have also just set a font family so that the font the text is a little easier to read and finally we have given it a padding of 10 pixels so you can see that there is a 10 pixel padding inside the border and then there is a content inside it okay so far we've not modified the display property then we have the item for each item and again this is a class item not individual items so we have specified the class item for each item we're not using the ids just yet we have again set a border of one pixel we have set a padding so you can see that there is some space around the text and finally we've set a background of cornflower blue that is the blue that you are seeing now let us slowly start turning this into a flex container so always the flex display property is set on the container okay so we say display flex and i'm going to hit save and now you can see suddenly that all the items are now laid out in a horizontal fashion okay so you set the display property on the container so on the container you set the display property and that causes the items to be laid out according to the settings the default settings of a flex box okay 
So the first thing that we can change is the direction in which things are laid out. And that is done using the flex direction property. And the flex direction property has four values. It has the row value, it has the row reverse value, it has the column value and the column reverse value. Okay. So let us take a look. Again, all of these properties are first set on the container. And for each property, we also have an example of whether it is set on the parent, which is the container or the child. So flex direction is specified in the parent. So we say flex direction row. And that doesn't change anything because the flex direction row is the default value. But we could also say flex direction row reverse. And now you can see that the items are laid out not from left to right, but from right to left. So you have item one, item two, item three, and item four laid out from right to left. Okay. They're still logically, they're still in this order, but they're just laid out from right, right to left. And this is where you can use Flexbox to maybe do some right to left layouts. Okay. Let's check flex direction column. Okay. Flex direction column, as you might expect, lays things out in a columnar format, which is pretty similar to display block, but except you are setting that this is a column on the parent and on the container, not on individual items. Okay. So flex, and of course you'll be able to set a lot of other properties as well. So this is flex direction column. And let me just increase the height of this so that I can show you clearly that the way things stack up is at the top. Okay. So flex direction column is top to bottom. You can also do flex direction column reverse and that will send things from the bottom to top. You can see item one above that item two, item three and item four. So that is how you can lay things out. Flex direction row is left to right. Flex direction row reverse is right to left. Column is top to bottom reverse column reverses bottom to top. Okay. These are the four values you can set for the flex direction property. And with Flexbox special, specifically, I would highly recommend that you practice this, that you check out if you have a question, what happens if I do X, then just go ahead and try it out and maybe set proper heights and widths. You can use the starting code that we've provided here and experiment and understand and improve your understanding. Okay. All right. So that's fine. Now, the next thing is to check what happens if you have maybe data that is not going to fix within the given width of the container. So now we have a container and now for this container, we have a bunch of items and all these items seem to be fitting just fine. Well, what happens if we had more items? Let's say if we had item five, six, seven. Right. So item five, six, seven, clearly you can see what happens is first, they try to compress to fit within, but if they cannot go beyond a particular width, then they just go out. Then they just fall out. Now, when they do fall out, what do you do? Another, another condition that could come up here is let's say our left and right padding was actually higher. It specified a 30 pixel padding left and right. What are you going to do here? Now these, these all seem to be overflowing. These all seem to be going outside the box here. And that is where you can specify a flex wrap property. So you can say flex wrap. And the default value is no wrap. And again, this has to be set on the parent and it specifies whether the container, whether the children should be wrapped, which means they should go on the next line or not. No wrap simply means that you want everything to show up on the same line, even if it exceeds the width of the container. The other option is to say wrap, in which case this is what happens. It takes item one, two, three, and then it, when, as soon as it finds a child element that cannot fit without exceeding the width of the container, it wraps onto the next line. So we have five, six, seven. You can also do wrap reverse. And the idea here is that it wraps not onto the next line, but onto the previous line. So you can say one, two, three, and then it goes four, five, six, and seven. Okay. And notice this is different from row reverse. So if you did re row reverse and you can check this out, it would now go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. So, Keep that in mind that you have a reversal on the row level, you have a reversal possibly on the column level, and then you can do that reversal on the wrap level as well, whether you want the lines to go up or you want the lines to go down. Okay. So that is your, uh, that is the flex wrap property. Uh, so you can of course just use no wrap, which is what just uses this. And then you have wrap and wrap reverse.
you can experiment with this and you will get a better understanding now the next set of properties which are around justification and alignment determine how flex items are positioned within a container so these options provide control over the distribution of items along the main axis so the main axis let's say if it is a flex row then the main axis is the horizontal axis and the secondary axis is the uh, is the vertical axis but if the flex direction is column then the main axis is a vertical axis and the secondary axis is a horizontal axis okay so we'll just talk about it's also called the cross axis so justification is controlled along the main axis that is done using something called justify content and then alignment around is controlled along the cross axis okay and i know this seems confusing this is probably the most confusing part of flexbox but with some practice you'll get used to it let's look at justify content now here is how justify content works let's say you have a flex container with flex direction row and on that container if you set justify content to flex start then things will simply show up from left to right okay if you set justify content to center then the items will still show left to right but they will be centered on the horizontal axis or on the main axis right so what that means is that all the items will be shown and then space will be added on the left and right on the other hand if you set flex end as justify content then the items will just stick to the right you notice they're still rendered left to right one two three but they are now sticking to the right side instead of the left side and similarly we have a bunch of other options as well so let's take a look let's get rid of some of these other items so let's get rid of item four five and four five six and seven or just let's get rid of items five six and seven so i'm just commenting them out and let us reduce the padding the horizontal padding for each item so this is how they look right now now i can get rid of the wrapping for now as well now let me just add justify content and again it's on the parent and let me say flex start that's where they are they are currently sticking to the start which is the left right it's not saying left it's saying start because if i had row reverse then they would stick to the right and if i had column they would stick to the top so it's just start at uh, start of the axis whatever be the main axis okay and now i could say justify content center and now you can see that they're still laid out left to right but now they are placed at the center and as i change the width of the screen you can see that they still remain right in the center so anytime you want to horizontally center content within the page just put an outer div give it the display flex and then put in an inner div um, and give the outer div justify content center and that is going to horizontally center bunch of content on the page very straightforward okay next let us now do justify content flex end now you can see that they are laid out at the end so i modify then there's another thing you can use you can use space between now what space between does is there is of course this padding for now let me just get rid of this padding so that we can have a better understanding of the space so when you use space between then space is added between each item and they are laid out from the left to the right with equal space between them you can see here that as i change the size of the page space is added or removed between and all space is equal okay then you have space around a space around is similar to space between but what you do is you take half of the space between and then you add it on the left and the right end as well okay so that is what space around looks like you can see visually that this space is about half of this space and that is why i removed the padding for now just so that we could clearly see these effects finally there is something called space evenly okay now space evenly as you can guess what it's doing is it's going to add the same amount of space on the left edge on the right edge and between items so slight differences between space between space around and space evenly depending on the use case you can use one of these or just do something else altogether okay but for now let me bring that back to flex start and we can also see this effect on a flex direction column so let's say we have the direction column 
and let's say we have a height of 250 px here you can see that these are now laid out from the top i can do flex end of course i can then do flex center they, and they are now centered so now the main axis is the vertical axis and in fact it starts from the top so the start is the top end is the bottom and i can do things like space around space between as well so this is space between that is flex direction column so all of these properties work for flex direction row and column okay get rid of that height all right so that is justify content flex start center end space around space between and space evenly and the same thing works for the column as well when you have a flex direction column this is how the justify content values look very powerful property you will be using this a lot to create more complex layouts then we have align items so justify content was along the main axis so for flex row it was along the horizontal axis for flex column it's around the vertical axis align items is used to align things along the cross axis okay so here is what that means let's say you have align items on you're setting align items on a parent where the flex direction is row let's look at an example of this let's just see this live let's set the height to 250 pixels again okay so the flex direction is row and i want to set the align items property the default value is stretch and you can see that as I increase the height of this div from whatever was the default height to 250 pixels, everything stretched. All of these inner divs, all of these child divs, they automatically stretch to take up the full height or the full space along the cross axis, which is the vertical axis, because the main axis is the horizontal axis. But I could also do flex start. So align items flex start. So now along the cross axis or along the vertical axis, things are sticking to the start okay so in the cross axis this is the start and this is the end so things are uh, sticking to the start i could also maybe just stick them to the end so i can just say flex end and now they are sticking to the bottom which is again the the main axis or the primary axis is horizontal so along the cross axis top to bottom they are at the bottom or at the end I can also align items center of course and in which case they are centered here along the cross axis and notice how this is different from justify content center which is going to center them along the primary axis or the main axis right so here is another trick if you just set align item center and justify content center then your content is centered vertically and horizontally on the page and right? as you increase or decrease the height it is going to be centered vertically and it is going to be centered horizontally as well so let's say if this was 300 pixels it would still be centered vertically if this was 150 pixels it would still be centered vertically so vertical centering can be achieved by using flex direction row and align item center or by using flex direction column and justify content center so there are both ways to achieve it uh, but that is how align items and uh, justify content play justify content plays along the main axis align items plays along the cross axis um what other options do we have for align items well we have fl flex start flex and center we obviously we looked at stretch which is the default value that there is also another specific align items property called baseline which looks quite similar to start but here's the difference what this does is this aligns the baseline of the text for each of the divs so if I were to go in, let's say if I were to go in into item one and change the font size to 10 pixels. And if I were to go in into item three and change the font size to 30 pixels, this is what the content would look like. So notice what's happening here because align items is set to baseline, the line that runs through the bottom of each line of text aligns perfectly. Now this is very different from doing align items text start which is going to just align things right at the very top or even doing something like align item center which is going to just align the centers of the items and not the baseline so 
So very special case, you might not always need this, but you can align by the baseline. If you need to, if you have text of various sizes in a bunch of flex items. Okay. So those are all the ways in which you can use align items. And let us revert that for now. And of course, all of this works on flex direction column as well. So here we have flex direction column. Let us increase this height to 250 px. Okay, so here is flex direction column. So now the primary or the main axis is along the bottom, along top to bottom. So the cross axis is left to right. And now I could say flex start to align things on the left. And by default, of course, the value is stretch to align things to take up the entire space on the cross axis. And of course, I could also have align item center, in which case they will be horizontally centered this time because the cross axis is the horizontal axis and vertically they're still right at the beginning. So uh, remember that for justify content, the default value is flex start, which is right at the beginning. But for align items, the default value is stretch, which is to take up the entire space along the cross axis. And of course, I can do flex end here as well. And now along the cross axis or the horizontal axis, they show up on the right. Let's revert that. So that was align items. Okay. So on this is what it works on row. This is how it works on column. I know it's starting to get confusing practice and that is how you'll get it. And of course, you can always come back and refer to it. You don't have to remember all of this perfectly. Okay. Just remember justify content is along the main axis. Align items is along the cross axis. Now you also have this special property called align self, which can be used to change the alignment of along the cross axis of just a particular child. Okay. So now we're looking at certain child level properties, not the parent level properties. So let's increase the height here. Once again, height 250 pixels and by default, everything has aligned stretch. And let me just go in here and let me just set this to align item center for now. So by default, all the align, all the items are aligned along the center. And let me go in here into item one. And for item one, let me just set align, align self. So item one just by itself should be aligned to the start. So flex start. Now align items, item one goes right, at, right to the top at flex start. And I can then at, I can then align maybe item to align self to flex end. Now I'm pushing item to right to the very end of the cross axis. Remember, we're still on the flex direction row. So the main axis is row, the cross axis is top to bottom. And we can of course go ahead and for item three, we can use align self stretch. And now item three is stretching and item four can be aligned separately as well. So you, you can have a global setting for align items and then you can override it using align self for each item as you need. Of course, this works not just for column not just for row, but also for column. So here now what's happening is that we have this, let me just get rid of the default, get rid of all these for now. So now we have the column as the main axis. So along the horizontal axis, we have set to align item center. That's why they're all centered. Then if we change the setting for item one, you can see that item one goes to the left because we are setting it to flex start. Item two goes to the right because we are setting it to flex end. So along the cross axis, which is left to right, it is going on the right. Item three is stretching and item four is in the center, which is the default setting that has been put in for the container. Okay. So you can set a property for the container and then you can override it for these individual items. Now that makes sense for align items doesn't make sense for justify content. And I'll let you think about why Okay. for now let's get rid of this. And let us just go back here to flex direction row. Okay, so that is align self, you can use flex start or you can use flex end to move it to the end of the cross axis, you can center it in the cross axis or even stretch it, or even align it to the baseline, you have all these options available to you.
okay next up there are also a couple of adjacent properties called align content and justify items i will not cover them here because they are not very commonly used i have almost never used them maybe once or twice but they are slightly different from align items and justify justify content so i will let you explore these on your own so check out the properties justify items and align content as you can imagine they might do alignment along the main axis and justification along the cross axis so you have those options as well and look up some tutorials to understand how they differ from justify content and align items or if you don't want to get confused right now just skip these all together and just use the default justify content along the main axis and align items along the cross axis but if you want to you can experiment okay <clears throat> so those are some justification and alignment properties so in most cases you will be working with flex direction you will be working with flex wrap you'll be working with the align items and justify content properties and sometimes you will use the align self property on a particular child but then there are also certain flex properties that you can set on children specifically to control how the various children take up space on the page okay and we're going to look at all of these properties they're called flex grow flex shrink and flex basis and then we are going to look at a shorthand property so that you never actually have to use all of these separate properties but it's useful to understand what they mean okay so the first property is the flex grow property now notice over here if i get rid of the height notice that these divs are not taking up the entire space available at these and let me just have three divs for now let's get rid of, get rid of the fourth div as well yeah so notice that these divs are not taking up the entire width on the page now sometimes you might want in maybe some kind of a sidebar layout where you have a left sidebar right sidebar and the middle item should grow to take up as much space as possible in such cases you can use the flex grow property so when you have some free space you can specify a flex grow property and by default its value is set to zero which means that you don't want a, a you don't want one of the children to grow by default you only want each of the children to take up as much space as is required to display all of its children okay so for example right now to show item 1 this is the only amount of space that is required but if let's say it, the text here was item 1 item 1 it would go it, it would take up twice the space to show the to show the content right however if let's say i wanted item 2 to take up all the space in between and item 3 to shift completely to the right then i could do something like this i could say for item 2 i could say item 2 flex grow 1 now what i'm saying is that item 2 should take up how much ever space is available in between and you can specify any positive number here 1 2 3 4 and I'll, we'll talk about what they mean but as soon as uh, as soon as you specify something other than 0 item 2 starts to grow to take up the available space okay now let's say i wanted to do something slightly more complex let's say what i wanted to do was item 1 should take up maybe 30% of the space item 3 should take up 30% of the space and item 4 should item 2 should take up 40% of the space so it should always be if there is additional space available it should go 30 40 30 okay and let's do let's see how to do that so the way i would do that is simply by specifying those proportions for each item so for item 1 let us say flex grow to be 3 and these are proportions so that's why i don't necessarily need to write 30 40 30 these are not percentages and item 3 will also be flex grow now you can see this layout 3 4 3 and maybe just to make it a little more pronounced you can look at maybe 2 6 2 you can see that 20% of the space is taken up by item yeah 20% of the space is taken up by item 1 20% by item 3 and you can see that item 2 takes up about 60% okay you can also do something like 1 1 or they don't have to add up to 10 or 100 or anything it's just that now you can see that the out of the additional space that is available 
10% of the space is taken by item 1, 10% by item 3 and the rest is taken by item 2. Okay. So what you're specifying is among the available additional space, how much space should be taken up by each item? How much additional space? So these are not exactly in that proportion. These are actually not exactly 1 is to 4 is to 1 because the base size is not affected. And that is where we'll talk about flex basis slightly down the line. Okay. But grow tells Flex grow determines a flex item's ability to grow relative to other items within a flex container, allowing it to expand and take up the available space. So what you can do is you can say that out of all the additional space, how should that space be distributed to each item? And the by default, it is zero. So by default, the additional space does not go to any item. And as you start setting values for each item, then though by those proportions, the space is distributed. Okay. So that is flex grow. Next up, we have something called flex shrink. Okay. Now, just as we have flex grow, we have the flex shrink property and the flex shrink property determines a flex items ability to shrink relative to other items within the flex container, allowing it to contract and fit the available space. So here is how it works. Let me get rid of flex grow settings for now. Let's just disable this, disable this, this. Okay, so now let's say we had too much content here and we had to actually shrink things. How can I do that? Well, let me just add a bunch of space here. Okay, so now there is now there is more space here and you can see that the text is wrapping onto the next line. But if we wanted to, if you wanted to shrink things a little bit, then we would have to go in and set the shrink property. Let me set here flex shrink. And by default, things shrink automatically. So this is the default value. So you can see that they have shrunk a little bit. Ideally, they should have been like this, but they have shrunk a little bit. They have shrunk a little bit because the, the text has come onto the next line. So there is definitely some shrinking that has happened. Right? So shrinking is happening by default and they're going to shrink to their base size and they're not going to shrink beyond the base size by default. But in case I set flex shrink to one for one of them, and then I set flex shrink to zero. Or the others, so I've set flex shrink to one and flex shrink to zero. You can now see that as I shrink it, item one shrinks, which is the default, it tries to shrink so till it can no longer shrink till there is no till it till the space of its children is completely taken up but item 2 and item 3 don't shrink because the shrinking is constant that's what happens and of course you can then shrink in proportions as well so let's say you set it up in such a way that each of these are taking up some additional space you have original size original size here and you're then going to try to shrink them in a certain proportion. So item one is going to shrink in a certain proportion. Item three is going to shrink in a certain proportion. This will be clearer if we have more content here. So let me just put some more content so that each of these can shrink independently. Okay. Now you can see that item one has shrunk significantly, whereas item two and item three have not shrunk at all. But let's say we want the shrinkage to happen in a certain proportion. So then we could say that, okay, item one should shrink in the proportion of one item or oh, two should shrink in the proportion of three. So it should shrink three X and item three should also shrink proportion one, right? You can now see that right now item two is shrinking the most, whereas item one and item three are shrinking the least. So what we are saying here is that the decrease in size has to be distributed in the ratio one is to three is to one for the specific columns. Okay. So that is flex shrink. And then the final, the final property is flex basis. Now the flex basis property decides what is the initial main size of a flex item before any available space is distributed. And by default, the flex basis is set to auto which means that the initial main size of each child is determined by the items own width and height, which is basically the width and height of its content. If it is not set. Okay. 
However, you can also say that the basis or the main size of a, of a particular item is zero. So let's see what happens when we do that. Let us set flex basis to zero for all of these. Okay. Now when we set the flex basis to zero, what we're saying is that there is no basic size. You can keep reducing the size and Well, I think, I guess it's one probably. Yeah. Uh, so by default, flex basis is set to uh, auto, which means it takes up its default size. And then flex basis of zero says that there is no basis size uh, and it can shrink as much as possible. So in this case, you can see that item one, two, three are all shrinking as much as possible because we've not set a basis size. So the basis size is just as low as possible, right? So by default, there's no shrink, there is no it is not going to take up any additional space than the minimum necessary space. On the other hand, and when flex basis is zero, shrink doesn't really make sense. On the other hand, we can add flex grow. And now what we're saying is that they can grow to take up the additional space in the specified criteria. So one is to four is to four to take up whatever additional space is available beyond the very basic minimum space. Okay. So the interplay of flex basis, flex shrink and flex grow is what decides what happens in the default state, what happens when you have more space available, what happens when you have less space available. Okay. But however, most of the time you don't actually use these three properties. You just use a basic value or you just use a simple shorthand property called flex. Okay. So here's what you can do. Instead of saying flex, uh, instead of saying flex grow, flex basis, flex um, shrink, etc. Let's say I want the ratios to be two, four, and four, at least the ratio of the additional space and the shrinkage. And I can just specify something like this flex two, flex four, and flex or uh, flex two. And now things are automatically scaling as I expect. So there is the base size that still applies a very basic minimum base size. So wh when you do flex two, flex four, flex two, what that means is you're saying that the flex grow value is two, the flex shrink value is two, and then the flex value is, uh, or the flex basis value is zero, okay, or the minimum possible space. So normally you'll just end up doing this flex two, flex four, and flex two, or setting some kind of a proportion between these flex items. And that is how you'll use it. But you have a bunch of different ways to use the syntax. You can just set a single initial value. You can set it to auto. You can set it to none, which will just use zero, zero for uh, zero, zero for each. And you can just use a single value, one value syntax like flex one, which is going to set it to one, one, zero. Or you can use a two value syntax, which is going to set it to one, one, and then maybe a specific base size, a fixed base size. Or you can use a three value syntax, which is going to use a certain a uh, percentage base size as well. So you have a bunch of ways to set the flex property. Okay? The most common use case of the flex property is something that I want to show you because flex grow basis and shrink. I've, I almost never use them because they never layouts are never that complicated that you need to use all these properties. But the most common layout that I use is that one of these needs to take up all the additional space and the rest of them do not need to take up the additional space. So in that case, I would do something like this. I would just go in. Let me just reduce the content a little bit. Yeah. And let me reduce the padding here a little bit as well. Yeah. So the most common use of the flex property, which is the flex grow shrink and basis property is this. You want item two to take up all the space in between no matter what the screen width is. So I would just go in into item two and I would say flex one. And just by doing that, just by setting flex one, item two takes up all the space in between, not just horizontally, but this can happen vertically as well. So let's say we have display flex and flex direction column. And we have a height of 150px or let's make that 250px 
Yeah. So you can see here now we are taking up all the available space in this direction. All right. And similarly, one other use case you might have is that I want item one and item two to always have the same width. So let me just go back to flex direction row and let me just set item one flex one let me just set this to flex five or something like a very high value and item three okay now you can see here that more or less item one item three are going to have similar widths and we don't necessarily have to achieve it by setting these flex values we can also just do these in this way we can just say width 20 percent and width 60 percent and width 20 percent okay so this is the actual real use case of the flex property or why we use flexbox because we want to achieve a certain set of widths this may be our main content this may be our left content this may be our right content now all of that of course when we're using the flex property under the hood it's it's using flex basis flex grow flex um, shrink and all that uh, but i just use the flex property directly okay so experiment with the various options for flex grow flex shrink flex basis but don't stress if they don't make a lot of sense because there are certain edge cases certain special scenarios which you may not be able to keep in your head you can always just look them up the key is maybe just to use the flex property and try to get what you want and the most common use case is either setting flex one to expand a certain div to take up all space or using flex one on a couple of divs to maybe make them roughly equal width okay now Flexbox has many applications in all kinds of web design. As you can see for the New York Times website, this kind of a layout is achieved and made responsive only using Flexbox. It is used to create responsive layouts. It is used to create certain grid systems as well. There's a separate layout called the grid layout, which we have not covered today. We'll maybe try and cover at some point. It is used to create equal height columns. Let's say you want to have maybe a bunch of uh, cards showing side by side. All of those cards should have equal height. That is something that you can create using Flexbox. It is used to perform vertical centering. Let's say you want to center a div vertically on the page or vertically inside another div. The way you do it is simply by setting flex direction columns, justify content center or flex direction row align item center. It is used for reordering elements. Sometimes on mobile, you want a left to right a certain layout and on desktop, you want a reverse layout. So that's what you can use it for. It is used for maybe showing image and text side by side. It is used for creating responsive forms. Let's say you have a form where you have a first name, last name. An example of this can be seen on the Jovian website. So you can see that first name and last name are side by side. And then again, you have email and then we have phone number and you have the country code and phone number side by side. And then you have again uh, the program. So all of this is achieved using Flexbox and it is used for ensuring spacing and alignment making sure that something takes up the entire space making sure that two divs are the same size and there are many tutorials you can go through the more practice you get with flexbox the better you will get at it specifically i would highly recommend the series of screencasts by wes boss called what the flexbox it goes into each flex property and then it shows you a bunch of specific scenarios as well and i would also highly recommend you to check out 30 days of flexbox which is again a series of tutorials that you can follow along day by day and there is just for reference there is this complete guide to flexbox that you can always check out this contains a bunch of visuals and it contains information about each property so that you don't have to remember this i always look this up i never remember this even after using this for probably 10 plus years at this point okay so it takes a while to get used to thinking in flexbox but once you do you can build pretty much any layout that you can imagine right so the last thing I'll say about Flexbox is that it's powerful, but because it is so powerful, it is also somewhat confusing. It takes a while to get used to it, but don't give up. Don't run away from Flexbox. Just limit your usage to basic flex direction, flex wrap and align items and justify content. And maybe every now and then use the flex property. So let's now go ahead and redesign the Jovian career site. So this is what it looks like on desktop. I think it looks fine on desktop for now. We don't need to really redesign anything here, but we do want to redesign it on mobile because on mobile, it definitely doesn't look good at all. So we want to do something with the mobile design. 
and we are going to follow these steps first we're going to create a separate branch on our code space remember we don't want to affect the main site when we are making changes when we are experimenting so we're going to create a separate branch and test our changes there without affecting the main site then we are going to create separate wireframes for mobile and desktop screens then we are going to set up base styles and media queries for a mobile first design then we are going to implement each section first for mobile and then for desktop then we are going to test each section at various widths and make required adjustments and finally we are going to create a pull request we are going to review that pull request review the preview deployment and then merge it back to the main site okay so our main site which is jovian careers responsive live.versel.app this is going to remain unchanged till we merge our pull request right so this is what the common practice is that you have the main site that is running then you create a branch work on your feature and once the feature is reviewed and tested and merged back then this will automatically get updated because versel will do an automatic deployment for okay? so this is our main site we're not going to affect that but this is our preview site which we are looking at here let us just open up index.html open with live server put that in here so this is a preview site let me just set it to a default width so this is what it looks like on desktop this is 100% width let me just open the same page up in a couple of other browsers as well and i'm just going to select different devices in each case so here i want to study its width on the tablet let's say maybe a tablet would be about 700 pixels raise the width a little bit here yeah so about 750 pixels i believe would be a tablet layout and let us also create a mobile layout here so we're going to look at a mobile layout as well so let's maybe design around 300 and maybe around 400 pixels that is what most mobile layouts are around okay now we have for our code space for our index.html which is running using the live server extension so this is all the preview of what we are doing on our code space we have the mobile layout here we have the tablet layout here and we have the desktop layout here and we're going to start with the mobile layout we're going to do a mobile first design and then we're going to slowly improve that layout to account for tablet and desktop as well Okay. so we're going we're going to use these breakpoints under 576 is going 576 pixels is going to be our mobile layout so this is about 400 that's mobile under 768 pixels and above 576 is going to be a tablet layout i believe we've set this to about yeah we've set this to about seven let's set it to about 740 yeah so that's in our that's in the tablet range and we can always go left and right and we can shift things and greater than 768 pixels is going to be a desktop layout which is what this is and of course we can also then consider large desktops etc for now i'm simply not considering those okay so let's get started step by step slowly and before we proceed i would encourage you as you are reviewing this to pause take a few minutes to think about how you would design the mobile version of the jobian career site and take inspiration from the examples that we looked at earlier and maybe try to create a wireframe for the mobile version of the site on pen and paper or using a digital whiteboard like excalidraw.com but here is a wireframe that we are going to be using now typically a design mockup that is given to you is going to be given for mobile tablet and desktop similarly we can try creating wireframes on mobile tablet and desktop but just to keep things simple we are just going to create a mobile wireframe and a desktop wireframe Excuse me we're going to uh, keep things simple use a mobile wireframe and a desktop wireframe and for tablet we will just approximate and maybe pick some elements from the mobile and some ele elements from the desktop okay so for the desktop view we are going to use the same layout that we had earlier so which is the jovian logo here at the top with the jovian text then an image here the about jovian section the job opportunities table and the submit your application form and then there is a footer at the bottom with a bunch of options courses programs and youtube for mobile here is what we are going to do we are going to use 
nav bar, but in the nav bar, we're not going to show the entire Jovian logo. We're just going to show the Jovian icon. Okay, this is a common practice on mobile that you often just show the icon. So I'll just show you an example of this. Let's say I go to jovian.com slash learn. Zoom in here a little bit. And if I go into the mobile view here, you can see that at this point, we only show the icon because we often have a bunch of things on the right as well. This is the profile icon, which also happens to be the Jovian logo. But yeah, we only show the icon on the mobile. And we also maybe change the layout slightly on mobile, as you can see on the Jovian platform as well. Okay. So on mobile, we're going to show the icon. We are going to show the image, but we're probably going to reduce its height a little bit, not to ensure that not to take up the entire page. Otherwise, it might just take up a lot of space. Then we are going to have this about Jovian section where we're going to have this description and we are going to move the image below. Right? So the image is going to remain below and I think I'll use the same layout for tablet as well. Then we are going to have job opportunities, but this time for job opportunities, we are going to use a list or maybe a bunch of divs. So we are going to show these cards instead of actually showing a table because on mobile viewing a table doesn't make sense. But on desktop, you're still going to use a table. So we're going to see how to achieve that. Then we have this layout for application. So on mobile, it's a nice idea to maybe just make all your inputs full width. So just let them occupy the full width of the screen. And uh, we have this upload resume cover letter button as well. And finally, for the footer, we are simply going to show the options one below the other. Unlike on desktop, we are going to show where we are going to show the options side by side. Okay. And we'll decide how to change these layouts for a tablet as well. But these are the two layouts that we are working with. Okay. And specifically the job opportunities table is going to be the real challenge because it doesn't have a table layout on mobile. It has a list of cards. And I encourage you to go ahead and replicate these wireframes on your own. Wireframing is a very useful skill for a web developer. Before you can go in and start coding the website, you should have a very clear idea of how it's going to look at the very least using these rough wireframes. And as I've said before, we are going to follow a mobile first design, which means we're going to first set up CSS styles for mobile section by section. And then we are going to enhance the CSS styles for tablet and for desktop and maybe even for smaller uh, for larger screens. Okay. So for that, here is how we can begin. We can begin by commenting out all the existing CSS and just rebuild the page right from scratch. And we'll just put in a bunch of media queries at the beginning. Okay, so first let's comment out all the CSS. Let us open up styles.css here. Let us comment out all the CSS. The way we'll do it is by adding this star slash star at the top and then adding a star slash at the bottom. Okay, so you added slash star at the top and star slash at the bottom. And now if we reload our pages, we can see that all the all the CSS is gone, completely gone, right? So we have no styles. We're starting from scratch, same content, but no CSS. This one image is looking really big. So I'm just going to give this image a height explicitly in my index.html file. I'm going to go into this index.html file and I'm going to scroll down and find this image, the team image, and I'm just going to give it a height of 100 just so that it doesn't mess up the entire page when I'm setting things up. All right. So now we are more or less ready to begin. We have this mobile layout, top to bottom content. We have this tablet layout and we have this desktop layout. All right. Now let us first just bring in our media queries that we are going to use for each layout. Now the base styles, because we're using a mobile first layout, the base styles are just going to be added right at the top without any media query. They're going to apply to all the screens. And then what we're going to do is have this condition called whenever the width of the screen exceeds 576 pixels, then we want a certain set of CSS rules to apply. Right? So we are going to then copy over this media query, bring that in, and that is going to handle tablets. So more than 576 pixels, that is going to handle tablets. So notice that it's going to apply about 576 and it's going to continue applying unless further overridden in a subsequent query. Okay, this way we can avoid a lot of repetition instead of setting all the properties for each particular possibility. Okay, then this is maybe going to be the second media query that we'll use, which is 
for laptops or maybe desktop screens, proper browsers. So this is going to be medium devices or MD, which is going to be above 768 pixels. And then there are also maybe another couple of queries, which we may not use, but let's just keep them around. What to do if it's even bigger, if it's bigger than 900 pixels, and if it's even bigger than 1200 pixels. Again, we don't have to use these, but if you want, we can maybe increase the font size, a uh, base size a little bit or something like that. All right, so now our basic setup is ready. We have this, we have like basic CSS rules that are going to come here. We are going to then add device specific or um, progressively enhance our design to tablet and desktop. Okay, looks good. Looks good. The next thing to do is to just set up copy over some of the basic styles without any media queries. So I'm going to first come in here and I'm going to say that the font size, the base font size on mobile is going to be not 16 pixels, but 14 pixels. I just want the font to be slightly smaller. I don't want it to, to be too big on mobile because otherwise there may not be enough content on the screen to be re readable. So let me keep that. And then let me come in here into body. And let us come in and let us set the font size for the body to 1 EM. 1 M. Okay. That is going to be the font size for the body. Then let me come in and let me set uh, apart from the font size for the body. We've also set here that we've removed the margin padding. All of this needs to go for mobile as well. We've set the font family to Roboto and sans serif, and we've set the body text color to four, 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 four. Okay, great. Let us now set the font family and the font weight for our headers. So we want the inter font family to be used. And remember these font families have been included using these link tags you can see here that we've included the inter and the roboto font family and their various weights so all of this is common all of this is going to be present on mobile tablet desktop that's why we're just putting it completely outside okay so that's fine too then let us go in and let us set the font sizes for each header so remember we are using these rems we are using rems or relative measurements for the headers so that on mobile screens, they are going to be multiples of, or let's set this to one RAM. On mobile screens, uh, they are going to be multiples of 14. So on mobile screen, you can verify here if I go into inspect and I check its computed font size, you can see that it's 35 pixels. 35 is 2.5 times 14. Okay. But as we go on to bigger screens, we're going to set the base font size to 16 pixels. And so the header size is going to increase as well. Okay. What else? Yeah, I think that's what we've added. So we've added HTML, um, body H1, H2, and let's add a couple more. Let's add the text color and let's add the, uh, the style for the links. Right now you can see that links are underlined. I don't want that. And I want links to be my brand brand blue color. So that's where I'm going to go in and grab this decoration text decoration or the links. Let me put that in here as well. Okay. So yeah, so now you can see that if I reload the page, our links have the desired color, they don't have an underline. And on clicking our links have the desired dark color or on over our links have the desired dark color. Okay. All right, so now this is looking good. So far, we have set the base styles, let me just reload this page. Yeah, the, we have set the base styles now. We, and of course, it just spreads out um, on tablet as well. So there's nothing that really is changing across the different layouts. The first change that I want to use is when we get to a tablet style, I want to use a slightly bigger font size for the body. Okay. So within the media query where we hit a min width of 576, I want to use a slightly bigger font size. So I'm just going to come in here and I am just going to use a bigger font size here. So I'll just come into the first media query, which is over here. And I'm going to put the font size of 16 pixels. Let's move these up. Let's keep all the base styles right at the top so that things are well organized. So these are the base styles. The base font size is 14 pixels. No change here. You can see that the base font size is 14. You can actually go in and check somewhere that the font size is 14. But as soon as we hit a bigger font size, as soon as you hit a bigger screen, 
As soon as we hit a min width of 576 pixels, the base font size changes to 16 pixels. Okay? You can actually observe this change in the font size by just dragging this. So at 576, the text should become slightly bigger. You see here that the text became slightly bigger and not just the text, because we are using rems to set the size of the headings, you can see that the headings have become slightly bigger as well. Okay, so this is one change that you will often see that from mobile to tablet or maybe from tablet to desktop, there will be a slight change in the font size. Now, of course, you can go ahead and maybe change. Let's say you get a very big desktop, a very big screen. You can use the base font size of 20 px. Let me just come in here and let me just show you what that would look like as well. See, whenever we hit 1200 pixels, I want to use 20 px. So, so far it's 16. At some point, it should become 20. Okay, maybe I'm still not hitting 1200 pixels. Let's try that at maybe 992 pixels. Yeah, so you can see that it's small here. So this is the tablet layout and at 992 pixels, it becomes bigger, right? And then of course, uh, on mobile, it is even smaller. So you have all those, well, actually let's set that to 20. So at 992 pixels, it should become bigger. Yeah, so you can see that just around 992 pixels, it starts to become even bigger, right? So at here, this is mobile. And this is tablet. And this is the large desktop. Okay, these are all the variations that you can check. And sometimes you just have to inspect things visually and figure out if you're getting what you're going for. Okay. All right. So now we've changed the base text size, and I encourage you to maybe change some other base styles. Maybe change base heading sizes as well, and see what happens. Now, the next thing we'll do is fix the nav bar. Okay, so first let us implement the nav bar from for mobile. Let's bring this back to about 400 and let us go check the nav bar. Okay, so now the we need to bring in the basic nav bar styles first. So let's bring that in here. The nav bar has a padding of 8 pixels and a margin of 0 pixels. So let's just bring that in. I think we can keep that. I don't think we need to change that at all. So I'm just going to bring it all the way at the top. You can see that our nav bar is starting to look fine. Now, one thing I want to do in my navbar is not use this entire logo, but maybe use a smaller version of the logo that contains just this icon and not the text. And for that, I have already put up this icon online, so I can just use this link or I can download it, drag it within my code space and add it to my repository. Both options are available. So let me do one thing. Let me just add this icon into my code as well. So let me just go IMG ID logo. And I'm going to change the icon with the text to logo with text. Okay. Then alt equals Jovian logo. And I'm going to change the alt of the existing icon to Jovian logo with text. And let's specify an SRC. And let us close it. And I think we have a height 30 as well. So let us set a height equals 30 as well. I don't think we need to change the height particularly. Okay. Now we have both these images. We have the icon image and then we have this logo along with the text. Now we want to show one of these on mobile and then on tablets, I think we have enough space that we can show the entire logo with the text. So here is how we can achieve this. First, we want to hide this icon. We want to hide this icon. We want to hide the logo with the text on mobile. So by default, I'm going to keep it hidden. And the way to keep it hidden is let me just select logo with text. So I'm selecting it with the ID and let me just set display none. There it's gone. The logo with the text is gone. It's gone, not just on mobile, but it's gone on tablet and it's gone on, it's gone on desktop as well. Now let me make this logo text visible on tablet. So I am just going to go into the tablet style, which is above 576 pixels or min width of 576 pixels. I'm going to say logo with text display. I can just say, I believe I can do block, which is the default. Now it doesn't show up on mobile, which is under 576 pixels, but it does show up on. Yeah, it does show up here on tablet and it does show up here 
on desktop as well okay but of course we also need to hide the logo we need to hide this logo icon so i can just also say over here logo display block on mobile and i can just say logo display none on tablets okay so on mobile i have the logo only the icon on tablets okay that should say none on tablets now i have the logo with the text and also on bigger screens i have the logo with the text so that takes care of the navbar that is a change that i'm going for that is a change that we have on our website as well okay all right so the navbar is taken care of and the only change we made is added this second image and we have added the base style where we are putting the padding in the margin and we have put the logo with text as display none and we are showing it on tablets and desktops and we are not showing it on uh, we are not showing the icon alone on tablets and notice that once we apply for tablets because this is this only has a min width criteria not max width it's going to apply at all bigger sizes if i want i can then go in and change it at a bigger size as well otherwise i can leave it as is so mobile first progressive enhancement section by section okay let's fix the banner image so the there are a couple of issues with the banner image one is that it's not taking up the entire width of the page and second is that i might need to limit the height of the banner image for each of the widths that i'm working with okay and i want to do that let me just do that so the first thing i'll do is go into the banner image looks like it has a height let me remove the default height so that i can change its height based on the specific breakpoints and let me come in here and let me just copy over some of the content that i already have for the banner so we have object fit cover this is to make sure that depending on what width or height we have it automatically fills the space the available space okay and here's the first thing i'm going to do i am going to first give it a height of just 120 pixels the banner image and i'm going to give it a width of 100 percent okay and i think that looks good so maybe one 150 pixels let's see yeah that looks good so now on mobile this is what it's going to look like it's going to take up 150 pixels and it's going to take up the entire width of the page and it is going to cover so if we did not have object fit cover you can see that it stretches the image which is not good i don't want to stretch the image especially if they, these are faces of people so always use object fit cover or sometimes you might need to use object fit contain if you want to if you want the entire image to fit inside which is not what we want here we want cover so let me just put object fit cover that's what this looks like okay perfect so that takes care of the banner on mobile but you can see that it's starting to get cropped on laptop on tablet and it'll get further cropped as i go bigger so on maybe on tablets i can increase its height a little bit so i can say banner i can give it a height of 220 pixels how about that yeah, i think that looks good maybe even 200 pixels should do it i think that's good and then here again it seems to be getting cropped a little bit so i can come in and i can come in into the next design and this is the first time i'm touching the desktop design so far we've just been updating for tablet and that has carried over to desktop so here i can maybe give it a height of 240 pixels maybe even 250 pixels this is now looking good okay so i should probably verify that this scales properly okay maybe i need to give it a little higher maybe let's go 300 pixels yeah i think that looks good so far at this as well but if i wanted i could even just do something like 250 pixels here and then on even bigger screens i could just go in and i could just make that 320 pixels okay so at some point it's going to become even bigger all right so that takes care of the banner i don't think there are any other changes required so we've removed the height property that was there on the image and we've actually set height specifically at various breakpoints so it's going to start out with 120 pixels it's going to grow to 200 and then to about 280 pixels or so at a desktops so that was pretty straightforward let us now go ahead and let us now do the about section as well so this is the about jovian section it has this h1 and then it has uh, some text over here 
and then it has this image as well. And what we want is if I go back to our layout, we want the text to show up above the image, still centered, but on desktop, we want them to show up side by side. Okay, let's try and achieve that. So, first thing I'm going to do is just copy over the styles for H1. So, H1 has text align center. I think that's good. I'm just going to keep that. Okay, but I feel that the space here above and below H1 is, seems to be very high. So I want to reset that. So I just want to say margin. I just want to set the margin to 8px0. So just 8 pixels of space above and below should be good enough for me. Maybe I could go 12px. Yeah, 12px looks fine. But of course, that may not look good on tablet and on desktop. So I might then have to go in here and I might need to just put in an H1 margin, let's say 16 PX on tablet. And I might go in here in into desktop and I might set margin to 20 PX zero. Okay, so it's about 20 pixels on the desktop, which looks fine. About 16 pixels here on mobile, on pad, on tablet, that looks fine. And about eight pixels here, and I can verify this. I can click inspect. And I can go in here into the computed styles and make sure that it has the right. I believe 12 pixels is what we put here. So 12 looks fine, okay? So that's how you can progressively enhance spacing for the H1. But otherwise, this looks fine to me. Of course, the H1 itself is also bigger because the base font size is bigger. Okay, next up, we have this about section which has the ID about. And notice that we have set a, don't need this, notice that we have set a maximum width for this about section. Okay, so we may not need this maximum width on mobile, but it is, it is still useful on tablet and on desktop. So I'm going to keep it around. So we want to use display flex. That, that was for the horizontal layout. And then we have given it a max width of 800 pixels and we've given it, a, given it a margin zero auto and we've given it an internal padding. Let's just check. Okay, so now as soon as we did this, you can see that here it has taken up some space and now it is showing things left to right. Here is what I can do. Now this is the benefit I get with flex. I can just set flex direction column. And I can keep, use flex direction column so that things the first and the second section, the description and the image show up one below the other. And then I can go in and let me see what I want to do for tablet. So for tablet as well, I think I want to keep this layout, but I want to limit the width to about 500 pixels. I don't want it to go all over the place. So I'm just going to put in here max width of 500 pixels so that on mobile and tablet, it just uses 500 pixels so on tablet. Also, this looks fine. But definitely on desktop, I want it to take up 800 pixels as it is available, right? So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say for the about section, set the max width, not to 500, but to 800 pixels. So now it's taking up 800 pixels and set the flex direction to row and not column. So now it's going to show up side by side. Okay. This is great, but of course it's not taking up 50% of the space. So I need to fix that as well. So let's come back to the mobile view. Now, there are two parts within about, there is the description and then there is the, yeah, there is the description and then there is the image, the team image. So let's first get what we're doing here. So for the description, we have the width of 50% that we need to set only on desktop and we have a font size as well. So let's just copy these over and let's try to fix them one by one. So let's see here. We are going to use the description. We don't need width 50% and we probably don't need the padding, right? But we do want the font to be 1.25 rem. So I'm just going to come in here and I am going to go into maybe the large device because I think this still works for the tablet layout as well. I'm just going to go into the large devices. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go into the medium devices, which is more than 768 pixels, which is what this is. And I'm going to add the width condition here under description. 
okay let me add a width of 50 percent and let me add that padding right so that there is space between the description and the image and now you can see here that the description takes up half the space only on the laptop desktop and all the bigger screens it doesn't take up it takes up the full space on tablet and it takes up the full space on mobile as well and of course the flex direction also changes from column to row and that is why the rest of the space is taken up here by this image okay so the next thing to do is to fix this image so let's see we are going to get this image so we have this team div and it's currently configured to take up only 50 percent of the space and i don't think that is necessary here so i don't think we need to take up 50 percent of the space here but i do like this border and looks like there is a height we have set so this height is probably coming from the html so i'm just going to remove this height so this is the team image i think this is looking good and this has the full width I, if I want, I could limit the height, but I'm not feeling like it. I'll just leave it as is. I think this image is looking good. So I'll just leave it as is. So it's looking good on mobile. It is looking good on laptop, on tablet as well. I think on tablet too, because we've limited the maximum width on tablet too. The team image is lo looking fine. Looks fine on tablet. Maybe we might need to configure like a. Might need to configure something to make sure that it is actually showing up properly. Let's just give team a maximum width of or a width of 100%. Yeah. Still a bit, still a bit problematic. Well, so there may be some minor fix that may need that we may need to do at the very end and we'll inspect it and fix it. But for now, this is fine. But where we really need to make a change is over here. So let me do one thing. Let me just fix the height of the image as well. So let me just fix the team image height to 240 px yes we don't need it i think this is fine yeah but now it is taking up too much space so we need to go in here and on the large desktop layout the team div should just take up a width of 50 percent okay all right so this is what we're going for we have the left half which is and of course the maximum width is 80 80 pixels and it is centered vertically using margin zero auto so that is all that is being done on the about section here margin zero auto and max width of 500 and then the max width is increased to about 800 here the flex direction is row so that's why this is showing up like this side by side and the team image is as a width of 50 percent so that is looking fine too okay and it looks fine on mobile as well so on mobile too this team image is looking good i don't see any problems here it looks fine on tablet as well more or less fine i don't think i don't see any major issues here we may have to make some change later on but otherwise this is looking fine now moving right along the next step for us is the jobs list so now we need to add a jobs list now if i go back here if i go back here to our mock-up on the mobile we have a job list so we have these cards and each card has a title and then each card has maybe one of these uh, jobs listed right and on desktop however we have a table how exactly do we achieve that we can do some kind of magic where we change the display type from div to table and all that but the simplest way to do it is to just show a list on mobile and hide it on desktop and then show a table on desktop and hide it on mobile okay so here is what we are going to do we are going to first take a bunch of html so we're going to create a bunch of divs so we are going to create a div called job list and we are going to then have a bunch of divs each with the class job and then inside that div we are going to have a bunch of divs each with the class job title for the title of the job and job detail for each detail within the job okay and of course i have the data for all four jobs here so these are this this is the same data that is present in the table but now i'm no longer using a table i am simply using a i'm simply using divs not even a list and 
I can simply copy this. So let me just take this so that I don't have to just type all of these jobs out. Yeah. Let me just take this HTML and I'm going to go put this into my index.html file right under or right above the jobs table. Okay. So now I have this data of employment opportunities. First, let me change employment opportunities to job opportunities. I think it looks better as job opportunities. So now I have this job opportunities and I have a list of job opportunities, which are just a bunch of divs. And then I have the table of job opportunities as well. And the list of job opportunities has the ID job list, jobs list, and the table has jobs table. So as you can imagine, what we can do is we can just set display properties for both of these to show and hide them respectively. And while we write it, let us also fix the display property for this H2. So let's go in here and let's go down. First thing we'll do is for the H2, we are going to set text align center. So let's bring that up. I think we are always going to have text align center for H2. So let me just put that so that H2 has text align center. We may want to once again, reduce the spacing above and below the H2. Um, I'll skip that for now but I'll leave that as an exercise. So use a smaller spacing on mobile and larger spacing on tablet and desktop respectively. Okay. Next up, let us just figure out how to show and hide the job list. So first of all, the entire jobs div itself, let's see if there is some setting for the entire jobs div. Yeah. So the entire jobs div has a max width of 800 pixels. So let's just take that and let us just put it here at the top. Okay. So the entire jobs div on mobile just takes up the entire width. No issue on tablet. It takes up the entire width as well, but we might want to limit its width slightly. You can see here at around 600 on tablet. We might want to just center it. We may not want to just show it. We may not want it to take up the entire space. Just like this content is centered. We may want to center it. So how about we use a max width of 500 pixels just like that so that the content is centered on the tablet, but then on desktop, we want it to take up slightly more width, right? So this is going up to 800 pixel width. So I'm going to come in into the desktop media query, which is laptops, desktops, and which is above 768 pixels. And for the jobs div, I am going to set min width of 800 pixels. Okay. Now you can see that it takes up 800 full pixels on the, on desktop, on tablet, it takes up only about 500 pixels and on mobile, it takes up the entire space available. Okay. That's good. Let us now set the display criteria for, for both of these. So I'm going to go in and there is this jobs list that I have, which I want to have display block by default and the jobs list, the jobs table, I want to set its display to none. Okay. So now my job opportunities is visible here on mobile. It is visible on tablet and it is not visible and it is visible on desktop as well. And this is where I may need to change something. So I need to change the layout here and I want to hide this and show the table. So let, let us try and hide this and show the table. Well, so if I go in into this layout above 768, I'm going to say jobs list display none. Remember the jobs list is simply the list of jobs that we have. So that's gone. And I can say jobs table display block. Okay. Now we don't actually want to use display block here. The default value of display for a table tag. Remember jobs table is a table. You can see here it's a table tag. So if you just search default display value for table tag, the default display value for the table tag is all right. I'll just tell you the default display value for a table tag is actually table itself. So we can, we need to set display table here. And when we set display table here, what it does is that allows the table to take up the entire width of the screen um, on most 
on most screens and that will happen once we add some of the other table styles as well okay so just keep that in mind that the default display for a table a table tag is table all right well we are doing fine so far um, we might need to copy in as soon as the table is visible we want to use it we want to set its display to use the entire width and yes we have a bunch of these settings as well so we have the border setting we have the border collapse setting and then of course all the table styles can be incorporated directly into the media query where the table becomes visible so let's capture all these table related styles so this is used to set maybe the borders for each table cell this is used to set a bunch of other things now you can see here that our job opportunities table is showing up on desktop but is not showing up on mobile it's not showing up on tablet and mobile and this is because jobs table we are setting its display to table we can also do block but you'll notice that in block it doesn't do what we want you can see that block is not what we want we want table because we wanted to use the entire available space okay so display table and below below the desktop screen width we have this display set to none right and of course we have this header row so we have colors for the header row we have a bunch of alignments then we have these alternate rows we have borders for these alternate rows that is something that we specify here we have a padding to space things out and for every alternate row we also have this uh, background color that is done using the nth child all of this is covered in the previous tutorial okay all right we're getting there we're almost there now the only thing left for us to do is style this actual job opportunities this job opportunities div okay let's try styling it quickly so the job opportunities div is this has each of these jobs has the class job so first i'm going to style the job class so dot job and for the job class i am going to say let's look at mobile so i'm going to first give it a border so border 1px solid i'm going to use a light gray ddd ddd okay now they have a border then I am going to give it a margin top, margin top, 4px, maybe even 8px. All right, I'm going to give it a border radius of 5 pixels. Okay, that's nice. Now I have a rounded border. I'm going to give it a padding of 8px. Let's see what that does. Okay, that's looking good. All right, so I have these boxes now. So these boxes are looking good. Then I have job title and job detail. Let me try and quickly style those as well. So job title and job detail. Okay. The job title is, let me see, font size. Let me give it a font size of 1.25 rem that it scales accordingly. Let me give it a font weight of 500. Okay, that's looking good. Let me give it a uh, color of 222222 okay color is looking good and then for job detail well let me just give it a margin top of four pixels just to space things out a little bit and let me give a color of here a slightly lighter color 555555 five, 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 five. okay that's looking slightly lighter okay i think that looks good so I have some job, I have a border, I have this radius around it, I have this title, I have uh, set up all of these details, I have put in some space here as well, and I've given it some weight. So that's looking pretty good. I think that's looking good on tablet as well, and it is centered on the page. And that is looking, that's just not visible on desktop. So with that, we have completed the job opportunities section. So you can see now, we have the jobs list on mobile and tablet and the way we did that was first setting a max width of 500 and then for job giving it a border border radius margin padding for job title increasing its font size for job detail increasing or making it lighter and then of course on the min width of 768 we increase the max width of jobs so that it's a little bigger on desktop and we set the job list display to none for the jobs table on by default we set its display to none and once we reach that 768 width, when we want to display it, we set its display to table. 
we make it full width we give it a border get border collapse and we give all those settings which are required to show the table properly okay all right we are on the last leg here let's go ahead and fix the application form as well the first thing i'm going to do is just pull out all these application form settings right all the way to the top so let's see have application form group form input data, all of that okay so how it works is we have this application div and inside this application div we have an application form which is a form with the id application form then each of these inputs and labels are together part of a form group okay so we're going to use all these styles and we have a bunch of custom styles that we have set up for all of these so let us go in and do that let's see let's come in all the way to the top above any media queries and let us paste the styles and this is what we end up with so now we have for the application itself the max width is 500 pix 800 pixels so it takes up the full width which is not what we want let's set the max width to 500 pixels instead okay that's fine and now it is in line on tablet it is all centered but of course we can go in and on the desktop version we can increase the max width so we can say hash application max width to be 800 pixels so that on desktop it still takes up the entire width it's looking good i think the only change i'm going to make here it, it actually looks fine the only change i want to make here is maybe make the inputs full width so i am going to come in here i'm going to change this to dot form group because that is going to be more specific so in each form group i want the label to have a certain i want the input to have the width of of about 80 percent let's say so that all the inputs are about 80 percent wide something like that maybe even 90 percent just going very close to full width yeah so i want all my inputs to be about 90 percent wide on mobile but as soon as i get to the tablet so on tablet i don't want it to be 90 percent wide so i'm just going to go in here on tablet i'm just going to set input select text area text area doesn't need to be modified i'm just going to set max width or width to be about to be auto okay so on mobile it takes up about the full width and that's nice and on i can remove this width 30 percent here and set that manually here so dot form group text area for text area we still want it to be a bit wide about 80 percent wide or even on tablet okay so on tablet what this is what it looks like the application look on the application on mobile looks like this almost full width the application on tablet looks like this so it is not taking up the full width but it is still centered on the page along with the rest of the content and the application on desktop looks like it used to there's no change there okay so that's nice the final thing we need to do is fix the footer so we have a footer right at the bottom let's go ahead and fix the footer the first thing we'll do is just copy over all the existing styles we don't need this h3 we don't need this apply i'll get rid of that so we just have footer footer links footer links li and copyright so be that with that we've exhausted all the styles yeah so we've carried over all the styles so let me just go in right at the top before we create any media queries let's put in the footer styles and let's see what that gives us now we have a footer which has this background that we're looking for and it has these links and it has this copyright all of that is good but on the mobile we want these links to show up one below the other and how do we do that well you see we have this display inline for li i think we can get rid of this so the links are going to show up one below the other okay and looks like they're centered now but they're slightly off center so if i just inspect this list i can figure out why it is off center all of this seems to be centered but looks like this ul this um, unordered list seems to have a padding on the left you see that green color thing that is just this padding on the left let's go into the footer links list and let us just set padding 
left to zero. Okay, all right. So that's what we have here. We have this footer div, then we have the footer links ul, and then we have a bunch of li's, and that is now showing the footers, the footer items, one below the other. I may even add some margin bottom, so I can say margin. 4px and 16px. So now I have a margin bottom so that they are slightly spaced out, maybe even 8px. Okay, so this footer is looking nice. Okay, let's see on tablet. Now on tablet, this footer is probably not looking good. I think I can just get it back to inline. So on tablets, I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to say footer links li display inline and let's see okay so on tablets it is inline on mobile it is still one below the other this is what i'm expecting and on desktop it is inline perfect with that we have completed the footer so we've done the we've done all the sections i think all of them look good on mobile tablet and desktop so that's good we have done the changes to the application form the only changes we made was some width adjustments for the inputs and we have done the changes for the footer the only change we made was that we wanted to show them one below the other on mobile and side by side on desktop and again practice this work it out step by step that is how all of these steps will make sense we can now review and deploy these changes so what we're going to do is first we're going to create a branch this is going to do that here by first opening the terminal so let's say file view terminal I'm going to first create a branch. So let's do git checkout minus b. Minus b is a quick shortcut to create and check out a branch in one step. And let me just call it responsive layout. Okay, now we've switched to a new branch. We've created a new branch and switched to it. You see, we are on the branch responsive layout. Now I'm going to do git add dot. I'm going to review the changes using git status. You can see that a bunch of new files have been added. There's a settings.json as well. Not sure what that's for, but it's okay. Then I'm going to do git add. Okay, I'm just going to do git commit minus m added responsive layout. Now we've committed it. Normally I would commit after every section and keep updating my pull request, but just for now, just for example, I'm doing that. Then let me do git push origin responsive layout okay so we stage the changes using git add we then commit the changes using git commit and then we create a push that branch to github using git push origin branch name okay now we can create a pull request so there's actually a helpful there's actually a helpful link here that uh, that is printed out for us but we could always just go on the repository page and on the repository page you can see that GitHub tells us that a responsive layout branch has just been pushed and we can create a pull request. So here's what we can do. We can say added a responsive layout for the jobs page. And I can mention changes. And I can just bring in the changes that I've made here. So let's see. Navbar has a logo without text. Then banner size is updated based on screen. Then about section is vertical first, then horizontal. And then we have the jobs list on mobile and tablet and table on desktop. What else? Application form full with inputs on mobile and uh, vertical footer items on mobile. Okay, just a short description of the changes, and we can create this pull request. And now you can see that our Jovin Careers responsive site, which is our initial website, Jovian careers responsive dot versal dot app live dot versal dot app 
this is still not updated this still has the old design in fact i can go in and to inspect and i can verify this that it's still trying to show the table it's try, still trying to show things side by side but now you can see that in this particular pull request Vercel has created a preview deployment so i can visit this preview deployment this is just for this branch and you can see that on this preview deployment if i go inspect we have our new layout so this is what you want to do your main website is as is no changes there but on your pull request you've made all these changes on your branch and you can test it out so somebody who is looking at your branch can first look at the preview deployment and that maybe the designer can take a look and tell you okay maybe you need more space about submit application maybe there is some change to be done in job opportunities maybe the footer is not looking nice let me rework that a little bit you can also maybe just see how things change you can see that okay job opportunities takes up the full space then it sticks to around 500 pixels then it suddenly expands and now when it expands here you get this two column layout and here you get this table and that is looking rather nice and the application also expands accordingly so the designer or maybe another developer can review the changes visually by looking at the preview they can also review the changes manually so they can go in and they can actually check in each section okay looks like we've added a displayed or html file they can tell you maybe we don't need this displayed or html file get rid of it um, we don't need this flexbox or html file so you can go and delete those files and update your pull request and okay they can see see a split so there's a split view available as well let me just split view yeah you can see a split view yeah so they can see here the changes that have been made that you have added this jobs list as expected and you've not modified any other html except adding the job list and changing the title here they can see here that you've added a, a bunch of base styles for mobile and you've made it 14 pixels you've not changed a lot else maybe a few things here and there and they can give you inputs on specific things they can give okay this doesn't look right and they can comment it and then you can revise those comments and pull, pull your branch again and so on and they can see that okay now you've added a bunch of these media screen uh, settings and all so this is a good way for you to even do a self review before you merge your changes to master and once the changes are approved then you can go in and you can get an approval and then you can merge this pull request to master okay now as soon as the pull request is merged to master what Vercel is going to do is it's going to pick up the new changes from the master branch and it's going to create a new deployment you can check this on versal.com that it is going to create a new deployment just now you can see here that's creating a new deployment uh, created just now by sydney jogin and now if i reload the page notice that i'm on the deployed main branch jovian careers responsive live dot app dot versal dot app and i reload the page and the layout is fixed this is the layout now the main page has gone live so this is the workflow that you need to get used to create a branch do your work test it out in a preview deployment and then merge it and then your layout is going to be fixed now we've created a responsive design just like that and that is something that you're going to experiment with in your next assignment okay so we staged and committed the changes pushed the changes to github reviewed the code tested the preview deployment made some if we can require we can make some final adjustments iterate on it and then the pull request can be merged to the main branch and it gets deployed and this is the final mobile layout i think this looks pretty good it's everything is readable everything takes up sort of the full width this is the final tablet layout so we're centering the content on the page to about 500 pixels we're limiting its width so that things are still readable and this is the final desktop layout notice that we did not have wireframes for tablet but we just use some components from this side and some from that side to build it and as an exercise, try adding more sections to the site. Try to implement them using a mobile first responsive design. Try creating a separate wireframe for the tablet screens and make changes to the page to implement it. And then one other thing we, we did not look into was the media type print. What happens when you try to print this page? So you can do that by trying to do command P and then trying to save it as a PDF. And you'll see what your page is going to look like. Okay. so by default it just picks up whatever is going to show up on the screen but for a printout you may need to do a separate layout and that is something that you can experiment with 
that is something that you can experiment with the media print query. Okay. So that's everything for today. Uh, we looked at how to use CSS media queries and breakpoints to implement a mobile first responsive web design. We looked at how to leverage various CSS properties, uh, specifically Flexbox to build fluid and dynamic layouts. Needs a lot of practice. So we will use Flexbox extensively over the next several months. So don't worry, you'll get enough practice. We looked at how to create separate wireframes or design mockups to determine the layout of a web page at various breakpoints. You always, always should separate the design and the implementation. Don't try to do them both together. You will get stuck. We looked at implementing, testing and deploying a responsive website using CSS media queries and Flexbox. And the best way to learn these skills is to follow along step by step and type out all the code yourself. And you can check out the completed code here using these links. I have included a ton of resources here. The idea is not that you need to go through all of these resources right now. A few I would recommend though is a responsive web design or media queries tutorial on CSS tricks, the video course by Wes Boss on what the flex box, but there are a bunch of others, no matter what you are feeling under feeling scared about or not confident about or doubtful about check out one of these resources, you should be able to figure it out if one of the concepts that we covered today did not make sense. And that's it. So in this assignment two, uh, you will be implementing a responsive web design using CSS media queries and Flexbox. So the Figma mockups are already provided to you. Uh, let's quickly go through the mockups. So in these mockups, uh, there are three layouts uh, for desktop, tablet and mobile. And on the desktop view, there is a nav bar with the logo of the company and some graphics, some title, subtitle and learn more button. And on the tablet and mobile view also there is similar layout, but the nav bar is different. It is not completely visible. It is in the collapse mode. And below the hero section, we have the newest read section, which is uh, a card layout. And on the desktop, uh, there are three cards in a row. And similarly on the tablet also, there are three cards in a row, but on mobile, we can see that the layout is a bit different. So it is having a column layout. So you will need to use some flex properties maybe to design these uh, layouts for different devices. And inside the card, if we zoom in, we have few more elements, the image for the article, the date of publish and the title and read more link. So this is how the assignment two is looking. Uh, the Steps to proceed with this assignment are already mentioned and I hope you guys have already started on that. So coming to today's session, today we are going to build a responsive web page using Flexbox and media queries. So following topics will be covered in today's tutorial. So we will be designing a responsive layout using CSS media queries. Then we will understand what are selectors in CSS and how to calculate dynamic width for particular uh, elements using CSS function and using the box shadow property. So the prerequisites for today's session are you should be aware about basic HTML and CSS and uh, you should know how to create a GitHub repository. And the environment that we are going to use for today's session is VS code. And we will be using the cloud based VS code. That is the code spaces, which is provided by GitHub. So as a part of designing a web page, we are going to design a responsive block page, which will make use of media queries, flexbox layout, and the design mockup and data is provided for you. So let's go through the mockup quickly. So this is how the layout will look on mobile. Uh, it will have a page title and uh, it has the cards which are stacked vertically. So this is basically a column layout you can see. And on tablet, 
we can see that the card layout is almost similar but the uh, method of rendering is different so we can see that on the tablet there are two cards in a row and for desktop it will be three cards in a row so this is the mock data that we will be using for uh, our today's session so first let's quickly recap about uh, what is responsive design so responsive design is an approach which ensures that our websites will look correctly and adapt to various different screen sizes devices and orientation so it will optimize the user experience by making the content more visually appealing so you can see from this image that this is some example of the uh, mock-up so on mobile it is vertically aligned and when it when we change the device it automatically gets aligned uh, to some different layouts and it gets scaled on higher devices so there are few key principles that we should be uh, aware about responsive web design first is the website uh, layout should be flexible it should not be fixed sized like the width should not be given in pixels if we resize the screen it should get scaled accordingly next is the flexible images so images have their own size and when we import the external images they render directly if we don't specify the width and the height separately and it might happen that the image can overflow uh, of the screen width so to ensure that this doesn't happen we should be using some css properties so one is the max width that will ensure that our image is within the screen width and other is the object fit that you might have already used in the previous lectures so that is used to maintain the aspect ratio of the image and it makes ensure that the image doesn't get stretched so we will be using that today third thing is the media queries which allows uh, us to write various styles based on the layout uh, of the device so we can specify various device properties like width height and orientation and write the styles for that particular uh, query fourth is the mobile first approach so this approach tells us that we should start designing our web page from mobile devices and then progressively enhance to the larger devices like tablet and desktop so this approach has gained popularity because of the number of users of uh, mobile devices compared to other devices so the next concept uh, is the breakpoints that is also important in responsive web design so breakpoints in css are specific points or conditions where the layout or styles of our web page are going to change and accommodate to different screen size these breakpoints are generally used along with the media queries so what is media query exactly so media query is the statement that allows us to write a specific set of css rules when certain conditions are met so these conditions are based on the width height and orientation of the device so let's see few examples quickly so in this example one we have a, a media query which says that uh, it should apply to the max width of 600 px so whatever styles we will write inside this block will apply to all the devices whose width is less than or equal to 600 px and this example tells us that we can also specify min width and max width together so this styles will apply for all the devices whose width is between 320 px to 600 px and third is the min width which will apply all the styles for the devices which whose width is greater than or equal to 600 px so we can use any arbitrary width and height for defining these media queries but there but there are few standard breakpoints that are generally followed based on the device types so for mobile the width of the device should be less than 576px 
and tablet which is the sm device uh, it ranges from 576px to 768px and desktop ranges from 768 to 992 and there are also higher resolution devices uh, which we call at call a large desktop whose sizes are greater than 992px so let's get started with the coding part so we will be using uh, github code spaces so you, we will be needing one github repository so i have already created a repository here and to run in the code spaces you just have to click on code and click create code space on main which the main is the branch of our repository once you click that it will open a new tab and you will get a vs code cloud interface and it should load in couple of seconds yeah so it is loaded and on the left side you will see the list of files uh, so we are having a readme file here and uh, we, we are not going to use the terminal so i will close it and let's quickly write our first file which is index.html So we will add some basic HTML code that is required for every HTML document we write. So we declare the doc type, then the HTML tag. Inside this HTML tag, we will be having a head tag. Inside head tag, we require a title tag. And let me give the title my blog. Hey Ashish, can you zoom in a bit? Yeah. A little more. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So apart from head tag, we also need a body tag. And let me add a H1 tag here, which will be the page title. And all right. So we have written the basic HTML file and to run this file we will need some extension that is live server and it can be found in the extensions tab so there is the extension live server uh, by Ritwik day we can install that yeah once it is installed you will see this go live option uh, yeah so you will see the go live option at the right bottom you can click on this and it will start a server and it will it should open in the new tab the uh, html page that we just wrote so we are able to see welcome to my blog now let's add some uh, css styles so we will be using external css file and uh, we will create one file uh, which is base.css so this base.css uh, will contain all the code that is required to be applied to all the basic html tags so this is important to be consistent across various browsers because various browsers have their inbuilt style that is auto applied to all the tags so for example on this blog page we haven't specified any font or any font size so it is automatically given by the browser so i will just copy these styles from the notebook and put it into this base.css file and uh, we can import this file using link tag rel should be style shit and 
href should be base.css yeah so uh, the file is loaded correctly and we can see that the font is now changed to sans serif and also the uh, title is centered to the page now the next thing we will do we will create one more file which uh, we will call styles.css so in this base.css file you can see that there is no code related to our block page design so we will create one more file styles.css to write all the application specific code it's not a mandatory thing but to keep things more organized and to keep our styles more organized we can create one more file and it can be similarly imported the way we have imported the base.css file all right so there is one more important tag that is required to make our web page responsive and that tag is the meta tag which has the proper attribute of name viewport so we also need to add this to the head tag all right so we are set up with our uh, environment and the basic html and the files which we will be working on today so the basic part of today's mockup is this block card which is going to be consistent across all the layouts that we have seen in the mockup so inside this block card we can see that there is one image one title author publish date and likes and i am able to see that there is some spacing around the content so maybe i will have to use some padding left and uh, that needs to be applied to all the content so that is one way other way i could think of this is adding one outer div which will contain the title author and likes so let's add this html code let me quickly resize this a bit All right. So let's add a div which uh, will be our div for the block card. And inside this block card, we will require one div which will have the image for our block. and uh, for the title we can use the div also but i will use h2 because it is the second uh, prior title after the page title so i will give it a class name block card title we will fill in the data shortly and after the title we have uh, the author and the publish date so maybe we can put this information in a single div because it is horizontally aligned so let me add a div for that with a class 
block card info and one more div will be required for this likes count all right so we can wrap all these three uh, elements inside one more div to add the spacing around them correctly otherwise we will have to add the padding for each of these elements separately so let's add a div and give it a class name maybe block part body and inside this image we will be having our image tag so image tag has will have the src attribute and alternate text attribute okay so now let's put some data and see how it looks so i will just copy the data and put it in the readme file so that we can get it from here so let's copy the title first and put it in the alt tag as well as the title tag refresh this once sometimes it takes time let me try to restart this so if we disable and enable the extension it should work all right yeah so we have loaded the title now let's add an image to this blog so image link is this provided in the notebook and add that in the src so the image is loaded and the title is also loaded but we can see that we haven't added any property for the image so it is taking its own width and height and it's maintaining its own aspect ratio and we can see we discussed the key principle that the responsive design should not look like this because we can see that the image is going out of the screen width so for that we will need to add some styles so let's create a style layout quickly so first we have a block card then we have a block card image then we have block card body 
inside this body we have one more div which is block card info okay so we'll need to resize this image correctly so that it doesn't go outside the screen width so for that we will be understanding the concept of selectors so selectors in a css is a pattern that matches one or more elements in a document allowing your styles to apply to only those elements so you have already used these selectors in your previous lectures and assignments so the three basic types of selectors are the element selector which applies to all the html elements so div e tag html body these are the elements so in our base.css file we have used the element selector so these are all the element selector and these styles are applied to these elements next is the class selector that we are going to use in our styles.css file and third is the id selector which begins with the hash there are many more types of selectors in css you can find it here i have provided the link in the notebook so the another type of uh, selector is the child selector so in child selector we have to specify two things first is the parent uh, selector and the child selector so that is specified using the greater than symbol so let's try to understand this using this image so in this image i have a div whose selector or class is block card image and inside that block card image i have a image element and there is one more image element on our web page so if we directly apply styles to this image selector so it will get applied to both the images this and this but what if i only want to apply the styles to the image which is inside a parent whose class is block card image so for this particular use case we can use the child selector so the syntax for that looks like this we have to specify the parent selector it can be either id selector or class selector or element selector and same, same thing can uh, be applied to the child selector it can also be element class or id so we are going to use this to style our image so we will be using block card image greater than image so let's add that so we will use the object fit property cover width 100% and height let's say 160 px so we can see that uh, the image is resized and it is not going outside our screen width and also we can see that the image is not stretched if you resize the window you will see that it is getting scaled in and scaled out but not getting stretched so this is how we want our html uh, image to render in a particular screen width so let's quickly add few more styles to our block card title we can left align the title so for that we can use text align left and we can also reduce the font size a bit that we can do using font size property and let's make it 1.5 rem all right and uh, now we can add some border to the block card 
so that can be done using the shorthand property of border whose first value is the width of the border so we will keep it 1px and then the style of the border so we want the solid border and uh, the third is the color so that can be any rgb color so let's choose some light color so fff stands for white so something darker than white maybe let's try ccc yeah so this is fine and also let's add some border radius to let's say 4px all right so we can see that the border and border radius are added to our block card now we need to add some spacing here but uh, before adding that let's also add the other information of the block the author and the publish date and the likes count so we can go here and add the author name any cotton and let's say the publish date you can put today's date and the likes to be let's say any random number 256 okay yeah so the content for our first card is done now we need to style it more so we will go to the styles.css and first we will add the padding here so let's give it a full padding from all the sides so that can be done using the padding property and let's give it 4px okay and we can see that there is a lot of space at the top of this title and that is coming because of the h2 tag that we have used so we can reduce that maybe let's make it zero because we already have a padding here and also let's change the bottom to let's say 5px so that it's look uh, more visually appealing and we'll also need to add some spacing between the author and the likes so the author and the publish date information is stored in the div which is having a selector block card info we will add a 5px margin bottom to the this div so now it is looking fine maybe we can increase the font size a bit but uh, we want a font size which is larger than the current one but less than the uh, title of the blog so let's try this 1.25 all right so our block card is ready now we will have to make it uh, like we have we will have to set the max width because we can see that it is getting scaled horizontally as i am uh, increasing the screen width but we want to scale it up to a particular width and after that it should have a fixed width so for that we will have to add a layout that is the parent component to this block card because right now it is taking the width which is available to it that is 100% of the screen so we have designed the block card and it is currently looking like this so now we will need to add some layout to this card right now as you can see in the html file we haven't added any parent div to this card so let's quickly add that so i will create one more div whose class name we can call block arts wrapper 
and we will put this block card inside this and let's define some style for this block cards wrapper so i don't want uh, the block card to take the complete width of uh, which is 100 percent so it should scale up to certain limit but after that it should have a fixed width so for that uh, I will have to use a max width property and uh, so we are designing for the mobile view first and uh, mobile view the max width is 576px so our max width should be such that it, sh it is less than 576 so I will just use 360px okay and refresh the page yeah so now you can see that the block card is restricted by its parent uh, component or elements max width which is 360 px and also i want all the blocks uh, to appear uh, centered horizontally so for that we can use uh, margin left auto and margin right auto it will auto center the block cards wrapper horizontally centered okay so now uh, let's see the device mode quickly and if we go to 320 you can see that the card is scaling up to certain limit till 360 px and then it will be a fixed width so in this way we are restricting the card width so that it looks consistent on all the uh, devices because we are working for a range of devices so all devices might have different width so it our web page might not look consistent so let's so that's that is the importance of adding the max width to the wrapper so now let's add few more block cards to see how the vertical layout looks like for that we will need some more data and let me quickly these times and grab the mock data from here we will be adding it at two places one is the image alternative text attribute and other is the block title and also let's add the image loaded we add other images title
All right, so we have all the data in place and we can see that all the images and the title are loaded correctly. So we, we want some spacing between two consecutive cards. Right now there is no spacing. So there are few various ways to add spacing between the card. The most efficient way that is uh, used in the flex layout and that is the gap. So let's quickly see what gap is. So gap property explicitly controls the space only between the uh, flex items that are the children of a display flex layout. It applies that spacing between the items and not on the outer edges. So the another uh, way to do this is the margin top. But if you apply margin top, it will also apply to the first element. And we don't want that. We only want the spacing between the consecutive elements. So that's why uh, it's best practice to use the gap. And uh, gap will require us to. So currently we are not using any display property for this wrapper. So let's add a display flex property. And the layout is in column format. So we will have to use flex direction column okay. and uh, gap property which will be 10 px. So now you can see that our mobile view is looking nice. So it is evenly spaced and there is no additional spacing here that is applied to the card. So if we inspect this and we can see that there is no additional spacing applied here and the the so the margin or the spacing is uh, highlighted using a color and there is no highlight of uh, the margin here. So that is the advantage of using gap. So we have uh, completed our mobile view. So we uh, so this is the mobile first approach and we haven't written any additional rules that how our web page should look like on tablet and desktop devices so it will look uh, as it is as it is looking on the mobile to make it responsive to the other devices we will have to use media queries with the breakpoints so let's uh, first design the tablet view so in tablet view we want two cards in a row so in this case we won't be using flex direction column we'll have to change it to row and also we will need some wrapping okay so these are the requirements and the spacing between the two cards horizontally and vertically should be 10 px and all the cards should take the space exactly half of the available size So for that we will need to add a media query so let's add that so we will require min width of 576px right that is the breakpoint of the tablet and we first we will add the flex direction that will be row so we will also need to add the class name here so we can see that all the cards are coming in a single row so to uh, evenly space them and uh, not to shrink them we will have to use the property flex wrap and set it to wrap so after uh, adding this now you can see that uh, all the cards are taking the space so that they fit the content correctly but uh, we can see that now if we are on the let's say tablet device we want two cards in a row and it is just taking a single card in a row 
that is because of the max width which is set to 360 so we will also need to modify the max width because now for the tablet devices we have more space available on our device so let's update the max width to uh, maybe we can double that because now it should be less than 991px which is the boundary of the tablet device so let's make it 720px okay and so still it will not work because we haven't specified any width to the block card and block card is still taking the complete width so we'll have to add a property to the block card to uh, to let the block card know how much width it should take so that it can fit to in a row so we can add this property again using the media query and we can put the block card class inside this media query and let's add a width of let's say 50 percent okay so we can see that still it is not showing two in a row so the reason behind this is we will have to check if 50 percent of the available width is available for the card or not so let's understand the concept here so we want two cards in a row and there is already a gap of 10 px between the two cards and each card has a border on the left and the right side and the border width is 1 px so in total 10 px is gone from 100 percent and uh, compute like so in total for the border is taking 4 px so the actual available width is 100 percent minus 10 px for the gap and 4 px for the border so that much width is available and that needs to be divided into two and if we give that then only the cards will show two in a row so how to do this so in css there is a way to calculate the width or any other property and that is done by using the calc function so calc function is used to perform mathematical calculations to determine the value of a particular css property so it is used to calculate the values dynamically and it is allows us to make more flexible layouts and even if we resize the screen it will automatically recalculate the values and apply it to the uh, elements so to do that we will have to use the width property and the calc function so uh, inside the calc function we will put the calculation that we want to do so out of 100 percent 10 px is for gap and 4 px is for border and the remaining width we will divide into two parts two because we want to show two cards in a row so let me add this width to uh, this block card inside this media query so we can see that the block page is looking correctly on the tablet device and from 576 it should change to tablet view and below that it is still uh, taking the column layout that is uh, expected from the mockup so you can see that by writing just three lines of code here and one line of code here we were able to make our web page responsive for tablet now similar thing we will have to do for desktop so for desktop so this is the formula that we can use in general to calculate the width of the card so here 100 percent is the uh, total space in width available 
and n minus 1 where n is the number of cards we want to show in a row and gap gap is 10 px in our case minus 2 into n so n is again the number of uh, cards and 2 represents the border on the left and the right side so if we put 2 in this formula we will get the same expression so for desktop view we want to show three cards in a row so for showing the three cards we will have to uh, again calculate the width by substituting n is equal to 3 so let's understand again how it is done so this is the 100% width which is available out of that there are two gaps because we have three cards in a row so there will be two gaps 10 px each so in total gap is taking 20 px space and border left and border right 2 px per card so in total we will have to subtract 20 px and 6 px and then divide uh, the remaining space into three parts so this is how uh, the block page will become responsive for desktop let's try to quickly add this so uh, for desktop now we have larger screen width so we can change this 720px to maybe some more device because now we have space uh, till 991px so i will copy this media query and change the minimum width to 991px which is the starting sorry 992px which is the starting point for the uh, uh, desktop devices and put the blocks card starter and we can see that these two properties we don't need to again copy that because uh, on the desktop view itself we will be requiring the row flex direction and we want them to wrap the only property that we need to change is the max width because we now want three cards in a row so let's copy only the max width and add that here and let's say we make it 960 px and similar thing we will have to add a media query for the block card So here the minimum width will be 992px and the width will be 20 100% minus 20px minus 6px divided by 3. So if we go to 992px, we can see that now three cards are shown in a row. So this has made our web page fully responsive for mobile, tablet and desktop. And if you want to make it more responsive by making use of the screen width of the higher devices, you can add the screen uh, you can add more media queries and uh, can make that more uh, responsive for the higher devices so you can see that we have added less than 60 lines of code css and have created a responsive block page design So now let's understand some other properties of CSS uh, for adding the hover styles. So suppose we want to add some hover styles to the card. So right now if we hover using the mouse over this card, it is not 
changing the style but let's say we want to add some shadow to the card and also want to change the cursor of this card so how can we do that so for that css provides some pseudo classes so the one example of pseudo class is the hover so to add uh, styles to the pseudo class we have to use the selector colon and the pseudo class name so for the block card we will be using the hover pseudo class and let's try to add that we can add it here and add cursor pointer now you can see that the default pointer device is the arrow and when i hover any card it is showing me the pointer device so in the similar way we want to add some shadow to the card to indicate that the mouse is over that particular card so for doing that we have a box shadow property in css so the way of specifying the box shadow is in this way so it accepts five parameters first is the offset x second is offset y third is the blur spread and last is the color so offset x means how you want to position your shadow if you specify some positive value here the shadow will shift to the right side and if you specify negative value it will shift to the left same thing applies for offset y if you specify positive value it is going to shift downwards and if you specify negative value it is going to shift upwards there are few more properties of the shadow one is blur spread and the color of the shadow so you can check this out uh, i have provided a link here which uh, specifies some more properties and how specifying these different values how the shadow changes so you can play around with that for now we will use this shadow property and add it into the hover uh, style so you can see that let me zoom in a bit so you can see that uh, there is a shadow here which appears when we hover over the card so in this way we can also change the background color of the card if we want to hover also we can change the font size all the colors and font size can be altered here if we want to do that on hover all right so that's the end of the session let's conclude so in this tutorial we learned how to create the responsive web page by just writing less than 60 lines of css code and uh, we learned how to use calc function in css to compute the width dynamically for our block card and we also use the object fit property so that the block images are not stretched we also learned the child selectors if we want to apply uh, styles to a particular element inside a particular selector that can be done using child selector there are few more child selector that you can check i have provided the link and uh, also we learned how to add a shadow to the card using the pseudo class hover so few tips that you should keep in mind so don't create unnecessary html tags and try to design the web page with the minimum tags and same thing applies for the css properties don't add unnecessary css properties check if the display flex is whether really required or not if it is required then only add otherwise it will become very hard to scale on various devices and lastly use meaningful class names to make it human readable and signify what they are doing so if you look to the class names that we have used 
so all have a meaning to what element they are representing on our html page in today's web development landscape, CSS frameworks play a crucial role in simplifying and expediting the design and development process. You've been building web pages for some time now, and you may have seen that a lot of effort goes into making sure that things, looks, things look exactly how you need them to. And this is where CSS frameworks can help reduce the amount of code that needs to be written and make the process of web development more efficient. We are going to talk about the Bootstrap CSS framework today, which is a powerful and widely used toolkit for designing responsive and mobile first websites. And Bootstrap, Bootstrap offers a vast array of pre-built components, utility classes, and a responsive grid system, which also makes it very easy for you to work with Flexbox without actually having to write a lot of Flex properties. So today we're going to see how to install Bootstrap's CSS and JavaScript bundles into a web development project. We're going to learn how to modify Bootstrap's default styles, which is colors and typography using CSS variables. We're also going to learn how to use Bootstrap's breakpoints and grid system for creating mobile first responsive web pages. We'll talk about leveraging Bootstrap's utility classes for applying layout and style changes without writing a lot of CSS. And finally, we'll also use Bootstrap's pre-built components and examples for building a web page quickly and efficiently. And the best way to learn these skills is to follow along step by step and type out all the code yourself. So I highly encourage you to do that. The more code you write and the more you ask yourself about every line of code you write, the better you will become as a, a web developer. So always make sure that you understand every line of code that you're writing. So we will explore these topics by attempting to solve this problem statement. Over the course of the past few lessons, we have been building a Jovian careers website. So here is what it looks like. There is a nav bar here at the top, then there is a banner image, then there is an about Jovian section, followed by some employment opportunities, a table, followed by uh, an application form, followed by a footer at the bottom. So this is the website that we have been building so far. And and in today's lesson, in today's tutorial, we will rebuild this Jovian careers website using the bootstrap CSS framework. Now, the reason we are rebuilding the same site again and again is to understand how to make the web development process more efficient while at the same time, improve the aesthetics and the completeness or the finish of your websites. Okay, so the, uh, I would like you to just keep that in mind today that you will notice today that we're writing less code, but we're ending up with a better website. And that is something that makes you far more efficient as a web developer. So specifically, we will add some links in the navigation bar as well. So here we have a navigation bar, we'll add some links here at the top. And we will also then make that collapsible on mobile because you don't have a lot of space to show links on mobile. So we'll add a menu button over there. We will also show the list of jobs using cards on mobile and using a table on desktop. So here we're using a table on desktop. That is fine. But we will also see how to use cards on mobile devices. So right now we just have a list here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so we are using cards of some kind here, but we'll see how to improve the layout of these cards using bootstrap. And we will also make the color scheme, typography and layout a little more consistent and a little more aesthetically pleasing. Okay, so this is the website that we had and let's see what we're able to create today. Now, of course, we assume here that you have basic knowledge of HTML and CSS. And there is also an assumption here that you know about Flexbox and responsive design and version control with GitHub and cloud deployment to Versal. All of this is covered in the previous lessons. So I would highly encourage you to go back and review specific pieces if some of these parts don't make sense today. Now, please post your questions in the chat because we will pause periodically and take questions. And the entire code for the tutorial can be found here. So the starter code, which is the site created in the previous tutorial can be found here. And the starter site can be found here. And you can find the completed code and the finished site using these links. So the first step today is going to be creating a GitHub repository. So I'm just going to go in here into github.com. And once I'm logged in, I'm going to click the new button. And now I am going to give this a repository name. So let me just call it Jovian careers bootstrap 
लाइव बिकॉज आई एम डूइंग दिस लाइव लेट मी गिव इट अ शॉर्ट डिस्क्रिप्शन जोवियन करियर्स वेबसाइट बिल्ट यूजिंग बूट स्ट्रैप टी एस एस फ्रेमवर्क आई एम गोइंग टू मेक दिस अ पब्लिक रिपोजिटरी सो दैट यू कैन एक्सेस दिस कोड वेन आई एम डन आई एम गोइंग टू एड अ रीडमी फाइल इज वेल जिस सो दैट आई हैव सम इनिशियल कोड इन द रिपोजिटरी आई एम गोइंग टू एड अ गिट इग्नोर फाइल इज वेल सो आई एम जिस गोइंग टू टाइप नोड विच इज गोइंग टू जनरेट द गिट इग्नोर फाइल फॉर जावा स्क्रिप्ट विच इज गोइंग टू इग्नोर एनी फाइल्स दैट आर नॉट नेसेसरी टू बी सेव्ड इन वर्जन कंट्रोल थिंग्स लाइक टेम्प्ररी फाइल्स or compiled files etc and i'm going to add the mit license here so that people can build on top of this and now i am going to hit create repository and with that our github repository is created perfect so now we have a github repository called jovian careers bootstrap live and we now need to start developing this repository and that is something that we'll do using code spaces so we are going to use a cloud based programming platform called github code spaces which lets us open up vs code or visual studio code in the browser so i'm going to just click the code button here and select create code space on main and that is going to now set up a new machine for us on the cloud it is going to download the code from the repository that we've just created onto that new machine and then it is going to allow us to start developing it using this browser based vs code and we can also start previewing it as we develop the website okay so there we go now this has just opened up and i can open up any of the files here and i can now open up any of the files here and start editing them for example i can open up the git ignore file here and start editing it okay so with that our basic development setup is complete we have created a github repository and we have opened it up using github code spaces the instructions are available in the notes if you need them now to begin we can set up a basic html page so we are not going to copy over any code from the previous uh, tutorial we are going to type out all the code or most of the code from scratch today so let us create an src folder within the repository it's always a good idea to create an src folder containing the actual files for the project that are going to be deployed into production because we don't want to send our git ignore license etc into production and in the src folder i am going to create a new file index.html and now in my index.html i can start putting in some things so i can start by maybe a doc type tag which just indicates that this is an html file i can now go in and put in a head tag i can go in and put in a body tag and now i can start adding some information on the web page so i'm just going to copy over a few things here which is something that we've been creating over the past few weeks as well so i'm going to copy a title tag so i'm i'm just going to have this title tag in the head and this simply says that the title of the page is jovian careers powered by bootstrap then i am going to copy a bunch of meta tags a meta cursor tag to indicate to the browser that we, that we are using the utf8 character set so this is something that you should put into pretty much every website that you build i am going to copy over the meta viewport tag and the meta viewport tag specifically with the content width equals device width and initial scale equal 1.0 is necessary for triggering responsive design otherwise older mobile browsers may try to automatically zoom in the content of your page to adjust for a desktop website so this is a way of telling the browser that you have created a responsive design don't worry about what these specific things mean this is something that you should have in pretty much every web page so i'm going to put that in here as well then i'm going to copy over a meta description and a meta og properties so an og or open graph title open graph description and open graph yeah open graph description and a normal description all of these as we've discussed in the previous lesson are used when you share the link that you have for the deployed web page with somebody else so this is what this is the title that is going to show up in the link preview and this is the description that is going to show up below the link apart from that we are also going to add a couple more tags so there's going to be one meta tag called the og image tag this tag is going to determine the image that shows up as the preview image when you share this link on whatsapp slack or any other social platform and that is going to be something 
set to the jovian meta.png file and we're going to need that meta.png file so i'm just going to drag in that meta.png file from my desktop so i'm just going to drag in this file from my desktop into the src folder so this is the file that is going to show up as the preview this image is going to show up as a preview when somebody shares the link to our website online okay finally i am also going to drag uh, put in a link tag with the rel equals icon and this is going to point to the fav icon so the fav icon is what is the icon the little icon that shows up in the browser like this when we open that website in the browser okay so let us add that meta tag in here as well so let's add the fav icon meta tag and let us bring that in here as well chovianfavicon.png okay so with that we have a basic setup of the page let me just open it up here so we have html head title meta a bunch of meta tags then in the body because we are going to create this jovian career site i'm just going to put in a bunch of empty divs for now so I'm just going to put in a nav bar and about Jovian div, a jobs list and application form. So all of these are just empty placeholder divs along with HTML comments above them. So let's do that as well. And let us just format the document. Okay, looks good. So now that we have some code that we have added into our HTML page, we need a way to actually see what this page looks like. And that is where we're going to use the live server extension. So I'm just going to search live server. And the live server extension allows us to preview the web page that we are building in our code spaces machine, which is running somewhere on the cloud. So it sets up a server and it serves that page so that we can open it on the browser. And once it is installed, I can come back into my index.html file. And right here at the bottom, I should be able to see a go live button or I can also just right click on my index.html uh, file and just select open with live server. Either way, once I click this, you can see that the website is now open. All right, so let me just put that website here. So this is the site that we have right now. And this is the site that we are going to start slowly building. You can see that there's not a lot here. Even if I zoom in there, there is just this nav bar. There's a bunch of divs with some placeholder text within them. And this is a site that we are going to slowly start building using bootstrap. Now, with that out of the way, we can start actually using the bootstrap CSS framework. So Bootstrap is a powerful open source CSS framework. And this is the website of Bootstrap, getbootstrap.com. It is designed to streamline the development of responsive mobile first web projects. And it has an extensive library of pre-built components, styles and utilities, and it enables developers to rapidly create visually appealing and highly functional websites. So a lot of the websites that you see on the internet either use Bootstrap or something very similar to Bootstrap, some kind of a CSS framework to add all the interactive features, all the various interesting layouts that you see on most modern websites. And there are many ways to install Bootstrap. And you can check out the different ways of installing Bootstrap on the website on the Get Started page. But the easiest way to use Bootstrap is to include its CSS and JavaScript directly within an HTML page. So Bootstrap has two parts. It has the CSS file, which contains a bunch of existing styles that you can use within your HTML page. And it has a JavaScript file. JavaScript is used to enable some interactivity, things like drop downs, pop ups, tooltips, etc. So there's a JavaScript file that you need to include as well. Okay, so let us first grab the link tag. So there are two things here. There is this link tag right over here, which contains the bootstrap CSS file. So I'm just going to grab that. And it's always a good idea to grab it from the website because that is going to have the latest version of bootstrap, which currently happens to be 5.3.0. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to paste this link tag right here, right below. So you can see we now have this link tag bootstrap.min.css that gets included. And you can also command click this link and see what that file contains. So you can see that it contains a whole bunch of CSS styles. We will obviously not be using all of them, but many of them are going to be useful for what we're going to do today. Okay, so that is the link tag 
Then another thing that you can do is include this script tag. And interestingly, this script tag goes not in the head, but in the body and right at the bottom of the body. And the reason for this is you do not want the loading of the script to prevent or block the loading of the web page. And that is why putting it the putting it at the end of the body ensures that only after the entire content of the HTML page is loaded, only then the JavaScript file gets loaded. Okay. We don't do that for CSS because we want the styles to load beforehand. Otherwise, if the styles load after the page loads, there's going to be a flickering effect. But for the script, because a lot of the interactivity is going to happen after all the content loads, it is okay to put that script at the bottom of the page. Okay, so I'm just going to go in and put that script right at the bottom of the page. And you can see again, there is this bootstrap.bundle.min.js. And this is all the JavaScript that is getting included by default. So that is how you add bootstrap to your web page. And once you save the file and come here and reload the page, you can see already that the styles have changed significantly. So earlier we had a slightly different font. We also had some default padding, but let's say I comment this out. You can see that we, there is some padding on the body. You can see that the font is slightly different. So there's already some change that Bootstrap has brought in. In fact, it resets a lot of the basic styles and it sets up basic styles for text. It sets up basic colors for the text. It sets up basic font sizes, fonts. It sets up a bunch of things by default. So that is how you set up Bootstrap. Now, before we actually start building something, we will have to start first, maybe customize the bootstrap setup to use the fonts and the colors that we want to use, because given the whatever company you're working at, they're going to have their own preferred fonts and colors that you might want to use. And you can override or customize bootstrap very easily. And frameworks like bootstrap enable customization via CSS variables. And CSS variables, also known as custom properties, allow you to define reusable values in your style sheets. And this makes it easier to manage and update values such as colors and font sizes throughout your CSS code. So I'm going to give you a quick tutorial of CSS variables and then we're going to start customizing some CSS variables to change what Bootstrap gives us. Now to define a CSS variable, you need to use the hyphen hyphen syntax or the minus minus syntax. So anytime you put minus minus followed by something, that is treated as a CSS variable. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, as a good practice, you should always define your CSS variables in this selector called colon root. And this is just, this is called a pseudo selector. This basically says that you want to put these variables and you want to make these variables available right at the very root of the CSS file so that it's available no matter where you are in the CSS file. Okay. So it's, it's, it'll be at the root of the document and it'll be available across all different kinds of styles, maybe even inline styles and style tags within the page. So here is how you can create some CSS variables. So right now we don't have a CSS file that is con that is connected to this web page, but I can just put in a style tag here for now. And I can just create a bunch of CSS variables here using the root tag. Okay. So now I have this root and in the root, I have set a primary color to be a certain blue. I've set a secondary color to be a certain green and I've set the font size to be 16. These styles are not applied to anything yet. These styles are just variables. So just like variables in any other programming language, the hyphen hyphen font size is a variable and it has the value 16 pixels. And similarly, hyphen hyphen primary color is a variable. It has the value blue or, or a variation of blue. Okay. And of course, this is the hex code of the color and VS code show very helpfully shows us a preview as well. Now, once you've defined a CSS variable, you can then use it within some CSS property and you can use it using the var function in CSS. So here is how you might use it. You might say something like body and then you might set the background color of body to var. And then here you provide the name of the color, uh, provide the name of the variable hyphen hyphen primary color. And now what's going to happen is when I paste in this style and I save the page, you can see that the body got a background of blue. That's because where primary color invokes a search for CSS variables. And there is a CSS variable in the root called primary color. And its value has been set to three, four, nine, eight DB, which is a blue. 
Similarly, uh, the font size of the body is going to search for the variable font size and that is going to get the color 16. Now the benefit of CSS variables is you can now go in and you can actually update these variables. So once again, if I go in here and I, let me also create a button here just to complete this example. And let's put a button here right at the top. Let's say, click me. Let's save that. So there's a button right here, right at the top. And this button has the color secondary color and the secondary color is a green. So clearly the button has a green color and the CSS, uh, the body has a blue color. Now you can go ahead and update a CSS variable. So you can either update it at the same place where you defined it, or you can update it somewhere. Maybe let's say you have a bunch of CSS files and you've updated it in a second or third file. So let me just go in and update these two values or just update the primary color. And now you can see as soon as I update the primary color to a purple that automatically updates the background color. So wherever the variable is used, the color is now going to get updated. Okay. So now you can see the value of CSS color, uh, CSS variables. I can define a bunch of variables based on the theme that our design team has currently given us. Then I can just use those variables everywhere in my CSS styles. And then when the design team comes and says, okay, we need to change the color. We are moving from blue to red. We don't have to go in and edit a bunch of different properties. We just go to our root tag, uh, our root selector. We just simply check the primary color and change its color to whatever the design team is asking us to do. Okay, so that is the value in CSS colors. So that is the value that CSS variables provide us. Okay, so for a moment, I'm just going to get rid of all of this now, now that we understand how CSS variables work. The last thing you can also do is you can also provide a fallback value so that let's say you're providing a background color and that is going to come from a variable. Let's say this variable is not defined for whatever reason, somebody went and changed the name of the variable or it was in a certain file that did not actually get included. You can actually provide a basic fallback or default value as well. So this is something that I leave as an exercise for you to test out. Okay. So you can learn more about CSS variables and experimenting, ex experimenting and experiment with them by following this guide on the Mozilla developer network. So I'll let you check it out as well. But here's what I want to now tell you customizing bootstrap is done by changing CSS variables. So many of bootstraps default color and typography settings can be customized using CSS variables. And you can get the full list of CSS variables that have been defined in the bootstrap.min.css file over here on bootstraps documentation website. So you can see these are all the variables that have been defined by default. And what you can do is you can now overwrite them in your own style tag or style file. And then what is going to happen is all the bootstrap classes which use these colors are going to pick up the new colors that you've provided or the new fonts or sizes that you've provided. Okay, so I encourage you to check out all the different variables that you can actually modify in in bootstrap. So that's one way using CSS variables. Another way to bootstrap to override bootstrap default styles is simply by supplying your own styles in a CSS file with appropriate selectors. Let's say you don't want to change the primary blue color for the entire website only for a particular set of buttons in a particular section, you want to change the color. So you can just uh, uh, provide the CSS selector, maybe give it an ID, maybe give it a special class. And then in that class, you can simply go ahead and apply the changes to that particular button. So remember that CSS styles are cascading, which means a more specific rule can override a less specific rule. And if two rules have the if two rules have the same specificity, then the rule that appears last in order takes precedence. Okay, and this is something that can be confusing and may require some experimentation to understand. So let's make the following changes to our page. We will use the font Roboto for the body text. If you check the CSS variables here, it looks like there is the, the font family for the body, BS body font family. This is what is going, actually going to be used in the body if you check the bootstrap CSS file. It itself uses the variable BS font sans serif and looks like BS font sans serif uses something called system UI, which is simply the default sans serif font in the browser or in the system or, or in the operating system. All right. So we don't want to use this. We want to always set it to Roboto. So that is one change we are going to make. 
then we will also use the font enter for headings now if you check here there is no specific font that has been specified for headings looks like bootstrap by default just uses a single font for the entire page for all kinds of text so that's where we can probably use some css selectors and change the font for headings and finally uh, at jovian we have a specific blue color that we use and there are different shades of blue that different companies use about half the companies on the internet seem to use a blue color for some reason but we are going to use this 2067F5 as the primary blue color. And you can see here that the primary color that is used or the primary blue and bootstrap is something else. And there's also this BS primary, which is exactly the same blue that is here at the top. We are going to change both of these, the BS blue, if I zoom in a bit. So we are going to change the BS blue color and we are going to change the BS primary color as well to our desired Jovian blue. Okay, so let's start doing this step by step. So first we'll add a sample heading, sample body text, and maybe a, a sample blue box that is going to be present in the index.html file so that we can actually observe these changes. So let me copy over this h1 tag, this div tag, and also this third div or the second div tag, which has a height of 200 pixels, and it uses the background var bs blue so you can use css variables within inline styles as well so within the actual style attribute let's go ahead and let us just put this within the body here and let us save it and let's reload this page okay so now now you can see we have h1 so this is the h1 tag and the h1 tag has the sample heading and then we have some sample body text. So I've just created a, some sample body text. And of course, I've zoomed in here a bit. That's why it looks big. This is the actual size. But let me zoom back in so that you can actually see this properly. And we've created this box here, which contains the default blue color of Bootstrap as the background. It has a height and width of 200 pixels each. Okay, it's using the Bootstrap blue as the color. Next, we can now first to change any fonts we have to first import fonts from google fonts so you can always go into google fonts and let's say there are a couple of fonts that you need to use you can go into that particular font you can add all the styles that you need and once you've added all the styles which i've done here for inter and roboto and generally speaking you should be able to copy over pretty much all the styles because you might need, you don't know which one you might need then you can come in here and you can actually go ahead and copy a link tag so if i zoom if i scroll up here you can see that there is this link tag that can be copied and that link tag has to be added into our index.html file to load these fonts from google fonts onto the page okay so i'm just going to add this link tag right below my bootstrap link tag Okay, and let's format the document once again as well. Perfect. So now we've included some fonts, but of course no change has been made yet because we've not actually used those fonts. Next, let us set up a styles.css file and connect it to index.html using a link tag within the head. So I'm going to come back in here. I am going to create a file styles.css and I am going to link it using a link tag so link rel equals style sheet href equals styles.css so i'm just going to put that into styles into the index.html file now one important thing you should keep in mind here is you have to put this uh, your custom styles below the bootstrap styles because that is the order in which the css variables will be read so if you put it above what's going to happen is first your css variables will be read and then the bootstrap css variables will get read and those bootstrap css variables will override your values but you want to do the opposite you want to take the bootstrap css variables and you want to override them and then all the classes that are present in the bootstrap css file will automatically pick up the overridden value so that is the interesting way in which you can go back and you can change some of the styles in uh, in bootstrap okay all right so now we have the styles.css file still there is no change that has happened now let us start by first adding this root tag and then changing a couple of or uh, three properties so we're going to change the variable bs font sans serif you can see here that there is this bs there is this bs font sans serif this is what is actually going to be used as the body font family so the body font family variable gets used in the body if you study the bootstrap structure um, so i'm just going to come in here and i'm going to create the root tag and you can see as soon as i pasted it a bunch of things have changed and we can disable these 
and we can observe the changes one by one. First, let us keep an eye on the text over here. As soon as I enable this, you can see that there has been a slight change in the text. It's very, it's very minute, but if you just look at it carefully, you see this is different and this is different, right? So these are minor changes in the font, but you want to get the company font, the font that your company uses. That's why this is important. Let's then change this blue color as well. Again, it's going to be very subtle. Yeah, so looks like there's a minor change here in the blue. You may not even be able to detect it, but I can always go in here and just for the sake of testing, I can go in and maybe make this a green color. And you can see that now the color changes to green, right? So whatever value you set for the BS blue CSS variable, that is going to override the default value in Bootstrap. And that is then going to be used within all the classes within wherever you want to use uh, this color. Okay. So I'm going to reset it back to the color that we had for Jovian. And just like that, we have modified a few basic styles. We've modified the body font family, and we've modified the blue and primary colors to our desired color. Now, of course, we also want to use the inter font for headings. So that is something that we can simply do by adding these selectors H1 to H6. And we can simply set their font family to enter with a fallback to sans serif if the font could not be loaded. So let me come in here and you can see that there is a slight change here to the heading. And I can even come in here and maybe you know, check out the font weight. Six and set that to 600. So you can see now my fonts or my headings are a bit thicker. So remember that if just because you've used bootstrap does not mean you can not use your own CSS styles, you can customize pretty much everything in bootstrap. And the simplest way to do it is often to just add a class, let's say there's a particular button you want to customize, just add a class to that button, and simply go into your CSS file and then apply the styles to that particular button or div or whatever it is. Okay. And with that, we have performed a bunch of customizations, the and we can now get rid of the sample heading sample body text and the sample div that we had. And we can proceed with the rest of our website. Now I want to point out that there's actually a much more, much deeper customization that you can do at a very specific component level within bootstrap and bootstrap is written using this language called SAS, which is essentially an extension of or an expanded version of CSS that can then be compiled down to plain CSS for distribution. And for more advanced customizations, you can actually go into bootstrap source code, you can make changes to the original SCSS files, which is what bootstrap is written in that the, this is the format of the file, and then compile them down to your own CSS file. And all of that is described on the bootstrap documentation website. Okay, most of the time you will not need to do this. But in some certain cases where you cannot figure out a way to do it by using CSS variables or using custom classes, you can go ahead and simply edit the SCSS files and generate a new uh, CSS file for your project. Okay. So as an exercise, I would encourage you to maybe make some more changes to the page either by modifying bootstrap CSS variables or by providing custom styles within the styles.css file and observe their changes on the web page. Now let's talk about how we can build responsive layouts. So bootstrap contains built in breakpoints, media queries and a grid system to create responsive layouts simply by adding some classes to HTML elements without requiring any custom CSS. And this is one of the nicest things about using bootstrap that you don't have to write breakpoints and media queries yourself. Replacing CSS properties with utility classes is one of the biggest benefits that you can get from a CSS framework. And we will explore multiple CSS frameworks over the course of this program, this course and future courses. But all of them will have this common pattern that they're going to take away some CSS that you had to earlier write manually and just turn them into simple classes that you can include within your HTML file. So first, let's understand the built in breakpoints in bootstraps because uh, in bootstrap because it's still useful for us to know this. So breakpoints and bootstraps are in bootstrap are predefined screen widths that help you create responsive designs for various devices like smartphones, tablets and desktops. And bootstrap uses a mobile first approach, which means that the boots, which means that the 
styles that you supply for the smallest breakpoint will automatically follow through or get applied to bigger breakpoints until you choose to change them all right so that is where you should always first design the mobile version of your site make sure that it looks good on mobile and by default all those styles will carry over into the bigger layouts as well and then you can specify some custom styles when you get to a tablet layout and just make the required changes that you need and then you can again uh, go to a desktop layout and specify some more changes so that is called mobile first responsive design with incremental adaptation to increasing screen size so by default the styles that you supply to bootstrap they get applied on excess screens which is screens smaller than 576 but of course they also carry over to bigger screens then if you can if you supply some style for the sm screen and we'll see where this sm word actually gets applied then that is going to only apply to screens that are bigger than 576 pixels then if you want to apply some styles for bigger uh, or uh, browsers with a bigger width width greater than 768 pixels you then use the md and then similarly there's a breakpoint for lg xl and xsl okay so the way you create layout changes or specific breakpoints is not by writing media queries but by simply using certain class prefixes in your html markup and don't worry if that doesn't make sense right now because we're going to see an example of that very shortly so the first key component that we are going to use from bootstrap or the first key layout element is containers and whenever you want to use some kind of a responsive layout whenever you want to do something interesting with bootstrap where the layout changes across different widths you have to first create a container okay and the way you create a container is by simply adding the class container to a div that's it so you create a container by creating a div and giving it the class container now bootstrap comes with three different containers or three different types of containers and we'll take a look at them one by one so the simplest container that you can create in bootstrap is just by creating this div and giving it the class container okay i'm also going to give it a height and width so i'm just going to give it maybe a width of 200 px height of 200 px or actually let me just give it a height not a width right now because the width is going to be set automatically so i'm going to give it a height of 200 px and i'm going to give it a background of let's use the blue bs blue now we have this container uh, we have just created a div with the class container and we've given it a height of 200 pixels and a background of blue and you can see here that this container has this property that it is always centered on the page and you can see when the when the page is really small maybe let's use browser tools to see this it's going to be slightly easier to do it this way yeah so you can see that the, when the page is very small it takes up the full width of the page but as we start increasing as soon as we cross the excess boundary okay now looks like up to 500 and okay up to 576 pixels it takes up the full width and then its width reduces and it just remains centered on the page and then we hit the next breakpoint which would be about 768 at 768 it becomes a little bigger but it still remains centered on the page it still does not take up the entire page and then as we keep going we hit the next breakpoint and then when we hit the next breakpoint at around 9 996 pixels or so it once again expands and it remains centered in the page and so on okay so this is what happens when remember we were doing all this business of setting a of uh, first creating a div and then centering it using margin zero auto by adding left and right equal margin and at various breakpoints adding various widths well bootstrap has already done that for us and you can simply add the class container and when you add the class container till about 768 pixels or so so till about the let's see what this means yeah till about 768 pixels it's going to occupy the full width no till about 576 pixels it's going to occupy the full width now at more than 576 pixels it's going to be 540 pixels at more than 768 pixels it's going to be 720 pixels wide at more than 9 960 pixels it's going to be 960 pixels wide and so on okay so it's ju it just gives you a nice centered div or, or horizontally centered div on the page and you can put all your content inside this div okay so the container is going to contain all of the rest of your page content 
Now, of course, you may not always want this. What you may want is maybe you may want it to always occupy the full width. If you want it to occupy the full width, just use the class container fluid. If you use the class container fluid, and let me reload that page. If you use the class container fluid, then it's going to always occupy the full width of the page. All right, so that's container fluid. And then there are various steps in between. You could do something like this. You could say container SM. And if you say container SM, so up to the highest point of SM, which is just before MD, it's going to probably still use up. Okay. Or up to the size SM, it's going to use up the full width. And from the size SM, it's going to become centered. Okay. So container SM, I think it's going to do the same thing as container for us. Up to 540 pixels, it's going to take up the full width at, at 560 or 576 pixels, it's going to become centered. You can also use container MD. Now container MD is going to take up the full width till 768 pixels and at 768 pixels, it's going to start restricting its width and progressively increase size with breakpoints. Similarly, you can do container LG, which is going to use up the full width up to a certain large size. And then after a certain point, it's going to use the center. Okay. So depending on when you want to constrain the content of your page, you can decide which container you want to use. And for now, I'm just going to use set it back to div container. And what that is going to do is given no matter what width I'm at, it's going to just center the content a little bit on the page, have some padding left and right. Okay. So that is the container. That is the first basic thing. No matter what you're doing in bootstrap, what, whatever page you're building, the first thing you'll probably do is just create a container. Okay. So one thing you can do as an exercise is maybe create a bunch of containers one below the other and give them all different container classes and see what happens to each of them as you resize the page. Now, the next thing that we need to understand once we have talked about containers is the grid system. So every container contains 12 columns. You cannot actually see these columns right now, but every container is inherently or internally divided into 12 columns. And then what you can do is you can decide to put content and you can decide how many columns that content can take up. Okay. So here is an example. You can, you can just maybe have a bunch of dips. You can have maybe 12 dips. Each of them takes up one column and there is also some space between the columns, or you can have something like two divs and you can have six of those divs taking up six columns, or you can even combine things. You can maybe have a div that takes one column. You ha have a div that takes two column next to it, a div that takes some more columns next to it and so on. Okay. So whenever you need to horizontally arrange columns in a row, or so whenever you want to arrange divs in a row and you want to control their relative width, that is when you use this grid system. And the grid system is invoked using two classes. So the first class is a row. So let's say you want to create three divs here. You want to create three divs and each of those divs should have an equal width. So here's what you can do within your container. Remember all of this always happens within a container, create a class, create a div with the class row. Okay. Now we've created a div with the class row. Nothing has changed here. Yeah. Nothing has changed here. Now I can create a div with the class column. Okay. And let me just call this box one. And let me also maybe give it a border. Let's give it a nice solid black border. And let's create a couple more divs like this. Okay, so I'm simply creating a few, I've created a row. And that is going to simply put things in a vertical order. Then I am going to create a bunch of boxes here, box two and box three. Okay. And let's see what happens. So you can see now that we have taken the container and then there is this row div that has been created. And I can just go in and actually get to that row div here as well, just by selecting inspect element. Yeah. So there is this row that has been created. And then within that row, we have these three columns. Let me just make the background white for these just so that you can actually see these clearly. Yeah. So within the rows, we have these 
you know, within the rows, we have these three columns, okay, box one, box two, and box three. Now, something I can do is I can actually specify ratios for these. I can say call one, which means I'm wanting to take up one out of 12 columns. And I can say call two, I want this to take up two out of 12 columns. And I can say maybe call six. So now you can see that I have this box one, which takes roughly one twelfth of the space available in that row. Okay, this is the entire row and it takes up one twelfth of the space. Box two, on the other hand, takes up two twelfth or one sixth of the space and box three uh, takes up six columns, right? So imagine there are 12 columns here. And what we've specified here is call one, call two and call six are the relative column widths that should be taken up. Now, of course, I can play around with this. Let's say I want four columns for row one. And then I want two columns for this. So four plus two, six, and then the remaining half goes here. And let's say maybe what if I had three columns? What would that do? So now you see what happens when I have four columns here plus three columns here. So that becomes seven, seven plus six becomes 13. And then the next column automatically drops onto the next line. Okay, so it's using Flexbox internally, but you don't have to worry about flex basis, flex grow, etc. You just tell it how many columns, uh, how many columns should be taken up by a particular box, and it's going to automatically uh, arrange the widths. And if the number of columns in a particular row goes higher than 12, then it's going to drop down into the next uh, next line automatically. Okay. Now where this gets a little more interesting is that you can actually modify the widths of each of these boxes based on the breakpoints. Okay, so we can start out like this, we can just say, call 12, which means we want box one, box two, box three, all of them to take up all 12 columns. Okay. So no matter what width I am at, it is going to take up the entire width of the row. And that is why even though it's it's supposed to be a row, or because box one takes up all 12 columns, box two drops onto the next line, box three drops onto the next line, and so on, right. So this is fine. But maybe when I get to and this is maybe nice for a mobile layout, I want to show three things one below the other. But maybe when I get to a tablet or a MD layout, I want to show maybe box two and box three together or some other layout. So then you could do something like this, you could say that, okay, at MD, so you can say call hyphen MD. So what you're saying is when we hit the MD breakpoint of 768 pixels, I want box one to take up only six columns. Okay, so remember, we are going mobile first. So first, everything takes up 12 columns. But now I want box one to take up six columns. So I'm going to come back in here, and I'm going to add the class call MD six. And with that, you will see that as soon as I cross 768 pixels, box one starts taking up only six columns and not 12 columns. Now, of course, box two is still falling onto the next line because there are not enough columns to fill its 12. And maybe then once again, we want to use six columns for box two as well. Right. And now you see what happened that up to 768 pixels, all of them show up one below the other. But as soon as we go into 767 or uh, 769 pixels, box one and box two come up side by side. And the reason they're coming up side by side is because we have overridden the property at this breakpoint using call MD six and call MD six. And at maybe at MD, we still want to re retain 12 for the third column. So we don't technically we don't need this property because it's simply going to carry over from whatever is there here. So whether I keep this or I don't keep this, it's not going to make a difference. It's box three is always going to take up the full width. Now, let me also increase the body font size a bit. Or let me just increase the font sizes of the columns. Yeah, so that our columns are a little bigger. I'm just using font sizes of 30. Okay, perfect. So now I have box one, box two and box three. And this is on MD. And now at some point, we're going to now hit maybe the next layout, which is going to be LG, right? So LG is going to be about 968 pixels or 992 pixels or so. So there's no change yet. But maybe on a very large screen, I want to show all three columns side by side. So in that case, I can do something like this, I can say call LG four, and I can apply that style to all of them. So let me go into 
the first box and use call LG4. Let me go into the second box and use call LG4. You can see now that as soon as we crossed about 906, 996 pixels or so, now box one and box two are no longer taking up half of the row. They're only taking up one third of the row, which is four out of 12 columns. And now we can maybe take box three and put this here on the corner. So let me also apply call LG4. And now box three so shows up here as well. Okay. And we could do this in a slightly different way as well. We could maybe use call LG3 for the first two boxes and maybe six for the third box because the third box may have more content. So now you see what we've achieved. We have not written a single line of CSS, but we've achieved this very interesting layout where first we have box one, box two, box three, all three of these, and you can put any content inside this, maybe an image, a heading, and then, a, and then some text. And then as soon as we, or maybe a heading text and then some content, as soon as we go into the tablet layout, which is about this much, then box one and box two come up side by side because we have more space now, so we can do that. And as soon as we go into LG, then box one, box two, box three, all show up side by side and they have the proportions that we need. So this is very, very powerful. And if you can master using Bootstrap's grid, and if you can know what are the right properties to use here, then things are gonna become really, really easy for you. Okay, so that is the bootstrap grid system using rows and columns. Now one thing I want to mention here that you have to have this row if you want to put things into a column. Okay, if I don't have this row class here, then every all the divs inside the container are, go, are going to be one below the other, you cannot avoid that. Although the column, the number of columns they pick is still going to get picked. So box one is picking three columns. Box two is picking three columns as well. And box three is picking six columns, right? So that's, they're picking up the right weights, but they're not showing up in a single row because to, sh to make them show up in a single row, you have to drop them or you have to wrap them in a particular row div. Okay. So keep that in mind. All right. So that is the that is how this behaves on excess screens all columns take up the full row width and show one below the other on md screens 768 and above column one and two take up half the row width while column three takes up the full row width and on lg screens all three columns are on the same row and we can decide what are their relative proportions now i would encourage you to experiment with bootstrap's grid system so there are a couple of resources you can check out one is the documentation itself and it has a bunch of different examples and you can just click this button and live edit these examples so it's going to open up a cloud editor for you and you can start editing this is of course the equal layout but you can also have these unequal layouts like this and you can do a whole bunch of things. So I would encourage you to experiment with this. There are also a bunch of examples that are given uh, along with the documentation. So you can check these out as well. Okay. Make sure you get a strong, a clear understanding of how the grid system works. Now, apart from this, you can also, sometimes you may not need a column on the left and a column on the right. You may just want to maybe just shift a particular column a little bit. So then you can also use something called an offset. So an offset is useful when you want to add some empty space before a column and you can apply an offset using the dot or using the offset star class where offsets represents the number of columns that you want to leave empty for a specific breakpoint. For example, we could have something like this. We have a div and the, we have a container inside it, we have a row and inside it, we have just a single div. Okay. Now we don't have multiple divs. We have just a single div and I'm actually just going to copy this class from here. And I'm going to get rid of all of these. So now I have a row, but what I want is I want this box to only take up six of the columns and I wanted to leave three columns on the left. And that is what the offset does. So when I say offset three, it's going to leave out three columns on the left and it's going to start from the fourth column. If I set that to offset one, you can see that it leaves one column here empty and it then spans six columns. I can of course then maybe set it to call seven and you can see that it actually does that. And I can also then play around with breakpoints. I can say that maybe this offset should kick in only at MD. So when I have the when I have the basic layout on mobile, there is no offset here. The column, it shows up right from the left edge and maybe there's something else I want to put here. But as soon as I cross 768 pixels, 
you will notice here as soon as I cross 768 pixels there this offset gets added okay and I can control this offset maybe I want this to be offset 6 in which case it is going out now offset has this property that if you set too high offset it's simply going to go out of the of the rope it's not going to go into the next row because that doesn't really make sense for an offset so yeah so keep that in mind that if you don't actually need to create a column you just need to maybe shift a column a little bit you can offset and of course you can combine things here as well so you can do something like maybe this is three columns with an offset of two and above this you have another box so this is box zero and maybe this is one column Yeah, so you could have something like this. You have this one column box over here, then you have a three column offset, and then you have a three column box over here. Okay, so you can create all sorts of interesting layouts uh, using offsets. So that is all about offsets in the bootstrap grid system. Next, I want to talk about something called gutters. Now, in the grid system, you can you have 12 columns, but those columns do not have to essentially necessarily stick together to each other you can have a gap between those columns and you can specify gaps between those columns using the gutter or the g or the g class so you can specify that at the row level you can simply say that you when you're creating a row you want the gutter to be of a certain size okay and the there are sizes the sizes go from 0 to 5 and it's not 0 to 5 pixels you can actually check inspect and check i believe it's zero time or i believe it's a multiples of four or something like that so a gutter of three would essentially result in three fours about uh, 12 pixels or there is some kind of a ratio that that it actually ties into uh, there is some responsive layout that it handles but just think of the gutter sizes as a sort of a scale of zero to five that you can modify things for okay so let us come back here and let us maybe revert to the columns that we had so we had three columns here Yeah, so we have three columns here and all these three columns you can see show up like this uh, and there's a sort of a responsive design in play here already now if i just add g3 you can see that some content or some space has been added on the left and right and also between these columns and for now let me just make these very simple columns so i'm just going to make it call three each of these is going to be a a call for yep so you have a call for and maybe g3 doesn't seem to be working okay yeah, it is yeah so the gutters are the spaces and as we increase the space you'll see that the gutter should increase let's see well, this doesn't seem to be doing the job probably because of the yeah let's add a small border to this okay so let's take a look at this so you can see that there is some gap here and there is some gap here now if we remove this gutter you can see that some of that gap disappears now that gap should also show up between columns i am not 100 percent sure why it's not showing up right now maybe it's because i maybe that that gap is actually getting at is going to get added inside the border that's why we're not seeing it um but yeah so what the gutter does is it adds gaps on the left right and between your columns right so you can check maybe g4 or let's just try gx4 and gy4 yeah so gutters should add gutter should add gaps i believe it's because it's probably going to overlap with the border here that is why it's not showing up but whenever you want to add spacing between the columns then you can simply set the gutter on the row variable okay so you can check out the documentation for gutters here 
this is this is exactly what it should look like so there should be some column there should be some uh, space here some space here and some space here on the right and similarly here you can see that there is a gutter on the left and right and that gutter can also be changed customized on the left right and bottom as well so you can have some spacing between the columns you can have some spacing uh, between the rows when things overflow into the next line and that is being set here you can see using gy5 and so on okay so that is all about how you use the bootstrap grid system so the key things for you to keep in mind are always use a container and the three types of container are a container that is always kind of centered and restricted and then a container that is completely fluid that always takes up the full width of the page and a container that takes up a full width up to a certain breakpoint and from that breakpoint it remains centered on the page okay so just use bootstrap containers don't you don't have to create your own containers or uh, add your own breakpoints or maximum widths generally speaking your bootstrap container should do the job for you okay now apart from containers you have rows and columns so you can create a row and then you can put a bunch of boxes in a row and then you can specify their widths using the 12 column grid system and you can change the widths based on cer certain breakpoints you can also then use offsets and you can also specify specific gutters and based on uh, the gap that you need between your columns okay now next thing I want to talk about bootstrap utility classes because this is also something that we're going to use when we start building our websites so utility classes in Bootstrap are single purpose reusable classes that can help you quickly style and modify elements in your project. And they include various aspects of styling such as spacing, text, backgrounds, etc. So the key idea here is for a single line of CSS property that you might want to put in the CSS file, you can simply include a utility, file, utility class that's going to do the job for you. So here are a few utility classes that uh, we're going to look at. The first is spacing related utilities. Spacing simply means margins and paddings. So Bootstrap provides a bunch of classes like this. So you can say MT hyphen three. And what that does is it says margin top should be set to three. And again, this is not three pixels. This is just on a scale of zero to five. This is a certain a uh, five is a very high pad uh, margin zero is zero margin so it is just somewhere in between and you can verify what that actual value is by inspecting it in your browser uh, and similarly you can say mt3 or you can say mb2 okay so t includes a, t means top b means bottom so just using these few characters we've specified the margin top and margin bottom or we could also do something like this we could do p hyphen four which means that you want a a padding of four units, not four pixels, four units on all sides. Let's see what that actually means. So let's maybe go in here, get rid of this container over here and simply post these in. So you can see now this particular div that we have here, this div has a top margin of three. And what do we mean by three? Well, if we just look at the styles for this div, the computed styles, you will see that this div has a margin of 16. So three simply means maybe about 16. And this div has a bottom margin of two. So that is eight. So I believe it works. Um, one is four and two is eight and three is 16 and four is 32 and so on. So yeah, so MT3 means a margin of 16 pixels at the top and M MB2 means a margin of four, eight pixels. And you can go ahead and change this. You can change this to maybe MB five and see what that changes it to. Now the margin becomes 48. All right. So you can always check what these margins are and let's check this div. So this div does not have margins, but this div has padding. So it has a padding of four pixels all around it or a padding of 24 pixels all around it. So P four simply adds 24 pixels on all sides. I could also do PX four and PY three in case I wanted to just X direction is left and right and Y direction is top and bottom. Now you can see that top and bottom PY3 applies a padding of 16 pixels and left and right uh, PY4 applies or PX4 applies a padding of 24 pixels. So this is how you can quickly apply paddings and they've already set some de some default values so that the spacing doesn't look very off. So always just try out maybe MT1, MT2, MT3 and see which one works best for the layout. Okay, so those are the spacing related utilities. Apart from that, we can also use utility classes for styling text. For example, you maybe want to center some text or maybe you want to make these, make it italic. 
Uh, so FST stands for font style or maybe you want to change the font weight you want to change the font weight to bold so all of those things are something again you can do using utility classes so i can come back in here and i can just drop this in and you should see that this text is now bold because it has the class fw bold and by the way if you're ever curious what styles does a particular class actually apply you can come into the inspect tools and you can check the styles tab and in the styles tab, you can see that the class FW bold applies the font weight of 700. Okay. So that's what it actually does. So there's a very deep level of CSS inspection that you can do whenever you're looking at a website, or maybe you've just used some bootstrap class and you want to know what exactly it does. Just right click on the text, just click inspect. Oops. Yeah, just click inspect. just click inspect and then you can either check the layout here using in the computer tab or you can go into the style style styles tab and see the exact styles that have been applied for each of the selectors that apply to this particular file okay or to this particular element and fw bold is clearly coming from bootstrap and it sets a font weight to bold let's check this one this fst italic this checks this sets a font style to italic and then we have text centered this is simply going to center the text of course you could also do text right or something like that and that is going to put the text on the right maybe it's text aligned right okay i don't know so yeah maybe there's a way to uh, align the text to the right i would just probably look it up in the documentation so how do you know these how do you know what utility classes are available well you just have to check the documentation if you check the documentation of bootstrap you can see that there is a section called utilities and then there are various utilities for text display flex etc so we were looking at text and you can see that there is text alignment so you have okay you have text start and text end so if you want to align something right you have to say text end and this is because it supports right to left layouts as well and you can see that now text has moved to the end so i would just keep the utility section of bootstrap open and look it up how is it better than typing out classes in your css file because by using a utility class you are co-locating the style with the html so at a glance it's going to be very easy for a developer or just for you to be able to identify what are the styles that are getting applied to a particular html element okay so utility classes are great because they just bring the styles into the html and help you get a clear picture of what the uh, what the element is going to look like okay then there are a bunch of background utilities so you could do something like this you could let's say set the background color to the primary color which is the blue that we have set so let's create this div over here let's get rid of these text utility classes and this is a particular div let's format that Yeah, so you can see that this div has a primary background color, which is the blue color that we've set and it has the color of the text white. So you can say text white that is going to simply change the color of the text. And I could also do something like P4, let's say, if I wanted to add some padding to it. And I could also add borders and things like that. So there are lots of utility classes available that you can apply here. There are also display related utilities. So let's say you want to change the display property. Remember, you can have block, flex, inline, all of those things. Uh, you can do all of that using display properties as well. So let's look at an example. So now we've created the span and we've set its display to inline block using D hyphen inline hyphen block. So the shortcut or the shorthand for the display utility is D and hyphen inline if you wanted to show it inline or hyphen block if you wanted to show it um, block within inline so all of these have different meanings this is going to turn it into a flex container and again you can verify you can just go in here click inspect and you can check that this is actually this has the display type flex and you can verify that it actually has a display type flex by putting a bunch of items inside it so let's say let me put item one item two item three you can see that they show up in a row of course if this was not flex but if it was block then item one item two item three would show up one below the other okay um, but and i could also have set it to d none so i could have done something like this that this is just simply not visible 
And here's one trick. Let's say you want to make something visible for a particular size, for a particular breakpoint. So you can say D none, and then you can say D MD block, or let's maybe say D SM block, and let's say D MD flex. Okay, so what we're saying here is I don't want this div to show up by default. I want this div to show up as block on SM and higher, which means 576 pixels and higher. And then on 768 pixels and higher, I want it to show up as a flex div, which means its items are going to show up in a row. Okay, so here this and let's just give it a little bit of padding as well. So let's give it P3. And let us give it a BG blue. So that you can actually see what's happening here. Okay, so Right now that div is not showing up item one, item two, item three. Let's get rid of this upper span. And now if I just increase it slightly. Okay. I guess DSM block did not actually work out here for some reason. I'm not sure why, but DSM block should also show up. <clears throat> but you can see here when we set uh, when we set it to uh, let's just put it this way. Okay, that initially it's set to display none, and when we close when we go to MD, we want it to show up as flex. Yeah. Okay. Let's just look, let's just do this. So D none. So it is none by default. And when we go into the SM layout, which is the small layout it's going to turn into block. So you can see that below by the, at this point, it is not visible at all. And let's just set this to BG primary. Or how do you set the background? Yeah, BG primary should be fine. Yeah, so it's not this div is not showing up here. But as soon as we cross 569 pixels, or 576 pixels, then this becomes visible. And you can see that it is using the layout block SM block. And let us add DMD flex here. So that when we cross 768 pixels, it should show up as a flex container. So all its items should go into a row. And you can see now that its items have gone into a row. Okay, if I come back at SM, it is blocked. So its items show one below the other and it is just not visible on a uh, small screen on excess screens. Okay. So these are the display utilities very useful for just uh, hiding and displaying things. Sometimes you may want to do it the other way around. And of course, we it also contains a bunch of utilities around flex box. So one of course is D flex or D M D flex or D S M flex. So all of these utilities, you can trigger them at specific breakpoints. So you can say D hyphen M D or B G hyphen M D hyphen blue or primary, etc. And all of these utilities um, can then also uh, and there are a bunch of flexbox related utilities as well. Specifically, the few the two you might use and are justify content and align items. So let's just take a look at an example of this. So here these are now this is now a flex div. Okay. And let me just also give it a big font size. Yeah, so this is now a flex container at MD screens. And I could do something like this, I could say, justify content center. And now you can see that along the main axis, because flex direction is row by default, all the content is justified at the center, or I could say space between or I believe it's just between. Yeah, so now we have added space between the content. So that is the other way this can work. Or I could say justify content end. And now all of the content is justified at the end. Similarly, you can have align items as well. So let's say we give this a height. So let's say we give this a height of 300 pixels. Now I could do this, I could say align items end. And you can see that items one, two, three have all moved to the end, right? And the most common use case would be probably align item center where you want to center them along the cross axis. And sometimes you want to combine that with justify content center. 
And what that essentially ends up doing is it centers no matter where you are. And of course, the flex gets triggered only at, at LG or at MD. But no matter oh, how you increase the height or width of the page, the content is going to remain centered vertically and horizontally. Okay. So you have all these nice utilities where you don't have to go into your styles.css at all. You can simply just add them at the class level in the HTML. So I encourage you to create a simple layout using the bootstrap five utility classes where you create a container with three equal width columns, then set the top and bottom padding of each column to size three, and then apply a different background color to each column and ensure that the text inside is white. And then try to center the text horizontally and vertically within the columns. So try to do all of this and make sure and also maybe throw in some changes at specific breakpoints and make sure that you are able to do all of this without writing anything within the CSS file. Okay, you have to look up the documentation and you have to achieve a certain layout just using bootstrap CSS utility classes. And let's see if you can do that. The way to become comfortable is just to exercise. There's no way you can remember all of these things. It's just the more you use them, the more they get committed to memory. We've now learned about the bootstrap grid system. It's pretty extensive. It allows you to do a lot of interesting things. We have learned about bootstrap utility classes. They allow you to apply text styles, background styles, flex styles, display styles, etc. Now we are in a position to actually start building out our page. And we're not going to write the HTML of our page from scratch completely in the sense that we're not going to just use grid and styles. We're actually going to use some components that the creators of bootstrap have already put together for us. Okay, so bootstrap offers a wide range of pre built components. And these components are designed to streamline the development of responsive mobile first projects. And these components provide a solid foundation for creating visually appealing and also highly functional websites. Now, there are a bunch of different components and we'll go through various, uh, we'll go through some of them, definitely not all. It's a huge library with a whole bunch of components. But the few categories are navigation components. So things like navigation bars, headers, footers, breadcrumbs, pagination, that is something that we'll find in bootstrap. Then there are layout components. So you can create cards, you can create list groups, you can create media objects like images, etc. There are a bunch of form related components. So the creators of bootstrap have set up special classes for rendering forms nicely so that you don't have to do a lot of work to show forms on your web pages. There are a bunch of modal components, which is basically pop ups that overlay the entire screen or things like drop downs and tool tips that you can add. Um, then there are of course, like a bunch of utility components like small alerts and badges and small things that you can use to highlight important information within your page. And there are also a lot of interactive components. And this is where a lot of the JavaScript is used. Because remember, we used a we imported a JavaScript module as well. So that's where we have like accordions, carousals, tabs, etc. And I encourage you to check out these three, we're not going to cover them today. So they will possibly be uh, get covered as part of a future assignment or something. But I encourage you to maybe play around with these a little bit. Okay. So you can check out the various components offered by bootstrap here. So bootstrap has this section called components in its documentation. And there are a whole bunch of components that you can pick up. So I'll, I'll let you check these out. And then there are also several examples on bootstraps web page on how to use these components in a proper page. So here there are some common patterns for building headers, nav bars, building the hero or sort of the main section, maybe building some feature sections, building sidebars. So you can create all sorts of interesting layouts using bootstrap components. So check out the documentation for components and maybe also check out examples. So whenever you're working on a project, these two pages are going to contain a lot of useful information for you. So with that, let us redesign the Jovian careers website. So this is the Jovian careers website right now. This is what it looks like. There's a nav bar, there's a banner image, there's this about section, employment opportunities, submit your application, etc. So let's redesign the careers website step by step using bootstrap components, as mentioned in the problem statement. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add some links in the navigation bar and show a collapsible menu on mobile devices. We'll see what that means. We'll also show a list of jobs using cards on mobile and on table. We're going uh, on desktop. We're going to use a table and we're going to make the color scheme, typo typography and layout consistent and aesthetically pleasing. 
Okay, so let's start with the nav bar. And this is where we can use Bootstrap's nav bar component. So we can come in here and you can see here that there's a component called nav bar. And a component essentially is simply a bunch of HTML and CSS along with some special classes. So the way you use a Bootstrap nav bar is basically by adding a class nav bar to a nav element. And there are a bunch of classes that need to be added. So the information about the classes that need to be added are here. There's this navbar brand, navbar nav, navbar toggler, navbar text, collapse, etc. And navbar scroll. So the best way to actually do this is to maybe go through the examples that have been given on the page and pick the example that is closest to what you want to achieve. Okay, so here is a nav bar which contains this, maybe this could become the logo and maybe these could become the links. We don't need this form as such, so we may not need this, but there's, and so this is an example, example nav bar, and this is the code for that example. So what you can do is you can simply copy this code and paste it. Now remember, whenever you paste code, you should study it line by line to know exactly what it does, okay? So copy this code and paste it in your HTML and that will give you a nav bar. And there are also various other examples. So this is like a plain nav bar, simple nav bar. Uh, you can check out these two as well. This is a nav bar with an image. This is a nav bar with an image and some text. This is a nav bar with a, just a bunch of links. I think this is something that we might be able to use. And then there are a bunch of different examples. So you can, you can also embed forms within the nav bar. I think I am simply going to maybe just pick the first, let's pick a very basic one nav bar with a bunch of links because that's what I want ultimately. So let me pick this up and let me start customizing it step by step. Okay. So let's get rid of this and let us just maybe bring this, make this a little smaller and make this a little smaller as well. Let's reload this. Okay. So this is what we have. No change here. Now let me just come in here and replace this navbar div with the code that I've just copied over. Okay. So this is the code that I've copied over and this code results in this navbar being added to my page. All right. Well, so first thing I want to do is I'm just going to study it line by line and I'm going to make some changes to it. So, all right, I have this class navbar and I want this navbar to show. So it's going to show up in a collapsed form like this, you can see that there's a button here. There's a button here. And when I click on this button, it opens up this menu. So bootstrap automatically gives me this nice mobile drop down menu so that on mobile, I, uh, there's no space to show the link. So it's going to show up in this button. So that's nice. Now I can specify when I want it to expand. Do I want it to expand on small screens, medium screens or large screens? So currently it is set to LG, which means when the width of the page crosses 992 pixels, I'll have to maybe zoom out a little bit. Yeah, but when the width of the page crosses 990 pixels or so, then this gets shown normally. Otherwise this gets shown like this. Maybe I don't need expand LG. Maybe I can do with expand MD. So. Yeah, so you can see here that up to the MD breakpoint, which is about 768 pixels, it's going to show up like this. And after the MD breakpoint, it's going to show up like this. Okay, so that's what these two classes mean. Navbar is simply going to trigger the entire navbar component um, for this particular element. And then the BG body tertiary, I believe this is simply the background color. I don't need that. So I can, I've gotten rid of the background color. What I do want is I want to add this nice shadow. I want to add like a small shadow here, which I have, which we have on the Jovian website. You can see that we have this nice subtle shadow below the nav bar. So I'm going to try and add that shadow. And I believe there is a utility class for adding shadows. I believe you just say shadow and that's going to add a sh utility shadow here, but this shadow is too big. I can make that smaller. So there's like a shadow SM utility class. Again, something that you can just search online, how to add a shadow in bootstrap and you can just find it online on Google or chat GPT. Okay. So now our nav bar has a shadow that is nice. Next we have this container fluid. So we have this nav bar. It's going to take up the full width of the page. What do I want? Do I want it to take the full width of the page? Well, maybe I wanted to take the full width of the page till the medium screen, but for LG and bigger, I want it to be centered. Okay. So I'm just going to do this. I am going to pick 
yeah so i'm just going to maybe make it fluid i'm just going to make it lg uh, at lg it's going to become centered and it's going to remain fluid for md and below okay so remember what this container is doing is this container is deciding whether the entire nav bar should be centered on the page or not now if i don't have this container lg you will or if i just make it container fluid it's always going to span from the left edge to the right edge okay and that, that is different from the toggle the toggle the toggle is controlled using the nav bar expand the container fluid decides whether the nav bar takes the full width of the page or not let me just set it for now as container um i'm md or container yeah container md so from for md screens and bigger it is going to be centered on the page okay so that is what this does so far this is fine okay then we have this brand nav bar okay i think this is where i might want to put the jovian logo so i'm just going to grab the jovian logo from here i have already put this in here so i'm just going to grab the jovian logo so we have a couple of logos there's one logo that is going to show up on small screens which contains just the icon does not contain anything else so let me remove this text nav bar over here and let me just put the jovian icon and you can see that it's going to show up on small screens but as soon as i hit yeah so you can see that i have given it the class dmd none which means it's going to show up on small screens but as soon as we hit the md breakpoint it is going to stop showing up okay and why do we have that because for bigger screens or for md breakpoint i actually want to show the full jovian icon or the full jovian logo with the text so let's put this in here. Okay, we're given it. I, I don't think it needs an ID anymore. So I think the ID can be gotten rid of. And even the height may not be necessary, but it's fine. Let me just keep the height for now. Okay, so let's get another Jovian logo for bigger screens. So let me grab the Jovian logo with text. So this is simply, again, the Jovian logo with text. So again, it's an image tag. And what we're seeing here is that it is hidden by default. So it has a display of none, but from the MD breakpoint, which is 768 pixels, we want it to show up in line. Okay. So this is what that ultimately results in that up to MD, we have the smaller logo, which contains just the icon. And then beyond MD screens, we have this bigger logo, which contains the actual Jovian logo. Okay, cool. So our navbar is almost ready i think we're almost ready to go ahead i let's see what we have here we have this navbar toggler uh, of the type button if i understand correctly i think it what it's doing is basically simply setting this button so this button is the button that is rendered here so this is simply the toggle button so i can also maybe just add a quick uh, comment here so this is the toggle button and the toggle button only shows up till MD because after MD, it is going to just uh, expand automatically. And maybe I can add a small uh, comment here saying this is the logo. Okay, so now in my nav bar, I have the logo and I have the toggle button. So all of this is fine. Now in the nav bar we have and in the toggle button, we have this that it controls or it targets this nav bar nav and the nav bar nav happens to be this div which contains a list inside it okay so it's not visible until we hit the md breakpoint and then from the md breakpoint it becomes visible and we can verify this by clicking inspect and let me just turn off the device mode for now and you can see that this id navbar nav id navbar nav is visible here but if i reduce the width a little bit it's not going to be visible so this is the nav all, all right this is fine now what do we want to do here well we want to maybe first edit these links so let's see it has collapsed navbar collapse i don't think there's any change we need to do here this seems fine id seems fine so i'm verifying every single line of code this is very important when you are working with bootstrap so let's see let's make the first link instead of home let's make the link courses and let's make this link programs and let's make this link youtube and let's make this final link sign in 
So in case somebody wants to sign in here from the careers page, they can sign in. Okay. So now you see, now we have courses, programs, YouTube, sign in. Okay. Looking good so far. Now, of course, there are some styles that have been put in here. So I think I can remove those styles. Let's see. The class is nav item for all of these. And I believe we can simply change the actual hrefs first as well. So let me just set this to jovin.com slash learn. So that is the link that I want the courses to go to. And this is not the current page. So this current page is causing the courses to look slightly different from the programs on YouTube. So I'm going to remove this aria current current page. So that all of them look similar and I'm going to remove this active as well so that yeah because all of these are going to some output so when you say active it's just going to give it a special style so I'm just going to remove this active as well so you can try out removing each class and see what happens and that's a great way to understand what these classes are doing okay then we have the second nav item and I think I also wanted to open in a new tab so I'm also going to say target equals underscore blank Okay, so now when I click on this, it's actually going to open the Jovian courses in a new tab. So that is the courses nav item. Let's now fix the programs nav item as well. I think I'm going to send it to the same location. So we have the courses nav item, then we have the programs nav item, both of them are going to the same location for now. Uh, I'm we may create separate pages later on, but uh, for now, both of them are going to the same same location. Okay, so these two are fine. I want to fix the YouTube link as well. So let me just copy this, come bring it in here for YouTube. Again, it has a class nav link. It is, I'm going to give in our YouTube link here. So youtube.com slash at Jovian HQ. That is going to be our YouTube link. So that is going to open our YouTube link. Perfect. And finally, there is the sign in. I want to turn the sign in into a button. So let's come into buttons and bootstrap also has a bunch of button classes. So let's come into buttons here and I can just turn that into a button simply by doing something like this. And there are like, there are examples here that I, all I need to do is I need to say button type equals button class equals button button primary prime. And then I can put in whatever content and this way I'm going to get this nice blue button. But one thing you can also do is you can actually just use not just a button tag, but you can also just use a a tag or a link tag. And this link tag by itself can auto or this anchor tag. So this a tag is the anchor tag. This anchor tag can also be made to look like a button using the BTN class. Okay, so we are using a link, but we're going to turn it into a button by simply providing these classes. And we can also give it the role button just for screen readers and such. So I'm going to remove this nav link disabled class from my sign in. So now sign in is just a normal unstyled link. And I'm going to add to it the class btn btn primary. And maybe let's see if we can also do nav link. Let's see what that does. No, that's going to change override things. Maybe I can simply do a pl or a margin left two. That doesn't seem to be doing anything. Maybe I can do it here. I can do px or p L two. Nope, nothing. MX two. Yeah, MX two does the job, right? Maybe L should also do it. No, L. Okay. Uh, I believe it is MS margin start that does the job. Yeah. So MS is margin start. So I'm just using the utility class margin start to give just some space to the button. Maybe MS three can be tried as well. Yeah, that looks good. So now I have my Jovian logo. I have courses, programs in YouTube, and I want this to go all the way to the right. I don't want it to show up here right in front. And I also want it to be center aligned with the logo. So there are a couple of things we may need to do here. And let's see how we can achieve them. Now, this is where the abstraction breaks. This is where you'll have to actually inspect the actual nav bar and make some changes directly. So I am going to first just select inspect the nav bar here. So right click, select inspect. Okay. So this is the nav bar. This is fine. And this is the container of the nav bar. Okay. So this is where this is where my entire nav bar lives. This is fine. Then I have the nav bar brand. This is all well and good. 
Then I have the navbar toggle that's not visible right now. And then I have this navbar collapse. Okay. So I want to, looks like this navbar collapse is right after the navbar brand. I want it to go all the way to the right. How could I do that? Let me take a quick look at the parent component, which is this container. And let me check the, what is the display type of this container? So if I check the display type of this container, the display type of this container seems to be flex. Okay. So that means the, my nav bar logo and the links are both items within a flex container and it has a flex direction row. You can verify the flex direction as well. By default, it's row if it doesn't say anything. So in a flex direction row, I want the contents to be spaced out. How do we achieve that? Well, along the primary axis, so along this axis, I want there to be an automatic space added between the starting component and the end component, the first and the second component. That can be added using justify content space between. Okay, so think about this. I let you think about this. And when you practice this on your own, so what I'm going to do here is in my container MD, I, which is a flex container, which contains the brand and which contains the, the list, which of course there's, it contains a button as well, which is not visible right now. I'm going to say justify content between or space between. What does that do? Well, that did not seems like it didn't do anything but maybe just by content let's try end okay that didn't do it as well so maybe maybe i need to take another closer look at what exactly is happening here so maybe i let me check this element so it looks like this div is also a flex div so maybe it's possible that this div may be taking up the entire space so just by content end is not working here let me try and come and set it on this collapse div, which is also a flex div, right? So this collapse div is also a flex container and it ha it contains a bunch of these uh, list items and all of these list items are contained in this. So let me come into the collapse div and let me add justify content end and you can see that it shifted to the end. Okay. So how do I, how did I achieve this? Well, I actually just tried it out. So sometimes all you have to do to achieve the desired layout is to think from first principles. Okay. This is the box I have and I need to shift something to the right or left. And how can I achieve that using some flex property or using some display property and then just dig in into the inspection and fix things. Right. But whenever you're using bootstrap, the one tip that I can give you right now is if you want all of your elements in the list of nav links to shift to the right, simply go into that collapse div, the collapse navbar collapse, which is the list of things that gets collapsed um, at a particular breakpoint and just add justify content end and it'll shift everything to the right. Okay. Uh, and on a case by case basis, you'll just have to search this. Sometimes you can just search this online as well and you can find the answer. Okay. One other thing we can do probably is maybe seems like this is not these things are not aligned properly so maybe i think it might also help to add an align item center here okay that's not doing anything all right i'll experiment later but one thing i want to do is maybe just slightly fix the alignment so that courses is right lining up properly with the center of the logo which doesn't seem to be happening right now Okay, so now we have courses and we have sign in as well so for the sign in button as well. Let me just add an href. And the href is simply jovian.com slash login. And the class uh, or the target is underscore blank that is simply going to open it in a new tab. Okay. Yeah, so this is looking rather nice, I would say. So here we have this mobile view. Okay, looks like on mobile view, we need to fix the sign in button. It should not have this left stop left padding, right? So I'm just going to trigger this from MD. Yeah, so now what's going to happen is that the margin is going to kick in only from MD. So let's see now this is looking good. I can collapse it. I can expand it. This is looking nice. And as soon as I increase beyond the medium width, which is somewhere about here, now it goes into this nice layout where I have these links right at the top and I have this nice sign in button. 
I think maybe MD2 might be sufficient. I don't really need MD3. Okay, I have this nice sign in button and this is looking pretty good. So with that, we have completed the nav bar. This is the original layout. I've just zoomed in a little bit so that you can see more clearly. Okay, so that's what we did. You can just check out the layout exactly. The code is present here as well, but we have just made it in made it so that it expands and it shows up a bunch of links from MD and higher, right? So this is the layout that we've achieved on mobile and this is the layout that we've achieved on desktop. Okay, next up is the hero section or the about section. So this is where Bootstrap also provides various examples for specific sections. So remember in this page, we have this about Jovian, then we have this, then we have this, and then we have this banner image as well. So let's look at some examples from the Bootstrap examples. So these are all the, these are a bunch of examples for the hero or the about section. And for this, looks like there is this centered option that we can just have some centered content on the page. I don't want that. Uh, there is this centered option with an image below it. That's not what I want either. Okay, this looks promising. So I have some uh, text here. I have some text here and then I have an image here that looks somewhat similar to what I need here. Okay, text, image, etc. And maybe this layout is actually better where the text, the, even the title is on the left and not on the center. And then I have these buttons here, but I don't have to use these buttons. Instead of these buttons, I can simply put in these two items that I have here. Okay, so I guess I'm going to use this layout. And this is one of the examples on this examples page, we have a bunch of examples. How do I get the code for just this example? There is a way you can download the code and then search it. So you can go into bootstrap examples, you can download the source code of these examples, you can open the hero folder, etc, etc. But I'm going to show you a quick way. Uh, when you're looking at a bootstrap example, just right click, click inspect, and find the outermost container. So okay, this is the container and looks like this container contains this entire hero element and inside it is the entire thing. So you can just click on this container, right click, select copy element. And that is going to copy the HTML code for this entire container that we're looking at here. Okay. So with one click, I've copied the entire HTML code for this container. And now I can come in into my code. And here in this about Jovian section, I'm removing whatever placeholder text I have. I'm just going to paste in this container. And just like that, you can see that we got this nice, responsive left aligned hero with image. And of course the, the image is not present here, so we can change this image. We have an image here. Um, well, actually, I think we have a link to an image here that we can grab. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I've, I've hosted this image online so that I can just copy it over easily. Let's see, I am, yeah, so the image source is this. Yeah. And so with that, I have this nice layout where I have this responsive left aligned hero with image uh, and with some text with these buttons and I have this nice image on the right. Okay, looking pretty good. And let us start understanding and customizing this. Okay, first thing I wanted this to be a container. I think that's fine. I want the content to be centered on the page no matter what screen size we are on. So this is fine. It's this content is always centered on the page. Okay, let me get rid of this. I think I don't need this call XXL8. I am not interested in that right now. It has this PX4. What is this PX4? Okay, so this PX4 seems to be this padding on, on the left and right. Okay, I think I can keep the PX4. It also has this PY5, which is the space above it. I think maybe this PY5 may not be necessary right now. So I'm going to get rid of this PY5 and automatically you can see that the top and bottom padding has completely gone away. All right. Um, yeah. So that is looking good so far. Next, let us come in here and let us check. Okay, what's happening here. So it looks like we have flex. By default, we have like, it's just a normal div with things going top to bottom. That's fine. And at some point it becomes a flex container with the direction row, but not just row, it, it becomes a flex container with row reverse. So on large screens, we have flex LG row reverse, which means on large screens, it becomes a flex container with a direction row reverse. And that is why the image comes on the left and the uh, on the right and the text comes on the left. Okay. I think that works for me that 
I have this top to bottom layout here. This is fine. And then I have this left to right layout here. This is fine. I may need to do some centering, but it's fine. Okay. Maybe I can just use a flex call layout initially, a flex column layout so that there's already this align item center. So what that can do for me is just make sure that the content becomes centered. Okay. That's not exactly, doesn't exactly seem to be happening yet. Okay. Maybe we don't need this flex call here. So this is okay. Align item center. I think what this does, I can, I can remove it and see what happens. So when I have align items, when I don't have align item center, the text comes on the top and it is aligned with the top of the image. When I have align items, oops, when I have align item center, the text is center aligned vertically with respect to the image. Okay. Earlier it was here. Now it is here. I think I like this better. So I'm going to keep align item center. Okay. There is this G five. Let's see what happens if we remove the G five. Well, looks like there was some shift in the gaps. I think it's fine. It's probably okay. Not a big issue. There is this PY five. Okay. Do we need this PY five? Yeah, I think we need that PY five. Maybe I can just make it PY four. Maybe we don't need that much space. Okay. Looks fine. Or PY five is fine too. Okay. Looks fine. So far my layout is looking good. Then we have this image. So we have this call 10, call SM8, call LG6, a bunch of stuff going on here. I think I'm going to make it very, very simple. I'm just going to say call 12 and call LG6 so that it takes up the full width. And I think we'll probably need that gap five now because yeah, I think we need that gap. Maybe I can make that gap smaller. Yeah. So I wanted to take up the full width, the, the div containing the image. I wanted to take up the full width on all screens. And then at some point I wanted to take up just half the width. So at LG, I wanted to take up half the width, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Okay. So let's give this call 12 as well. And on LG screens, Yeah. And on LG screens, it's both of these are going to take up half width. Okay. So there seems to be this MX LG auto. I'm going to get rid of that. There seems to be this image fluid. This is okay. What else? Well, I think it's, this is a gap that might be causing the problem. We'll fix the gap later. Okay. So yeah. So till LG, it takes up the entire width of the uh, width of the page or width of the container, the centered container. And from LG screens and bigger, it simply takes half the screen width. Okay. So this is good. This is looking good so far. And let me also maybe add a rounded border to the image. So I can just go in and say rounded. Okay. And let's also maybe say MX auto so that it's centered on the page, no matter what width it's taking up. Okay. Let's maybe add some padding below the image. So let's just say MB four. Yeah, I think this is good. So now we've added some padding below the image and let's add a similar, we'll add a similar padding for the uh, other content as well. Okay. So this is looking pretty good. So now we have the Jovian logo and let's make this PY four. I think PY four should do the job for us. Yeah. So now we have the Jovian logo. We have this image. Okay. We have this text here. I'm going to change this text. So let's see display five FW bold text body emphasis. All this looks good. I'll keep those LH one. All that looks fine. I'm just going to change this to work at Jovian. Okay. I think I want it to be centered by default. So I want to say text center by default and then it's looking good. And then at a certain point, I want it to become left aligned. So at LG, when the layout shifts, I want to say text LG left aligned to left aligned. I have to say text LG start and it's going to become left aligned over here like that. Okay, great. So again, we've, you can try removing some of these and see what it does. What happens if you remove display five? What happens if you remove text body emphasis, etc.? Let's try it. Let's try removing text body emphasis. Okay. It didn't make a difference. So probably we didn't need that. What about font weight bold? Do we need that? 
okay we definitely need that what about display 5 do we need that yeah we definitely need that okay so this is all looking good we have uh, work at jovian this is a nice little uh, thing that we've added and let's get rid of these buttons i don't need these buttons here okay let's take a look at this actual paragraph of text i think this paragraph you want to maybe change it to the paragraph that we were actually using earlier so i'm just going to come in and maybe copy over the paragraph that we had earlier let's paste this paragraph here okay looks good yeah this is fine i think we also had another paragraph linking to a couple of courses so we had this full stack developer bootcamp data science bootcamp let us maybe add those paragraphs as well so let's add another paragraph and let's see if this class lead is important what if i don't have this class lead okay this class lead seems to be important it's going to make the text a little nicer to read a little bigger so i'm going to keep this and i'm going to keep this in my next paragraph as well and in my next paragraph let's add this text let we also offer two industry focused boot camps all right cool and let's get the links to those boot camps so let's get the i'm just going to copy this entire ordered list so we have an ordered list ol with the class lead it contains one list item which contains a link to the full stack developer boot camp it contains another list item which contains a link to the data science boot camp okay and just like that we have created a very nice looking hero section so this is often called the hero section um i think we can probably get rid of this margin you can see that there's this margin bottom that we had kept i think we can get rid of it when we get to a large layout yeah so we have this margin bottom i don't think it is very useful here in this case so for a large layout i'm going to get rid of it so i'm just going to say mb lg 0 okay nice so now it's nicely centered on the page okay perfect so on mobile screens we have this toggle and we have this image we have the centered work at jovian but of course this paragraph it's better to just keep it left aligned and then we have links and then um, the font sizes are also responsive you'll notice that the font size is actually increasing that's what the display fonts or the utility classes allow us to do and then as soon as we hit this large layout you can see that we flip into and then at excel there's a certain change as well in terms of the container size but we flip into this nice two column layout which is looking rather nice and i don't think we need this banner image anymore because just this layout itself is looking so nice that i don't feel like then further adding a banner image or anything okay yeah looks good i am feeling pretty happy with this and now we can probably move on to the next section okay so the next section is the employment opportunities which we want to show as a list of cards on mobile and on desktop we want to show it as a, a table okay so how do we do that let me just copy this over here so that we can actually just see this side by side so here you have this employment opportunities table by default it's a list of cards like this let's see if there is something to create cards in bootstrap so let's go into the bootstrap documentation let us search for cards yeah so there seems to be this card component and this card component can be used to show an image can be used to show a card title used to have uh, have some text and maybe also have some content here at the bottom i need something much simpler maybe i need something like this which has a card title a subtitle and maybe just some text about it so i'm just going to copy this and i am going to come in here i'm going to create a new section again i'm going to create a div and i'm going to give it the same class that i had for the previous div above so container let's see what did that look like container and px4 so i'm going to give it container and px4 so that left and right we have some space so that the content does not stick to the left end of the page and let me put in an h2 here and let me just put uh, let me just call this job opportunities okay so now we have this job opportunities let me also just add class text center here okay and i want to right now i want to just work with smaller layouts so i'm just going to keep it like that 
And let me just now add this. Maybe I'm going to add a div and I'm going to give it the ID jobs list. Well, maybe I don't really need an ID. Let me just drop in a comment here saying jobs list. Okay. And inside this div is where I'm going to create my cards. All right. So let me paste in this card and let's see what it gives me. Okay. So this is the card that I get. It's on the left. So I'm going to change a few things up. First, I'm going to remove this width. I don't need this width. I do need this class card because that's what adds this nice border around it. I am going to add maybe a MY4, which is just, okay, maybe not here. Uh, MY4, which is margin in the Y direction, four units, which is going to just give us some space here. And maybe I'm going to also add a MT5 here. Yeah, so that this is a little spaced out from the previous content. Okay, looks good so far. And let us now add, okay, let's now fix the card title. So we have this front end developer role. Let me just grab the content of the front end developer role here. Okay, so card title is front end developer. So I'm just going to use that. Front end developer. Okay, that looks fine. Then we have a subtitle in the subtitle. I'm going to put in the location of the job, which is Bengaluru, India and 12 lakh rupees, which is the uh, annual salary. So I'm going to put that in here. I don't need these links at the bottom. So I've gotten rid of these links. And then I here, maybe I can just put in that this was posted three uh, this was posted like on March 3rd, 2023 or something like that. So I'm going to put in that information over here. Okay. So very basic content. Yep. Okay. So now I have front end developer. This is good. Bangalore, India, March 3rd, 2023 looking good. I can maybe just make this slightly better. I think the spacing is a little off. So maybe this MB two is not required. Maybe just make it MB one. This looks fine. And I guess this text can be slightly smaller and maybe a little grayed out. And that is where I can use this small um, tag, HTML tag, which bootstrap automatically turns into slightly smaller text. And I'm also going to use text body secondary. So I still have this card text class, but instead of using the P tag, I'm using the small tag and I'm using the color text body secondary color. So now you can see that we have this nice hierarchical card where we have this front end developer Bengaluru India 12 lakh rupees and posted March 3rd, 2023. Okay. So that is the, yeah, so that is the card that we have created and I'm just going to copy this over just so that we have like a nicer version of this available for us to easily replicate. And let's fix this padding here as well to MY5. MT. Maybe we, this H2 needs some padding below. So I'm just going to add MB4 to this H2. Yeah, so that things are a little spaced out. Okay, so that's one card. Let me copy over the other cards as well. So this is the full stack developer role. So let me come in and let's now Oh, looks like I have this additional div here. Full stack developer role. Let me just format the document. Looks fine. Okay, full stack developer. Let me add in the data scientist role as well. Data scientist. That is the data scientist role right here. And finally, let me add in the ML engineer role as well. Okay. So all we're doing is simply using the classes from bootstrap. We're still using writing plain HTML code, but now we're adding classes from bootstrap and all those styles and maybe also some JavaScript nice features can get added in automatically via bootstrap. So now we have all of these job opportunities. I think this is looking pretty good. Um, this is fine, but I don't want this to show up beyond MD. So I think when we hit the MD breakpoint, I want it to, I want this to disappear. So that's where we have this DMD none class. So we can say that by default, it has a certain display, but at the MD breakpoint, we want it to disappear. So for the entire jobs list, so this is the jobs list. 
I'm just going to give it the class D M D none. Okay. So you can see that at in very small screens, this is visible and this is looking good. As soon as we hit the MD breakpoint, then this goes away and is no longer visible. Okay. So with that, I think we've completed the first one th or the first half of the page, which is the nav bar, the hero section and the job opportunities, at least on the mobile view. Now, of course, at MD, this disappears. And from size MD, we want to show a table. So let's maybe first bring in a table here. So inside the jobs list, well, right after the jobs list, but still within the jobs div, so within the jobs container, we want to add a table. So let's just add a jobs table here. Okay. And let's first, maybe I'm just going to put in a div containing a table. So you can see all I've done here is I have have a div and inside the div, I have a table and inside the table, I have this table row uh, or the header row. And of course I've used certain col column spans and row spans to achieve this kind of a layout where you have you know, job title, then location has city and country under it and so on. So to achieve this layout, I have used column span row span. So this is the exact same table in terms of the basic HTML that we had the last time. And I'm just going to save that and let's see what that does. So now this has added this table here at the bottom, right? But there are two issues here. One is that this table is always visible. We don't want it to be always visible. We want it to be visible only on MD and higher. So I'm just going to say class D none. So which is by default, we don't want it to be visible and then D MD block. Okay. And what that does is from MD on MD, the list disappears and the table appears. Okay. That's good. The second thing is, of course, this table is not looking very nice right now. So one thing we can do to trigger bootstraps tables is simply use the table class. And how did I get this? Well, I simply looked up the documentation. So in the documentation, just search for table and they have this class for table. So you can just add in table, the table class to any table component. And that's going to create this nice table for us. Okay, the table is looking nice, but we still want borders around the table. So we want a border table. So let's see where, how do we add a border to the table? Well, it looks like we just have to add the table bordered class. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to add the class table bordered and voila, our table now has borders pretty good. I would like to maybe give it some more color. So let's see how we can add colors. So accented tables. Well, let's see how we can maybe make get these striped rows. I think this would be nice. So let me copy this table striped CSS property. And this is how you work with bootstrap. You look at an example that contains what you need and then you just add that property. So table bordered, let me add the CSS, CSS property table striped. And yeah, I think the table is looking nice. Okay, maybe I can make a few changes to this particular to the heading because the heading the header row should probably look a little different. Let's see how can we color how can we color the table? Are there any colored tables here? Okay, looks like there is a way to color tables as well. We can use this table primary class to give it a primary color. But I don't want it on the entire table. I just want it on the header rows. So it looks like I can just add class table primary on a row and it should just color that row. Let me color the first header row table primary. Okay, nice. It gets it gets this nice primary color. Let me add this to the second row as well, which contains the city and country. And this gets the nice color as well. And because of the striping logic, this gets a slightly different color. Okay, our table is starting to look good. I think I want to center the titles here. The so I'm just going to add text center for the table row text center. Right. So this is how you build it out step by step. Okay, nice. The table is looking good. So till mobile, this is fine on MD, we switch into the table, which is looks fine to me. I think it's not uh, it's not cramped or anything. Okay, when we get to LG and higher looks like this is this table is getting too big. Maybe I might want to just limit the overall size of the table a little bit. 
So this is where I can maybe use a small helper layout here. So what if I do this? Let's say on LG, on LG, I limited to just eight columns. Instead of taking the entire 12 columns, I limited to eight columns. So on MD, it's going to take up the full width, which is here. But on LG, it's going to just take up eight columns. But of course, I don't want it to take up the left eight columns. I want it to take up the middle eight columns out of the 12. So that's where I can add an offset. So I can say offset LG four or maybe offset LG two. Yeah. So what I'm saying is leave two columns here, leave uh, and then take up the eight columns and that automatically leaves two columns here. 12 minus eight minus two is uh, two. All right. So that way the table is going to be sent completely full width on medium screens, but on large screens, it is going to simply take up. Okay, on large screens, it is simply going to take up the uh, eight columns in between. And that just expands a little bit, but it still looks nice, I feel. Okay, so that's great. I think we've been able to set up a nice table. Let's see, maybe I can just increase this gap a little bit. MB five, maybe here. Yeah. This is looking a little nicer. Okay, so our with that we are done with our jobs list and jobs table. So this is what our jobs list looks like job opportunities on mobile. And then we've also added a table. And this is what our job opportunities table looks like. Okay, perfect. Next, let's move on to the application form. That is probably the only big piece that's left here and the footer should be pretty straightforward. Now for the application form, once again, Bootstrap offers various pre-built form components. Okay. So first let us just set up the basic layout and then we are going to start incorporating this one by one. So once again, I need a container here. So I'm just going to give it a class of container and PX4 because I want some spacing left and right. So PX is the padding. It is basically this space that you see on the left and right. It's nice to have. I think it's, it's good. We can keep it. Okay, then I need an H2 here. So H2. And in this H2, I want to put in submit your application. Okay, the H2 is looking okay too. Well, maybe for this H2, I can add a text center because I want to center this text. And maybe I need to add some space above as well. So maybe let me add MT5 above. Okay, now that has added some space above. And let me then also go ahead and add a form here. So I'm going to copy over the form that I had the last time, at least in terms of the basic um, action and method. So remember, we were using a tool called form bold to actually post the form. So let me add the form element here. Okay, I've added the form. And now into the form, I can start adding inputs. Okay, so I've created a form, but this form doesn't have any inputs yet. I could put like input type equals text. And that should create an input box here. So let me just move this up a little bit. You can see that now I have this input box, but of course I want to use a nice input form that is created very nicely with bootstrap. So I'm going to come into bootstrap here and I'm going to search for form. Okay, so here is an example of forms. Uh, looks like you don't need anything on the form component. And for the actual inputs, looks like we need to do a bunch of things here. We need to set a class of, okay, this is just a, we need to put the input and label and maybe some help text in a div. And we then need to maybe specify the class form label for the label. We need to specify the class form control for the input. And if we want some helper text, so this is some helper text that we want to show below the email, then we can specify some helper text as well. So how about we simply copy this over? I think we understand this well enough. So we can just copy this over and let's put it into our form instead of this. Okay. All right. So just like that, we have this email address input field that is looking good. And I am going to simply give it the I'm going to give it the ID email. So the input is going to have the ID email and the 
email help is the description below the email address this looks fine as well and yeah i think this looks good so we need form label and form control it looks like these are the two things that we require and that automatically helps us create the layout okay what else well i feel like maybe we don't want to use the entire uh, we don't want to use the entire width for email of the page maybe we want to use just maybe half the space so i can go in here and i can say call six and this way it is only going to take up half the space but now the trouble is even on a really small screen, it takes up only half the space. So let me say call SM6. And this way on a really small screen, it's going to take up the entire width. And then as soon as we enter bigger screens, it's going to take up less width. Okay. So this is good. I think I'm happy with this. Okay. Perfect. So just like we have email i have also already put together some other examples so here now i have this name field so i'm just going to copy the name field all we have is we exa we have the exact same mb3 call sm6 except this time the id and the name are full name or or name i guess um so let me just copy this over and this is of type text so let's insert the name field that's giving us the name field email we already have the email field but let me just in any case copied over once again so that is going to give us the email field the only difference between the name and the email field is of course their id and name are different the field name but also that the type is email and that is going to automatically add some validation and we've also uh, added a placeholder and we've added a required field so forms we've covered in a lot of detail already so i'm not going to go into the specifics here but now we have the name field we have the email field all we've done is added a few bootstrap classes form label and form control which makes it look nice let's get the phone number field so again the only difference here is the titles labels ids and the type is tel tel which requires this to be a phone number field okay and let's format the document a bit yeah Cool. so now we have the phone number field as well this is looking good let's get up the let's get the date of birth field as well okay let's get date of birth so yeah for date of birth we have once again we have the same layout exactly except that this time it's a date picker so you can go in and you can actually select a particular date here so that's good okay next up is the apply to field so this is more of a drop down uh, this is like a select component so i'm just going to bring it in here first so the position applying and then we're going to look at take a close look at it okay so the position applied for is a drop down and from here you can select whether you want to apply for full stack developer front end developer etc so how are we doing this well once again we have class mb3 and call sm6 now the only difference here is instead of an input we are using a select which is what we have to do anyway but the class we are changing now from a form input to a form so it was called form control here now that has been changed to form select and that's it that's the only change the label still says form label and we have a default option with an empty value set to select a position that's why by default it is pointing to select a position and we have then a front end developer full stack developer data engineer ml engineer i believe we can also make it required so that the user has to select a particular option so yeah this is just a normal drop down all we've done is added a class to the label added a class to the select and added maybe this uh, layout or this bottom margin and this six column layout here so that it looks slightly nicer okay then we have this resume upload this is a file upload and the only difference here is the input type is file so again i'm just going to kind of bring that in directly as well so here is your file upload and that allows you to pick a file again exactly the same finally we have this cover letter and in this case it is a text area okay so no change here again the only change i'm making is i want the text area to actually be full width right so i want the text area to be I want the text area to actually be full width and that is why I've set I've removed that call SM6 so I'm going to use a full width text area and that has a, a label cover letter and once again you give it the class form control and that's it we have our application form the last thing we have is the terms I'm just going to bring in the terms real quick really straightforward 
it's just a simple checkbox. So all we do is we say form check input and form check label. Again, all this is borrowed from the bootstrap documentation, simply copied over and with a, a quick assessment of how things are. What else? Um, I think we have the submit button right here. So let's grab that submit button. That is going to be a primary button for us. So we have submit application and now we are ready to submit the application. So that's it. I think this form is looking good. Maybe we can make like some final changes here. Let's see. Okay, I think the form goes. I guess the form goes too wide. I think we want to restrict the form to just be just as wide as this job opportunities table because otherwise it's going to become a little hard to actually read the content of the page. So I'm going to add the exact same classes here that I had for the previous one. So on the form, I am going to add the class. LG, let's say call LG eight, so that it is not too wide. And I'm also going to add offset LG two, so that it is relatively speaking centered on the page. Okay. So now we have work at Jovian job opportunities, submit your application. And we have the form as well. Let's quickly verify the form. Okay, we have email, we have phone. Okay, phone looks fine. We have date of birth, we have position. Yep. I think this is all. Let's check date of birth. Yeah, I guess date of birth needs to be changed to DOB. Let's change this to DOB. DOB. And yeah, with that, our date of birth is fixed as well. Perfect. So now we have the form. Now we have the hero section. We have job opportunities. The final thing that we need is the footer. Okay. Now, where do you get the footer? Again, Bootstrap has a bunch of examples that you can choose from. So here are some examples for the footer. Let's look for footer. And let's open up the footer. Okay, so there's this example right here. This is something we could do or we could do something like this. I think this might work out fine for us. So we could probably just right click inspect and copy this entire container. Paste it in and make some desired changes to it. So I can get rid of this. I can simply paste that in. And then I just need to make the desired changes to it. And because I made these changes already, I'm just going to copy it over from here. It's exactly what it looks like. Um, I'm just taking an example of the footer, which is a container. And then it has maybe a PY, MY, and it has the list of links. And below it, it has this copyright text. It's a very simple, straightforward footer. I've just made very minor modifications to what we already have in the bootstrap example. Okay, so let's paste in the footer here as well. And with that, we have a footer. So great, this is what it looks like on, let's just go normal to the basic device mode and let's see things from scratch. So this is what it looks like on mobile. There is this nice drop there's this nice menu here we have and then we have work at jovian and maybe we can make this a little bigger on maybe we can make this a little smaller on mobile i let you maybe explore that as an exercise then we have job opportunities maybe we can make this heading a little bigger i let you experiment with that as well then we have submit your application then we have the form here full name email address phone date of birth etc upload resume cover letter agree to conditions submit application and then we have a footer now, as soon as we get into the MD layout, the cards disappear and uh, this appears, the table appears, but we still have this vertical layout for the hero section and the form seems to take up the full width. When we get to LG, then this now becomes horizontal as well. And these open up as well. You can see that on MD2, these open up and on SM, these don't. So yeah, a bunch of changes going on in each section. You can just browse through each breakpoint and you can see that the footer also slightly changes. You can see that the footer here, it splits into multiple lines and here then it expands into a single line. And of course we have this nice line here as well. Okay. Yep. So I think this is looking good. At this point, I am just going to make the changes. So I'm, I'm just going to commit this. So I'm, I'm going to say added bootstrap styles for sections and I'm going to commit this and I'm going to sync it and we're ready to actually deploy this. Okay. So this is the final step. We're going to take this repository and just deploy it on Vercel. 
and you know how this is this is really really simple so we just go to github.com or we just go to vercel.com and on vercel.com let us just add a new repository and you can sign up and connect your github account let's add the repository jovian careers bootstrap live which we have created just now and we are going to the root directory is the src directory so i'm going to select the src directory and i am on the main branch and i can click deploy and now it is going to take the code that i've just pushed to the git repository you can see that we can actually see what the change that was just made yep so we just added the bootstrap styles for sections and in the src folder we have this index.html file which contains bootstrap it contains the nav bar it contains the logo toggle button the collapse section it contains the about section with the hero image and it contains a description and links to the boot camps it contains the list of jobs so this is a normal list of cards and it contains a table with bootstrap styles and it contains an application form and it contains uh, the application form contains various types of inputs contains a position resume cover letter etc contains terms contains a submit button contains a footer and that has just been deployed so in just under two or three minutes we've deployed our project to Vercel. now we can open it up and check it out and of course it is a fully responsive website so we can actually just open it up here in our device mode view and we can check out the links the links seem to be working fine okay this link maybe needs to be updated to open in a new tab we can check out that job opportunities show up properly all right this is good submit your application this looks fine too and let's just try filling out the application as well akash ns akash ns at jovin.com plus nine one okay let's try to hit submit and it's going to say this is a required field so let us fill this in and let us upload a resume so let's grab a resume here i'm applying for the let's try to apply again okay this is also required so let's select that too well cover letter why well i know responsive design and bootstrap and then i agree to the terms and conditions i click submit and this is going to make a submission remember we were using this third party tool called form bold so if you check the form here we had set the action to form bold and in a future lesson we'll look at how to actually handle the content but we are simply sending it to third party and that is going to then send us an email with the response but yeah the form has been submitted and the joven team will get notified so perfect i think this page looks pretty good now considering where we started and even com compared to where we were the last lesson i think this was looking good better than what you had earlier but it still had certain issues you couldn't you could tell that it's not very polished but you couldn't tell exactly why and that is where frameworks like bootstrap come into picture you can use their default styles you can use the examples that they have and you can build out these nice looking uh, web pages i think there's still some spacing that we can improve here probably i think the spacing seems a little bit off here too i'll let you fix that as an exercise maybe we can add maybe like a subtitle uh, or something like that but otherwise uh, maybe we can increase the size of this header but otherwise i think this is looking pretty pretty good and it also has like slight interactive elements uh, on mobile so that's it that is what we have ended up with this is what the page looks like all good and this is what it looks like on mobile uh, we have these nice cards and we have this nice separation of the different elements of the card as well that's good so in this tutorial we saw how to install bootstrap css and javascript bundles into a web development project we saw how to modify bootstrap's default colors and typography using css variables and custom selectors we saw how to use bootstrap's breakpoints and grid system for, for creating mobile first responsive web pages remember you have to first put a container then inside it you can put a row if you want to put columns and then you put, put multiple columns within the row and then you can use sizes on a call 12 column grid to arrange them then you can have use the breakpoints as class prefixes and that is how you achieve all kinds of interesting layouts and of course you have a lot of utility classes for display for background for text for flex 
So all those are going to be really useful as well. We saw how to use uh, Bootstrap's pre-built components. So we used the nav bar. We built. We looked at an example hero section. We we used uh, form components. We used tables. We used a, a example footer, and we used these for building a web page quickly and efficiently. And all the code for this tutorial can be found at this link. And you can also check out the finished site because it's deployed to Vercel automatically. And I would encourage you to check out some of these resources. The official Bootstrap documentation is really the only resource that you need to work with Bootstrap. And most of the time, what you're going to be doing is finding an example or finding the documentation, copying or copying it over, and then carefully making changes to each line. Always make sure that you understand what exactly what each class does. And if you're confused, try removing it, see what it does, or go into inspect element and see what it, uh, see what explanation you can come up for it with. And then we have a bootstrap crash course you can check out, which is similar to what we did today, but a different example. So maybe looking at a couple of different examples can help you just explore more components, become more familiar. There are also a bunch of other tutorials and there's this nice cheat sheet that you can check out if you want to understand what are all the different classes that are available and what do they do. Hello and welcome to this live tutorial on building a scientific calculator from scratch using HTML, CSS and JavaScript. No frameworks required. We're going to do this all live step by step and we're going to try and replicate the functionality of Google's inbuilt scientific calculator. And stay till the end because I'll also show you how you can do most of your work simply by asking chat GPT the right questions. So with that, let's get started. Now, this is what Google's inbuilt scientific calculator looks like. If you just head on to google.com and search for calculator, you will be able to see this user interface and you can perform calculations here. For example, seven minus three multiplied by 69 multiplied by pi. And you can see that that gives us the result 867.079. And of course, you can then use this result and build on top of it as well. But this is the basic functionality that we will try and replicate today. You can see that there are a bunch of simple calculator buttons here, and then there are a bunch of more complex scientific calculator calculation buttons that are also included here. So let's see how many of these we can actually implement. And this is what the calculator looks like on mobile. So here is the user interface on mobile and here all the functions are under this other tab FX. So we'll try and replicate maybe some of this functionality as well. And we are going to do this step by step using just basic HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So all the steps that we're going to follow are listed here in this doc, which is linked from the description. So you can follow along if you'd like. Now there are some prerequisites here. You need to know a little bit of HTML, a little bit of CSS, a little bit of JavaScript, and a little bit of Git and GitHub. Now don't worry if you're not an expert in any of these because we are going to cover just introductory uh, explanations about each of these as we use them. Apart from this, we will also be using the Bootstrap CSS framework. And that is again something that I'll refer you to the documentation for in case you're not already familiar with it and you will be able to find the links here as well. So here are the steps you're going to take. We're going to first prepare our development and deployment environment. So we're going to create a public GitHub repository, launch it in GitHub code spaces to edit it completely online. Then we're going to set up our basic bootstrap framework and also then deploy the web page to Vercel quickly so that we can test and share our implementation easily. Then we're going to build the user interface with HTML and CSS. We're going to look at what the Google calculator works like, and we're going to build that mobile first design and progressively enhance it for tablet and desktop. And then we're going to add some functionality using JavaScript. So this is where we're going to add a script file. We're going to create some variables and functions to keep track of current and previous expressions. And then we're going to create functions to implement the logic for each button and add some click handlers as well. Finally, we are going to test the page carefully on different screen sizes, ensure that the HTML, CSS and JavaScript is well organized, and then stage, commit and push the changes to GitHub and verify that the site is deployed. Now, I will leave some parts of these as exercises for you to do. Uh, so try and build on top of what we are doing today and we'll see how far we can get in about 90 minutes or so. And then we'll also talk about how you can use ChatGPT to take away maybe more than half of your work. All right. 
So with that, let's get started. And if you have any questions, please post them in the comments. So the first thing that I am going to do is start a new GitHub repository. So I've just gone into github.com. I've signed in and I've simply, uh, I've simply uh, ready to, I'm, I'm ready to put in a repository name. So let us call it scientific calculator live. Perfect. And let's give it a description. So a replica of Google's scientific calculator built live. All right. And I'm going to make it a public repository. I'm going to make it open for everyone to use so that you can see the code. I'm going to add a readme file and I'm going to select the git ignore template node. And that is going to add a bunch of git ignore uh, settings, which are going to ignore any temporary files that get created when working on a HTML or web development project. I'm going to choose the MIT license here because I want you to be able to build on top of this and let's click create repository. And just like that, we have our repository now created on GitHub. GitHub, of course, is the platform used by 50 million plus developers for sharing projects online. We use GitHub internally at Jovian as well. And of course, now we need a way to actually write the code. And that is where we are going to use an online coding platform called GitHub Code Spaces. So I'm just going to click the code button here and you can develop this locally, you can git clone the repository and then you can run the code locally. But I'm just going to use an online coding platform offered by Git, uh, GitHub called GitHub Code Spaces. Now what that is going to do is it is going to set up a machine for me in the cloud. And then it is going to clone the GitHub repository over there. And then it's going to give me this Visual Studio Code interface within the browser. Visual Studio Code is the editor that we use for web development and a lot of software projects. And now we can actually start writing our code in this Visual Studio Code browser. All right. So let me just bring this to one half of the screen so that we can be a little more organized here. I'm going to close this terminal over here. And let's bring this here and we're going to use this for just testing what we are building. Okay. So to begin, I'm just going to go back and search calculator so that I have for reference what my calculator looks like. So this is what my calculator looks like right over here. I am just going to right click and click inspect. And generally when you inspect, you will see a view like this. So you will see some developer tools here below your actual uh, web page. And in the developer tools, there's this button right here. This is called the device mode. So what you can do here is click this button and now you can view the web page in a mobile device. So you can see a mobile preview of the web page and you can also put the dock to the right side or the left side so that you can actually line it up nicely with a mobile device. So this is what, let me just reload the page. So this is what the calculator looks like on a mobile device on google.com. And I'm going to open up one version of it on desktop as well. So this is the normal view of the calculator and this is the mobile view of the calculator. And we're going to start by building the mobile view of the calculator. Okay. Now to start coding, uh, I am going to start by creating an SRC folder over here. So I'm going to just create a folder SRC, which is where I'm going to put in all my HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And now let me create a new file index.html, which is going to contain all the HTML that I'm going to write. So let me just uh, put in a doc type here. So that's something that you should always put in. Let me put in the HTML tag. And in the HTML tag, let me put in a head tag. And let me put in a body tag. And in the head tag, let me just put in a title, scientific calculator. And in the body tag, let me put in for now, just a div that says hello world. All right. So this is what we have so far. We have Let's zoom that in a bit. So we have scientific calculator. Let's get rid of this. Yeah. So we have scientific calculator. That's the title of the page. We have a body inside the body. We have a div that says hello world. And now let us simply try and view this page. So we want to be able to preview this index.html page and to preview it, we can use an extension called live server because it's not very straightforward to preview a web page directly from code spaces. You need a VS code extension for that. So just head into extensions and search for live server. 
Okay, the live server is simply going to let us preview the web page we are building uh, within code spaces. Okay, so once this live server extension built by Ritwik Day is installed, let's close this extension tab here. So extensions are found here in the menu. You can see that there's a menu called extensions and just search for live server install it. Now once you do that, you will see that there is a go live button. I'll have to expand this a bit. Yeah, you will see that there's a go live button at the bottom of the page. And this go live button is going to turn your code space into a server essentially. And it's going to give you a preview of the page that you had uh, open here. So I'd open index.html here. And now you can see that I have this index.html. If I zoom in a bit, you can see the words hello world over here. And you can see scientific calculator in the title. So that is how I've set up a preview of my code. Okay, so that's great. Now we have on the left, we have an index.html file. On the right, we have this hello world uh, text. So that's great. Now, of course, we want to use the Bootstrap CSS framework. So I'm just going to go in here and search Bootstrap CSS. And Bootstrap CSS makes it really easy to build very flexible layouts. It also provides a bunch of, yeah, maybe I should go for the latest version. Uh, it also provides a bunch of different components that we can use and that makes development really fast. So I am just gonna, let's see, read the docs and we wanna get started with Bootstrap. So let's start by, okay, it says that you need to create an index.html file and we need to add a couple of meta tags. So let's copy these meta tags, meta car set equals UTF-8 and meta name equals viewport. So these are both required to enable proper responsive behavior on mobile devices. So I'm just going to come in and paste these meta tags in my code over here. So all I've done is I've read the documentation. So read meta tags from here and pasted them here. Then the next thing I'm going to do is include bootstrap CSS and JavaScript. So bootstrap contains a CSS file, which contains all the styles that it provides. And it contains a JavaScript file, which contains all the uh, all the interactivity it provides with drop downs and things like that. So let's just come in and include those as well. So I'm going to include my the link tag for this bootstrap CSS file in my head tag. And I'm going to include the script tag over here at the bottom of the body. Okay, now, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry, you can spend some time learning bootstrap. But the idea here is we are using an external framework. All it gives us is some nice things that allow us to quickly build web pages without having to worry too much about writing a lot of custom CSS. Okay. Perfect. It also says you can also include popper and JS separately. Well, I'm not worried about that. Uh, so with that, I think I've added bootstrap and I should immediately be able to just see that you can see here that the styles have immediately changed. I had a different font earlier and now I have a slightly different font. So that's great. Now we've added bootstrap as well. And at this point, I my web page is looking pretty good and I think I'm ready to start building my scientific calculator. But let me also save the work I've done. And the way I'm going to save it is simply by adding so going into the git tab in Visual Studio Code and adding a com, adding a commit message to perform a git commit. So I'm just going to say here, um, add bootstrap. Let's see add index.html and bootstrap. And I'm just going to click commit. And it's going to ask me a few things and it's going to just commit those changes. And that's it. And now this is going to get pushed. So you press the sync button. And that is going to now push that code back to the repository. Okay, so that of course is the git workflow, you open up the code either locally on your computer or on a GitHub code space, then you make some changes and you test them out using a live server or some kind of a server. And then you commit and push those changes back to GitHub. So GitHub makes this workflow very simple. And now you can see that in this index.html file, you actually have the scientific calculator basic code that we have put up so far. All right. So with that, let us actually start building the scientific calculator. So I am just going to build this piece out for now to, to begin with. And this looks like okay, maybe I just want to put this in the center of the page somewhere somewhere over here. And maybe I'll just put a title called scientific calculator somewhere. So I'm going to start by creating a bootstrap container. So I'm going to create a div with the class container. And what that does is that creates this nice div which is always going to remain horizontally centered within the page and let us inside this div let us put in an h1 or a header tag 
एंड लेट्स कॉल इट साइंटिफिक कैलकुलेटर ओके परफेक्ट सो नाउ वी हैव दिस साइंटिफिक कैलकुलेटर thing over here and this is looking fine um i and you can also see that the container is actually centered on the page so that's why this is centered but i could also just add text center the class text text center on the header itself so that this header comes right in between okay i could also control the font size if i wanted maybe this is too big for me maybe i don't want something so big well actually i'm not i'm i'm a bit zoomed in and that's why maybe it appears a bit too big i might want to add some space above and that is where you would normally write some css you would say margin top 32 pixels or something like that and again bootstrap provides some simple uh, simple classes utility classes where you can say something along the lines of my or mt which stands for margin top and you can say mt2 and it has like a pre configured sets of uh, margins so you can say 1 2 3 4 or 5 and that is going to control the margins let me try mt3 yeah so i think mt3 that is the amount of margin that got added here that looks good okay so that's the utility of bootstrap and you can check out all of these classes simply by looking up the documentation so there are these utility classes for spacing and you can see here bootstrap includes a wide range of shorthand responsive margin padding and gap utility classes and you can do something like mt1 mt2 mt3 so i'll let you experiment with it this is not a bootstrap tutorial but the idea is we've just spaced things out a little bit we've centered this on the page and we have now uh, put some space above our title and let's start building this uh, let's start building this actual calculator so i'm going to put this calculator inside a card a bootstrap card because that would be a nice way to kind of contain the entire user interface of the calculator because my page is largely empty and the way i'll do that is first i will create a row so in bootstrap whenever you're creating a responsive layout you start by creating a row and in that row i am going to now create a column okay and in this column so maybe let's just look at the row and let's just add a border to the row so that you can see what the row looks like so right now we have this row and this row takes up all the space from this end to this end that's a lot of space i probably don't need that much space uh, so i'll do something about it but let me now add a column to it so let me add a column and let me make this maybe just six or uh, let me make it a width six columns long so in bootstrap there is something called the grid system so every row is split into 12 columns and you can create a div spanning six columns so this is where my ui my ui is going to go so i could say ui goes here all right so now you can see uh, if i add another border around this you can see that now we have this row of content once again i'll zoom in for you so that you can see clearly what's happening but yeah you can see that now we have this row of content and in that row of content we have this column this one or this one div that covers six columns out of the 12 i i want to center this div i don't want it to take up the entire width but i want it to center so that's where i can say something along the lines of offset call 3 and okay that doesn't yeah i guess it's just offset 3 yeah so now what we have done is we have said that we have a row and the row spans the entire width of the container and in that we are going to create a column uh, a, a div which spans six columns but of course it's going to leave three columns on the left and then it's going to create a span six columns and then of course three columns are going to be remaining on the right okay so we've le left an offset of three columns we are taking up six columns and then we have three more columns on the right that we uh, that is that way we've centered this user interface on the page all right so so far so good this is looking fine to me Now let us start adding some of the user interface for our calculator. Um now I'm going to use a card to create the calculator just to have a nice let's see let's just search for card. So just to have a nice uh, border around my calculator around my calculator I'm going to use a card. So here's what we can do we can create a div with the class card and then we can create a div with the class card body. So let me just quickly do that let me get rid of these borders. and let me get rid of these borders and i'm just going to say div class equals card and i'm going to say div class equals card body 
and my UI goes here. Okay, so we're getting close. So you can see that by using the card component from Bootstrap, again, just look it up, just look at an example, you'll get it. Now we've created this nice card and inside this card, we have this nice user interface that we can now start building. Okay, and now let's start by creating. So what's the first thing here? The first thing is this input box right over here. So let's start by creating this input box. How do we create an input box? Let's search for input. Okay, looks like there's something called an input group, which we can use or maybe even like form control. I think we need something like this. We probably want to just show the output of the button clicks, the current expression in an input box like this. So I am going to use, I think this looks good, form control LG. So maybe I can just use this. So let me just copy this form control LG and come back here and paste that in here. And yeah, that looks good to me. Of course, I probably don't need, I probably don't need this placeholder over here. So let me get rid of placeholder. So you can see we have an input of the type text and it has the class form control and form control LG to LG simply means large. So to make it a little bigger. And finally, we have uh, a bunch of other labels that we might fi find useful. Okay, so now we have form control LG. I'm also going to make this read only because we don't want to be able to edit this directly. So I'm just going to make it read only uh, like that. Uh, and we only want to edit it based on the content that we put from the buttons that we click. Okay, and that's going to come up soon. All right, the last thing I'm going to add here is maybe an ID because so I'm just going to give it an ID calc display. And because this ID is going to be used to actually set the value of this particular field over here. Okay, so now we have this field, something like this, not exactly this, but close enough. Now we need to start adding some buttons. So we have all these buttons, okay, brackets, percentage, AC, uh, 789, etc. So let's start adding these buttons. So to add these buttons, I am once again going to create another row. So I'm going to say div class equals row. Okay, and let's add the first row of buttons here. So the first row of buttons is I'm going to use the BTN or button tag and each of the buttons is taking up one fourth of the space. So remember that every row has 12 columns inside it. So that means each button is going to take up three columns. So maybe first let me create a div with three columns. So div class equals call three and that's going to take up three columns. And inside this, let me put in a button. Now again, there's a way to put in buttons in Bootstrap. There's a, there are some helper classes. So I'm just going to search for button right over here. And again, we're going quickly because this is not exactly a Bootstrap tutorial, but you can go to the documentation. You can see what buttons look like. This is what buttons look like. Uh, I don't want a base button. Maybe I want a button like this because that seems to be the color that is used in most of these buttons. So I'm just, I'm just going to use BTN light or button light. Let's grab that. Okay, button type equals button, BTN light. And let's just paste that in here. And yeah, looks like we now have this light button. So that's good. Uh, of course, we need some spacing around it. We maybe need to add a border around it. So let's fix that in a second. But at this point, let me add one button here. So the, the button here is that. Okay. So my button's looking fine and let's add maybe a couple more buttons and then we'll fix this spacing, etc. So we have another closing bracket percentage and AC. So let's come in and fix those buttons. Okay, this is interesting. Now when we make when we reduce the size of our scientific calculator or of our browser, that is going to squish the calculator a little bit. So maybe we can do this, we can say offset MD three and call MD six. And for small screens, we can just take let it take up the entire space call 12. Okay, so for small screens, it takes up the entire width of the container, the this is the the div wrapping or the column wrapping the card. So for small screens, it takes up the entire width, and then it shifts into a smaller width later for MD screens. Okay, and we can adjust this further towards the end. But for now, this is fine. All right, coming right back, 
we need to add a few more buttons, but let me just improve this button slightly a bit. The first thing I want to do here is let's put one more button and then we'll see what we can do about it. So the first issue that I'm running into that this button is not really taking up the entire width of the column. Maybe it should. So I could just come in into the button and let me just go into the button and say W hundred. And W100 is a helper class within Bootstrap that makes the button take up the entire width of the column. Okay, let me add that here, the W100, let me add that in here as well. So both my buttons have width of 100, so that's good. I think buttons can also have a margin top probably. So let me add a margin top here. So let me say MT1 or MT2. Okay, MT2 looks good. So now there is some top margin that we have added. Let me maybe also add a border to these buttons because it'll be nice. These buttons seem to have a border around them maybe. So let me add a border to this as well. So let me add empty to border. Okay, the button is looking good. I think the space between these buttons is too high. Um, maybe I can reduce the space and this is a default space between the columns within a row and you can control the space between columns using something called gutters uh, in bootstrap. Again, that is done. I I'll let you explore this, but the basic idea here is you can use these GX and GY classes to control the amount of space between columns. So I'm just going to come into the, come into my row here, which can, which is the row of buttons that I've created. And I'm going to say GX one. And you can see just as, as soon as I say GX1, the buttons become a little wider and the space between them reduces. Okay. So yeah, I've just added a bunch of classes here and you can always look up what these classes do. So I encourage you to do that. And I encourage you to also maybe right click inspect and see what exactly what are the CSS properties that get applied here. Okay. All right. So now we have the button and we have uh, another button. Let's take and let's take these two buttons and add a couple more buttons. Oops. Okay, let's add, let's see what these buttons are. So percentage and AC are the buttons that we are adding here. So let's add the percentage symbol. Let's add AC. Okay, that's good. Now we want more buttons here. So one thing we could do is maybe create more rows. Uh, we could actually create another row and then in that row add multiple columns. But remember that Bootstrap has 12 columns within a row. And if you try to create a div that does not fit within those 12 columns, it will automatically go to the next line or the next row essentially it's going to wrap onto the next uh, line. So I can, I don't actually have to create a new row. I can simply copy these columns and just create another set of columns right below it. And what that will allow me to do is I can then make it a little more flexible, maybe uh, in my layout, uh, but you don't have to do it this way. It's just an easy way to do it. Okay. So here's my second row of buttons. How many rows do we have? So we have one, two, three, four, five rows. So let's add those five rows here. So I'm just copy pasting. Uh, I'm just copy pasting these four columns or these four column buttons again and again. One, two, three, four. And let's add one more set of buttons. Perfect. All right. So now we've added a bunch of these buttons and let's maybe actually put in the values. So we have seven, eight, nine and the division symbol. We should find a way to actually copy that division symbol. Uh, let's find it. So if you just search division symbol, you can actually find the symbol online. Uh, but anyway, let's first put it in. So this is the first row of data. So this is fine. Then this is the second row of data or second row of buttons. Let me make them seven, eight, nine, and the division symbol. So let's copy that division symbol and put that in here. Okay. So now you have seven, eight, nine division. Perfect. Then let us get that next row that is four, five, six and the multiplication symbol. So let's get that in four, five, six and multiplication symbol. Yeah, this is the multiplication symbol. So four, five, six and the multiplication symbol. Perfect. It's looking good. Let's get the next uh, set of rows here. So one, two, three and the minus symbol. So let's get the minus symbol all, is already present on the keyboard. So we don't need to change a lot here. One, two, three and the minus symbol. Okay. We've added the next set as well. Finally, we have zero dot equal to and the plus symbol. 
So now we have zero, we have dot or point or percentage or decimal point equal to and the plus symbol. Okay, perfect. It's looking good. I think the equal to symbol can be made blue. And again, this we can do simply by changing the class here instead of button light, I could say button primary and instead of border, I could say border primary or maybe like border and then border primary and that's going to give it the blue color. Okay, with that we have implemented the basic user interface of the scientific calculator right over here. And we have, of course, it's not working yet. None of the buttons actually do anything. But if for 15 20 minutes of work, this is not looking too bad. Okay, so let's go ahead and commit that. So basic buttons and input box. Let's commit it. And let us just sync it. And that's going to now go and get added to our GitHub repository. Okay, perfect. Now, we'll also see how to deploy this. So stay tuned till the end. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll also see how to do all of this or most of it using something like chat GPT. Okay, now let us start adding the functionality for this. And to add the functionality for all of this, we are going to have to use some JavaScript. So I'm going to assume basic knowledge of JavaScript here, variables, data types, functions. And I'm going to show you how you can use JavaScript within an HTML page. And there are various ways to do it. But the simplest way to do it is by using a script tag. So you could, for example, go to the bottom of your body and add a script tag here. So I'm just going to go in here and add a script tag. And you need a closing script tag as well. Okay. And you can also put in yeah, I think that's it. And then now you can put in anything inside this. So I could put for example, console.log. Hello world. Okay. And now this anything you put within the script tag is JavaScript code. So now you can actually check you can inspect. Let me yeah, so this is the mobile view. I think that's fine. But let me just bring the dock down to the bottom. And let me also turn off device mode for now. Yeah. So you can actually check the console tab here uh, of the developer tools. You can always go, go here from window developer tools or just type developer tools here from the okay, it's from the view tab. So view developer developer tools or JavaScript console, that's going to bring you to this page. So view developer JavaScript console. There's also a shortcut for it. You can see here that we typed console.log hello world and that printed hello world here instead if you had said hello Jovian, that would say hello Jovian. So this way you can add JavaScript code within your HTML. Now, of course, we need a way to actually connect this JavaScript code with the buttons that we are seeing on screen. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to say document dot on ready. Yeah, something like that. So, uh, what you what we want to do is we want to make sure that we run the JavaScript only after the entire document has loaded up properly. So I'm just going to go in maybe and ask this on Jobot, our chat GPT powered chat assistant. So let's see how do how to run some JavaScript code after the HTML document is ready. Okay. And it's going to tell me some explanation which you should read absolutely. Okay, so basically what it's telling me is that if you want to run some JavaScript code, if you want to interact with an HTML page, after the HTML page is loaded up properly, then you need to put in your JavaScript code inside this piece of code. So basically what we are saying here, I'm just going to first come in and paste it in here. So basically what we are saying here is that to the document, which is the entire HTML document. And this is a predefined variable in JavaScript. There's a bunch of predefined variables like window document, etc. So to the document, we are adding an event listener, which means when this event occurs, we want to do something with it. What is the event that we're looking for? We are looking for the event DOM content loaded, which means that the entire page, the HTML, the CSS, etc. of the entire page has been loaded in by the browser. And when that event or when the entire content has been loaded, then we are asking 
the browser to fire this JavaScript function. So you can see that we've provided two things. We've to add event listener, which is a function or a method inside document. We've added two things. We said when the event DOM content loaded is fired, which means when the entire content is loaded, then call this function inside uh, call this function or call the code inside this function. Okay, and that's why we're providing it as a function because a function can be invoked when the event occurs and not we don't want to run this code immediately. We want to run it only after the page is ready. Okay. So that's how you add some JavaScript code into um, an HTML page. Okay, now what do we want to do here? I guess first thing to do is maybe just once again, add that com console log saying that document is ready. And let's just see then you can see here now the same thing is printed document is ready. But of course, it is printed after the browser has loaded the entire content. Okay. Now, let's get remember this input over here, we have given it an input, uh, we have given it an ID calc display. Okay, we've given an ID calc display. So let's first get this input, let's get a hang of this input. So let's, um, let's call it display. So let me say const display equals document dot get element by ID calc display. Okay, so what we're doing here is we are saying that we want to get the HTML element, which has the ID calc display and document dot get element by ID is the function you use to do that. We want to get the calc display HTML element, and we want to store it in the variable display. Okay. And now we can just do console.log display, for example. Okay, let me fix the tab size over here. Looks like it's just adding a bunch of spaces that I don't need. Indent using spaces and two spaces. Yeah. All right. I'm good. So now we have this. Now let's do console.log display. Okay. And now you can see here that as soon as the document loads, our JavaScript code is searching for the element with the ID calc display. And it is simply printing it here in the console. And you can see when I hover over it, it actually shows me on the screen right over here that the input box is what um, this element is referring to. Okay, so now we've gotten a hold of our input box. Now let's try to get a hold of all these buttons. Okay, how do we get all these buttons? Well, let's see const buttons equals document dot get elements by class name. And I think all the buttons have the class name btn. And I can say console.log buttons. Okay, great. So you can see here that each button has a class btn. All right. So we have gotten a hang of all the buttons with the all the elements with the class btn simply by saying document dot get elements by class name btn. Okay. And you can see here that we've printed them out. And it says that it's an HTML collection of 20 buttons. And each button as I hover over it, you can see that shows me that specific button. So that's the first thing you need to understand whenever you're writing some JavaScript code to add interactive interactivity into an HTML code, you can simply uh, select uh, some HTML node using things like document by dot get element by ID, or you can get element by class name, or you can get element by tag name, there are a bunch of ways and you can store those HTML elements or references to those HTML elements in these uh, in variables of your choice. Okay. All right, next up. Now let us maybe try to add a click handler to one of the buttons. Let's do something when a button is clicked. So let's say buttons zero, and that should simply pick the first button dot add event listener. So again, now I'm adding an event listener to the button. And what event do I listen for? I want to listen for I want to listen for the click. So I'm saying when the button is clicked, I want to run a function. So I have to provide the function that is going to get executed when the button is clicked. Okay, so the function that gets executed when the button is clicked. Uh, for now, I'm just simply going to say console.log first button clicked. All right. And now you can see that I have this event listener attached to my first button. And nothing happens so far, you we are not printing first button click. And let's say I click the first button, you are going to see printed your first button clicked. So that is the next thing you want to understand that you can add event listeners or click handlers to specific DOM nodes. In this case, it's a button. And you do that using add event listener. And you can do that not just on 
uh, click, but you can also do hover. And let's say I could just then print out first button hovered. And this time what happens is when I simply, well, maybe not hover, maybe it's some other event. I don't know, like focus. I don't know. Well, there's probably some event uh, out there. But yeah, uh, for click, you can simply get uh, some something printed out on clicking. Okay. Perfect. So now we've added a click listener to one of the buttons. But ideally, we want to add click listeners to all of the buttons at once, uh, or individual click listeners to all of the buttons. How do we do that? Well, we can do something like this, we can say buttons dot for each. So for each is a way for you to do something for every element in a array in a JavaScript array. Okay, so what you can do is you can now provide a function to for each, okay, which is going to take each individual button. And it is going to operate that on the individual button. So the button now is going to refer to each button one by one. And now I can say console.log button clicked. And from this button, maybe I can get the text of that button. So button dot inner text. So if you want to get the text inside an HTML uh, element, then you do that simply by simply by calling dot inner text. Okay, that's a property. Let's see, maybe it's for each without a yeah, like that. Okay, so let's turn that into get elements by I could just use a for loop here, I, I think that would be simpler. So for let I equals zero, I less than buttons dot length, I plus plus a for each would have been nice, but looks like there are some problems when you're working with an HTML collection, you probably can't do for each or something. But button so const button equals buttons I. So what I'm doing here is I'm looping over the list of buttons and I'm getting each button. And then I'm saying button clicked button dot inner text. Okay. Alright, so now what we've done is for each button, we are simply going to log that the button was clicked when the button is text and we are going to log the inner text of that button. So ah, I need to add that actual um, click listener. So I need to say button dot add event listener click, of course, we want to do the console log only when the button is clicked and not always. So let's add this console log only when the button is clicked. Okay. All right, well, let's see what's uh, L E N G T H that should fix it. Yeah. Okay, so now you can see here, all we've done is gotten a list of buttons using get elements by class name, gotten a list of the actual document, uh, the actual display input display using get element by ID. And now we are looping over the buttons using this for loop, we are saying I equals zero I less than buttons dot length I plus plus, and we're getting each button as buttons I and then we're adding a click listener uh, event listener to each button. And on the event click, we want to invoke this function. Okay, the function that that's going to get invoked is simply going to say console.log button clicked. And now when I click on a button, you can see that each time we simply print which button was clicked button click percentage button click nine, eight, seven, etc. Okay, so it's a bit of work to hook up JavaScript code with some of the event handlers for specific uh, DOM nodes for specific nodes on the HTML page. That's why a lot of people use frameworks or libraries like jQuery, React, etc. But this is just raw JavaScript, we're simply picking up a button, we are attaching an event listener to it. And this is what it's doing. Okay. Now, of course, what we want to do instead is not actually use the uh, uh, console log the event, but simply add that here in add that information here. For example, if I type seven, I just want seven to be added here. Okay. So Here's what we can do about that. So let's say in this button, let's do this, let us first keep track of the current value of the input in a variable called current value. Okay, so let's do that. And let us say const value. So this is the value that is present inside the button is simply button dot inner text. Okay. And now I can say current value. 
plus equals value. Okay, so we have adding we are adding the inner text of the button to the variable current value which we have here. And then we can say current value. Uh, then we can we have the display here. So we can say display dot value. Remember display, this is simply the input box over here. So we can say display dot value equals current value. All right, so let's try that out. Okay, so you can start to see here what's happening. As soon as we, uh, so what we're doing is we're creating this variable current value. It contains the empty string right now. But what we're then doing is when a button is clicked, we're getting the inner text of the button, adding it to the current value. So the current value now contains the empty string plus the value from that button plus the value from the next button that clicked and so on. And then one very important thing we're also doing is we're also setting the value of the input box to current value. If we didn't have this, then current value would keep changing. So we could just log current value over here. Okay, we could just log current value over here. And you can see current value is changing to whatever I set it to. But this is not changing, there's nothing is getting added here. And that is where you can actually set the value of the value inside an input field and you can change the text inside a particular div and you can do all sorts of things. So basically you can modify the content on the page using display.value or display.inner text or whatever you want to uh, want to use for it. And you can set it to some value that's coming from a JavaScript variable or you can just set it to something manually. Okay, so that's great. So now we have this functionality. And I think one thing we can do is maybe bring it to the right instead of the left. So I'm just going to come back in here into my text, uh, into my HTML code. And I'm just going to say for this input text end. And I believe that's simply going to orient the text at the end for it. And that's looking good. Okay. So now we're able to actually capture this value. But of course, we are not actually working with the equal to yet. So we need to handle equal to we need to handle AC. Let's start with AC. AC is simply going to clear the entire thing. So let's start with AC. So what we can do here is we can actually do an if else on the value of the button text. So based on the button that was clicked, we need to do a simple we need to maybe uh, run a separate piece of logic. So I'm going to say if value, which is the button that was clicked equals and I'm just comparing here. That's why I'm using the double equal to equals AC. Then we want to do something else. Otherwise, we want to do something else, right? So else we want to do this. So let's get this into else. Okay, let's get this into else over here. And let us now go in here and let us set the current value simply to empty. And again, let's just set display dot value equals current value. Okay, so now we've implemented the functionality for the AC button. So let's say minus three and when I press AC, you can see that simply clear, clearing the current value because its value is AC and it is setting the display value to the current value. Okay, so now I am I think things are looking pretty good. So now we are working now this is working. Uh, of course, brackets and all are also working. These may not be val valid expressions. But nevertheless, these expressions are working. The next thing we need to do is actually evaluate these. So when equal to is clicked, we don't want to insert an equal to we actually want to evaluate these. And for this, we're going to use a shortcut here. Normally, uh, something something like Google would actually do a proper if else condition, they would parse the string and they would have some logic to evaluate it. Or maybe they would send it to a server and evaluate it and get the result here. But we're just going to use a shortcut which is not safe to use in a production application. So I just want to tell you that. But here's what we're going to do. Um, let's put another else if over here. So let's say else if and after else if let me just uh, close the bracket over here as well. And let's say if the value is equal to the string equal to okay, I know this looks confusing, but we're saying the value inside which is the inner text of the button is equal to the string equal to in that case, what do we want to do? Well, uh, let's maybe write a helper function here to do this. So let's see, uh, let's call this function evaluate. So function evaluate. And let's call it evaluate result. And let us just call this function evaluate result in that case. Okay, and we're going to put and this is just to keep our code organized slightly nicely. So evaluate result. So I am just gonna 
here's what I'm going to do. I am going to simply say const result equals eval. Okay, and now this is a very dangerous function. Be very careful while using it. But here's what eval does. You give it some JavaScript code and it is going to execute that JavaScript code for you. Ideally, you should not be evaluating user submitted JavaScript code on your website because they can have some code there which can fetch some data from your um, from somewhere uh, on your server and then do malicious things with it. Uh, it. This code could be coming from some Chrome extension or something. So definitely never use eval in production applications. Rather, you might want to write an if else to kind of parse the um, expression and then execute it. So I leave that as an exercise. But for now, I'm simply going to evaluate the current value. So I'm going to take the current value as an expression as a JavaScript expression, I'm going to evaluate it. And you can test this out, you can actually go into the Yeah, so let's say you, you type two plus three, you can see that that evaluates to five, right. And you can also do slightly more complex things, you can say two plus three. Now, of course, in JavaScript multiplication has this star symbol, four divided by seven, and that evaluates to 2.85, etc. Right. So eval is simply going to take an expression and execute it like JavaScript code and store that result in this thing called result. Okay. And then we can say current value equals result. And maybe we can convert it to a string. So how do we convert something to a string in JavaScript? I'm just going to add ask Jobot. How do you convert something to a string in JavaScript? And you can just say dot to string and that's going to convert it to a string. So I'm just going to use that. So I am just going to say result dot to string. Perfect. And let me now set display dot value equals current value. And I think this should be it. Um, let me also maybe Yeah, let's let's try this out first. So let's say four plus three equals seven. And just like that, we've implemented our uh, calculator. See, well, that wasn't that hard. And we are still just about at 160 lines of code. But of course, most of this code is just a bunch of buttons copy pasted many, many times. And we will when we learn frameworks, we are also going to learn about how you can reduce the amount of HTML that you write where you don't have to copy paste things. And if you have to change the style of all the buttons, you have to go and change them in a bunch of places. But for now, since we're keeping things simple, let's just uh, keep it that way. But just like that, we've implemented the functionality and it works probably with something even more complex, I could say seven minus three plus and then in brackets 2.1 plus six and that entire thing works. Okay, so that's good. There is one problem though, AC works as well. Let's try eight multiplied by nine. What does that do? Okay, that fails and that fails specifically because well, uh, inside evaluate result, let us just log the value of current value. So let's say console dot log current value, current value. Okay, it's always a good idea to give labels to your logs. Uh, let me get rid of this document dot is ready. I think I don't need that anymore. Okay, so when I do eight times six, you can see here that the current value is eight times six, it has this time symbol, but we don't want the time symbol, we actually want the symbol star, the star symbol is what is valid JavaScript code. So we may have to do some replacement over here. And that is where we can say, const um, let's see, converted val, let's just call it converted value equals current value. So current value is a string. And in the string, we simply want to replace the the this character over here, which is the times character, let's get that from our code over here. Yeah, so this is the times character. So we want to replace the times character with a star. Okay, so that's all we're doing here. And now we Oops, sorry about that. And now uh, we can log the current value. And let's log the converted value as well. In the converted value, we've simply replaced times with star. And let, let's evaluate it. Let's evaluate the converted value. Okay, so let's now tie seven times six equals. 
and you can see here that the current value was seven times six and uh, the converted value, they should say converted value. And the converted value is, let's try that again, nine times six. So the current value is nine times six and the converted value is nine star six, which is valid JavaScript code. And that ultimately ends up being converted into the string 54. Okay, so that's great. We have fixed that. Maybe there's, we also want to fix the division symbol. So let's go ahead and fix that as well. We don't need to fix minus and plus. They are probably fine. We probably need to uh, do something about the percentage as well. We're going to see what to do about that. But let us fix the division symbol as well. Let's grab the division symbol over here. And let us come in here and let us just go in and say, yeah, replace, right? So I'm just going to come in and say, Let's let's add some space here just so that things are a little easier to see. And by the way, in JavaScript, you can actually put statements on the next line just for better readability. So I'm simply replacing the division symbol by slash. And hopefully now six divided by three should work. That's two. Uh, let's try percentage. So nine, 29% equals. Okay, that doesn't work again. So we want to convert percentage as well. A quick replacement for percentage would be to simply multiply it by 0 0.01. So I could just say multiply it by 0 0.01. And let's see now. So let's see AC 9% equals 0 0.09. Okay, that's working as well. And I think that's it. That is our basic calculator. We've not added the scientific functions yet. We will see how to add them in just a bit. But that's looking pretty good. And Things are looking so good so far. So I'm just going to commit this. So I'm going to say added basic functionality. And let me just commit that. And let me send that back to the GitHub repository. Okay. Now I can check back the GitHub repository over here. Let's see github.com. And I should have my repository here. Where is it? Well, I'm just going to go into my profile. And in my profile, I'm going to look for repositories. And here we have scientific calculator live. And you can see scientific calculator live has all the code and everything is still inside index.html. Uh, one quick thing I'm going, to, I'm going to show you right after this is how to separate out the script into a different file. So let's do that as well. Let me come back in here. Let's create a file script.js and let's grab all the code from index.html into script.js. Okay, and let's put that in here so that we can worry about it separately. And let us now just give this src equals script.js. Okay, and it should still work exactly the same way. Hmm. Let me just restart the live server and let's see. Okay, let's, uh, let's try going live again. Yeah, there it is. And let's see if the let's grab this and put it in here. Okay. Well, it says refuse to execute script from such and such. Well, let's we should be able to fix that. So let's just go into Jobot and let's search. I got this error while including JS in HTML. Okay, so we're sending the wrong MIME type, etc. The server needs to do something. Okay, looks like there's some kind of a Yeah, I'm just gonna say I don't have access. All right, well, looks like there's probably nothing I can do about this. 
at the moment. So I'm just gonna have to maybe bring back my uh, JavaScript code. Well, no, it's gone. Okay. Yeah, that did it. I think I just had to put src script.js instead of slash script.js and that worked. Yeah, sometimes you run into these errors and you just search online and you should be able to figure them out. And let us just commit this. So let's say separated out the script file. And let's push it back. And now the next thing I wanna show you, now that this is loaded up, let's just yeah, you can see there's index.html script.js. I want to show you how to deploy this. So you can go to vercel.com and create an account. And Vercel is a platform for very easily deploying JavaScript related or Node.js projects in any web uh, web related project. And I'm going to say add new project. And you can connect your GitHub account here and it can get access to your private repositories, public repositories, etc. And you can see here that it can see in my account that there is this scientific calculator live. So I'm importing this project over here. And here on vercel.com, I can select some framework. So I'm not using a framework right now. There's a CSS framework, but this is talking about more of a backend framework that I'm using. I'm not using any of these, but I do need to tell it which directory contains my index.html file. And that happens to be SRC. So I'm gonna select the SRC directory as the live directory. And then I can just click deploy. Okay, it's as simple as that. You go to vercel.com, sign in, connect your GitHub with it, and then click deploy, create a new project, and select the root, uh, root a directory and now you can actually go ahead and uh, you get this nice url scientific calculator live dot vercel dot app and i'm just going to drop that in the chat and you can try it out you can try it out on your own and you can see whether it's mobile friendly or not yep it looks fairly mobile friendly to me yep and we'll have to figure out how to make it exactly like the google uh, scientific calculator but for now i am pretty happy with how this is looking okay Great, so now let's continue on. Now that we've done this deployment as well, let us continue and add maybe some of the scientific features. We may not get to everything. We are kind of running out of time here as well. But let's see, let's add maybe a couple of rows. All right, so now there is this selector here, one, two, three in FX. I'm just gonna add it below. I'm just gonna keep, keep things simple for now, but I encourage you to try it out. And I'm gonna add this row, sign, ln, pi, and cos, because these seem like an interesting set of things to add. So let's see, let us come back over here and let us say, uh, let's add another row of values. So let me grab the last four buttons and let me create a copy and let me paste that in here. So one is called sign, then one is called ln, which is logarithm and the natural logarithm probably. And one's called pi, let me just get the pi symbol. Let's get it here. Okay, and the pi symbol over here is just that character. And let me get in, what's that last symbol over there? Cos, so let's get cos in here as well. Okay, so let's see if we are able to make that work. Of course, this doesn't need to be a primary button anymore. This can be our normal light button, all right? And yeah, there we have sign ln pi cos. And let's try to just implement sign for now. Okay, what if we do sign and then maybe open brackets? And of course, like it has to be proper, it has to be a, a proper expression for it to get evaluated. And I click equal. Okay, runs into an error. So it says reference error sign is not defined. Okay, and I'm literally just going to copy this error. And I'm going to come back to Jobot and said, um, say, let's just reset this. I got this error when trying to compute sign in JavaScript. And what does it say? It looks like you may have forgotten to prefix a sign function with the math object. And this is how you should be using it. Nice. So I'm just going to go ahead and use that. I'm going to go into my script.js and into my script.js, I'm just going to add that replace. And for sign, I am just going to replace that with math.sign. And hopefully that should fix it. Let's go back in here and let us check. So sign four equals, okay, 
looks good it's probably in radians not in degrees that's fine i'm not too concerned about the specific details right now so sine is implemented here minus 0 0.75 uh, maybe we should fix cost the same way as well let's see cost uh, that is simply math.cos for cos okay so let's try cos 8 times sine 9 equals okay yeah seems fine i could i could just test that in this calculator as well uh, this calculator actually allows typing too in case you want to try that and it, all, it also inserts button it also inserts a bracket and all but cos 8 times sine 9 that's what we did so cos 8 times sine 9 yeah that's about the same 0 0.559 0 0.559 599 0 0599 Okay, that's good. Uh, let's deal with ln over here. So, okay, I think one thing we should do is somehow find a way where if the result has already been computed, then we should not, um, pressing a button should not add to that. But again, advanced behavior, I'm going to leave that for now. But ln 8, let's see if that works. Nope. So let's try math.ln. I'm just going to try this out and see what happens. ln math.ln okay so ln 8 hmm math.ln is not a function so let's see um i'm going to come back here to jobot i'm going to ask it once again uh i'm trying to compute the natural logarithm in javascript I get this error. Okay, jovian.com slash jobart, just go in here and drop it in. Okay, it's math.log, I believe. So for the mathematical, uh, for the natural logarithm, you just say math.log. So I'm gonna change that to math.log. Um, and I'm gonna say, uh, while we're here, can you also tell me how to find the value of pi? Yeah, it's just math.pi. So I'm going to fix that as well. So let's go in here and let's replace the pi symbol. I'm going to get the pi character. The pi symbol is right over here. And there you go. We have fixed that as well. So now we type pi, we press equals, that's 3.14 and whatever pi means. Okay. And we can, for example, try to compute the, the pi r square of a circle. Okay, that reminds me we can probably add things like square too. Let's get one more line while we're while we're doing this. This is interesting. Let's go ahead, go ahead and implement one more line over here. Okay, we have uh, log e tan and square root. Fine, let's do it. So log I believe would be the log to the base 10 and I can verify that by again going into log to the base 10 equals one. Yeah, so log is log to the base 10. So how do we do log base 10? Lock to the base 10 in JavaScript. Yeah, I think it's going to try and figure out. Yeah, okay, there's something called math.log10x and that is going to do log to the base 10 for us. So we can do one more row and probably square root is going to be somewhat interesting. So let me just do one more row and I'll leave the rest, rest as an exercise for you um, so that I don't give everything away. Let's see. So we have these buttons. I'm just going to grab these buttons once again. And I am going to drop that in here. Let's add log. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. We will look at the questions. And alongside, I want to tell you that wait till the end because there's going to be something really interesting that you don't want to miss. Okay. So we have log e tan and the square root symbol. So let's go in here, square root symbol and let's grab that okay that is called the radical symbol but let's yeah let's just put that in here and now we might want to just handle these as well so what what about e let me just ask it what about the constant e how do i get that well that is simply math dot capital e so we'll just use that so let's go in let's go into the settings uh, let's go into the script.js file 
and let's add those replacements as well so replace we want to replace log with uh, math.log10 that's fine and we want to replace e with math.e okay and we want to replace tan with math.tan before we actually evaluate it and finally we want to replace let's see the square root symbol and what exactly do we replace it with i'm not sure okay let's just search here what about square root you just use math.sqrt so i'm just going to put in math.sqrt right in here okay and with that hopefully let's see square root of 4 equals ah okay there's some something went wrong here i believe this requires a bracket so um i think we might need to actually put a bracket here so square root bracket 4 close bracket equals yeah that's true so that works so we might need to be a little careful while working with square root uh, or we might want to do something in something a little more interesting while replacing instead of just replacing the square root itself maybe you want to take square root followed by whatever comes after it and put that in brackets or something but for now it's fine but uh, another thing that i should do properly is i should maybe just put all of this into a try catch okay so javascript has something whenever there's an error you can actually catch the error and you can handle it in some fashion and maybe show a message to the user so let's say try and let's put all of this into a try block okay so it's, it's going to try to execute this code and if the uh if the ex if the code works then that's fine but otherwise okay let me just search what is the syntax for try catch in javascript what is the syntax for try catch in javascript okay the syntax is like this so try catch and then you catch an error and then i'm going to print the error so i'm going to say console.error and that's going to print the error in that nice red format so i don't want to get rid of the error but what i can do is i can set current value equals error and I can say display dot value equals current value. Okay, this way, I'm also informing the user that there is an error, and they can then deal with it somehow. Okay, so let's try that again. Let's do something wrong. Let's say percentage and let's do equal to here. And it just prints error over here, just like a normal calculator. And it also prints out the exact error for us for the developer to debug invalid regular expression missing slash or something like that right so definitely this is something that you want to do you want to try and catch these errors so let's say you want to understand what exactly is try catch you can actually ask jobot um, or there's like a personal tutor here and you can just ask it teach me about javascript try catch statement and start conversation and it is going to just tell you a bunch of things about the try catch statement. Okay, what exactly it does, it's going to maybe show you an example. So it's going to show you an example of how to use it, how to catch these errors. So you can generate tutorials on demand. Just go on jovin.com slash jobot. And if you want to go use one of these specific tools over here, just scroll down and use them or you can just type start typing and get help. Okay. All right. I think I'm pretty happy with the scientific calculator at this point. I am not going to go any further than this. Um, I will leave the design, the responsive design to you as an exercise. So how do you make it go from this to this? That is something I'll let you figure out. Uh, if you can't, then just put all the buttons here below. That's perfectly fine. You don't have to exactly implement the design. And then there's also this one other interesting thing that the Google um, that the Google calculator does, you can actually give it a certain input. And when you click, when you click enter, it stores the previous result on top. And you can see that pi equals is stored over here. And it shows its recent history as well. That is probably too complex. But this is something might worth checking out where you can have a previous result variable and just show the previous result above the current result. Again, uh, it's an optional part. So you don't actually have to implement the whole thing. But we've got ourselves a pretty good scientific calculator. I think I'm pretty happy with this uh, right now. So I'm just going to save it over here. So let me go ahead, go ahead and say 
um, implemented a few scientific functions. I'm just going to commit it and I'm going to publish it. And my scientific calculator should now be live. Now, one of the things that Vercel does, the platform that we've used for deployment, because it's connected to our GitHub, uh, what it does is every time you push to the main branch or the, uh, or the main branch or the, or the primary branch of the repository, it is automatically going to redeploy your code. And you can see here that now you can see that on my Vercel production website, uh, it is automatically now, it automatically contains the updated code so you can play along with it right now. And this is one of the best uh, things uh, with using an integrated platform like Vercel for deployment. Now you, you're probably wondering what if I make a mistake, Will that what if the deployment fails? Well, it's going to use the previous version, but if you create a branch, and this is something that we cover when we talked about Git. But if you create a branch, then on that particular branch, it's going to create a preview deployment. It's not going to affect your main deployment. And then you can create a pull request, merge it back. So that's all about the GitHub workflow. Okay. The final thing that I want to show you before we close is that we didn't actually have to write any of this to begin with. Um, the tools that we that are at our disposal are actually getting so good right now um, that you might not actually have to write in much of this code at all. Um, so this is one thing that I tried to do earlier today. I just figured what if I could just ask Jobot which is powered by chat GPT, GPT 3.5 right now, soon GPT 4. What if I could just ask it that I want to build a scientific calculator similar to the one available within Google search. Okay. And let's build it step by step. So first, please give me the basic HTML code for the page and the calculator without any buttons and use a bootstrap five CSS framework and make it responsive. Okay. That's what we've said here. And let's see if we can if Jobot can generate some code for us and looks like it is generating some code looks like it is okay it's generating it it created an html page for us it has a meta it has the right meta tags it has this link tag for the style sheet it has the scientific calculator and i've asked it not to put any buttons right now i'm going to add the buttons in the next step but it could have just created the buttons for me as well there's a limit to how many characters it can give you at once and let me just grab this and let me open up this online platform where I can quickly uh, test out HTML code. Let me get rid of what they have here. Let me put in this HTML and you can see here that it is creating the scientific calculator, this basic layout already. Now the bootstrap styles did not get added and I have a sense of why that is. So one of the issues that the chatbots or the code generation bots run into is that they may not, because they're character wise generators, they may not actually have picked up the right integrity, which is the hash that is used to verify um, the link tag. So you might need to replace this link tag with the actual link tag from Bootstrap. So I'm just going to go back in here, go into introduction and grab the link tag from Bootstrap itself. Okay. Uh, so let's go in and fix the link tag. So you should always verify any AI generated code that you are working with. You should always go through every line of code, but just because it's not directly giving you the result that you want, doesn't mean that it's not going to be able to solve your problem. Okay. Let me add that script tag in here as well. So it is created for me, the scientific calculator, and you can see that it's followed the same best practice that I followed, or maybe I copied it. Uh, but you can see that it has this row over here and it has this column and okay. And that is okay. It's made, it's made this calculator too narrow. So I'm just going to stick with call MD six or call SM six. So, so far so good. Okay. Let me now go in here and let me come back. Okay. So now let me ask it. Okay. Give me the additional code to add the buttons within the calculator and I'm just going to tell it not to don't rewrite the entire HTML. Yeah. And let's see if it can just give me the code to add the buttons and it does. So now it tells me that copy paste this code into the form element um, just below the input field. So let's do that. So now it's adding a bunch of buttons. You can see it's adding seven, eight, nine slash four, five, six star or one, two, three. So it probably also knows what Google's calculator looks like or a calculator in general. And that's great. And it's got these bunch of uh, other buttons here at the end equal to zero dot. And then it's got maybe a button called clear. That's like a huge button and maybe a backspace button. 
okay and it's given me some explanation about the code as well yeah th this is just insane i did not expect that things would get to this point um but it it is and let's just put that in here let's add in the buttons okay well it's not looking too bad i think definitely there's maybe some layout changes we may have to do to make the buttons look slightly nicer but i'm not complaining i think this is fine for now and we could for example go in here and we could say gx1 right uh, not just for this row but for every row so we could go in and say gx1 over here we could go in and say gx1 over here and we could go in and say gx1 over here and maybe gx1 over here and right now, of course, it is using button secondary. Maybe we could just fix that and use button outline. And um, let me just actually ask it if it can add some space between the buttons. So let's say uh, provide some CSS to add space between the rows of buttons. Okay. So now it says, okay, just add that. That's it. Just add the margin. And you can just add it within the, you can just add it as a style tag within your HTML. And I just go in there and I just put that in there. And there you go. The scientific calculator is looking rather nice. I could maybe come in here, maybe uh, the H5, I could maybe just uh, text center it. And I could maybe just make it read only. Okay, that's nice. And, but it of course doesn't have any logic yet. Let's see if Jobot can actually write the logic. Okay, this part I'm not too sure, but can you now write the logic for the buttons using JavaScript? Um, don't use any frameworks because sometimes it might use jQuery or something like that. That's what a lot of examples on the internet contain. Don't use any libraries or frameworks and just give me the content for the script tag. Okay, and let's ask it and let's see if it can do that. Okay, perfect. It is giving us, hmm. Okay, it seems like then I, I then have to add this Okay, I let me tell it I don't want to add I don't want to add any an on click handlers. So you can actually tell it that you're not happy with the code. I don't add any on -click, on click handlers. All the code required to implement the logic should be in the script tag. Okay. Yeah, look at that. So now it's just doing document dot query selector all expression field and it's given it's given it the ID expression probably and then it is evaluating a bunch of things. Let's see. Let's just copy this JavaScript and let's see if that works. I am not very confident if this is going to work. Uh, GPT four would definitely do a much better job. GPT four is the newer version uh, of uh, Chat GPT. But okay. Yeah, so now we have added some event listeners. I think it, we might want to put it inside document dot uh, element ready or something like that. But let's see if this works. Seven. Nope. Let's see. So what does it say? The expression field is called. Uh, okay, the input does not input has the ID result. So maybe this should be get element by ID result. What's the expression field? Well, there's no expression field. Hmm, maybe not. Maybe this is, uh, you've added the result field. Okay, let's just do, let's just change that to current value. Well, what if we just give it the ID result as well? So it looks like it is, it has two fields, one for expression, one for result. Maybe it got confused there, but look at that. 8 minus 9 equals minus 1. That's not bad. Okay, clear and backspace are not working. So let's tell it you're not handling the clear and backspace buttons. Please update the code. Also, there's no field with the ID expression. 
we just have one result field. Okay, and it apologizes for the mistake, obviously. And now it is going to update things to also handle the, yeah, again, it probably messed things up a little bit. Like it is thinking about C and slash, I guess it probably doesn't have the full context with it anymore, but let's go ahead and fix, make that small fix. Uh, this is still a lot faster than coding everything from scratch, of course. And yeah, so here it's using this backspace button. So instead of the back, word backspace, it's using just this arrow and it's using C. So maybe just let's replace that with clear and let's replace that with, or how about we do the other thing? We, we replace clear with C and, and we replace backspace with the arrow character like that. Okay, so how about that 56 and that backspace is now working and 56 589 times 23 equals 13457. Yeah, 589 times 23. That's actually right. Great. You could probably also now go in and say add sign log and a bunch of other buttons. But I'm pretty happy with this. It, it just generated an entire scientific calculator with maybe two or three messages. It is uh, just insane. And not only that, it also, we also just copy pasted a bunch of errors that we encountered and it's all those errors for us. So use these tools, use ChatGPT, use Jobot. Uh, of course, verify the code that it writes. Do not just depend on the code without verification. I have not had a chance here to look through every line of code, but you should, you should do that because it may introduce some security vulnerabilities or something like that. But in any case, that is how you build a scientific calculator using HTML, CSS and JavaScript. I hope this was an informative session. Uh, a lot of things that look fairly complex are actually really simple to build out. It's that you don't have to build in a lot of the complex functionality. You should always focus on building the most simple parts first and then you can always add in the responsive design, the animation, uh, the multiple rows of data, the history, etc. Those are all things that actually do require a lot of additional code. But the simple functionality is generally fairly straightforward to implement. And in a lot of cases, you can get a lot of help from uh, from Jobot, from ChatGPT, from whatever AI tools you're using. Okay, so let's see now if we have any questions at uh, this point. Okay, well, I do not see any questions. Can this be uploaded on YouTube? This is on YouTube. It's going to stay on YouTube. So you're fine. How to create a function for the, how to create the functionality of clicking on either FX or 123 and the buttons to ensemble changing entirely. Yeah, so see, if you want to do something more complex than what we've done here, ideally what you should be doing is two things. One, uh, you shouldn't just be storing the current value in a string. What you should be doing is maybe having an, you should have an array of tokens and you should have an array of tokens or uh, array of uh, hosting the value of button clicks and that array could be converted into some value that is actually displayed in the input so that when we click the equal to button, you don't have to evaluate a particular string but instead you can look at element by element, look, you can look at the array and you can then use some JavaScript code to evaluate an arithmetic expression, right? So yeah, you could, for example, let's just try this and see what happens. Okay, jovin.com slash jobot. You could, for example, ask jobot, write a JavaScript function to evaluate uh, an expression from a scientific calculator don't use eval. Okay, let's see. So this takes an input and it has this whole set of operators and you can add more operators as well. You can see here that it has created a bunch of like a basic code for you. And now it's going to do some of this business. And you can see here that it can work with all of these interesting operators clearly. Hmm. It could also potentially, okay, square root is not yet supported. But let's say add support for sign log cos etc it's going to then update that and let's see maybe we can actually use it in our code i don't know but uh, possibly 
Yeah, so it's basically what it's doing is it maintaining a stack, it is putting tokens into the stack, getting tokens out of the stack, and it is also testing whether the expression is invalid. And yeah, all of this should work. If all of this works, then potentially, let's see if, okay, the, maybe the expression may not contain any spaces, so we may have to fix that. It says let tokens equal to expr.split space. Um, the expression may not contain any spaces. What will you do then? Yeah, so it's going to write more complex logic and you can keep working with it and try and figure it out. So I encourage you to try that out with chat GPT. Okay, instead of eval, you want to create a different function. Is there a better way? Yeah. So one thing you could do is you could actually attach on click handlers on specific buttons directly from HTML. So I want to show you right here. This is what chat GPT or Jobot tried to do. You can say on click and then you can provide the name of a JavaScript function that is defined in the script file and you can call it with some value, right? So you can have a function called button clicked and button clicked can uh, be get called with this particular value when this button gets clicked. So that's one other way to do it. I am not going to go into a lot of detail with that right now, but just know that you can also specify on click handlers within the HTML itself. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, looks like this is actually working not too badly. Let's just try it out. I'm not sure if this is actually going to work, but Let's see, let's put that in here. So let's get our evaluate expression. And instead of eval, let's just do evaluate expression over here. Evaluate expression. I should be taking a close look at this code, but what the hell, let's see. Seven times nine equals, nope. There's definitely some error here. I guess there's, it's not uh, that straightforward because it's like doing some reg regular expression match. Yeah, but now seven times eight works fine. Yeah, so you might need to just test this a little more carefully than what we have done here. Um, you can, one way to te test this would be maybe to put it into a JavaScript console and then test it out. Uh, but this looks, this looks good. I don't have a problem with this. Um, with the modification, it should probably work out just fine. Okay. All right, I think that's everything that we were covering today. So let's just go back and check where we started. So we wanted to build a scientific calculator and the way we did this is let's grab those links and put them in here as well so that you can actually see these. So here is the finished code. I'm just going to add it right here in this doc. It's also going to be in the description. Here is the actual scientific calculator that we built out the finished site. Uh, that's right here. So we created a public GitHub repository. We use GitHub code spaces for development. We added the Bootstrap CSS framework. And of course, we also later figured out how to deploy this web page to the cloud by creating a Vercel project. And you can then connect it to your own uh, domain as well, something like scientificcalculator.ai or something. And it should, it should work fine too. So that was the first step, prepare for development and deployment. The second step was to build the user interface with HTML and CSS. So we added the content for each section one by one using HTML. This is what it ultimately looked like. This was the HTML code. So we had a bunch of, uh, uh, we had like this row, we had maybe a, a, a column inside it, we had the title, we had a card, we had a body inside the card, we had an input, then we added the buttons row by row. So uh, we could we could also have used the browser's inspect tab on Google to inspect it, but we didn't need to do that. Uh, we didn't really get into a lot of progressive uh, enhancement for tablet and desktop, but we did make it a mobile friendly or mobile first design. And we've not tried to design or uh, replicate the design very closely, but we did our best effort given the time we had. Then we did add a script file later in the in the process, but we started out simply with a, a simple script uh, tag of uh, the file was added later Fun variables and functions to track the current we were just tracking the current expression we didn't really track the previous expression uh, we added functions to implement the logic for each button well turns out we could just use eval and we did not actually have to implement the logic separately for each button and then on click handlers those we just added it in a loop so we took a bunch of shortcuts here which is fine for something like this where there is no sensitive information for us to worry about we just used eval but otherwise you might want to use an evaluate expression 
kind of a formula or an evaluate expression uh, function again could be generated with help from Jobot. You could also give it some example inputs saying these are some example inputs you have to handle and giving those, give, keeping those example inputs in mind it's going to then generate a function. So remember that it's not always going to be able to read your mind and know exactly what you need. So you need to give it some input you need to give it some examples and in a lot of cases you can also give it uh, if it does not give you exactly what you want you can then ask it another question follow up with it and it can give you the uh, right answer and you can also just copy paste your error and it'll fix things for you okay um, and of course you should very carefully look at all the code that is generated by AI definitely don't just copy paste the code into your projects okay test the page carefully at different screen sizes Ensure that HTML, CSS, JavaScript is well organized. Yeah, it looks fairly well organized to me. I could add a few comments here and there. Maybe I could add a few comments here. So I could always just go in here and I could say to Jobot, add some comments to the following JavaScript code. And it can add a bunch of comments for me. Yeah, it is now explaining the code, but I want to add, I want to add some comments inside the code, and I can always tell it that uh, yeah, please add comments inside the code. Okay, so it may not understand, it may not exactly understand what uh, you want it to do, but just talk to it, just don't give up immediately. And now it is rewriting the code for us with a bunch of comments. How nice is that? All right, and one thing you can also do is you can just use Jobot to get explanations on code. So you can always just go on jovin.com slash jobot and simply go on code explainer and paste whatever piece of code you have, enter the programming language and it's going to explain that code to you. But let me just for now, let me just take this code, put that in here and see if it still works. I think it should. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't. Generally it doesn't mess this up too much. Let's see. 8, 88 minus 3 equals 85. Yep. Ln or Let's do AC, LN8, that should be about, okay, LN seems to have failed. Yeah, for I, I'll investigate that later, but yeah, you can definitely use it to document your code as well. Just verify that it has not modified any of your existing code. Okay, so that we did. Then we staged, commit, and pushed our changes all in a few uh, clicks on VS Code. Didn't have to write any git commands. And then we verified that our site is deployed to Vercel. We tested it out. And it's working fine. Again, maybe there might be something I might need to fix. Yeah, there's something wrong with my ln function. Cannot read properties of undefined log 10. Yeah, I guess it's probably math log 10 there's something wrong with that in javascript math dot log 10 hmm okay i don't know what's um what's going on here but we'll fix it we'll find it and we'll fix it no problem so with that, we've reached the end of this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. Do leave a like on the video. And of course, please do subscribe. We're, we're going to do more of these tutorials. And if you have any questions, please post a comment. We will try and reply to all the comments, uh, specifically if you have technical doubts. Or you could also just go on jovin.com slash jobot and ask your question there. And continue building on this. Try to see how close you can get to the Google scientific calculator. The closer you get, try to implement this toggle for radians and degrees. See exactly what it does. Um, and, and try to maybe also add this button, which is going to toggle a few things. Again, the hint here is maybe use some JavaScript to trigger the, maybe have like one div of buttons and another div of buttons below it and have a JavaScript variable which tracks which mode you're in. And based on the change to the variable, also change the display property of the divs. So that's kind of the hint that I'm gonna give you here. But I'll leave it at that. So thank you for joining and have a good day or good night. Take care. Now, the Express Web Application Framework is a minimalist web framework for Node.js, streamlining server-side application development with flexible routing, middleware, and a vibrant ecosystem of libraries. So we'll talk more about all of these aspects. Don't worry if these don't make sense right now. Now, you might think that a server is a piece of software, and that is partly true. Server is some 
uh, is a piece of hardware and uh, you might think that a server is a piece of hardware and that is partly true. These are racks of servers in a data center. But the server that we're going to talk about today is a piece of software that serves requests. Now, uh, here's what we're going to cover in today's tutorial. We'll talk about creating and running a web server using the Express Web Framework. We will talk about serving HTML pages, static files, and dynamic data using templates. We will talk about using route parameters to create and serve dynamic pages. We will talk about accepting form submissions and sending emails from a server. So there's a lot of ground we're going to cover today. And in some sense, we are stepping into the full stack domain here. In some sense, we are covering the backend side of things now that we've learned basic web development. So let's move forward. Now, of course, the best way to learn these skills is to follow along step by step and type out all the code yourself. So make sure to do that to get a proper understanding. And we will explore these topics by attempting to solve this problem statement. So the last time we created a Jovian careers website powered by Bootstrap, and this is what it looks like. It has a navigation bar. It has a bunch of links here in the navigation bar and a sign in button. It has this work at Jovian section with some text and an image, and it has this job opportunities table, a list of job opportunities and an application form. And it has a footer here at the bottom. Okay. So we built all of this using Bootstrap. And you might also remember you might also remember that uh, we had made this responsive. So you can see here that there's an image here at the top. There is some text. And on the mobile view, we have cards instead of um, instead of a table. And we have the same application form, except that it is now adjusted to show up properly on mobile. And it scales properly as we grow from mobile to tablet, where we switch into the job opportunities table from the job opportunities card list. And then we also take up more space on the screen. Okay. Now uh, we are going to do a couple of things this time. The first thing is that we should, we want to make the main page only show a list or a table of job openings. We do not want to have the application form on the same page. Uh, it's probably a better idea if clicking on a particular job role opens a job details page with an application form and submitting that application form can then potentially trigger an email to us and also show an acknowledgement form acknowledgement page to the user. So now we are going to build a server, which is going to accept these form responses and send out an email. So let's get into it. Now, of course, we assume here that you have knowledge of HTML and CSS basics and a responsive design with bootstrap. And you uh, are familiar with version control with GitHub and cloud deployment with Vercel. Okay. If you haven't, please make sure to review the previous lessons uh, before we move forward. And you can find all the source code and the result for the starter site and the finished site over here in the notes. So we'll start by creating a GitHub repository. So I'm just going to go over to github.com. And if you're not signed in, make sure to sign in. And I'm going to click new and I am going to create a repository. And let me just call this Jovian Careers Express Live because we're building this live. And this is simply a Jovian Career site powered by Express.js. All right. And uh, this is going to be a public repository. I am going to initialize it with a readme file. I'm going to select the git ignore template node.js because we are going to actually write some node.js code this time. And I'm going to give it the MIT license and let's create that repository. So with that, the repository is now created. And now we need a, now we need a way to run this repository. And of course you can download this repository onto your computer and run it but we are going to run it using code spaces. And I just select the code option here and select code spaces and click create code space on main. And what this does is GitHub sets up a machine for us on the cloud where it pulls the contents of this repository and opens up a visual studio code interface for us to interact with the repository, which is to write code and run the code, test things. And then we can push these changes back to the GitHub repository. Okay. So that is a GitHub workflow that we have been following for the past few lessons. All right. Let's give that a second to uh, start properly. Now, um, let us, uh, so here's what you do to uh, start developing on, on GitHub code spaces. And now let us start building our web server. Now, web servers are software applications that handle incoming requests from a client. And that client could be a web browser, or that client could be a mobile application, or that client could be a Discord bot, Slack bot, anything. 
any form of a client, any anything that requests or needs some information, makes a request to a web server, and then the web server processes that request. And for processing the request, it may then contact a database, it may contact another external service, it may do some uh, data processing, and then it returns that response back to the client. All right. So there is a request sent from the client, some processing happens from the server, and the response is sent back to the client. So that's basically what a web server is software applications that handle incoming requests from web clients. And it's a, it runs on a computer essentially. So a web server is running on some computer on the cloud and is handling incoming requests. And it responds to these requests by sending back the requested content. And that could be web pages, images, videos, data, et cetera. And to communicate with the web server, typically you use an HTTP um, a protocol, which is where you often see if you just check the URL of any page, it says HTTPS or HTTP. And that basically means that you are using the HTTP, your browser is using the HTTP protocol to communicate with the web server. And web servers can be configured to handle different types of content. For example, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, Python, all it, it just depends on what kind of uh, software you want to run on your uh, cloud computer, which is powering the web server. And web servers can obviously be used to host web applications. For example, Jupyter, what we are using here, is running on a web server. Jovian itself runs on a web server. Google, Instagram, Facebook, everything runs on a web server. Now, the difference between websites that we've been building today, star, uh, the, uh, the difference between websites that we've been building so far called static websites and web servers is that web servers can deliver dynamic content from a database or a REST API, whereas static sites like index.html, uh, the web pages that we were building cannot deliver dynamic content. So today we'll talk about how we can deliver dynamic content using the Express Web Application Framework. So let's get uh, started with Express. Um, so here's what you need to do to set up a simple Hello World project using Express.js. Step one is to initialize a Node.js project inside a project directory. So we are here in this GitHub uh, project, GitHub repository that is open on code space. And I guess we can just go ahead and use this uh, as our project directory. So I'm going to initialize a new Node.js project here. And to do that, I'm just first going to zoom in a little bit. All right, so let's zoom in here. And I am going to start by typing npm init minus y. So let's type npm init minus y. And now the you will see here that a project has been initialized. And what that really means is a package.json file has been created. So you can check here in the sidebar, there is a package.json file, which contains the name of the project, which is auto inferred from the name of the directory. It contains a version and a description. Again, both of these are auto inferred. Version is set to 1.0 and description is auto inferred from the readme. And then we have a then we have a main file. So this is not something that has been created yet. And this is something that we can potentially change when we want to. In fact, we can even remove it if we want. Then we have some scripts here, some keywords, some author, some license. These are not important right now. These are more important when you are publishing a module to uh, the NPM registry. But for us, the key things here are um, these, and these are some things that we will modify over time. All right. So now that we've initialized the Node.js project, the next step is to install the Express.js web framework. And we're going to install the Express.js web framework by simply running npm install express. So I'm going to come in here. And once again, let me reset things here. And I'm going to say, and I'm going to say npm install express. Now, when we click npm, when we type npm install express, you can see that a node modules folder is created here. And inside these node modules folder express and all of its transitive dependencies get installed. So you can see here that you have uh, you have Express here, of course, this is the Express framework. Then there is also a bunch of other frameworks that have been installed. Now I do want to mention that the node modules folder will not get added to your GitHub repository when you push these changes back to GitHub, because if you check the git ignore file, you'll see that node modules is mentioned here. Uh, so basically we don't want to uh, send all of these dependency files, all their JavaScript code to our GitHub repository, because that's going to make our GitHub repository really heavy. Uh, so instead, what we do is we simply add that dependency in package.json, and that happens when you run npm install. So you can see that package.json contains the name of the dependency that you need to install and the version of the dependency. And whenever you need, whenever someone someone else need to run your code, they can simply get the bare minimum code 
and then they can run npm install and they can install all the dependencies on their computer and the same can happen when you're trying to deploy this application to the cloud all right so keep that in mind that we don't commit the node node module server the node modules folder to our github repository because it is ignored in the git ignore okay now you will also see this package log.json file basically what this contains is all the dependencies that node modules uh, that express js depends on those are listed here and their versions are listed here so this is to ensure that some of the transitive dependencies don't go out of date uh, and cause problems later so this is to lock the versions of all the dependencies that you've installed and and their dependencies and their dependencies and so on okay now don't worry if all of that doesn't make sense the only key thing you should keep in mind is when you say npm install and type the name of a package that is going to get added into the package.json a file and that can then be used to reinstall that package on any other computer okay now next we are going to create a folder called src and we are going to put all our application code inside that all our html css javascript etc and inside the src folder we are going to create a new file app.js and inside it we are going to add some content so let's create a folder src so i've just created a folder src and now let's create a file app.js and now in the app.js file, I'm going to say, uh, let me copy out the first two lines. So I'm going to say express equals require express. This is how we uh, pull in the express dependency. So this is how we get access to the express library by saying require express. And then I can create an app, uh, an express application, a web application simply by calling the express function. Okay. And just like that, an app has been created, a web server has been created, but we're going to do a couple more things as well. Now, the first thing we're going to do is set a basic, um, set a basic route. Okay. So let me just paste this over and then we'll talk about it here. So what we're saying is app dot get. So we're saying that when the app gets a request and when it gets a request on slash, which means when it gets a request on the basic route, right? By the basic route, we mean it's simply, let's say this application was deployed on jovian.com. Then when you try to access jovian.com, that is treated as the slash or the root level route. But let's say if you try to access jovian.com slash akashanis, that would be treated as the slash akashanis route. Okay. So if you just try to access the server raw without any sub path to the uh, URL, then that is going to get sent to this particular route. So whenever you're address, whenever you're attaching a route handler to uh, whenever you're attaching a route for an express application, you need to specify a route handler, which is basically just a function that is given the request that has been sent from the client and that is given a response object and it can then use the response object to send the data back to the client okay so the request object is used to get data from the client the data that the client has sent in its request the response object is used to send data back to the client all right so you will see this pattern very commonly in all uh, javascript web frameworks you'll attach a route and the method could be get post etc we'll talk about that but you'll attach a route and uh, to the application and for that route you will specify a route handling function okay finally we actually need to run the server and the way you run the server is by calling app.listen so once you've created an express application you can say app.listen and basically what this is saying is now the app will start listening for requests now to start listening for requests it needs to specify a port there are many applications that can run on the same computer on the same hardware so the different applications or different servers can occupy different ports. They can listen at different ports. All right. So that's where, so think of it as mailboxes within a building. So you specify your mailbox number or your port number. So let's see uh, app.listen port and the port is currently just being set to 3000. But what we also often do is sometimes while running the application up an external port is specified. So when an external port is specified while running the application, that is going to be configured in what's called an environment variable process.env.port. But we, uh, if that is not specified, we just pick the default value of 3000. Okay. So for now, again, don't worry about this line. Basically what it says is use the port 3000. If no other port has been specified while running the application. Okay. All right. So this app is going to start listening on this port 3000 when we run the project. And it is also going to just print something out to this, uh, to the console saying that the server is running on such and such URL. Okay. <clears throat> so with that, we have set up our very basic web application that is going to take a request and simply return hello world. 
Now, uh, the last thing we need to do is we actually need to configure a command to run this server. So one way we could run the server is just go and say node src slash app.js. Okay, that's one way to do it. We just go into the terminal and type node src slash app.js. But the preferred way to run or configure applications in general is to specify the script that is used to run the server in the package.json file. So in package.json, you will, you will have this scripts object. And in this scripts object, it is common to just add a start key. And in that start key, specify what command should be executed to start this application. Okay. And the command, of course, that we want to execute is node src slash app.js. Okay. So now that we have done that, now that we have started, now that you have specified a start script in um, package or JSON, we can say npm run start. Okay. And when we say npm run start, that is going to do the exact same thing as node src slash app.js. Why are we doing npm run start? Well, it's just good convention. Any node.js applications that you create, it's a good convention to specify the start script so that somebody else who's running the application can does not have to guess what the start script is uh, going to be. Okay. So let's just run npm run start. And with that, the server is running. So now the server is running on the Visual Studio code. Uh, the server is running on the GitHub code space machine that is somewhere in the cloud. And to access that machine, we can just click this open in browser button that shows up. What it does is that is it takes our request from our browser and forwards it to the port number 3000 3, of the GitHub code spaces machine. Okay. And you can already see here, we now have on this port, we are simply printing hello world. And you can see now that if I just change this to hello Jovian and I kill the server and I restart the server and I reload this page. You can see now it says hello Jovian. So just like that, we have set up our first basic server. So here's what's happening. When we type the URL into the browser, that URL sends a request to the server and see this URL. This is basically just like a simple URL, like a simple something dot something dot com or dot dev slash, and there's nothing after it. And that is why that is going to match with this particular route handler. And this particular route handler simply says, hello, Jovian. Now, suppose I had said in here slash Akash NS. So if I had something at the end of the URL slash something, you can see that it says cannot get slash Akash NS. It only knows how to get slash. And we'll see how to add more of these routes to our servers shortly as well. Okay. So uh, now we've set up our dev server. And one thing I want to mention is instead of running npm run start, because start is such a, a special common command, you can al also just say npm start instead of npm run start and both do the same thing. And with that, we have set up a web server that shows hello world. Okay. <clears throat> now the next step would be to serve an HTML file. Now, of course, we don't just want to return hello world from our server. We want to actually return some nice HTML. So here's what we'll do. We will create a folder pages inside the SRC folder. So I'm going to say SRC. I am going to create a new folder pages. All right. And now inside pages, I'm going to create a file index.html. So now we have an index.html file. All right. And into this index.html file, I'm going to put in some content. So I'm just, I've just taken some of the content from the from the uh, website that we had created the last time, the Jovian careers website. And I have included it here on this link. So I'm just going to copy paste it because we don't want to just uh, sit and re-implement the entire page that we had uh, created the last time already. Okay. So now we have put in inside SRC, we put in a folder pages and inside pages, we put in the file index.html. However, this browser has no way to actually access that index.html file. This browser can only make a request to the server and the server is only listening on the route slash and on that slash route, it is simply returning hello Jovian. It is simply sending hello Jovian. So instead of sending hello Jovian, we need to send the contents of the index.html file. All right. How do we do that? Well, here is what we can do. So we can first include this new utility function called path. So we say path equals require require path. And this is path is simply a utility to construct full file system paths uh, based on uh, based on relative paths. Next, let us change this one line of code. 
So instead of saying res.send file, instead of saying res.send hello Jovian, so let me comment that out. I'm going to say res.send file path.join dir name. Dir name is basically just the name of the current directory, which is dot slash src. So underscore underscore dir name is a existing variable in Node.js that automatically gets the name of the current directory. So we want to take the name of the current directory and to it, we want to join pages slash index.html. All right. So we want to get current directory which is the src folder slash pages slash index.html. And we want to send that file in the response. All right. That's all we are doing here. So let us hit save again and let us reload the page. Nothing happens because we have to restart the server. So remember this express, what it does is when you start the server, it reads the entire JavaScript file. And then if you make changes, you have to restart the server. So let's see controls. Let's type control C control C is used to kill the server or stop the server. And then, uh, so you just go into the terminal, press control C and then type NPM run start or NPM start again. And now if we reload the page, you can see now that it actually shows us the job applications page that we had created earlier. So it has a header. It has this work at Jovian over here and it has this uh, footer over here as well. All right. We've not added the jobs table and we've not added the uh, application form yet. We've just added these parts and you can, of course, you can study the code inside index.html to make sure that's exactly what we have. So yeah, we have a head and inside the head, we have a title. We have some meta tags. Looks like we have some link tags, Jovian web icon.png. We have some, um, we have bootstrap. We have some fonts and looks like we have a style sheet styles.css. So we might need to add a few more files. But then we have a nav bar over here and that is what is uh, showing this nav bar. Then below the nav bar, we have this about Jovian section over here. All right. And then below the about Jovian section, we have a footer over here and that's basically what we are showing on the page. All right. So with that, we have just returned some HTML from the server. Now, one very important piece of information I want to point out to you, to you here is to understand what is visible on the server and what is visible on the client. Now, all of this code that we are seeing here, it is JavaScript code, but this JavaScript code is not running in your browser. This JavaScript code is running on the server. So your browser simply makes a request. Your browser simply sends a request to the server. All the JavaScript code inside app.js is executed on the server. It picks up the index.html file and it sends it back to the browser. And now it's in the browser that the index.html file is parsed and displayed as a web page. Okay. Now what you might also have is that you might also send a JavaScript file to the, uh, to the browser. And then that JavaScript file can get executed on the browser as on the browser as well. Okay. But that's different from the app.js file. The app.js file only runs on the server. And I'm stressing this again, because this is a common source of vulnerability, right? So understand that only the result of the execution, which is hello world or the HTML file is uh, sent to the browser. This should say browser uh, is sent to the browser and the rest of the code remains on the server. So understanding which part of your project code is executed on the server and which part of your project code is executed on the browser is very important to avoid any security vulnerabilities. You do not accidentally want to send some database credentials to the browser because then your user will be able to see your database credentials and they'll be able to access your entire database. Rather, you want to keep them on the server and just send the response that the user needs to them. Okay. So with that, we have figured out how to display a HTML file. So that's great. Now, uh, the next step is to maybe make our workflow a little easier. Uh, every time we make a change to the index.html file, we have to manually restart the server. And each time uh, that requires us to go in, press control C and then restart the server. There's a better way to do this. There is this helper library called NodeMon, uh, which stands for node monitor. So I'm just going to say npm install NodeMon. So that's going to install the NodeMon package for us. And you can see here that it gets added here to NodeMon. All right. And now I'm going to add another script here called dev. So now in my package registration, I already have the NPM start script, which is going to be used when I'm happy with all the code. I don't feel a need to change the code too many times, but uh, I also want to use another script during development. And here I'm just going to say NodeMon src slash app.js. So the only change we've made between start and dev is that 
Start has node src slash app.js and dev has node mon src slash app.js. What this is going to do is every time the uh, every time there is a change made to any file in the project, it is going to restart the server automatically so that we don't have to come in and restart the server manually. Okay. So let's now run npm run dev. Instead of npm run start, I'm just going to run npm run dev. And now you can see that if I go in here and I change the title of this page, for example, so the title of this page is Jovian Careers Powered by Bootstrap. And let me just change it to Jovian Careers Powered by Express. You can see that the server will restart automatically. Well, looks like it did not. So that's where you also have to configure what causes the server to restart. So we say nodemon.json, nodemon.json. That's a new file we put into the root folder of the project. And then we say um, ext. And then we give it the list of extensions for which Nodemon should uh, monitor, right? So let's see, Nodemon extensions. Let's just search that format. Yeah. So you can specify it this way. You can say um, ext and then you provide a list of extensions. So I'm just going to provide a list of extensions here. I'm going to say that anytime a JS file or JavaScript file changes, restart the server. Anytime an HTML file changes, restart the server. Anytime a styles uh, or a CSS file, uh, file changes, restart the server. Anytime a PNG or a JPG file changes, restart the server. So anytime any of these files change, I want to restart the server. And let me just restart Nodemon itself once again. Let's see. Okay. I think I might have messed something up here. Ah, I believe it's just uh, you do not need it to be an array. Yeah, you just need it like that. Okay. So you provide a list of extensions as a comma separated string. And let's now run npm run dev once again. And now you will notice that anytime we change any HTML file, CSS file, JavaScript file, it's going to restart the server. Okay. So I'm just going to say powered by express here and I'll just reload the page. And now you see here, it says powered by express. All right. So that is the benefit of uh, using Nodemon. It's going to automatically restart the server, but you still do have to go to the browser and re uh, reload the page. All right. Um, so now we have set up Nodemon and we are using npm run dev for development. And when we want to do a final testing or deployment, then we can just use npm start. Okay. Now the next thing I want to point out is that index.html contains references to files like styles.css, jovianmeta.png, and jovianfavicon.png. But so far we have not added any of these. So uh, you see we are referring to styles.css, but there's no styles.css file here. And more importantly, there will, there is no styles.css file here. So all of these things are executed on the browser. All the HTML is run on the browser. And when the browser, when the browser tries to get styles.css, it's going to run into an error. So we need to find a way to pass all of these files, styles.css and PNG and all of these directly as is without any changes to our um, browser. And that is where we are going to create a folder called static. Okay. So we are going to create a folder called, let me just rename it public actually. Yeah. Let's create a folder called public. So SRC public. And into this, I'm going to uh, put in all the files that are going to be sent as is without any change to the browser. Okay. And inside the public folder, let me put, for example, styles.css and into the styles.css, let me put in some content. All right. Okay. I've put in some content into styles.css. Looks like I have one more piece here. Yeah. So all we're doing in the styles.css is maybe configuring the default font bo body font and configuring, configuring the default blue color and the primary uh, color on bootstrap. So these are all CSS variables we're configuring. And then we're also configuring the font family for the heading. So we're using the inter font family, which we have included within our index.html page from Google fonts. And we are also configuring that the a tags or the link tag should not have any underlines. So text decoration underline is the default. We are setting it to text decoration uh, none. Okay. So that's the styles.css file. Next, I have a couple of these files. I have this file 
uh, Jovian favicon.png and Jovian meta.png on my computer. I'm going to drag them in here and put them both into this public folder as well. And you can download these files from these URLs. So just go into this URL and right click and save it as Jovian favicon.png and Jovian uh, meta.png. So this is what the Jovian favicon.png looks like. It is going to be used to configure the fav icon or the icon in the browser. And this is what the Jovian meta image looks like. This is simply going to show up when we share that link with somebody else on, on social media, et cetera. Okay. So, um, all right. So now we've added these files, styles.css, index.html, uh, uh, styles.css, Jovian fab icon, Jovian meta, but nothing seems to have changed. Even if I try to access slash styles.css, I still cannot get it. So it still says cannot get styles.css. So what do we do? Well, you actually have to inform express that there is a certain folder on your, in your project from where you want to directly send all the files to the browser. You don't want to make any changes to them. Okay. So how do we do that? The way to do that is by just adding this one line within express. So we say app.use after creating the app, we say app.use and app.use is a very common uh, pattern in express where any new feature you want to add any uh, what's called middleware in express, any new features you want to add, you just add them using app.use. And here in app.use, we are going to use, uh, we're going to set up a static folder using express.static and we need to give it the exact directory name. So all the full or the full path of the directory where this, um, all these static files are located. Okay. So I'm going to say path.join underscore underscore dir name which is simply getting the name of the current directory slash public. So what we're saying here is take everything that is there in this folder called public and send it to the browser as is when requested. Okay. And now it says the app crashed. Okay. I put in an extra underscore. So yeah, now the app should have restarted. Yep. So now the app is restarted. And now if I reload the page, watch closely, you will notice the fonts change. There you go. You see the fonts just changed and you can actually see here. If I open slash styles.css, you can see that now we have this styles file that is served. And if I open slash Jovian underscore fav icon dot PNG, you can see now the fav icon is getting rendered. If I open Jovian underscore meta dot PNG, you can see that our meta meta image is getting rendered as well. Okay. And all of these are linked from index.html as well. So that will show up properly too. You can see here, it shows the nice icon here in the browser tab. So that's one other thing I want you to take away. Anything that you want to directly send out to the, uh, to the browser, then you simply create a folder and put all of those files into a folder and you, uh, simply configure a static folder within app dot use. Okay. Now we didn't do this for index.html because we're going to make some changes to index.html show some dynamic data on that page. That is why we want to process it before we send it. That is why we didn't put it in the public or static folder. Okay. All right. So just keep that in mind. Static files are served as is by the server and it is generally used for style sheets, scripts, images, icons that you just want to pass on to the browser directly. And you can check out this resource to learn more about static file serving. Now, one last thing we can do is to simply push our changes back to GitHub and then deploy it to Vercel. So I'm just going to come in here into the Git tab of the sidebar, and I'm just going to say added basic, uh, well, added express app index.html and static files. I'm going to click commit, and that is going to simply stage and commit all the changes. And I'm going to sync this back to GitHub. So stage, commit and sync three step process. And once this is done, we can go in here and you can just reload this page. And you can see here that we have this SRC folder. We have this package.json. You can see package.json has the dependencies express and nodemon. And there's no node modules folder because it is ignored in the git ignore. And the SRC folder has a pages folder where it has index.html. Of course, it has app and it has this styles.css, etc. as well. Okay. Now let's deploy this. So I'm just going to go to Vercel.com and Vercel is the platform we typically use for deployment because it's really easy to use. That's what Jovian.com is replied on as well. And I'm going to select uh, add new project here. And if you haven't connected your GitHub account, you can connect it here. If you can, if you haven't connected all the repositories, you can configure your GitHub 
setting here as well. But in this case, we're simply going to go into the Sydney Jovian account and import Jovian Careers Express Live. And when we import it, we can select the framework preset. Okay. Now, uh, there's no framework preset here. And uh, because this is just express, there's no framework as such. It's just a, in fact, a Versal does not have inbuilt support for express, uh, but the root directory is just the directory which contains the package or JSON file. And we can click deploy. Now, hopefully what this should do is it should look into the package or JSON file and it should deploy. And let's see if that happens. Okay. So it looks like the deployment is complete, but if we try to access it, it says 404 not found. And this is because Versal needs things to be configured in a certain way. Versal needs to be told what is the root file that we need to access. Versal needs to be told what are uh, the different ways in which different routes need to be handled. So there is one special piece of code that you need to add when you're deploying an express application to Versal. Okay. And again, this is not something that you know by default. This is just something that you would normally Google and figure out, but you need to add a file called Versal.json that informs Versal a few things. One, it tells Versal that src slash app.js is the key, is the main file that uh, it needs to build, the for, for which it needs to install all the dependencies, etc. And you also need to tell it that it needs to use the Node.js environment. So Versal supports a bunch of different runtime environments, and we're just informing here that we want the Node.js environment. And finally, so this points to the main file of the server. This points to the, uh, the use points to the environment. All of this goes into builds. And finally, you also need to configure uh, we want what we want to do is all the routes and no matter what route we try to access, we want them all to be sent to app.js and app, we want app.js to handle the routing and not Versal itself. So that is again, something that is configured. And again, don't worry if this seems confusing, whenever you are deploying an express JS application to Versal, you simply copy paste this um, or find it online. Okay. So let's go back here and let me go in here and create a Versal.json file. So new file versal.json. And in this file, I'm just going to put in this code version two builds routes, um, just standard code for configuring versal to run with express. And I'm just going to say add versal.json and let me click commit and sync it. And that should now get sent up to the server. And now let us go back into our versal dashboard. Let's go back into Jovian careers express live and delete this project and, and just create a new one with the versal.json file. So sometimes what happens is uh, if you change the versal.json file, you may have to just uh, recreate the project. So I'm just going to delete this project and you can delete the project from the project settings. And let's check the versal.json file. So the versal.json file looks fine to me. And now let's come back into versal and create a new project. So now once again, I'm going into new project. I'm set, I'm selecting the Jovian careers express live project, which has the versal.json file already, uh, no framework preset and the root directory is just the dot slash, which is the root of the entire directory, because that's where the package or JSON and other files are present. And I'm just going to click deploy. Okay. And hopefully this time it should pick up the settings from the versal.json file. Yeah. looks like you have a versal.json file, so it's going to pick up the settings properly. And let's see if it's going to do that deployment this time. And it does. Perfect. So our application or our web uh, web server is now deployed to Versal and it is now scalable. So our code space machine can shut down anytime and it cannot scale, but Versal will automatically scale things depending on the traffic and it will automatically redeploy whenever you push to the main branch. So that's it. So now we have a basic deployment ready as well. And now we are ready to start maybe rendering some data dynamically into that page. Maybe let's see if we have any questions at this point already. Okay. The, there's a comment here. Server is a special computer to deal with traffic. That's right. Yep. That's a good way to look at it. What's the difference between using static.app and using express. So in static.app, all it does is it takes the files that you have and it gives them to the browser when requested in express, we can write some custom logic, for example, uh, fetching data from a database, sending an email, handling form submissions and all of that. Okay. So I hope that answers that. What is the difference between flask and express? Well, flask is a Python web framework. Express is a JavaScript web framework. They do the same thing. They are both the smallest possible frameworks essentially in each of those languages. Um, but that's basically it. 
what are dynamic contents so anything any data that is for example fetched from a database for example if you go to my jovian profile each time you open it you'll see something different because i may have worked on new notebooks in the meantime now obviously i'm not creating an index.html file and putting it up each time i create a new notebook this data is going to be fetched from the browser from a database and that uh, html file is going to be uh, created on the fly when you try to request it okay what was minus y doing here so when i said npm init minus y i will let you search that online uh, all it does is well it makes our work a little easier otherwise npm init is going to ask you for the package name etc cetera, etc cetera. okay what is a route well a route is simply a path on the page so for example if you have um for example if you have jovian.com slash akashness that's a route right so slash akashness so jovian.com here is the domain and slash akashness is the path or the route which is where within this server do you want to go or slash akashness slash notebooks which is what you see here that is another route or slash akashness or slash sydney slash express web application that is another route or slash learn slash uh, courses that is another route or slash learn slash full stack developer bootcamp that's another route. so these are all the sub paths that you can have present in your application and uh, we've just looked at the root route which is where there is no sub path which is just jovian.com or wherever or in this case it is deployed at, at jovian careers yeah in this case it is deployed at jovian careers live.versel.app so that is what we've looked at so far but we look at some sub routes as well uh, shortly okay what is a port well as i gave the mailbox analogy uh, let's say in a building you have a bunch of people living and everyone needs to get their mail delivered so that's where there's a mailbox and the mail for each person comes into the respective mailbox in the same way when an application is running when a server is starting on a particular computer and there are many servers all the time running on your computer internal processes that you may not be familiar with each of them can uh, can put their claim on a port and all the requests messages sent to that port are going to get delivered to that server so that is something the operating system provides if we deploy to the cloud uh, do we have a different port and how does it work yeah so when we deploy to the cloud what happens is versel or whichever cloud framework we are using it automatically puts in a variable called port process.env.port so it automatically supplies a port number and ideally your application should have the ability to read that port number from the environment variable that is being provided by the cloud infrastructure platform so that it can run on that port okay okay where can we read these good conventions any resource well these are all just things that you will almost always end up doing so what we're doing right now is just the only way to do it uh, you just have to go through the process of building an application and you kind of learn all these conventions along the way it's hard to go wrong you can just search these online how do i do this or that okay why do we do with it this way why do we have a request why do we have a client and a server so the client let's say you have an application i like jovian which has the data of 300000 users now when we have the data of 300000 users and you you open jovian.com on your computer i don't want you to be able to access the data of access the private data of all 300000 users that is why your in your browser i simply give your browser the ability to contact my server and then when the when your browser sends a request to my server i have a way to validate okay this came from this particular user and then i can ensure on my server that i can contact the database and only return the data that is um that makes sense for you okay but if i simply open up my entire database then anybody would be able to access anything and that's why we put a server in between to do this okay what is dir name well uh, as i mentioned underscore underscore dir name is going to simp when you use it within a particular uh, javascript or node js file it is simply going to get the uh, directory which contains that file and we have just used it to get the full path for the pages index.html and for the public directory what is colon root pointing to yeah so in our styles.css this is something we covered the last time in our styles.css file colon root simply is a way to define some uh, global css variables all right and it's go it's global not just within this file but across all files so because we want to override some css variables that have been defined in bootstrap that is why colon root is going to take whatever global css variable is there and it's going to rewrite the variable with this name with this value okay so this is how you override the css variable 
if we are creating a web server using express then what are apache a web server or nginx or Tom tomcat okay i will not get into those right now i will encourage you to ask chat gpt or jobot this question uh, is there an app.delete app.put yes so we'll talk about http methods uh, so you have all of these app.get is just the simplest way where you're simply getting uh, it's just one of the http methods that is used why is there no express framework preset in Versal? Yeah, it for some reason they don't have it i um, i guess they should they should probably have added it at some point but they decided not to okay please add the questions in the chat as well when recordings are posted okay we'll try to do that are all these routes basically different folders in the server in the source code okay not exactly so conceptually yes as a browser or as a user i can think of folders uh, i can think of them as folders on the server however if let's say we have jovin.com slash akashinist jovin.com slash sidhan jovin.com slash somebody else if we create ended up creating folders on our server for every single person then we would end up with a lot of folders and we would run out of server space what we do instead is we put all the data in a database which is optimized for uh, storing large amounts of data and then our routes are configured in such a way that given whatever route we get they can figure out how to fetch the right data from the server and we are going to take a look at that shortly okay next question difference between http and https so http traffic is not encrypted which means if somebody is uh, can track the packets going uh, going through your network so basically somebody who uh, can kind of listen into your wi-fi router or maybe even your wi-fi router company or maybe your internet service provider everybody can see exactly what you're sending the full contents that the email that you're sending or the password that you're sending whatever it is but https means that th the client and the server they have initially done some kind of an encryption handshake and the client encrypts the data sends it to the server and when the send, uh, server sends back the response it encrypts to the data sends it to the client in uh, the client being the browser in between your internet service provider or somebody just listening into your wi-fi will not be able to see what's going on and now most websites just work on https so moving right ahead let us now uh, send some dynamic data and add it into the index.html page now of course uh, we are not going to talk about databases just yet but we are going to su simulate databases in a certain way essentially um, so here's what we're going to do we're going to create a file called jobs.js so i'm going to create a file here called jobs.js okay and in this jobs.js file i'm going to put in some data so let me take in all this data over here and this is simply a list of jobs so const jobs equals uh, this is our first job object which has an id 1 title front end developer location bengaluru salary 12 lakhs um, posted on march 3rd 2023 similarly there's a second job third job so we've taken a json array an array of json objects and put that into this variable called jobs and uh, we are going to just export this as the default export from this module okay so jobs.js is this file into which we have put in a bunch of jobs now um, we can actually import these jobs here so we can say const jobs equals require dot slash jobs okay and i can also just console dot log jobs and you can see that when we import this from require dot slash jobs we get all of this data here and we can now use it in our server and we can even send it to the browser however we want okay now of course right now we are getting this from a file but in a real world scenario you would be getting this from a database which is something that we'll look at in a future course okay the next thing is to actually put these jobs into the index.html file so now what we're going to do is turn this index.html file into a template and we're going to turn it into a template using a template rendering system called mustache and i'll talk about what mustache is in just a second but here's what we need to do the first thing we need to do is install this mustache express package so i'm just going to go in into the terminal and i'm just going to stop this server for now and i'm just going to say npm install mustache express okay so mustache is the templating uh, the the template engine that we are going to use and mustache express is the connector that that allows you to connect mustache to exp, allow express to mustache 
Okay, so that was step one. The next thing we need to do is to convert our index.html file, which is an HTML file, into an index.mustache file or a mustache template. Okay, and here's what, what we're going to do. So I'm just going to go into my index.html file. And I'm simply going to rename this file. So I'm just going to rename this file to index.mustache. Okay. All right, so far so good. We've not really changed anything. We've just installed a package, renamed the file. What difference does that make? Now, um, we'll add some of this later. Now I'm going to come into my app file, my app server, and I'm going to incorporate the mustache template rendering engine into my express server. So first thing I'm going to do is go into app.js and just require mustache express and get this mustache express object. Okay, so now I have this mustache express object over here. And in this object, uh, this object now contains the mustache template rendering engine. Now I need to add it into my app express app. And the way we add it is like this. So first, we have to set a bunch of views within our application. So what we say is that the views or the templates or wherever, whatever contains the markup or the HTML is all present inside this folder called pages. Okay, so what we're saying is, um, let's actually just make that nicer here. So what we're saying is app dot set views to path dot join underscore underscore der name pages. All right. So we are saying that inside the pages folder, I have a bunch of views or I have a bunch of templates that I can use. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing we need to say is that we need to set the view engine. Okay, whenever you hear view, think of it as template. These are all just words for the same thing. Um, so now we say so app dot set view engine to mustache. Okay, so we've set a directory that contains our templates or our views, then we have set a view engine and that engine has the name mustache. And finally, for that engine, we need to provide the handler function. Okay, and the handler function is simply coming from mustache express. Alright, so uh, three things we need to set anytime you're adding some form of templates to render some form of dynamic data, and all of this will become clear when you actually see this in action. You need to set the views. So the views we are simply setting to the pages folder. You need to set the view engine and the view engine we are simply setting uh, to mustache and the actual engine that we are using for the engine name mustache is called mustache express. All right. So this is just something that you'll have to drop into any express application whenever you're adding some some templating uh, engine to it. And you, there are a bunch of other templating engines as well, like pug, ejs, etc. Mustache is just the easiest one to work with, uh, really simple to understand. All right. So, so far we have installed Mustache Express, set it as the view engine, and we've said that all our templates or Mustache files are inside the pages folder. Okay. Now, the next thing we can do is we can go in and render that template. So here's what we can do. Instead of saying res.send file, which is what we were saying earlier, we can say res.render. And in while we are rendering, we need to give it the name of the view that we want to render. So we are saying that we want to render the view index. And we want to send this data into that view to populate the uh, to populate that view. Okay, again, these words will soon make sense. But basically, now you can understand that okay, index simply refers to the index dot mustache file. And that index or mustache file is going to be located in the folder that has been configured for views and the folder folder is called pages. All right, so we have this pages folder index or mustache. So, so this is simply going to pick up the index or mustache file. And it's going to give this additional data, which is a dictionary containing the key jobs, which points to the list of jobs that we have. And that additional data can now be used within our index dot mustache template. Okay. So let's come back and actually use this. Now we have in this page, we have this about section and then we have this footer just below the about about section and above the footer, I'm going to add a new section called jobs. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to first add this div called jobs, job opportunities.
Okay, so so far th th there's nothing new we've done. We've simply added this job opportunities div and there we have it. Okay, so now we've simply added a simple div which says job opportunities, nothing fancy going on here. But then we want to now add the job list. So let's add this jobs list. So this is going to show up only on mobile. So I'm just going to reduce the width over here as well so that it shows up properly. So this is going to be our jobs list and let's add the slash div over here. Okay, now inside this jobs list, I'm going to do something very interesting. I'm not going to type out all the jobs one by one, but instead remember that my template is being rendered with this data. So I have access to a variable called jobs, which points to a list of jobs. Okay, so I, so I can take that list of, uh, I can take that variable, which is a list and I can loop over that variable like this. I can say hash jobs slash jobs. So what this is doing is this is basically creating a for loop and inside this for loop, I can put in this content like that. Okay. So let's see what is happening here. We have it. We had an index.html file. We just renamed it to index.mustache. Inside it, we added this new div called jobs list. Inside this jobs list div, we use this special syntax called bracket bracket. And that's why uh, these are called the mustaches or the curly braces. That's why the library is called mustache. And then we said that, okay, we want to look for this object or this key called jobs. And whatever is there in that key, if that is a list, we want to loop over that list. And that is where we use this hash character. This hash basically means we want to loop over something. And this slash simply means we are, uh, we are at the end of the loop. And then in each loop, so remember our jobs.js file, our jobs.js file contains a list of jobs. So in each loop, we have access to the job. And now what we can do here is we can use a particular key or a particular a particular key from the object. For example, we have the key title, we have the key location, we have the key salary, we have the key, um, uh, we have the key posted. So all of those can now be accessed within this loop. Okay, so now bracket bracket title bracket bracket is going to get the value for the first element in the first loop. In the second loop, it's going to get the value for this uh, for the title from the second element, then it's going to get the title from the third element and so on. So because there are four jobs listed here, four of these divs will be rendered div 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 div. And in each of these four divs, the data from that corresponding job will be picked up. And what data are we picking up? We are picking up the title. We are picking up the location. We are picking up the salary and we are picking up the posted. Okay. So wherever you see bracket bracket, that is going to get replaced with some actual data. And finally, uh, we are also picking up the job ID and using that we are creating a link. Okay. Let me save that. And again, I encourage you to just run this yourself and see if you can make sense of this and let us yeah and now you can see here now we have job opportunities front-end developer full stack developer data scientist machine learning engineer all right so again think about what happened what we did was we installed the mustache express package we then imported it we configured it as the default view engine for express and we configured the default view directory as the pages folder then in the slash route we are simply rendering the index mustache file uh, or the index mustache template into that template we are passing a dictionary in that dictionary we have a key called jobs which is a list of jobs now whenever you have a list you can use it within that mustache template like this to loop over that list and whatever you put inside the hash and slash that is going to be applied to each element of the list okay so each element is going to be one job or one job object from that one job object we want to insert into our html the title the location the salary so that's why this title gets inserted the location gets inserted the salary gets inserted the posted gets inserted and all of this gets looped four times for each of the jobs that we have okay so here this data came from a file but this data could instead have come from a browser uh, from a database or could have come from a third party source like twitter or something like that if you are using a twitter api or something okay so think about this but this is basically what mustache or any templating engine is used for to insert data into an html template and fill it out and create a proper html page out of it now if you just right click here and click inspect you will not be able to see this template over here. What you will see instead 
is that we have this jobs list and in this jobs list we have these four jobs these four cards and in these four cards we have each of these particular uh, data for each of these particular job roles okay so the so this template combined with the code that is running over here is going to generate the html and only the html the final html sent to the browser uh, and that is how things work okay now if you can wrap wrap your head around this and you may need to just rewatch this a couple of times to get it then you've basically understood what most web servers do they take some data from a database put that into a template using some kind of a templating engine and then they just send that data back to the client okay so that was the jobs list but why don't we also do the jobs table so let me just grab the jobs table as well oops yeah let's grab the let's grab the jobs table as well so i am going to zoom out here a little bit grab this entire jobs table like that and let's put that right below our jobs list so that's our jobs table let me just give that a tab and all right and now you can see that on mobile i still have the jobs list yeah on mobile i still have the jobs list but on the desktop i have the jobs table okay jobs list on mobile jobs table on desktop how did we create the table again we created a normal table with a table tr and it had a th job title location salary etc but once again we use the same jobs variable and now using the jobs variable we now created the title we created the location we created the salary and posted at and we this time we created not a card but we created a table row and four of these get, rows get created and each of them is going to have the appropriate information okay so just understanding this templating syntax can sometimes be a bit tricky at the beginning but once you get it it becomes second nature and mustache is actually really simple to understand so with that we have rendered the mustache template you can see here we say rest.render we've given it the, we've given it the name of the template index.mustache and a list of uh, parameters that we wanted to pass in okay now of course uh, if we wanted we could also pass in more parameters for example i could pass in a parameter called company name and uh, i could pass that in as let's say google for just for example then in my index.mustache i could come in here right at the top where i have my h1 where is that yeah so i have i have my h1 and here instead of saying work at jovian uh, i could maybe have just done work at company name all right and if, if i had done that work at company name you would see that now it would say work at google so you can pass not just one parameter but you can pass any number of parameters you want and now i change this back to jovian and it says work at jovian and you can modify any part of your template as you want you can modify something inside the class inside the tag name whatever you want yeah, the templates are very flexible but also uh, they can also be a little tricky to work with for the same reason all right so now the job now the page shows a job table or list on the appropriate device so now it says work at jovian and now we have the job opportunities table one thing i want to mention is we have also added links to these tables so what happens is when you click this link it goes to this uh, if you if you see here at the end of the url it goes to slash job slash one or two or three or four based on the job id it's going to go to a different route so the next step for us is going to be implement that route page implement the individual job pages for each of the jobs and we'll see how to do that in a dynamic fashion once again without having to create four separate pages because you could have 100 jobs or you could have 50 jobs so you do not want to create uh, hard code the number of jobs you have or create a bunch of routes uh, anticipating how many jobs you'll have you should just be able to handle any number of jobs okay so that is our second step and i would encourage you to maybe check out the mustache manual to learn how the mustache templating engine works it's actually really simple all it does is given some text like this it could be html css whatever it and given a bunch of these uh, template tags uh, a name value in and slash in or whatever it can take this data and it can just simply uh, fill that data into this template okay now the next step for us is to create a page for each job at the url slash job slash job id okay and for this we are going to again follow a two-step process first we are going to create a template for that particular job 
So I've already uh, again put together some content. So I'm just going to create another template called job.mustache. So in the pages file, I'm going to go in the pages folder. I'm going to create job.mustache job.mustache and let's close everything else and let's paste in here the job.mustache file. And what does it contain? Well, let me just change this formatting to HTML. Yeah. So what does this contain? This contains again, a bunch, uh, a head, basically a bunch of meta tags, etc. Then it contains a body in the body. It contains the nav bar. So it's the exact same nav bar that we have in index.html, but then it contains an application form. Okay. So it contains an application form. And here it says there is an H one that says that it is going, it is going to say apply job dot title. So you can already guess here that it expects to maybe get a variable called job, which has a title field inside it or a title key inside it. Similarly, it expects to get the variable or, or input job, which contains a location and a salary and a posted information. And also it's going to uh, create this form and the form action now is also going to be something different. We'll come and touch on this later, but then it renders this form over here this uh, application form and then it renders the footer below it. Okay. There's no, yeah, there is a footer here as well. Okay. So we have, uh, you can already visualize that this is going to render the same page, but instead of the about section and instead of the table, it's simply going to show an application form with a title on it. Okay. But how do we actually show this page when you try to access a job? That's where we now need to add a new route. So here's the route that we're going to add. We are going to go back into app.js. And now we're going to create a new route. This time we're going to say app dot get slash jobs colon ID. And in this case, uh, the, and you see here, we've not put in a particular job ID. We could have put in slash one slash two slash three slash four, but we have created a more generic route. And this is called a route parameter. We've created a more generic route that can handle anything after slash job. So it can handle slash job slash one slash job slash two slash job slash 99 slash job slash hello slash job slash buy slash job slash Google. It could handle anything, but of course we want to maybe do some filtering and ensure that it's actually a number, a job ID. Okay. So what we do then in our route handler function is uh, we get the ID. So whatever is indicated using a colon at the beginning, you can access its value in request.params. Okay. You can always just go in here and also do console.log rec.params. And that's going to print rec.params. Okay. And by the way, this console log is not going to show up on the browser. This is actually going to show up on our terminal down in the server over here. Oops. Yeah, this is all, this is going to show up in the terminal down in the server over here. So if I just run the page once again, and open that. Uh, and if I actually try to open that particular page, that uh, that particular route, then it is going to show up here in the server. It's not going to show up in the browser. So remember what is executed on the server and what's on the browser. All right. So we get the ID uh, that is present in the route parameter. And then we try to find. So we are using the find method of an array. All it does is given a condition or given a function, it finds that job uh, at that element, which matches that condition. So we are saying jobs dot find given a job, the job dot ID dot two string. So we've done two string here because the IDs here are numbers. So what we're saying is in the jobs list, find the job whose ID when converted to string matches the ID that we got from the URL. So from the URL, we get an ID and we search for the job matching that ID in the jobs table. And that gives us a match job. And let us also log the matched job. So console.log matched job and let's log matched job. Okay. And finally we are saying rest dot render job. So we are, we are rendering the template job dot mustache this time, which is present in the pages folder, which is configured as the views, uh, for our express. So we are rendering the job dot mustache template and we are rendering it with the data job where uh, the key job or the variable job will have the value of match job. Okay. So let's just run this. Let's see it in action and things will become clearer. Let me click on front end developer over here. Yeah. Let's click on front end developer and you can see now magically we have navigated to slash job slash one because that is something that we configured in our index.js template. We've navigated to slash job slash one. So that automatically gets caught by this uh, route handler. And when it gets this ID, you can see that the ID it printed here is one. 
and you can see that it's a string. So by default, all route parameters are strings. And then we tried to search for that ID within the jobs array. And we got back a match job and this was a match job. It had the ID one title front end developer location, Bengaluru, India, salary, etc. And then we put that into the um, into the template like this. And in the template job dot mustache, we are actually using it to render things. So we are using it to render the job title, which is showing up here after apply. We are using it to render the job location, job salary and posted on, which is all showing up here. All right. And the application form is generic. There is no change here. So that's, I think that's pretty neat. Now we can go back and like, let me open full stack developer. And now it says apply full stack developer. And there's a different salary and location. Let me open data scientist. Now it says something different. And let me open machine learning engineer and now it says something different. All right. So that way with just one route, we have handled four jobs, but not just four jobs, potentially hundreds of thousands of jobs. On Jovian, for example, we have hundreds of thousands of notebooks that people have created but there is only one route that is serving every notebook, right? And that is the benefit of having web servers and web applications that can do all this kind of dynamic stuff. Okay, so let me get rid of these console.logs. And now uh, we are ready to move forward because now we've created the single individual job page. So the next step for us is going to actually support submitting the application. So if you see here, if I click on a job role and I fill out the application, let's say I fill out John Doe and I fill out the email address john at doe.com and I fill out a phone number and let me fill out a date of birth here. Let me fill out a cover letter and agree to the terms and conditions, click submit application. So now what happens when we click submit applications is in the form, we have specified a certain action. So and we have specified a certain method. So all of this data is going to be posted. Uh, so there are two ways, two methods we can specify one is get one is post. And I'll talk about the differences as well. Get simply means that all of the parameters or all of the data that has been filled in into the form will be sent as part of the URL. Whereas post means that the URL is going to be just this. The data that is there in the form is going to be sent as the body of the request. Okay, so every request has a URL and a body and it has something called headers as well, which we'll talk about later, but a URL and a body get is going to just put everything in the URL. Your URL is going to become really long with your cover letter and name and email and everything, which is something we may want to avoid, especially if you can, if you have these text fields with a lot of content. So that's where we use post. So in post, this is, we are simply going to send this data to this particular URL slash jobs slash particular job ID slash apply on the server. But we're going to include all the data in the request body. And let me click submit application. And it says cannot post slash jobs uh, slash one slash apply. Well, that is because in our web server currently, we can only we have only handled the slash route and we have only handled the slash job slash ID route. Well, we could try to handle it like this. We could say app dot get slash jobs slash colon ID slash apply. And we could say something along the lines of rec res. Um, and let's say let's simply send res dot send got the application. Let's see if that works. So let me go back here and let me click submit application it still says cannot post that is because here I am listening for the get HTTP method. So if I was sending the data using the get method like this, then it would work. So if I click send, uh, I'd have to reload the page. Yeah. So if I just put in something here, a at b.com and something here and something here and something here and I click submit application. Now it says got the application. So when I send with the method get, and I have a listener with the method get it gets the data, but where is the data? All of that data is here, right here. You can see it's part of the URL. It's all part of the URL phone equals such and such email equals such and such dot com uh, and name equals such and such. And this is not a good idea for long, for longer forms for short forms. It's okay. But for long forms, it's not good. But on the other hand, what we want to do is we actually want to send it with the method post and we want to listen to it with the method post as well. Okay, so this time when I reload this and let me fill that in again, John 
do a date and something and submit okay do at e.com and submit this time you can see that we actually listen so every request and hence every route has two things it of course has the route path which is going to match the specific route depending on the parameters and it has a method so we need to to accept form submissions which are sent using the post method we need a route that can uh, that is declared using the post method okay and now here we will be able to get some things out from the request uh, all the all the form elements that have been sent and then maybe do something with them maybe send an email send them to a database etc so uh, there's a comment here well uh, a lot of things make sense now yep yep so this all fits together this, we have to go about it see the whole thing to actually understand and um this was you i was going to say this is so much easier it is such a hassle typing table rows one at a time exactly so you almost never type out the data by yourself you almost always get it from a database and you just use some kind of a templating engine to just generate all that html for you okay what is the small tag well it simply makes the text a little smaller that's all okay when do we learn to get data from the database in a future course are you also using express for the Jovian website? No. So we're actually using another framework called Next.js, which is what is part of the next course because we use a UI library called react and Next.js plays better with react. A lot of people use express. It's part of this. Um, you might have heard the mean stack, which is the MongoDB express angular JS and um, angular and Node.js stack, I believe. Or something like that. And similarly, there is a Mern stack, which is the MongoDB express react and node.js yeah so yeah there are a bunch of these stacks but uh, there's also some frameworks that are specific to specific ui libraries for example next.js which is what we use which is what we're going to cover okay then uh, we were using flask and later using something yeah so we're also using flask for us somehow for some reason we because we've migrated to things over time we started out with python uh, as our backend and exp or JavaScript as a front end, and that's why we're still using both Flask and Next.js. Okay, yeah, so we are planning to use React. In, yeah, we are already using React and Next.js. We just haven't migrated to it fully. How can you make the web app remember what you input? You cannot. It, it's just that when you go back and forth in a browser, uh, the browser retains the history of the page. Uh, so that's all. I was just using that. Normally, a web app will not remember what you inputted. What other dynamic content can we use this framework for? Well, you can create a blog post. All of Jovian could have been built like this. There was no problem with it. Okay, is uh, Java lets us do multi-threading and JavaScript allows for asynchronous programming, but it is still single-threaded. Yeah, so this is some more advanced concepts. I will not really address this, but I'll answer your question. Say if I want to handle multiple concurrent requests, I think a Java backend would do better than uh, JavaScript. Well, not necessarily because what you could do is you could run multiple JavaScript processes. So what you do is JavaScript itself is single threaded, but what you can do is you can run five JavaScript processes and all of them can asynchronously handle a lot of uh, load for you. Or you could just use a bunch of servers. Um, that said, a Java backend would be better if you have to do a lot of processing on the server. Typically, if you simply have to call a database and then return the result, maybe just format it in a certain way, fill out a template. Node.js is going to be as fast as you can get more or less because it has that asynchronicity. It's very easy to write asynchronous code with it. Um, but if you have to do a lot of processing, then you might run into issues where if you have like one second of processing where you have to process maybe 10,000 rows of data or something. In that case, you might want to use Java or something. Okay, and if for those of you who have no idea what we just talked about, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Okay, my end goal is to build a web app like Jovian uh, by the end of the program. That is going to be a final project to build something like uh, something along the lines of Jovian, uh, a proper web application with a user login, with a database, with a proper framework, uh, a UI framework, etc., etc. So let's continue on now. Uh, so far we have created this individual job pages so obviously we have the main page which contains the list of job opportunities either as a table or as this nice list of cards and when we open up a particular page we have a dedicated application page for each role front-end developer along with some information along with a bunch of uh, inputs and when we click submit application so we have a submit application button over here right now that doesn't work 
so if i just put in john doe and i put in something like that and put in a date of birth here or something and finally put in a cover letter and agree to the terms and conditions it does work but it doesn't really do anything right now uh, it simply says got the application but it's not doing anything with it okay so now the next step for us is to actually fill out the application um, or is to actually maybe do something with the application data so i'm just going to delete this right now um, and that is going to ensure that this doesn't do anything like that so we're, we're now going to fix that okay so let's now add another page that can accept form submissions and send the application over email and then send a send an acknowledgement show an acknowledgement page to the viewer so for this i'm going to need three packages i'm going to need a packet co package called node mailer which is going to be used to send an email so what i want to do is i want to just inform myself like i am the creator of the site i'm the ceo of jovian and i've put up this job site and i want to just send an email to myself whenever somebody submits a job application okay i don't want to give away my email publicly so that not everybody can contact me i want them to fill out the form on this site but i don't want to store that in a database anywhere right now that's too much work i'll just send that data to myself as an email okay and maybe i could also cc the person who uh, who applied just so that they know as well uh, but in any case now uh, for that we are going to use the node mailer package number one second we are going to use a package called dot env now the dot env package is useful when you do not want to put sensitive information like your email password in the code remember we are going to put up all the code for this particular email um, for this particular um, project on github uh, in public or sometimes even in private and we may not want to put our password there because then our password will, will just be present there on github for everybody else to see so that's where there's a way to securely read some of these things using environment variables for which we use the dot end package and finally um, the request body that is being sent when we are posting the form data that uh, that body is going to need to be parsed in some way and for that we need to use this body parser package okay and you'll see all of them in action shortly so let's come back in here let me shut down the server for a second and let me now just install these packages node mailer dot env and body parser okay all the packages are installed now i can restart the server npm run dev and let's close this for now next let us create a file called dot env at the root of the repository so i'm going to create a file over here called dot env into which i'm going to put in my email and password credentials so let's put in a folder dot env in the root of the repository and into this i'm going to put in these two things of course what i'm going to put in here is the actual email and the actual password that i want to send the data to um, obviously i don't want to show you that information so what you will have to do is you will have to replace this with your email and your password and i would suggest not using your primary email uh, just to be careful what you can do is you can go to gmx.com this is a website where you can create a free email and on gmx.com you can just create an, uh, an a throwaway email and just use that and its password okay and that's what i'll be using as well so i'm just going to go in into another desktop over here and i'm going to close it over uh, close it here but i'm going to put in my email id which i have created for this tutorial and password okay and i've done that so i'm not going to show you my env file again if i open it you'll be able to see my email and password so I'll, I'll, i won't show it but it's there now the other thing i want to mention is the env file is already ignored in the dot git ignore file so which means when i do a git commit and send it to github then this data is not going to be sent it is going to remain securely on my code spaces machine which is just private for me and it's not going to be sent to the github repository which is public for everyone to see or if it was private my co-workers would be able to see it which, which is again undesirable okay but now that we have put the uh, information in this .env file, we need a way to actually load this information into our app. How do we load this information into our app? We do it by saying this, require.env.config. So the first line require.env.config is going to read the .env files that are present in our uh, project folders. And it is going to then read each of those and then automatically add them to the process.env variable okay 
So remember we had this process.env variable. So now instead of apart from dot port, it can also get a bunch of other things that we have defined. So let me just put this right here at the top dot env and now here we have the we've also included the node mailer package and we've also included the body parser package okay all right next step is to also configure our application to use the body parser so remember uh, when we send the data from this form we are posting it which means we are not sending the data in the url we which means we are actually um, sending it in the body of the request and that body of the request needs to be parsed in a special way so right below app dot uh, express right below my app creation logic i'm simply going to say app dot use body parser dot url encoded extended false now don't worry about all of, all of this right now if you just search online how to add body parser to express you'll get the line of code that you need to add and you can look up what exactly extended does okay but the basic ideas and by and this one general tip i want to give you here is from this point on, you will see a lot of code which we are using, uh, which we will not exactly describe perfectly. And the idea is that you have to kind of look it up online, maybe use ChatGPT, JoeBot, Google, and understand what it means because there are so many libraries, so many frameworks, so many uh, options in each of them that it doesn't really make sense to cover all of them. It's something that you should just look up uh, and try to figure out as you need it, okay? So now we add body parser. We've added uh, this middleware essentially to our application. To, uh, which is going to parse the request body. And now, uh, one other thing we need before we actually start processing the request, we are going to create a transporter. We are going to create a transporter which is going to have the configuration required to connect with the mail server and send the email, okay? So I'm let me create this transporter over here. So I'm gonna say node, mol, node mailer dot create transport and this transport uh, is basically uh, is needs it needs a host the host is mail.gmx.com so depending on which email provider you're using you'll have to look up their smtp host so just search for smtp host for your email provider and you also need to look up their smtp port all right and then finally you also secure true is almost always set secure true means you're using https the secure version of the transport and finally, you need to provide authentication and in the authentication, you need to provide the username and the password as the user and pass keys. Now, of course, I'm not going to type in my username and password here. Rather, if, since I've already put something into the .env file and I've read that using the .en require .env um, line of code over here. So this is automatically going to get populated with my email ID and this is automatically going to get populated with my email password. So now we have this transporter and now we can simply say transporter.send and that's going to send whatever email we want to send. Okay. So with that, we are finally ready to actually parse all the content. So let's just go about this line by line. So let me come in here first and let me just for now, Simply say console.log request.body, req.body. All right, let's just do that much. Very straightforward. We're just going to log the body over here. So let me just open up the terminal. This is my terminal over here. And let's just click submit application. And you can see that when I clicked submit application, it simply said um, name John, uh, John Doe email, whatever, akash at jovin.com, phone number, DOB, cover letter, etc. So we simply logged the body over here and nothing happened here because we've not sent anything from the server. Let's just go back. Yeah. What we can also do here is we can, we can do right now rest.send application received. If we had done that, then when I click submit application, it's going to log the request body over here. You can see it logged the request body over here for us, but along with that, it also printed application received, right? But that's not what we want to do. We want to actually do something with the application now that we have the request body. Okay. So what next? Well, next up then let us get, so the request body has this name, email, phone, date of birth and cover letter. Let's get all of that information out from the request body. And for that, we're going to use this special syntax called destructuring. Whenever you have a particular object, and you want to get the keys out of that object and you know the names of the keys, you can put all those keys into specific variables like this. So you can say const and then you can open brackets and then you can type the names of all the keys 
that are present in the object or you can pick just some of the keys that are present in the object and you can say equal to request.body. So it's kind of the opposite. Instead of saying request.body equal to name, email, etc. Now you're saying that from request.body extract the name and put it into a variable called name, extract the email, put it into a variable email and just do that. And now you can see if we do console.log name. Now this will just have the name picked out from the request body. All right. And I can see submit application here. Yeah, if I say submit application, you can see it prints the name John Dito. Okay, so we now have all this information from the request body into a bunch of variables. Nice. Next, let us now get the job that we are currently working with. So remember, we are posting when we are posting, we're also specifying the ID of the job in the URL as a route parameter. So let's get the request.params.id that is going to get this uh, that is going to get this URL parameter ID and let's get the matching job. So let's also print in the matching job. So let's log console.log matched job matched job. Okay, and let's also for now just do press dot send received. So that is a match job, but then let's also maybe log the request body just just for complete clarity. Okay, and let's click submit application once again. So now you can see that this was what was sent or submitted by the user. So this is obtained from the form that the user submitted name, email, phone number, date of birth, cover letter. And this was uh, received, this was a match job. So that means in the URL, we had slash one, if I check the URL over here, you can see that we've done slash one slash apply. Right? So slash one slash apply, and that is get getting picked up as the ID here. So and that has been matched uh, or searched within the jobs list, which currently comes from a file, but could have come from a database. And from there, we get the title of the job essentially. Um, so now we have all the information. We have the information about the job that uh, that is being applied to. We have the information about the application itself, the applicant itself. So the next step is to actually construct an email. So for constructing an email, we create this mail options object. All right. So all we are doing here is into it, we are putting a from email. Now the from email ideally is the same email that whose password you have put in into the transporter. So yeah, you put in a username and password. So the from email should be the same. The two email could be whatever you want. Let's say you've set up this GMX email because you don't want to reveal your uh, credentials or put your password of the primary email. The true email could be, I could put into the two email. I could just put in akashns at jovian.com, something like that. Or I could also put in, I believe I could put in a list as list here as well. So let's say I also, apart from sending it to myself, I also wanted to send it to the person who has actually emailed me. So their email is present now in the email variable. I can pick it up from the application and I can email them that the application sent and such and such. But for now, just to keep things simple, I'm going to send it to the same throwaway email that I've created. All right. I don't want to uh, worry about that, but I could send it to whatever email I wanted. So keep that in mind from is ideally the same email that you've configured in the transport to can be whatever you want. You can put in multiple emails here as well. All right, then we have a subject we can set and I'm just saying new application for matched job dot title so that when I get the email, I want to know which job the person has applied for. And then you can create some HTML. So what you can do is you can create an HTML string and inside that HTML string, we have inserted a bunch of these things. So this is what is called a JavaScript string um, formatting, essentially a, or a template literal where you started with a back code and then you insert into it using a dollar, you insert name, email, etc. Okay, you can learn about this. What you can do is you can also just paste this code on chat GPT or Jobot and ask it to explain the code. Uh, but essentially what we're doing is we are creating a simple HTML email with name, email, phone number, date of birth, and a cover letter information. All right, name, email, phone number, date of birth, cover letter, all of that. And that is our mail options. So with that, our mail options object is ready. And finally, we can now just simply send that using transporter. Now we can say transporter dot send mail. Yeah. So now let me get rid of this rest dot send and let me paste this in here. So now we can simply say transporter dot send mail and I give it the mail options, which contains the from to subject and HTML body. 
and then I can give it a handler. So when it tries to send the mail and let's say it succeeds or fails after the mail sending is done, it is going to get called, uh, it is going to call this handler function that is provided here with wh whatever error or info was received. So if there was an error, then we want to simply log that error. We want to print that error here in the server and we want to say error sending email. If there was no error, then we want to simply say email sent successfully. Okay, so let's just save that. Um, so now we have all the information. I think this position is not required because we are not actually asking for position in the form. Okay, so I'm going to just close this terminal tab here. Let's take a quick look at this again before we actually run it. For when we post some data to slash jobs colon ID slash apply, then this handler gets called from the request body. We are going to get the name, email, phone number, date of birth and cover letter. From the request params.id, which is the URL parameter, we are going to get the ID and we are going to find the matching job. We are then logging both of them to the terminal. And then we are creating a mail options, which contains a from to subject and a body. And then we are saying transporter.send mail with the mail options. And if we receive an error, so we need to give it a handler. So what happens is it tries to send the mail in the background. And once the mail sending is done, it calls this handler function. So you always have this like callback function that you keep passing to almost everything that you do in JavaScript, right? This is, this is what is meant by asynchronous programming that you're not, you're not blocking the main thread. You can serve other requests from other clients till the mail is being sent in the background. And then whenever the mail sending is done, it is going to invoke this function. Now, if there is an error after sending the email, then we are going to say rest.status500 error sending email. So what we are saying by status is HTTP status codes indicate whether the request was served successfully or not. So I would encourage you to just search for HTTP status codes. You, know, you must have heard of 404, which means that the page or the, the URL was not found. 200 simply means that the URL was found. 500 means that the server encountered an error, 400 means bad request means you made some mistake while sending the request and so on, right? So there are all these HTTP codes that the server uses to inform the client what went wrong, if anything. Okay. And it also sends a message error sending email. Otherwise it says rest or status 200 email sent successfully. Okay. So let's now go back here and let us submit this once again. I'm going to click submit application. This is the moment of truth. And when we click that, it says email sent successfully. So I'm just going to go into my GMX account. So gmx.com. And let me just log in over here. Let's see. Let me grab my email. and password and let me log in and once I am logged in hopefully I should be able to see that new email so it says here new application for front-end developer John D uh, John Doe Akash and at Jovian.com phone number is such and such date of birth is such and such I write code well that seems to be exactly what I had filled out here great now one thing I want to mention though Almost every email provider has turned off SMTP by default because it is somewhat insecure and that includes GMX too. So what you, what you will need to do first is if you're using GMX, uh, you will need to go into home. You will need to go into email settings and under email settings, you will need to go into pop three and IMAP and under pop three and IMAP, you will need to enable this setting, enable access to this account via pop three and IMAP. Okay. So that is just how you enable this SMTP business on um, GMX. Let's see if it's not enabled. So let me just show, show you what happens if I don't enable it. And I try to send it now. You see that it faces an error in sending the email. And what is the error? Well, I can actually look up the error here. So if I just check the terminal and you can see that it says that I got the data, I matched the job, but invalid login authentication credentials invalid. All right. But I turn this on again and save it and fill out this captcha Q D W Z Z Z B and continue. And now I try to submit this again. Let me try a different job this time. Maybe data scientist. And let us put in a date of birth here. 
and let's click submit and this time the email should be sent successfully okay i can come back here and check the email and let's see back to email and you can see there's a new application for data scientists akashinis at hey.com such and such and the cover letter simply says i train okay so nice i think with that we've basically implemented what we were looking to implement we have implemented uh the the page here as well now of course this is not how we should show it ideally we should create a nice page saying your application has been received maybe let's try to do that as well let me go in here and let me say create a new mustache template called applied dot mustache okay and let me go into my job dot mustache copy over everything from here into applied dot mustache yeah and let me get rid of uh, the form here probably don't need the form and let me simply say in a div your application has been received all right I'll make it look slightly nicer. So let's see what can I do here? Well, let me go into index.mustache. Let me get some styles from my description section just so that it looks slightly nicer. Okay, class lead, this looks good. So let me get that class lead in here. Applied.mustache. Let me give this class container and lead. All right. Okay, so let's try this again. I click submit application or oh, let's also render this template. So instead of saying dot send, I can say dot render and I can simply give it the name of the template I want to render and the name is simply applied. And now if I click submit application, okay, it still says email sent pro I should probably reload. Oh, sorry. I should not render this one. I should render in the other case. So dot render applied. So, and now let's click submit. And you can see that the email has been sent and it also says your application has been received. And of course I can make a few changes here. I can maybe say text center and I can say MT5 and I can also say maybe MB5. So that this is slightly nicer. Uh, so I'll let me go back here. Let me click submit application again. Yeah, I'll have to restart uh, something probably. Oh, I see what's happening. So we actually want to reload the server even when a mustache file is changed. So M U S T A C H E. I'm adding this setting inside nodemon.json so that whenever I change a mustache file, that automatically reloads the server as well. So let me make these MT6 and MB6. Let me go back and submit application. Still, okay, I need to restart Nodemon as well. When you change Nodemon.json, you need to restart Nodemon. Um, or you could just do, you could add JSON as another file that it watches for as well. Okay, but npm, oops, let's run it again. npm run dev. And let me just fix the spelling here. I think there is a small fix it we have three p's here let's do that let's put this in here quotations let's go back and let's click submit application and it says your application has been received okay perfect so with that we have implemented we should have a prop probably a top margin as well it's not showing up just yet uh, but you can always figure that out. Small styling changes, I'll leave that to you as something to do. But with that, we've implemented a nice applied page as well. That's nice. Um, now we want to actually deploy this. So for us to deploy this, of course, we can go in here and we can say um, added templates and dynamic pages and click commit and let's send this. So that's going to go to GitHub and that is going to automatically deploy to Vercel. Uh, however, remember that our .env file is not, is not uh, going to get committed to the GitHub repository, which means if I look back at my GitHub repository over here, 
that is going to contain everything but it's not going to contain the .env file. So when Versal picks up all of this code and tries to deploy it to the cloud, Versal doesn't have my credentials. So I need to give Versal my credentials. Let's go back here into the project, Jobin Express Careers Live, and let us actually see it in action. Okay, work at Jovian, this is all well and good. Full stack developer, all right. Let me put in some information here, Akash NS, A at, at B.com, something like that. And let me put that in here, cover letter, not ready. And let me click submit application. And we're gonna get into this error, error sending email. Obviously because Versal doesn't know the email and password that we need to have, right? So that is where, just like you have environment variables in a .env file for local development, Versal has a settings tab and inside it you can specify some environment variables, okay? So here you need to add in a couple of environment variables and I believe I can probably just paste the contents of an environment variable file. Yeah, but I, I just want to do that securely. So I'm going to go in here and paste my environment variables. So my email ID. Yeah, and I've added them and now I'm going to just save them. Yeah, and now they have been added. So they've been added below. I've added my email ID. I've added my email password and these are stored securely on Versal. And I can add, so the way I basically added this was to say email underscore ID and whatever at whatever.com and I clicked save and that is how these got added. Okay, so now the environment variable, my email ID and password have been added into Vercel and it is going to populate them into process.env and that is going to then get picked up but I just need to do one more deployment to actually send it. So let me just do redeploy and redeploy. It's gonna take a second, it's gonna pick up all the environment variables as well this time and it is going to redeploy this Vercel it's going to redeploy the package or the application. And now let's go back in here. Let's try again. Okay. Full stack developer role. Let's see. Jane Doe. Jane at Doe.com. Like that. And let us just fill that out here. So I've I can zoom this in for you, but yeah, I've simply filled out for the full stack developer. I've simply filled out the application and click submit. And this time it says your application has been received, right? We can add some space above it, but I guess this is fine. I can also then go into gmx.com and let's see, let's just reload this page. This is a very old email service. So you can clearly see that you have to reload things and all, but yeah, Jane Doe, Jane at door.com phone, date of birth, cover letter. Perfect. And with that, we are more or less done. So now we have created our website, which anybody can use. And this is a website that honestly, at this point, we can probably deploy as our careers website. Maybe just change this image to an image of our team. Maybe just update the uh, roles that we have in our, in the repository and then deploy it. Um, but the next step here would be maybe adding some sort of a login system, maybe storing the data in a database and maybe allowing applications also to be stored in the database and so on. So there's a lot you can do here. Now here are a few exercises for you. Create a mustache template apply.mustache. We've already done this but how about apart from saying your application has been submitted you also show what is all the data that the user has filled out. Remember you still have you can pass a variable the you can pass a request body maybe as the application data into the template and you can populate the template and show all the data there. How about you can try modifying the form submission to include the resume as an attachment to the email. So what happens here is you have to use a encryption or a encoding type called multi-part form data. And for that you'll have to use not body parser, but something called Multer. Okay. So Multer is a middleware for handling multi-part form data in Express. All right. So I'll let you check that out as well. Here is another thing you can try to do. Now what might happen is somebody can create a quick script that can uh, open up the page or uh, maybe like some kind of a web scraping script that can open up the page and then just fill out hundreds of applications and then yeah fill out hundreds of applications let me reload that yeah fill out hundreds of applications by simply automating this or clicking the submit button again and again and again and that will lead to hundreds of email over here 
So we want to avoid that. We definitely don't want hundreds of emails. And for that, what you can do is use some kind of a captcha. The, you see that thing where they ask you to select traffic signs and all. It's actually very easy to add. And uh, one one captcha system that you can use, which is actually easier to use than Google's reCAPTCHA, is the Edge captcha system. Okay. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to go in and log in here and you'll have to generate some, you'll have to put some code into the index.html file or whatever uh, HTML you're sending to the browser. You'll have to put some code on the server and you will have to um, then just verify that it works properly. Okay. Now, one good way to do some of these things is to maybe just go on, uh, let's say on Jobot. So jovian.com slash Jobot. And you can ask Jobot, um, show me an example of how to add spam protection using H captcha in an Express.js application. Okay. And just like that, Jobot should be able to tell us exactly what we need to do. So first you need to install the npm install edge captcha package. Then inside your express server file, you need to um, require the edge captcha, edge captcha package. And then what you need to do is a couple of things. One, um, you need to create some captcha HTML and send that into your um, template. And then second, you need to maybe verify the captcha response using captcha.verify from the body, you can get this, get this edge captcha response and verify it. Okay. And that's it, right? Or you can also look at the documentation. So the documentation, there is some documentation for Express.js and here you can check its example and it says something about how you do it. So there are many ways to do it. Um, just look it up. This is a very common use case that people do. And this is again, a common pattern from now going forward that it is impossible for us to just learn or teach or remember all of the various possible things that you can do. From this point on, what you need to do is figure out what you need. For example, I need a captcha, then search online, maybe study the documentation, maybe use chat GPT or Jobot or look at somebody's blog post, understand the code that is there, bring that code into your project because that code is never going to be directly copy pasteable. Bring that code into your project, test it out. And if something goes wrong, check the documentation, repeat the process again. Um, debug things, test it out. And uh, once it works, you're good to go, right? And with that, you now have access to potentially thousands of libraries and thousands of features that you can easily incorporate into your web applications. All right. So I'll allow you to do that. Modify the song, uh, modify, um, yeah, prevent spam and automated submissions by adding human verification using edge capture and use chat GPT or Jobot for help. So here's what we did today. We created uh, and ran a web server using the express web framework, really simple, just a few lines of code. We saw how to serve HTML pages and we saw how to serve uh, static files. And then we also saw how to serve dynamic data using templates where we use the mustache templating engine and we filled in jobs data from a list. It could also have come from a database into the template. We also saw how to use route parameters to create and serve dynamic pages. So we created a job wise application page where we showed the job title, salary, location, etc., at the top of the page and the application form. And then we also accepted form submissions um, on a new route, which was a post route where we passed the request body. We passed the content from the um, form that was submitted. And from there we got the emails. And by the way, if you have a doubt, how did we get to know that the form had this, uh, yeah, if you have a question, how we got to know that the form had had certain keys. Um, so you have these things here. How did we get name, email, phone number? How do we know that these were the actual names of the keys within the form? Well, that is actually present within the form itself. So if you check the form for every input, we specify the name. So name equals name, name equals email, name equals phone, name equals DOB. And that's exactly what we get here. Name, email, phone, DOB. And then there is that last input, which is the cover letter. Name equals cover letter. And that's what we get as a variable cover letter. Okay. So we got all the data from the form and then we created this mail and we use node mailer to configure our settings, our credentials, our credentials were paid post. Our credentials were stored securely in a dot env file read in securely using the dot env library. And then we created a transport. And from that transport, we sent an email. And that email was then visible here. 
on our GMX account. Yeah, so maybe I was just, uh, I got logged out here. But yeah, that was available on our GMX account. So that's how you build a web application, right? This is the most basic version where we're simply using HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We're not using things like React, etc. But this is the core, the core idea is going to remain the same. You have a server, some logic happens on the server, server can connect to the database, server can process requests, server can handle form data, et cetera, et cetera. And then you send some HTML to the client and that along with that HTML, you might have some CSS, you might have some static files. You might actually also have some JavaScript files which get executed only on the client, all right? So all of that is something that you can do as well. Now all the code for the tutorial can be found here. It's all open for you to see. So you can check it out, except of course the credentials themselves. Um, this is the starter code and this is the finished code. So this is all the finished code that you can look at. And this is the finished site that you can check out. And check out these resources to learn more. At this point, you just have to Google things or ask Jobot or ChatGPT. Express.js, documentation, NodeMon, Mustache, Body Parser, HTTP methods, Node Mailer, SMTP, all of that, okay? One exercise I would definitely encourage you to try is to modify the form submission code to include the resume as an attachment to the email. That'll be a very interesting thing for you to try, okay? Now, your objective with this project and with this course really is to be able to build uh, an entire website by yourself from scratch. So you're going to build a personal website using the tools and techniques that we've covered in this course. Okay. Now, of course, this is not a web design course and design is its own uh, entire area that might take several years to perfect. Uh, so that is why I would not recommend trying to design a website from scratch. What you can do is check out the Figma community over here. So this is the Figma community. If you just go to figma.com slash community. So Figma is a design platform, web design platform, and just search for personal website. You should be able to find a bunch of interesting personal website templates that you can use. So uh, for instance, this one looks interesting. Let's take a look at this. And whenever you open up a Figma community project, you can actually go in and you can check out what pages they have provided. So yeah, this is a UI design page and on the UI design page, you can see here that uh, this person has created two versions. So you can use either of these versions. Okay, uh, they, have a, they have a name, then they have uh, a couple of links and a download CV button. And then they have like this hero section. After that, they have their social links. After that, okay, they're talking about some of their services. This is where maybe you could talk about your education, your work experience. Um, then they have maybe uh, some projects that they worked on like this listed here. And then they have maybe some blog posts. So if you have some blog posts that you've written on Medium or elsewhere, you can link those as well. And they uh, again, they have a filter with some social links, right? So you do not have to, and I want to stress this again, you don't have to try to design your own web page. I would not recommend doing that because that's not what this is about. It's about being able to code your own web page in HTML and CSS. Uh, and make it look good, make it responsive, use the tools, libraries, frameworks that we have covered in this course. Here's another example. Again, let's go into this. Uh, so here again, there seems to be this section over here, there is a nav bar and then a bunch of links here. So it's not that you will use these exact same links in your project. What you are going to do is you're going to replace it with some of the links or some of the items that make sense for you. And there's this hero section, you can probably put up your own picture here. And then there is uh, a bunch of services, there's an about section, there's a bunch of project sections, a bunch of cards here, and then uh, just more things here, right? So it's again, you don't have to use all of this, you can just use some of this, then there's a contact form here as well, and so on. So I just want to go over some guidelines here. So there's no tutorial here as such for this, because I want you to just try and do this on your own. This is the first open-ended endeavor in terms of web development. So there's not a lot of step-by-step -step instructions. It's a bit open-ended for you. So go out, check out the Figma community, check out Dribble, find a good design that you feel you can implement. Then here are some requirements that your website needs to satisfy. Now, of course, feel free to do as much as you want. Feel free to go as deep as you want in, and as um, broad in terms of the kind of content you want to incorporate. But the, the key things that you need to keep in mind is this, that your website should contain at least two pages. 
and I would recommend these pages can be home and contact or if you want to spread them out into multiple pages if you want to have home as one page and then maybe projects as another page or one page per project or something like that you can do that as well or if you want to incorporate a blog of some kind into your website you can do that as well but for the purpose of this project we require your website to have two pages all right uh, not more you can have more than that but at least make sure that you have two not one will not do second the home page should have at least four sections and by section we mean so and that excludes the nav bar so this is one section you can see here this sec there is a section called um this is generally called the hero section because well this is where you kind of put a put a picture and just say some say something with big text this is just welcoming people then you have maybe a you can have maybe a work experience section you can have maybe a project section if you don't have a lot of projects you can have maybe an education section or something like that uh, and then finally or you can just talk about your career and finally maybe you can have a footer you can have maybe just like uh, a, a small note about yourself maybe just sharing your uh, basic your, your life journey so far or some just something very basic that would be informative for a potential employer so when you go out later down in the boot camp and you go on and apply for a full stack developer role and you share the link to your website so keep in mind that what do you want people to see when they click on the website link in your resume you now what is it that you want to say to them right you want to present you want to tell your story very briefly just like you do on a linkedin profile for instance and you want to present some interesting work and you want to showcase that you have what it takes to build good uh, good looking responsive websites okay then the website should contain at least one form and i would recommend this it could be a contact form so you can maybe if you have a contact page on the contact page you can have a contact form or you can have a if you're if you don't have a contact page you have a different page for something else then you can maybe just create a form for uh, on the home page itself but make sure that it, it has at least one form with maybe at least three or four fields typically they would be email name uh, your your message or something like that and uh, i would recommend that as you browse a few of these examples and we have included several examples here start by first creating an a wireframe because that is what we have been doing so far right so follow that procedure of creating a wireframe even if you've picked a design because you're not going to implement a design exactly right you are going to change the design or you're going to pick the content that is going to make more sense for you for your website so start by uh, just after having selected some design or after having just figured out what you want to show start by first creating a wireframe so that you can figure out what content you want to put on the page right so for instance is if i were creating my uh, personal web my personal website i would maybe let's see so let's say i were creating akashanis.com that is my that would be i would probably get that domain and that is my personal website and here what would i like to put so well i would like to definitely have a nav bar at the top and in the nav bar i would want to mention my name i would want to mention uh maybe like the home link and maybe let's see i would like to mention a contact page link something like that right and then all after the nav bar i would want to have maybe a quick hero section let me just put in that information here and then we'll draw the wireframe so a, a hero section and in the hero section i will probably have maybe a photo uh, maybe a, a heading like a big title hi i'm akash or something like that and maybe a subtitle let me just call it title and subtitle right something like that so that would be the hero section then maybe i would have an about section in the about section i would uh, create a short bio something like hey i'm akash i'm from such i'm from india i live in bangalore i do this i do that i've done this in the past etc thanks for checking out my website feel free to contact me right something like that so uh, that would be good then i would probably want to include maybe my uh, projects because i think that would be the most interesting thing that i would want to showcase all the interesting things that i've worked on over the years so um, i have a bunch of uh, like android apps websites uh, courses etc i would mention those um, then maybe i would want to let's see i would want to maybe talk a little bit about my um, career 
right so in this i would probably mention my education and i would probably combine education and uh, work experience because i've just had one job full time job and after that i've just worked as a consultant and and so on so yeah education work experience etc uh, so i would do that then i would probably just uh, have a footer and here i would put some social links okay, i don't have social links but uh, i would probably put like some external links so like jovian uh, jovian links etc right and maybe i might also have one section here where i might highlight some of my best uh, work in terms of videos so like uh, add some youtube videos like that all right so that would be what i would want to put so then what i would do is i would try to create two wireframes i would try to create one wireframe for mobile and one wire one wireframe for desktop so i would just put it like that maybe and i would say okay this is my desktop wireframe and this is my mobile wireframe all right and then as you can imagine i'm basically gonna just put a bunch of boxes here okay so this is going to be my nav bar and i can just fill in some information into my nav bar and again you can do this on paper i'm just showing this to you here on this uh, tool excaledraw.com uh, but you can do this on paper absolutely fine so that would be the nav bar and then i would have a hero section here so i would kind of leave some space for the hero section here is where i would put the title something like hi i'm akash like that and often when i'm doing this i would even just pre-draw so i would maybe just do something like that that okay maybe here i want to put like a, a a picture of myself saying hi or something and maybe have like a couple of lines of uh, uh, introduction about myself here i might want to again mention my name here i want to say home contact something like that then i have the about section so that would be something like about me and then i would have maybe a few few lines of text about myself uh, i could also maybe put a picture on the side but i think that's fine so then after the about section i would probably then go down and then uh, create a project section and that's where it's a good opportunity to create use some cards maybe so let's see projects and i would probably just put a bunch of cards here uh like that maybe three cards or so and then i would maybe just put a button saying view more and maybe there could be a separate projects page that goes in there and uh, yeah feel free to get as detailed or as rough as you need but uh, the idea is you want to lay out all the content that you want to add here so so that when you are actually implementing you don't really have to think about what content do i want to put here right um then okay we have videos so i would probably put in some videos here so let's see videos again i would probably just embed a couple of youtube videos here like that and maybe have a line describing what projects what, what videos i've done uh, and so on and then i would adapt it to uh, the mobile view so in the mobile view of course you would have a slightly different structure maybe you would not you would need a like a menu over here instead of an actual buttons so i would probably have that menu button over here i would probably take this hello uh, you might also want to take a picture uh, a, a new picture for your personal website it, it would be nice but yeah i would probably take this like hello thing and i'd probably just put that here and then the hero text would probably become centered and that would come here like that and then i would have the about me section i think this would remain as is so you get the idea that you want to have one uh, breakpoint for mobile you want to have one breakpoint uh, for tablet and one for desktop but if you want you can just do mobile and desktop wireframing and you you will kind of know that okay this i'm going to get from this so, it's, so the styles i'm going to get from here but the content and what i'm going to write here all of that you can actually put into your wireframe i'm not putting it right now because it'll take a while but you can actually put all this into your wireframe or maybe into a google doc or something uh, but the idea is before you even start writing your first line of html you are in a position where you already know what's the what the page is going to look like the the biggest mistake that you're going to make and i'll repeat this again is that you start coding right away and then you're thinking okay what should i put in this section and then you as you're trying to put something into the section you realize okay now the design is no longer working or now uh, i'm not able to make it responsive so separate the design content and implementation okay um yeah so then once you've created a wireframe then uh, create you know and once you pick the design for inspiration 
then create it section by section and the website must be responsive and it should be easily viewable on mobile on tablet and on desktop okay so make sure to test it on real devices and make sure of course you can deploy it to Vercel. you can open it up you can send yourself a link and test it now you can use bootstrap or you can use any other css framework you want to build the website if you want you can do it without bootstrap feel free uh, this is an open-ended project we are not forcing you to use bootstrap you, you don't have to but if you want you can uh, use bootstrap that's fine uh, or you want to use some other uh, css framework that's perfectly fine too now for the form that you create you can either use formbold.com to collect the responses using uh, and we've covered this in one of the lessons probably i, I believe the second lesson or you can set up an express server, uh, an express web server to collect form responses. So again, this is covered in the previous lesson. So in the lesson express web application framework, you can see here that we have a section on handling form responses where we basically used, uh, we created an app.post link. So you can do that as well. Uh, both of these can be deployed to Vercel equally easily. So that's fine. You don't have to use Express for this. You can do a simple HTML and CSS if you want. That's perfectly fine. But uh, yeah, as a challenge, I would encourage you to maybe try, try out using Express. That will also help you practice templates and other things. Then uh, use consistent and aesthetically pleasing colors, fonts, and design elements. So one of the things, even though we are not focusing on web design too much in this course, one of the things we've tried to do is make sure that our websites that we build don't look ugly, uh, which means that they don't have a very poor or not poor exactly, but uh, they do not have a very well, uh, they don't have a thoughtless or, or, or a random choice of colors, right? The default colors that CSS gives you are not great. Uh, ideally, you want to use a color palette and that's where we have looked at things like Tailwind, uh, tailwind colors it's a good place for you to pick out uh, yeah tailwindcolor.com so you you want to use a color palette you want to have one primary color and you want to use different shades of that primary color if blue is not your thing pick green or pick rose or pick red but definitely stick to a color palette and similarly fonts as well you want to be consistent with fonts feel free to experiment here feel free to try different fonts but ideally stick to one font for headings and one font for body now that doesn't mean that it has to be inter and roboto like if i go back here on the figma community you can see that here you know, there's an interesting font that is used for the uh, for the header here and that's uh, what's called a what's called a serif font and in fact it's not just serif font it has slight slight calligraphic elements as well Whereas there is a different set of uh, the different font that is actually used for the body text. All right. And then there's this uppercase font that is used here as well. So feel free to experiment. You can use two, maybe three fonts, but make sure that it stays consistent across the page. It shouldn't be the case where you use a certain font in the nav bar, then you use a certain font in the header, uh, the hero section, then you use a certain font in the about section. Please don't do that. Please uh, keep it consistent. I hope you've picked that up. And similarly with design elements as well, like if you want to spray in design elements here and there, for example, here, there are these dots that are there. Um, you'll have to figure out how to actually add these design elements, but for all these design elements, keep them consistent. Like this arrow you see here, that arrow is there everywhere. Or you see this highlight here, that highlight is there everywhere as well. So um, yeah, make sure that you are staying consistent in all of these in terms of the design. That is the key. Even if it is a very simple black and white kind of page with, with maybe just one color here and there, consistency is key. So make sure of that. Now you need not replicate a design exactly. Just try to make your site look good. Just try to make it look consistent. Just try to make it look well spaced out. And finally, your website should be deployed to Vercel. And again, there are no instructions here. By this time, you should be familiar with the deployment process. So you should have to create a GitHub repository, keep it open source, keep it public. And um, then you deploy it to Vercel. And optionally, if you want, you can also connect a custom domain to it. So you can go ahead and actually uh, on Vercel.com, if you go into domain settings, I'll let you figure it out, but you go into domain settings and you can add a custom domain so you can purchase a domain. I think some cheap domains are, uh, let's see. So I, I believe like dot XYZ domains are very cheap. So let me, if I, let me just search for Akash and his dot XYZ. Um, I think that's about, 
164 rupees, that's about uh, less than $2 a year, right? So $2 a year is not that bad. But uh, so you can buy it for a buy it for a year if you want. But this is not a compulsory part of the um, uh, this is not a compulsory part of the project. Even if it's deployed to Versal, that's perfectly fine. Even if it's akashness.versal.app, that's completely okay. No problem there. Now, uh, one thing I just want to suggest is make sure that you know, as you copy over things from different sites, you might find that there is some content there and you might just put that content directly. Uh, make sure that all the information on the website is true and accurate. That is key because the, uh, we want you to be able to actually use this website. This is not just a project that you're creating. We want this to be a website that you can use, that you can update over time as you work on the uh, through the rest of the bootcamp and you should be able to link it from your resume, right? So you want it to be informative for your potential employer, uh, but at the same time, you also want it to demonstrate your skills. So finding that balance is the key here. Again, it's more open-ended. I am, um, we do not intentionally don't want to give you like a set pattern that you can follow here. We want you to encounter these challenges. We want you to uh, like look into these constraints and figure out what is the right balance for you, okay? And for the project specifically, I would highly recommend scheduling at least one one-on-one -on -one call, maybe two. So once once you once you've created a wireframe, once you know what your website is going to contain, and once you maybe pick the design as a reference, maybe schedule a one-on-one -on -one call just to have a chat, just to kind of go over the content itself, right? And then the second thing that you should do after that is once you have implemented the website and made it responsive, maybe you can get one get on one on one call with one of us again to get inputs on uh, what further improvements you can make to your website. Okay, so those are the two things that I would uh, that I would suggest you should do. Okay, so here are some examples for inspiration. Let's go over some of these examples very quickly. Um, you can search for more on Dribble or the Figma community. Just search for personal website and you'll find hundreds of examples. Okay. So let's see. There is this one. This one is, yeah, this one is one that we already looked at, but let's take a closer look at this. So here, okay, it says, Hi, I'm Saklan. I'm a web and app designer. I design beautiful websites. And of course, you can imagine putting a picture here. There's a nice uh, uh, nav bar here at the top. Then latest work, so it's put like you can refashion this as an about section. Of course, you can just put um, uh, about me, and then you can just write a few things here. Uh, and then again, okay, what I do? Okay, so this is more like the about section. Want to work? So there's not a lot here. There's like three sections. Maybe you might want to add another section here, or maybe just reuse one of these. So again, this is not. Uh, it's not like something that you can use directly. You might have to make slight changes to it. Here is one. This is something that we uh, used for assignment one. Feel free to use it if you like it. I would not suggest using this because you will not be learning enough in the process, but this is a good template as well. So you can definitely uh, use this for inspiration in terms of how to structure your website if you don't end up using this exact, um, if you don't end up using this exact template itself. Okay, let's take a look at this then. Yeah, this one also looks pretty interesting. It has some interesting fonts as well. So again, let's see. Yeah, there it is. So now you can put a logo here or you can just put your name here and here the nav bar here is at the in the in the center and then there's a contact button. Um, then, okay, hello, I'm Zaror. And, and then there's some information. There's an email and CV download button. Okay, there are a bunch of logos of uh, his favorite tools. I think that is a good thing you can put in. Four plus years of experience and here, okay, there is some information here. There's a code. This could also be an about me and let's connect. Yeah, so four sections uh, and of course, you may have to think about what content you're going to put here, but again, a good one. Let's see what's up here. Yeah, Stephen William, UI UX designer. Again, there's a bunch of uh, interesting stuff going on here. So let's see, final design. There are four sections. So there's of course the hero section. Um, it has this nice thing on the side. That's also interesting. Then um, yeah, these are projects. So maybe you can put some projects here and you can link to them as you work through the bootcamp. Um, you can maybe link to some, some of your GitHub repositories here. 
then okay these are also like projects so you could use maybe this one as about this one as projects or something and then this one just as a quote or something you want to convey to the person seeing it and then this is like the footer so this is nice and then let's see a couple more yeah this one is very detailed you don't necessarily have to use uh, all of these sections but again use it more for inspiration so you can see how it goes i think this is a great example of how it goes from um yeah how it goes from like a basic design setup here to something that is more interesting here with a hero section and some articles and some projects and things like that okay so great uh, if you want to add a blog feel free to add a blog uh, into your website and blog would simply be a couple of pages for now i like this one this one is really simple let's see yeah so this one doesn't have a lot of images this is basically this hello section over here then this is what i do where to find my work about me and schedule a concert this could probably go on a second page and that's it there's this bottom over here right uh, yeah a couple of real websites i want to point out so one you can check out the website for ashish uh, ashish is a senior software engineer jovian again this is a very different style and this is a sort of a very minimal approach here but i think it covers everything uh, it it has a it's very text heavy it's sort of more structured like a resume but it's great it does the job and for a developer it actually might be a good thing the font used here is a monospace font so that's again an interesting choice of font uh, but again for a programmer that is something that might make sense and then there's a link to a blog here and then so again these these open into different uh, other websites so that's fine there's a project section there's an achievements yeah so this is more structured like a cv and that's perfectly fine it's your personal website you uh, give it your personality uh, just as long as you are satisfying the requirements that we have laid out here that is perfectly fine here's another personal website you can check out um, so this is akansha she is or was a graduate student pursuing masters in uh, data science so here she has a home page where she has a picture she has this uh, about section and uh, she has a bunch of links and then she has a project section where she has like a bunch of cards uh, showing her projects right and this is great because it um it it simply shows you that okay there you go to this site you learn enough about this person and you can go into the project section and then you can check out okay this person has done a lot of interesting work and i probably want to like as a potential employer i probably want to uh, talk to this person then um here's another one another like a lot of people take a more text heavy approach and that's perfectly fine again i want to stress that this is your website so this is andre karpathy he is a researcher at open ai um so before that he was working at tesla so he has this simple website where he has a timeline of his work and after that he has some featured talks or um that he has given over the years and then a little a section about teaching a section about writing uh, and in this case yeah the the blog actually opens on a different site and that's perfectly fine a bunch of pet projects and publications etc right so again great it's all and then the bunch of social links here as well so perfectly fine uh, this works too so i want to say that don't limit yourself to the kind of websites that you see on figma or on dribble uh, go feel free to go a little um wider in terms of your search feel free to just uh, look at personal websites of uh, people uh, you generally tend to follow you can generally find them on their twitter you can find them on their uh, on their linkedin for project or elsewhere one other good source for a bunch of these uh, sites is just going on youtube and searching personal website html css and you will find here okay this looks interesting that looks interesting that looks these three look somewhat similar i would say but still uh, this looks pretty interesting this one uh, this one over here is also good um yeah this is also interesting this has got some this one looks pretty slick i mean it's got that whole cyberpunk theme going on and uh, it's also a tutorial so you can actually probably even follow along with this and again it's fine if you are uh, referring to a tutorial a little bit so let's take a look at this this one's got uh, got a few animations as well so let me just play this yeah so this is what this website looks like at the end of all of this development i believe this is implemented in react but it doesn't have to be 
So it's got a, a bunch of animations. It got it's got a bunch of colors over here. Uh, it's got this nice bottom sticky bottom bar. Um, let's just watch the entire demo over here. It's got a portfolio link. It's got a bunch of social links. It's got this nice image which is cut out in a random shape over here. It's got this nice about section. There's some uh, animation going on here as well. There's an animation on the buttons too. Then there's a more detailed section. What I do again, this could be projects as well, possibly. Let's keep going. And yeah, these are like some latest projects. So that and then probably there's at the end, I believe there is a contact form somewhere. Yeah. So again, you don't have to add any animations, but if you want to, you can. And uh, there are often you can use a bunch of like CSS or JavaScript helper libraries to implement animations. Bootstrap itself also allows you to create some animations. The reason we don't cover animation in a beginner course is because most websites will not require any animation or you'll end up just using some prepackaged library. Uh, but if you want to add animations, please feel free. Uh, we're not stopping you. So one tip I want to give you very important tip is that you can go beyond the scope of work as uh, that is described above. You don't have to limit yourself to this. However, make sure to first implement everything that we've mentioned above. So first do a first pass and implement just the bare minimum. Just implement everything that we've done before going too heavy on, let's say, creating five pages and all that. So first create a basic version that satisfies the evaluation criteria. Make a submission here and only then continue building on top of it. Very important. You have to do this iteratively because if you keep expanding the scope of your website, you will be stuck on the first page or the first section forever and you will never actually and, and you'll be trying to animate the first section the hero part of it and all that and you'll be just stuck on that for days right so do the basic version make a submission we'll give you feedback as well um, and then continue adding whatever else you want to add okay uh, we started out by looking at html and css basics um, so here we just understood html css the very basic foundations of uh, uh, web development so we wanted to create our first web page and creating a first web page. What we really wanted to do was we wanted to create a Jovian jobs website, which we kept building and, uh, and improving over the course of uh, the several lessons. And we just wanted to have a nav bar, a header section, displaying a picture, a list of job openings and a footer at the bottom. Uh, and that for just for that, what we did was we uh, created a folder on our desktop. We opened up Visual Studio Code. We added just some HTML code to it that showed us our first web page. And then we understood how tags work. Then we uh, created some important tags like HTML, head, body, title, etc. Then uh, we added some div tags with some content. Um, then we had created a wireframe. So we decided that, okay, we need to maybe first create a wireframe like this. So this is where it all started. Uh, okay, we wanted to have a nav bar, we wanted to have this header image, we want to have an about section, job opportunities and a footer. Then we added some content uh, using HTML. So again, we added a bunch of headings like this. Then we added some text and paragraphs. So then start things started looking a little better. Of course, it's still basic content, then we added some lists. So we created a list for uh, let's see, we created a list here, an ordered list and an unordered list here for the footer. Then we added some links. So after adding some links, this is what our page looked like. Then we added some images. So we added an image here at the top and image here below. And uh, this is what our page looked like without any CSS. Then we went ahead and added some CSS. So we started centering things. We started adding some image styles. So we learned how CSS declarations work. We have some selectors and then we have a property and a value and we can put it inside the style tag. We can put it in a CSS file or we can use the style uh, attribute. Then uh, we looked at the different ways to select a tag an ID a class and we understood the CSS box model where we have some content padding border margin and then we implemented the wireframe. So we started by adding some basic styles. So just adding styles to the body, then adding the nav bar. Uh, with a Jovian logo, then adding the banner image, the about section, the jobs, the footer, and this is ultimately what our first web page looked like, right? So once we did all of that, this is what our first web page looked like. And then we deployed it to the cloud using this platform called static.app. Not something that you would do in production, but it works for our first web page. 
and that was that was our first web page and that was not too bad for a first web page uh, but this is something that we then kept in in improving on over the next several lessons so in the second lesson was advanced html and css and this time we just wanted to iteratively improve the existing web page by adding and modifying sections we want to learn how to work with tables how to add forms how to how to work with colors in css how to um, save how to use meta tags all of that so again we uh, basically just uh, and we learned about the iterative method and this is something that you should try to apply to your own personal website development as well try to get the first version out in one day and maybe then take the second version out everything is something that should be deployed and that is why we may, we also focus on deployment from the beginning your website should be live from day one and you should just keep adding more information to it instead of saying okay i'm still working on it i'm still working on it i'm still working on it. i'm gonna i'm gonna put, take it live tomorrow or next week or, or something like that don't do that uh, just take it live with whatever minimal content you can and just keep improving it so here's what we decided that we're going to add this job opportunities table and then we are going to add a form here as well and uh, then we learn about tables in html and how to create complex tables like this using the table tr and td tags we learned about using um, the border attribute to make sure and collapsing the border so that it looks something like that and then once we had the table okay so that's a table without borders and then we saw how to style html tables so again we can uh, add a bunch of borders we can add a bunch of background colors we can add a bunch of text styles so just with a few lines of css our table looked a lot better and then we decided that we want to merge some rows and columns make things look a little nicer so we uh, learned about row span call span and things like that and this is what our table ultimately looked like then we learn about text styles in CSS. So every website, every company has a personality and part of that personality is the fonts they use. So to use external fonts, we use uh, Google fonts. And again, I encourage you to experiment with fonts, but just pick two or maximum of three fonts, one for maybe headings, one for subheadings or things like that, and one for the body text. Um, and make sure that those fonts pair well together. And there are a bunch of resources here that you can check out for finding good font pairings. We at Jovin, we use Inter and Roboto as a heading and body. Uh, probably a slightly boring choice, but it does the job. Um, maybe at some point we'll update that, but there are a bunch of pretty interesting pairings that you can check out here, okay? So part of building your personal website is going back and reviewing all the resources that we've shared with you and figuring out something that is um, that interests you, but at the same time, that also looks good, okay? Um, so yeah, so then there we learned about a bunch of font and text related properties. We learned about understanding sizes in CSS. So there are absolute sizes. Pixels are the most common. These are not really used. And the relative sizes, again, percentages and rems are the most common. Others are not really used too commonly. But in any case, you have a bunch of these uh, sizes that you can use as well. I really want to stress again that feel free to go back and refer to specific sections we've put we've put in a lot into these lectures like these are things that you'll keep probably referring back to for months probably even years as you're going through uh, the rest of the bootcamp and also your web development uh, uh, job all right uh, okay then we have yeah text sizes and style guidelines again we have a bunch of things over here then we talked about colors in css so there are a bunch of inbuilt colors they are not very good for actual web design. So I would not recommend using these inbuilt colors and in general, you want to avoid something that is too bright or too dark or too grayish. Uh, it looks very nineties. Uh, you want to use something that something that has like, uh, these are called pastels or something that is slightly dull, but at the same time also has, a. Uh, also has an interesting shade to it, right? So these ones, uh, the, uh, the yeah, all of these slate green, sea green, all of these are interesting. Um, but really what you should be doing is using a color palette using some platform like uh, Tailwind colors or something. So then we have RGB colors. So you can of course specify inbuilt color names. You can use RGB background RGB values. You can use hexadecimal, which is basically another, another short way of writing RGB where the first two characters represent red, the next two characters represent green and blue and it goes from 00 to ff that's why it's called hexadecimal so 0 to 9 and a to f uh, all of these are used to create numbers essentially you can learn more about the hexadecimal number system if you need you can also add transparency to your colors whether you're using rgba or you're using hexadecimal 
and colors can be set for the uh, text colors can be set for the background for the border for the box shadow and and much more by the way backgrounds can also be images so that's also something that you can check out like this one here as a background image not a great choice but you can see the difference between a good consistent color scheme and fonts and a good contrast between the text and the background versus uh, a, a good contrast versus bad um, definitely your personal website shouldn't look like this so i just want to stress here that it's very the reason a lot of the old websites look like this or poor uh, poorly designed websites look like this is because this is what your website will naturally look like if you are thinking on the fly versus if you have looked up a template if you have decided a color palette if you've picked good fonts colors you have frozen all these details before you're actually coding it then your website is more likely to look like this okay um so yeah so just keep that in mind then these are all some color text color guidelines again not it's not fixed but you can use these as a reference so almost always you want to start out with some standard reference something that is some somebody has figured out is a good set of selections and then make sw slight tweaks to it to uh, do what you want it to do um so yeah once we apply all these uh, then we get back a pretty good looking site and then we have forms as well so forms are created using the form tag and through the input tag select tag text area tag and we also use the label tag so every form has an action and again this could be an external website this could be maybe a server endpoint you have implemented and a method uh, but you create divs and inside the divs you create these labels and you have a bunch of different types of inputs text checkbox radio drop down text area password email etc and once you've put in a form then um, you can style it you can give it a bunch of different styles and this is what a form might potentially look like okay and then there's a action and a method and a target so in this case well uh, we used form bold because we were not talking about servers early on so you can just use any service that can receive form responses form bold is a good one useful one uh, in case you don't have the option or the time to set up a proper server and we simply pass its action method etc and it can collect whatever we needed to collect and then we have uh, html meta tags meta tags provide information about a web page to search engines and browsers so when your website is searched online and google finds it and shows it in a search result that is when all these meta tags will come into picture okay so these are some common meta tags and these are some platform specific meta tags and then there's a title and fav icon tag that are used to change the browser title and fav icon so that's again something that you can um, set up as well right so you should you can literally just take this set of meta tags paste it into any website that you're building i think one uh, requirement we should we will add in the project is that it should have your website should have proper meta tags um so that it can be shared easily by with other people as well and then cloud deployment again we were still talking about uh, static app be here because we had not touched on git and github so that was lesson two and then you had an assignment where you had to convert a design mock-up into a web page so you had this design mock-up and what you did was you had to inspect it using figma then you had to set up a basic page structure and styles this is the mock-up over here you have to set up the basic page structure and styles then you have to implement the web page section by section then you have to deploy your web page to the cloud and make a submission all right um a few tips avoid copy pasting styles directly from figma so there's a knowledge base article on this and we've also picked up a bunch of common mistakes and put them into this google drive folder so again use these go back and refer to all of these for your personal website as well your goal should be to get a pass grade on your first submission and for you to get a pass grade on your first submission make sure that you're not repeating the mistakes that you or other people have made okay um that was the first assignment then we talked about version control and cloud deployment the proper uh way to do web development and that is where we talked about git and github so we started by just getting started with github uh, we learned about what version control is how it is useful we learned about git uh, where you basically you put your code on a remote server and then you can pull it into any computer or maybe a cloud computer like github code spaces and you can make some changes and then you can push it back and still have all the older versions available and you can also view it from the browser uh, on github.com and you can also collaborate with other people right so again there's a lot git itself is a huge thing that for years people um 
keep learning or just try to manage through uh, just running a few simple commands. That's what I do. I just remember three or four commands and use them all the time and look things up whenever I require. But this is the basic structure of what Git gives you. And GitHub gives you a bunch of abilities on top of uh, Git. It is basically a web based platform that also gives you some collaboration tools. Uh, it's where you can find open source projects. It has a wide community and it has great integration with other tools. Right? And, and for a web developer, their GitHub profile is kind of like their resume. So we'll talk at some point about actually creating your own GitHub uh, readme uh, profile as well. Okay, we'll cover that at some point. So here, yeah, yeah, we talked about how to create a project repository and then you have these things called a readme and a git ignore. We talked about them as well and a license as well, especially if you're building an open source project. And once a project repository is created, we talked about how you can open it up using GitHub code spaces, a cloud based development environment with a free tier that allows you to write test and debug code directly in your browser. Quick to set up gives you a consistent environment. You don't have to install anything, lets you work from anywhere. And Starting a code base is really easy. You just click the code button and click create code space. And that's how you can create a code space. And it gives you this visual studio code interface in the browser, which honestly is good enough. That's what I've been using for a bunch of uh, projects that I've been working on. And uh, you don't even need to install anything on your computer and you can install extensions within this VS code browser and they will remain there the next time you try to open it. Uh, so we at Jovian have almost all completely shifted to GitHub code spaces. Uh, we still do use our local machines because the free uh, tier is not sufficient for some of our work. Uh, that's why. Um, yeah, and then you can run it using a live server. So especially when you're developing a simple HTML and CSS web page, you can just use a live server to run things. And then get a, updating a GitHub repository is fairly straightforward. It's a three step process, uh, but there are buttons to do it in one step, but you just first add files and stage them. And then you commit them and then you push them, right? So each of them has a certain purpose, a reason they were built. Um, but what you should just remember is that all these stages are important for your code to actually reach the GitHub cloud repository. All right. So make sure that you are always going to add push and then add commit and then push. So add is going to stage your changes. Commit is going to record a new version and push is going to push it to GitHub and then somebody else can pull it. And there are ways to just do this using uh, visual studio code so that you don't have to run anything on your end. Then cloud deployment with Vercel was again a breeze. All you do is sign up on Vercel.com and you connect your GitHub account. Then you select the repository that you want to deploy and you select the folder inside which your actual code is present that uh, that needs to be deployed and it's going to deploy it for you and it's going to look something like this. So this was actually the website that we deployed and um, yeah, that still looks fine. It's, it's going to be there. So you're going to have all these old versions of your websites or uh, for each repository. Vercel is free. It has a good, a huge, uh, basically an un unlimited free tier unless you start hitting significant amounts of traffic at which point it will make sense for you to pay anyway. And finally, once again, we just cover tag talked about meta tags. So meta tags are pretty important because you want to be able to share your work with other people. And when you share it, it's kind of the cover for your book. Uh, if the website is your, if your website is the book, then the meta tags, which is the meta title and image are the cover and books are judged by the cover. So similarly, websites are judged by their meta tags. All right. And then the, we talked about the GitHub collaboration workflow when multiple people are working on a repository, the way you should work is create a branch. Then you should create a, uh, make your changes on the branch by making a bunch of commits like that. Then you should create a pull request where somebody from your team can, or even just you yourself can review the changes. And then you can, based on the comments, you can make, uh, you can update your branch and keep pushing more changes. And finally, you can just merge, uh, the you merge your branch to the main branch. And just like that, your changes will then get deployed automatically if you're using a deployment platform like Vercel, right? So whenever you're doing any new development and this you should try to apply to your website as well. Once you've pushed out the first version, then for the second version, make sure that you create a branch and then you keep pushing your changes into a branch and uh, keep updating a pull request. And when you've done enough work that you feel it's ready to again go live, then push it back. Okay. So Try practice, uh, practice using the GitHub workflow here, the GitHub flow for your work. Um, it's also again, just good practice. And it's something that you can talk about when you are, um, let's say when you're sitting in an interview, you can mention that when I built my personal website, I used the GitHub flow. So first I created a simple 
a page with just my picture and a few lines about me and then I deployed it to Vercel and then I created a new branch and on that branch I added a project section, I um, created a pull request, I tested it, I reviewed my own code and only then I merged it back and then I updated and I, I did that three, four more times to add multiple things to my website, okay? So try to do that, try to follow the GitHub flow for sure and it will help you. Then creating pull requests, well pull requests are uh, again, uh, there's a flow here then keeping your branch up to date. So sometimes the master branch and the main branch will go forward. So you'll have to pull those changes back into your branch and all that. This makes more uh, sense when you are working in a team where there are actually other people working in as well and you might run into merge conflicts, so you might have to fix them. Uh, not something that you have to know by heart or not something that you will be doing on a daily basis but you can always come back whenever you want to review this topic so there are a bunch of resources here that you can check out okay regarding merge conflicts and regarding uh, branching of course git can also be installed locally so if you're up for a not a challenge ex exactly but if you want to put in the work to actually set up git locally uh, you can go ahead and do it i wouldn't say that this is necessary anymore because either your company will be using something like github code spaces or they will give you a laptop with with all of these things pre-installed so i wouldn't worry too much about it okay but all the information is here and you can always look it up whenever you need to so feel free to come back to all of this whenever you need to look into it then we talked about responsive design and flexbox so this is now we got to a point where we want to make our websites look good not just on our desktop development screen but also on mobile screens so this is where uh, we wanted to create, um, so we saw that our, the website that we had created doesn't really look very good on mobile and we wanted to create the website, we want to make it more responsive and to do that, well first we duplicated the GitHub repository that we had and we, then we deployed it once again, opened it on GitHub code spaces and we learned that for responsive design we have to break up our design into three or maybe at least two but maybe three or four uh, different designs and at each breakpoint, which is at each device width, the layout will change a little bit. So here you can see that at now uh, for small screens, the layout looks like this. And then suddenly at about 576 pixels, the layout is going to shift into this. And then the layout is going to shift into this at 768 and at 992 it's going to shift into something else, right? So this is a very common pattern. Almost all websites follow it and any websites made in the last 10 years will, will follow it. Now to enable it though you need this meta tag this is often something that is forgotten so make sure you do that again a lot of these instructions are not necessarily given on the project page but you'll have to go back and see uh, how to make these happen okay so it's also a way for you to review all the content you have device mode on your browser using which you can test the responsive or the responsive layout of a website and uh, you can a great way to just see how other websites are achieving responsive design is to just open them up on device mode and see what they do now the way responsive design is implemented is using css media queries where you can provide at media you can provide a media type and a condition and when the condition is met for example if you say min width 768 so if the condition min width of 768 is met so when the condition holds true then these css rules apply otherwise uh, these css rules don't apply all right so here are some examples min width and you can also do it on orientation you can also combine min width and max width like that so that way you can define specific rules for different windows of uh, width however the better way to do it so that's how you set you can set breakpoints but the better way to do it is use, use a mobile first approach which is first write all your css queries or, or your uh, create your design for mobile and then add maybe for small or, or for tablets add a min width breakpoint and add some additional CSS rules that can go on top of that and then for your tablets and laptops add some more rules by setting min width 768 and so on right so you want to ensure that you don't have to repeat a lot of the layout uh, design uh, and you want to start building from mobile first so use this for your personal website as well uh, use a mobile first approach so start with the mobile design and then add these breakpoints or you can use bootstrap to do it uh, but whichever way you choose to do it this is uh, how you should achieve it then we also talked about a flexbox because as browsers resize you cannot exactly know what size you should build for so you should not you should never hard code your widths but to keep your proportions constant you can use css flexbox and again there is a bunch of things in css flexbox so the first thing is you have to uh, set the display property now of course the block inline inline block are some of the basic display properties but display flex enables flexbox and display none uh, hides the element altogether 
So Flexbox has this concept of containers and items. So there's a flex container and then there are a bunch of flex items. Now, uh, as soon as you said display flex, then the container um, or the items are laid out along uh, according to the rules of CSS Flexbox. And then you can give a bunch of properties to items as well. So some are container level properties, some are item level properties. One is the flex direction, which is where things flow from left to right or right to left or top to bottom or bottom to top. So this is done using row, row reverse, column, column reverse. Then you have wrapping. So again, uh, things will by default just go out. But if you say no wrap, then they're going to try and fit or compress. Um, you can say wrap down so they can wrap downwards and you can say wrap reverse and they can wrap upwards like that. Okay. Um, so again, these change based on the flex direction. So you might have to just also uh, play around with it. But in most cases, you just want to do the simplest thing. Some of these more advanced uh, options never actually get used or they get used simply when you're trying to achieve a fairly advanced layout, which doesn't really come up very often. So then you have justify content. So along the main axis, do you want things to be at the start, at the center or at the end, or maybe you want to be spaced, uh, you want space around them, you want space between them, or you want even spacing. Or, uh, and of course, for uh, flex direction column, it's going to be different. Then you have align items and that applies along the cross axis. So again, if the flex direction is row, do you want things to be sticking to the top, sticking to the bottom, uh, be at the center or stretch to take up the entire space or maybe align according to the baseline. So that is something that you can look at as well. Then you can change the alignment at a child level as well. So let's say you have an alignment setting at the parent level. You can actually modify that setting for a particular child using the align self property. And you also have something called align content justify items. I've almost never used them, so I wouldn't worry about it. You also have these properties, flex grow, flex shrink, flex basis. They have a certain meaning. I would really not bother about these too much. Really the only property that I often just use is the flex property where I would just simply put flex one to make something uh, take up a bunch of space, uh, or all the available space. Okay. So that is that and using that we then decide that we want to redesign it using uh, Flexbox. So we, the first thing we do is we create a couple of wireframes. We create one wireframe for desktop and we create one wireframe from mobile. So this is what we want it to look like on desktop. And this is what we want it to look like on mobile. And we start with a mobile first layout. So we lay out a bunch of base styles and we, we have a base font size. We have a base body size. We have a base, uh, uh, font. we have a base size. We have a base heading sizes. We have, uh, we have a bunch of base styles and then, uh, for tablets, we want to slightly increase the body font size and so on. Right? So, yeah, so we, then we create that nav bar, uh, like this. So for the nav bar, we used a slightly different logo. Then we created the banner image. We created the about section and then we added, we started with a mobile first layout and then we added a bunch of things here to uh, change the layout slightly on mob on tablet and on desktop. Then we have a jobs list that was shown on mobile and tablet. And then we have a jobs table that is shown on desktop. So yeah, a jobs table that is shown on desktop. And uh, then we have this application form. We made some changes here, but ultimately this is what it looked like on mobile about Jovian employment opportunities, submit your application, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, looks good. Looks readable, uh, could be better, but looks readable. And even these are stacked vertically. And this is what it looks like on tablet, slightly different. Okay. Slightly more spaced out, but still using the list. And then this is what it looks like on desktop here. It's using a table and here the three footer items are shown vertically uh, are shown horizontally like they are on tablet. Okay. So that's our, uh, that was a lesson on responsive design and CSS Flexbox. Then we had an assignment on mobile first responsive design where you had this layout that you had to implement. So this was the layout uh, where you had a mobile tablet and desktop layout and you had to implement each one of these like that. And yeah, I think there's not much to be said here, except that you could use Flexbox to do this. And you also learn about the CSS calc property. And these are the, the process you first set up, prepare for de development and employment. You set up base styles and break points, you implement it section by section, and then you deploy and make a submission. Okay. Then we learned about the bootstrap CSS framework, which is, uh, which makes life really easy when you're working with, uh, uh, when you're working on a complex project. 
So again, we wanted to rebuild the Jovin Careers website, add some links in the navigation bar, show a collapsible menu on mobile devices, show a list of jobs using cards on mobile and table on desktop and make the color scheme, typography and layout consistent and aesthetically pleasing. And for that, we wanted to use the bootstrap. Uh, so there's a basic project setup, of course, but we wanted to rebuild the project using bootstrap. Now bootstrap is a powerful open source CSS framework that is used to design a uh, streamline the development workflow especially for mobile first designs. So we installed Bootstrap and uh, we installed simply by including a couple of uh, links within our page and right, right away changed a few styles. Then uh, we customized it using CSS variables. So we changed the primary color. We changed the, uh, let's see. Yeah, so we changed customized Bootstraps typography. We customized, uh, we customized the fonts. So we used a couple of outer fonts. Then we created a styles.css file, we set the fonts, we set the primary color and we set maybe the heading font to be enter. And there are other customizations that can be done, but these basic customizations should do the job even for your own personal website. Then we decided that, okay, we're going to start out. So bootstrap has a bunch of pre-configured breakpoints. So we're going to start out with uh, uh, just building out a, a basic container and building out a layout and then making it responsive by adding more uh, utility classes. So yeah, the, in Bootstrap, you typically start out with a container that centers your content on the page horizontally, and it takes up full width until whatever size you want. And after that, it uh, stays in the center. And Bootstrap has a grid system, a 12 column grid system. And what you can do is you can uh, set up a row and inside that row, you can have a bunch of columns and you can set widths for those columns on how many uh, of these uh, grid elements you wanted to span. So you can mix and match. You can have three, 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 or you can have three, four, and four, or you can have maybe three, three, and six. You can have three, two, two, things like that. As soon as it crosses 12, it goes on to the next row. Okay. So you create a row and inside the row, you create a column and that's what it does. And then we talk, we looked at offsets. We looked at gutters. Those are just ways to shift things around here and there. And then we talked about utility classes. So bootstrap has a bunch of utility classes to set margins, set paddings, um, to set sizes, a bunch of uh, utility classes to make things bold, italic, to center text, a bunch of utility classes to set background colors, a bunch of utility classes for borders, for display, for flex, etc. Okay. And it also offers a bunch of components. So it offers a nav bar component. So you can use something like this. Um, so this is a nav bar component for our site. And this produces a nav bar like this, which on mobile created a collapsible menu, but on desktop creates this nice three links with a sign in button. So what you do with typically with components is you check out the example code and you simply copy paste and drop it into your, um, not copy paste exactly, but yeah, take a close look at it and either just drop it line by line or write it, or maybe in some cases when it's exactly what you need, just uh, copy pasted and it's fine, but make sure you understand every line of code that you're copy pasting. Don't have anything that doesn't actually make sense. You can always inspect something. You can right click inspect on the page itself and see what exactly a piece of uh, code does. Okay. So that's the nav bar over here. It had a couple of images. So we were using a different logo on mobile and a different logo on desktop like that. You can do all those using some utility classes. Then we created a utility uh, hero section. Again, there are a bunch of examples here for the hero section and we found this one interesting. So we went ahead and simply copied it from the browser itself. So you can just open up these tools. So again, feel free to use some of these examples if you think that is going to be useful for your website, your personal website. And then we pasted it in here, made some changes and we got this nice hero section, which looks pretty good, pretty well designed. Um, and yeah, that's with that, we had the hero. Then we created a jobs list. This is where we used a card component. So bootstrap has this card component that we could use. So we added a bunch of cards and you can see here that we created this nice job opportunities and it has this nice visual hierarchy, big text, bold font, dark color, uh, smaller text, then even smaller text, lighter font, even smaller text, even lighter font. All right. So use all of these things to give your content some hierarchy. Then we created a jobs table for desktop. Again, bootstrap has some examples of creating tables and this is the table that we ended up creating. Then we wanted to create a form. And again, bootstrap has a bunch of great utilities for building forms. So we just dropped in a bunch of examples and then modified it. And that gave us this nice little form with uh, everything looking very consistent, very clean, and also a nice submit application button. And finally bootstrap, we looked at some examples for footers. 
uh, over here like for example you have a bunch of footer examples so from this we picked out an example that worked for us and we added a footer as well and we, and then we took the site and then we deployed it and this is what our site looked like which is so much nicer it looks so much cleaner and if you want you could just use a bunch of these bootstrap components and templates to build out your personal website and make it look just something as simple and clean as this and that's perfectly fine that's not a problem at all and this is what it looks like on mobile this expanded menu and then work at jovian some of the content is centered and of course things that were side by side have come one above the other the table has shifted and now our go has gone away and now we are showing a bunch of cards then we have the submit application section and that's it and then we have summary and references uh, about this and a bunch of tutorials on bootstrap that you can check out okay so that was a bootstrap css framework and the next assignment was building a scientific calculator and here your job was to use uh, not just html css but also some javascript to build out a scientific calculator that is as similar to google scientific calculator as possible and many of you did a pretty good job at this and you also wanted to make it responsive so that it looks like this on mobile and it looks like this on desktop and um, there's this tutorial here that goes into how exactly you add the javascript Hello, functionality yeah uh, basically what you do is let's see you go in here you add in a bunch of event listeners for each of the buttons and for each of the buttons you uh yeah you you add event listeners and then you add the logic so you have maybe uh, you take the expression and then you evaluate it or you add something to the expression so all of that is covered here i think this is a great tutorial on uh, how exactly to use javascript to add interactivity and we are going to go much deeper into adding interactivity but for now i think this this does the job and the last thing I want to mention is you can build these things pretty easily with chat GPT. Anytime you want some piece of functionality on your page, you can always say, let's say, how do I animate some text to just shift up and down as um, this user is scrolling? You can always just search on chat GPT and get some uh, code from it, right? So that's what uh, I just want to mention there as well. Use chat GPT or use Jobot right over here. Use Jobot for help too. Okay. So that was the um, third assignment. Then we talked about the Express Web Application Framework. So the Express Web Application Framework is a minimalist framework for Node.js for streamlining server-side application development with flexible routing and middleware support and a vibrant ecosystem. So we wanted to improve the Jovian Careers website. This time we, we wanted to have a single, uh, just only show the table, only show the jobs on the main page and then show the application form on individual job pages. And then we wanted to have uh, uh, an application form that can trigger an email and an acknowledgement page. So this is what we did. Well, we, we again created a new repository and we learned about creating web servers. So instead of static websites where you simply open a URL and then you get back an HTML or CSS page, a web server can take a request and then do some processing, maybe call a database or something, get some data from a database like jovian.com is doing and then send it back. So we learned how to build web servers or web, web applications. And the way we did that is, well, we use the Express uh, Web Application Framework, which is really simple to get started with. You just create a bit of text like this, and uh, you just write a bit of text like this. And as, just like that, you will get this when you open it up, when you run it using npm start or node src app.js, uh, you're gonna get this hello world response. And now you can start sending whatever content you want after doing whatever processing you need to do, right? So the key benefit of a uh, web of uh, server-side frameworks is that you can do some processing. So we saw how to uh, serve HTML files. You can always just uh, do rest.send file and send out a file like index.html. And this is what it looked like. Now, uh, as we make changes, we don't want to keep restarting our server again and again. That, that's where you can use a tool like NodeMod to automatically restart things. Then to serve static files, you can use express.use. So express or app.use express.static. So any images, any CSS files are often served as static files. And uh, deploying express applications to Vercel is also fairly straightforward. You just, is also fairly straightforward. You just need this Vercel.json file in the project's root folder with some content that uh, informs Vercel where to uh, send all the requests and what environment to use, okay? Now, uh, next we looked at how to use templates. So let's say we had this list of jobs that came from a database or maybe it's just something that we have hard coded. 
Um, now we want to actually render it using a template and that's where we can create a template uh, we can change index.html to index.mustache and then inside it we can create this mustache template which can loop over the variable jobs and then create a list of these cards and in each card insert the uh, title job title job link and the salary and the posted date and then similarly we can also create a table once again that can loop over uh, the list of jobs and create table rows and the table will be shown on on desktop and on mobile will show the list of cards so we are reusing code html code but this time we are putting it inside a template and we configure mustache as the view engine and then we simply render that index template and we give it the data jobs uh, the list of jobs as the variable jobs and just like that that renders this page over uh, that renders this table on mobile on desktop and a list of cards on mobile and there are a bunch of things you can do with mustache it's really easy to use uh, but the idea here is you take some data and you put it into some html template to uh, render a page then we also looked at route parameters so if you have a uh, route like this app dot get slash jobs colon id then you can take your uh, you can take some logic and then use that to render different kinds of dynamic pages for example here we have this template called yeah we had we have a template called job so we have a template called job and in that template job dot mustache we simply render an application form and we render the title of the job right and that's what that looks like i believe the job template is yeah some it's a, a you all the source code yeah here is the template content for the job template right so it contains just uh, uh it's going to use the job title and it's going to show that job title in here it's in the application form at the title of the application form all right uh, then we looked at how to handle form submissions now to handle form submissions we need to use this app dot post route okay and we need to also give it a we need also need to use this body parser middleware so that it can parse the uh, content that is going to be sent using the post method and finally uh, we can store the form responses in a database but what we chose to do instead was to simply format an email and send it send out an email using the node mailer package okay so the idea is not that every form response has to be emailed but you can get that form response into a route and then you can do whatever you want with it store it in a database just throw it away send out an email call an api whatever you want to do okay and um once yeah and then we saw how to just make sure that we are not exposing any credentials directly within our code so we put in an email id and password as environment variables both within our uh as an as a dot n file uh, within an uh, within a dot n file which is git ignored in a node.js project and then also within uh Vercel because Vercel also needs those and just like that we created this uh, final website which has a bunch of job opportunities at jovian like this and we can also then go in and fill out an application let me just fill that out And when you hit submit application, that's actually going to go and try to send an email. Not right now, this, this did not send, but yeah, it's gonna send an email and it's gonna show an acknowledgement page. So that's great. And there are a bunch of other resources you can check out. And in most cases, you can just ask ChatGPT what you're, uh, you can ask it and it'll tell you exactly what you, uh, what you need, okay? So that is the uh, final lesson. And of course, now you're going to be working on building your own personal website. Um, so, that's all that's all for today and we have successfully made it to the end of this course uh, we have learned a lot about html css javascript and web development in general um it's been a great journey so far and i hope you feel like you've learned something over the past uh, several weeks that you can actually apply 